Chapter 24 Instinct Instinct is usually defined as the faculty of acting in such a way as to produce certain ends, without foresight of the ends, and without previous education in the performance. That instincts, as thus defined, exist on an enormous scale in the animal kingdom needs no proof. They are the functional correlatives of structure. With the presence of a certain organ goes, one may say, almost always a native aptitude for its use. Has the bird a gland for the secretion of oil? She knows instinctively how to press the oil from the gland, and apply it to the feather. Has the rattlesnake the grooved tooth and gland of poison? He knows without instruction how to make both structure and function most effective against his enemies. Has the silkworm the function of secreting the fluid silk? At the proper time she winds the cocoon such as she has never seen, as thousands before have done, and thus without instruction, pattern, or experience, forms a safe abode for herself in the period of transformation. Has the hawk talons? She knows by instinct how to wield them effectively against the helpless quarry. 370. A very common way of talking about these admirably definite tendencies to act is by naming abstractly the purpose they subserve, such as self-preservation, or defense. Or care for eggs and young and saying the animal has an instinctive fear of death or love of life, or that she has an instinct of self-preservation, or an instinct of maternity and the like. But this represents the animal as obeying abstractions which not once in a million cases is it possible it can have framed. The strict physiological way of interpret, page 384, ing the facts leads to far clearer results. The actions we call instinctive all conform to the general reflex type, they are called forth by determinate sensory stimuli in contact with the animal's body, or at a distance in his environment. The cat runs after the mouse, runs or shows fight before the dog, avoids falling from walls and trees, shuns fire and water, etc., not because he has any notion either of life or of death, or of self, or of preservation. He has probably attained to no one of these conceptions in such a way as to react definitely upon it. He acts in each case separately, and simply because he cannot help it. Being so framed that when that particular running thing called a mouse appears in his field of vision he must pursue. That when that particular barking and obstreperous thing called a dog appear there he must retire, if at a distance, and scratch if clothed by, that he must withdraw his feet from water and his face from flame, etc. His nervous system is to a great extent a pre-organized bundle of such reactions, they are as fatal as sneezing, and as exactly correlated to their special excitants as it is to its own. Although the naturalist may, for his own convenience, class these reactions under general heads, he must not forget that in the animal it is a particular sensation or perception or image which calls them forth. At first this view astounds us by the enormous number of special adjustments it supposes animals to possess ready-made in anticipation of the outer things among which they are to dwell. Can mutual dependence be so intricate and go so far? Is each thing born fitted to particular other things, and to them exclusively, as locks are fitted to their keys? Undoubtedly this must be believed to be so. Each nook and cranny of creation, down to our very skin and entrails, has its living inhabitants, with organs suited to the place, to devour and digest the food it harbors and to meet the dangers it conceals. And the minuteness of adaptation thus shown in the way of structure knows no hounds. Even so are there no bounds to the minuteness of adaptation in the way of conduct which the several inhabitants display. The older writings on instinct are ineffectual wastes of words, because their authors never came down to this defy, p. 385, night and simple point of view, but smothered everything in vague wonder at the clairvoyant and prophetic power of the animals so superior to anything in man and at the beneficence of God in endowing them with such a gift. But God's beneficence endows them, first of all, with a nervous system, and, turning our attention to this, makes instinct immediately appear neither more nor less wonderful than all the other facts of life. Every instinct is an impulse. Whether we shall call such impulses as blushing, sneezing, coughing, smiling, or dodging, or keeping time to music, instincts or not, is a mere matter of terminology. The process is the same throughout. 
In his delightfully fresh and interesting work, Der Thierisch Will, Herr G. H. Schneider subdivides impulses, Trieb, into sensation impulses, perception impulses, and idea impulses. To crouch from cold is a sensation impulse. To turn and follow, if we see people running one way, is a perception impulse, to cast about for cover, if it begins to blow and rain, is an imagination impulse. A single complex instinctive action may involve successively the awakening of impulses of all three classes. Thus a hungry lion starts to seek prey by the awakening in him of imagination coupled with desire. He begins to stalk it when, on eye, ear, or nostril, he gets an impression of its presence at a certain distance, he springs upon it either when the booty takes alarm and sees, or when the distance is sufficiently reduced. He proceeds to tear and devour at the moment he gets a sensation of its contact with his claws and fangs. Seeking, stalking, springing, and devouring are just so many different kinds of muscular contraction, and neither kind is called forth by the stimulus appropriate to the other. Schneider says of the hamster, which stores corn in its hole. If we analyze the propensity of storing, we find that it consists of three impulses, first, an impulse to pick up the nutritious object, due to perception. Second, an impulse to carry it off into the dwelling place due to the idea of this ladder, and third, an impulse to lay it down there, due to the sight of the place. It lies in the nature of the hamster that it should never see a full ear of corn without feeling a desire, page 386, to strip it, it lew in its nature to feel, as soon as its cheek pouches are filled, an irresistible desire to hurry to its home. And finally, it lies in its nature that the sight of the storehouse should awaken the impulse to empty the cheeks, page 208. In certain animals of a low order the feeling of having executed one impulsive step is such an indispensable part of the stimulus of the next one, that the animal cannot make any variation in the order of its performance. Now, why do the various animals do what seem to us such strange things, in the presence of such outlandish stimuli? Why does the hen, for example, submit herself to the tedium of incubating such a fearfully uninteresting set of objects as a nestful of eggs, unless she have some sort of a prophetic inkling of the result? The only answer is ad hominem. We can only interpret the instincts of brutes by what we know of instincts in ourselves. Why do men always lie down, when they can, on soft beds rather than on hard floors? Why do they sit round the stove on a cold day? Why, in a, room, do they place themselves, ninety-nine times out of a hundred, with their faces towards its middle rather than to the wall? Why do they prefer saddle of mutton and champagne to hard tack and ditch water? Why does the maiden interest the youth so that everything about her seems more important and significant than anything else in the world? Nothing more can be said than that these are human ways, and that every creature likes its own ways, and takes to the following them as a matter of course. Science may come and consider these ways, and find that most of them are useful. But it is not for the sake of their utility that they are followed, but because at the moment of following them we feel that that is the only appropriate and natural thing to do. Not one man in a billion, when taking his dinner, ever thinks of utility. He eats because the food tastes good and makes him want more. If you ask him why he should want to eat more of what tastes like that, instead of revering you as a philosopher he will probably laugh at you for a fool. The connection between the savory sensation and the act it awakens is for him absolute and selbst verstandlich, an a priori sin, page 387, thesis of the most perfect sort, needing no proof but its own evidence. It takes, in short, what Berkeley calls a mind debauched by learning to carry the process of making the natural seem strange, so far as to ask for the why of any instinctive human act. To the metaphysician alone can such questions occur as, why do we smile, when pleased, and not scowl? Why are we unable to talk to a crowd as we talk to a single friend? Why does a particular maiden turn our wits so upside down? The common man can only say, of course we smile, of course our heart palpitates at the sight of the crowd, of course we love the maiden, that beautiful soul clad in that perfect form, so palpably and flagrantly made from all eternity to be loved. And so, probably, does each animal feel about the particular things it tends to do in presence of particular objects. They, too, 
are a priori syntheses. To the lion it is the lioness which is made to be loved, to the bear, the she-bear. To the broody hen the notion would probably seem monstrous that there should be a creature in the world to whom a nestful of eggs was not the utterly fascinating and precious and never to be too much sat upon object which it is to her. 371. Thus we may be sure that, however mysterious some animals' instincts may appear to us, our instincts will appear no less mysterious to them. And we may conclude that, to the animal which obeys it, every impulse and every step of every instinct shines with its own sufficient light, and seems at the moment the only eternally right and proper thing to do. It is done for its own sake exclusively. What Volop, page 388, Tua's thrill may not shake a fly, when she at last discovers the one particular leaf, or carrion, or bit of dung, that out of all the world can stimulate her ovipositor to its discharge. Does not the discharge then seem to her the only fitting thing? And need she care or know anything about the future maggot and its food? Since the egg-laying instincts are simple examples to consider, a few quotations about them from Schneider may be serviceable. The phenomenon so often talked about, so variously interpreted, so surrounded with mystification. That an insect should always lay her eggs in a spot appropriate to the nourishment of her young, is no more marvelous than the phenomenon that every animal pairs with a mate capable of bearing posterity. Or feeds on material capable of affording him nourishment. Not only the choice of a place for laying the eggs, but all the various acts for depositing and protecting them, are occasioned by the perception of the proper object, and the relation of this perception to the various stages of maternal impulse. When the burying beetle perceives a carrion, she is not only impelled to approach it and lodge her eggs in it, but also to go through the movements requisite for burying it. Just as a bird who sees his hen bird is impelled to caress her, to strut around her, dance before her, or in some other way to woo her, just as a tiger, when he sees an antelope, is impelled to stalk it, to pounce upon it, and to strangle it. When the tailor bee cuts out pieces of rose leaf, bends them, carries them into a caterpillar or mouse hole in trees or in the earth, covers their seams again with other pieces. And so makes a thimble-shaped case when she fills this with honey and lays an egg in it, all these various appropriate expressions of her will are to be explained by supposing that at the time when the eggs are ripe within her. The appearance of a suitable caterpillar or mouse hole and the perception of rose leaves are so correlated in the insect with the several impulses in question, that the performances follow as a matter of course when the perceptions take place. The perception of the empty nest, or of a single egg, seems in birds to stand in such a close relation to the physiological functions of oviparation, that it serves as a direct stimulus to these functions, while the perception of a sufficient number of eggs has just the opposite effect. It is well known that hens and ducks lay more eggs if we keep removing them than if we leave them in the nest. The impulse to sit arises, as a rule, when a bird sees a certain number of eggs in her nest. If this number is not yet to be seen there, the ducks continue to lay, although they perhaps have laid twice as many eggs as they are accustomed to sit upon. That sitting, also, is independent of any idea of purpose and is a pure perception impulse is evident, among other things, page 389, from the fact that many birds, e.g. wild ducks, steal eggs from each other. The bodily disposition to sit is, it is true, one condition, since broody hens will sit where there are no eggs, 372, but the perception of the eggs is the other condition of the activity of the incubating impulse. The propensity of the cuckoo and of the cowbird to lay their eggs in the nests of other species must also be interpreted as a pure perception impulse. These birds have no bodily disposition to become broody, and there is therefore in them no connection between the perception of an egg and the impulse to sat upon it. Eggs ripen, however, in their oviducts, and the body tends to get rid of them. And since the two birds just named do not drop their eggs anywhere on the ground, but in nests, which are the only places where they may preserve the species, it might easily appear that such preservation of the species was what they had in view. And that they acted with full consciousness of the purpose. But this is not so. The cuckoo is simply excited by the perception of quite determinate sorts of nest, which already contain eggs, to drop her own into them, and throw the others out, because this perception is a direct stimulus to these acts. 
It is impossible that she should have any notion of the other bird Kam ing and sitting on her egg. 373. Instincts not always blind or invariable. Remember that nothing is said yet of the origin of instincts, but only of the constitution of those that exist fully formed. How stands it with the instincts of mankind? Nothing is commoner than the remark that man differs from lower creatures by the almost total absence of instincts, and the assumption of their work in him by reason. A fruitless discussion might be waged on this point by two theorizers who were careful not to define their terms. Reason might be used, as it often has been, since Kant, not as the mere power of inferring, but also as a name for the tendency to obey impulses of a certain lofty sort, such as duty, or universal ends. And instinct might have its significance so broadened as to cover all impulses whatever, even the impulse to act from the idea of a distant fact, as well as the impulse to act from a present sensation. Were the word instinct used in this broad way, it would of course be impossible to restrict it, as we began by doing, to actions done with no provision of an end. We must of course avoid a quarrel about words, and the facts of the case are, p. 390, really tolerably plain. Man has a far greater variety of impulses than any lower animal, and any one of these impulses, taken in itself, is as blind as the lowest instinct can be. But, owing to man's memory, power of reflection, and power of inference, they come each one to be felt by him, after he has once yielded to them and experienced their results, in connection with a foresight of those results. In this condition an impulse acted out may be said to be acted out, in part at least, for the sake of its results. It is obvious that every instinctive act, in an animal with memory, must cease to be blind after being once repeated, and must be accompanied with foresight of its end just so far as that end may have fallen under the animal's cognizance. An insect that lays her eggs in a place where she never sees them hatched must always do so blindly, but a hen who has already hatched a brood can hardly be assumed to sit with perfect blindness on her second nest. Some expectation of consequences must in every case like this be aroused, and this expectation, according as it is that of something desired or of something disliked, must necessarily either reinforce or inhibit the mere impulse. The hen's idea of the chickens would probably encourage her to sit, a rat's memory, on, the other hand, of a former escape from a trap would neutralize his impulse to take bait from anything that reminded him of that trap. If a boy sees a fat hopping toad, he probably has incontinently an impulse, especially if with other boys, to smash the creature with a stone, which impulse we may suppose him blindly to obey. But something in the expression of the dying toad's clasped hands suggests the meanness of the act, or reminds him of sayings he has heard about the sufferings of animals being like his own. So that, when next he is tempted by a toad, an idea arises which, far from spurring him again to the torment, prompts kindly actions, and may even make him the toad's champion against less reflecting boys. It is plain, then, that, no matter how well endowed an animal may originally be in the way of instincts, his resultant actions will be much modified if the instincts combine with experience, if in addition to impulses he have memories. Associations, inferences, and expectations, on any considerable scale. And, page 391, object O, on which he has an instinctive impulse to react in the manner A, would directly provoke him to that reaction. But O has meantime become for him a sign of the nearness of P, on which he has an equally strong impulse to react in the manner B, quite unlike A. So that when he meets O the immediate impulse A and the remote impulse B struggle in his breast for the mastery. The fatality and uniformity said to be characteristic of instinctive actions will be so little manifest that one might be tempted to deny to him altogether the possession of any instinct about the object O. Yet how false this judgment would be! The instinct about O is there, only by the complication of the associative machinery it has come into conflict with another instinct about P. Here we immediately reap the good fruits of our simple physiological conception of what an instinct is. If it be a mere excite motor impulse, due to the pre-existence of a certain reflex arc in the nerve centers of the creature, of course it must follow the law of all such reflex area. One liability of such area is to have their activity inhibited, 
by other processes going on at the same time. It makes no difference whether the R be organized at birth, or ripen spontaneously later, or be due to acquired habit, it must take its chances with all the other area, and sometimes succeed, and sometimes fail. In drafting off the currents through itself, the mystical view of an instinct would make it invariable. The physiological view would require it to show occasional irregularities in any animal in whom the number of separate instincts, and the possible entrance of the same stimulus into several of them, were great. And such irregularities are what every superior animal's instincts do show in abundance. 374. Wherever the mind is elevated enough to discriminate, wherever several distinct sensory elements must combine to discharge the reflex arc. Wherever, instead of plumping into action instantly at the first rough intimation of what sort of a thing is there, the agent waits to see which one of its kind it is and what the circumstances are of its appearance. Wherever different individuals and in different circumstances can impel him in different ways, wherever these are the conditions, we have a masking of the elementary constitution of the instinctive life. The whole story of our dealings with the lower wild animals is the history of our taking advantage of the way in which they judge of everything by its mere label, as it were, so as to ensnare or kill them. Nature, in them, has left matters in this rough way, and made them act always in the manner which would be oftenest right. There are more worms unattached to hooks than impaled upon them. Therefore, on the whole, says nature to her fishy children, bite at every worm and take your chances. But as her children get higher, and their lives more precious, she reduces the risks. Since what seems to be the same object may be now a genuine food and now a bait, since in gregarious species each individual may prove to be either the friend or the rival, according to the circumstances, of another. Since any entirely unknown object may be fraught with weal or woe, nature implants contrary impulses to act on many classes of things and leaves it to slight alterations in the conditions of the individual case to decide which impulse shall carry the day. Thus, greediness and suspicion, curiosity and timidity, coyness and desire, bashfulness and vanity, sociability and pugnacity, seem to shoot over into each other as quickly, and to remain in as unstable equilibrium. In the higher birds and mammals as in man. They are all impulses, congenital, blind at first, and productive of motor reactions of a rigorously determinate sort. Each one of them, then, is an instinct, as instincts are commonly defined. But they contradict each other, experience, in each particular opera, page 393, tunity of application usually deciding the issue. The animal that exhibits them loses the greater than instinctive, demeanor and appears to lead a life of hesitation and choice, an intellectual life, not, however, because he has no instincts, rather because he has so many that they block each other's path. Thus, then, without troubling ourselves about the words instinct and reason, we may confidently say that however uncertain man's reactions upon his environment may sometimes seem in comparison with those of lower creatures. The uncertainty is probably not due to their possession of any principles of action which he lacks. On the contrary, man possesses all the impulses that they have, and a great many more besides. In other words, there is no material antagonism between instinct and reason. Reason, per se, can inhibit no impulses. The only thing that can neutralize an impulse is an impulse the other way. Reason may, however, make an inference which will excite the imagination so as to set loose the impulse the other way. And thus, though the animal richest in reason might be also the animal richest in instinctive impulses too, he would never seem the fatal automaton which a, merely instinctive animal would be. Let us now turn to human impulses with a, little more detail. All we have ascertained so far is that impulses of an originally instinctive character may exist, and yet not betray themselves by automatic fatality of conduct. But in Maul what impulses do exist? In the light of what has been said, it is obvious that an existing impulse may not always be superficially apparent even when its object is there. And we shall see that some impulses may be masked by causes of which we have not yet spoken. Two principles of non-uniformity in instincts. Were one devising an abstract scheme, nothing would be easier than to discover from an animal's actions just how many instincts he possessed. 
he would react in one way only upon each class of objects with which his life had to deal. He would react in identically the same way upon every specimen of a class, and he would react invariably during his whole life. There would be no gaps among his, page 394, instincts, all would come to light without perversion or disguise. But there are no such abstract animals, and nowhere does the instinctive life display itself in such a, way. Not only, as we have seen, may objects of the same class arouse reactions of opposite sorts in consequence of slight changes in tile circumstances, in the individual object, or in the agent's inward condition. But two other principles of which we have not yet spoken, may come into play and produce results so striking that observers as eminent as Messrs. D. A. Spalding and Romains do not hesitate to call them derangements of the mental constitution, and to conclude that the instinctive machinery has got out of gear. These principles are those. 1. Of the inhibition of instincts by habits, and 2. Of the transitoriness of instincts. Taken in conjunction with the two former principles that the same object may excite ambiguous impulses, or suggest an impulse different from that which it excites. By suggesting a remote object, they explain any amount of departure from uniformity of conduct, without implying any getting out of gear of the elementary impulses from which the conduct flows. 1. The law of inhibition of instincts by habits is this. When objects of a certain class elicit from an animal a certain sort of reaction, it often happens that the animal becomes partial to the first specimen of the class on which it has reacted, and will not afterward react on any other specimen. The selection of a particular hole to live in, of a particular mate, of a particular feeding ground, a particular variety of diet, a particular anything, in short, out of a possible multitude, is a very widespread tendency among animals even those low down in the scale. The limpet will return to the same sticking place in its rook, and the lobster to its favorite nook on the sea bottom. The rabbit will deposit its dung in the same corner, the bird makes its nest on the same bough. But each of these preferences carries with it an insensibility to other opportunities and occasions, an insensibility which can only be described physiologically as an inhibition of, page 395, new impulses by the habit of old ones already formed. The possession of homes and wives of our own makes us strangely insensible to the charms of those of other people, few of us are adventurous in the matter of food. In fact, most of us think there is something disgusting in a bill of fare to which we are unused. Strangers, we are apt to think, cannot be worth knowing, especially if they come from distant cities, etc. The original impulse which got us homes, wives, dietaries, and friends at all, seems to exhaust itself in its first achievements and to leave no surplus energy for reacting on new cases. And so it comes about that, witnessing this torpor, an observer of mankind might say that no instinctive propensity towards certain objects existed at all. It existed, but it existed miscellaneously, or as an instinct pure and simple, only before habit was formed. A habit, once grafted on an instinctive tendency, restricts the range of the tendency itself, and keeps us from reacting on any but the habitual object, although other objects might just as well have been chosen had they been the first comers. Another sort of arrest of instinct by habit is where the same class of objects awakens contrary instinctive impulses. Here the impulse first followed toward a given individual of the class is apt to keep him from ever awakening the opposite impulse in us. In fact, the whole class may be protected by this individual specimen from the application to it of the other impulse. Animals, for example, awaken in a child the opposite impulses of fearing and fondling. But if a child, in his first attempts to pat a dog, gets snapped at or bitten, so that the impulse of fear is strongly aroused, it may be that for years to come no dog will excite in him the impulse to fondle again. On the other hand, the greatest natural enemies, if carefully introduced to each other when young and guided at the outset by superior authority, settle down into those happy families of friends which we see in our menageries. Young animals, immediately after birth, have no instinct of fear, but show their dependence by allowing themselves to be freely handled. Later, however, they grow wild, and, if left to themselves, will not let man approach them. 
I am told by farmers in the, page 396, Adirondack Wilderness that it is a very serious matter if a cow wanders off and calves in the woods and is not found for a week or more. The calf, by that time, is as wild and almost as fleet as a deer, and hard to capture without violence. But calves rarely show any particular wildness to the men who have been in contact with them during the first days of their life, when the instinct to attach themselves is uppermost, nor do they dread strangers as they would if brought up wild. Chickens give a curious illustration of the same law. Mr. Spaulding's wonderful article on instinct shall supply us with the facts. These little creatures show opposite instincts of attachment and fear, either of which may be aroused by the same object, man. If a chick is born in the absence of the hen, it will follow any moving object. And, when guided by sight alone, they seem to have no more disposition to follow a hen than to follow a duck or a human being. Unreflecting lookers on, when they saw chickens a day old running after me, says Mr. Spaulding, and older ones following me for miles, and answering to my whistle, imagine that I must have some occult power over the creatures, whereas I had simply allowed them to follow me from the first. There is the instinct to follow. And the ear, prior to experience, attaches them to the right object. 375. But if a man presents himself for the first time when the instinct of fear is strong, the phenomena are altogether reversed. Mr. Spaulding kept three chickens hooded until they were nearly four days old, and thus describes their behavior. Each of them, on being unhooded, evinced the greatest terror tome, dashing off in the opposite direction whenever I sought to approach it. The table on which they were unhooded stood before a window, and each in its turn beat against the window like a wild bird. One of them darted behind some books, and, squeezing itself into a corner, remained cowering for a length of time. We might guess at the meaning of this strange and exceptional wildness, but the odd fact is enough for my present purpose. Whatever might have been the meaning of this marked change in their mental constitution had they been unhooded on the previous day they would have run to me instead of from me, it could not have been the effect of experience. It must have resulted wholly from changes in their own organizations. 376, page 397 their case was precisely analogous to that of the Adirondack calves. The two opposite instincts relative to the same object ripen in succession. If the first one engenders a habit, that habit will inhibit the application of the second instinct to that object. All animals are tame during the earliest phase of their infancy. Habits formed then limit the effects of whatever instincts of wildness may later be evolved. Mr. Romains give some very curious examples of the way in which instinctive tendencies may be altered by the habits to which their first objects have given rise. The cases are a little more complicated than those mentioned in the text, inasmuch as the object reacted on not only starts a habit which inhibits other kinds of impulse toward it, although such other kinds might be natural, but even modifies by its own peculiar conduct the constitution of the impulse which it actually awakens. Two of the instances in question are those of hens who hatched out broods of chicks after having, in three previous years, hatched ducks. They strove to coax or to compel their new progeny to enter the water, and seemed much perplexed at their unwillingness. Another hen adopted a brood of young ferrets which, having lost their mother, were put under her. During all the time they were left with her she had to sit on the nest, for they could not wander like young chicks. She obeyed their hoarse growling as she would have obeyed her chicken's peep. She combed out their hair with her bill, and used frequently to stop and look with one eye at the wriggling nestful, with an inquiring graze, expressive of astonishment. At other times she would fly up with a loud scream, doubtless because the orphans had nipped her in their search for teats. Finally, a Brahma hen nursed a young peacock during the enormous period of eighteen months, and never laid any eggs during all this time. The abnormal degree of pride which she showed in her wonderful chicken is described by Diar. Romains as ludicrous. 377, page 398. 2. This leads us to the law of transitoriness, which is this, many instincts ripen at a certain age and then fade away. A consequence of this law is that if, 
during the time of such an instinct's vivacity, objects adequate to arouse it are met with, a habit of acting on them is formed, which remains when the original instinct has passed away. But that if no such objects are met with, then no habit will be formed, and, later on in life, when the animal meets the objects, he will altogether fail to react, as at the earlier epoch he would instinctively have done. No doubt such a law is restricted. Some instincts are far less transient than others, those connected with feeding and self-preservation, may hardly be transient at all, and some, after fading out for a time, recur as strong as ever, e.g. The instincts of pairing and rearing young. The law, however, though not absolute, is certainly very widespread, and a few examples will illustrate just what it means. In the chickens and calves above mentioned, it is obvious that the instinct to follow and become attached fades out after a few days, and that the instinct of flight then takes its place. The conduct of the creature toward man being decided by the formation or non-formation of a certain habit during those days. The transiency of the chicken's instinct to follow is also proved by its conduct toward the hen. Mr. Spalding kept some chickens shut up till they were comparatively old, and, speaking of these, he says. A chicken that has not heard the call of the mother till until eight or ten days old then hears it as if it heard it not. I regret to find that on this point my notes are not so full as I could wish, or as they might have been. There is, however, an account of one chicken that could not be returned to the mother when ten days old. The hen followed it and tried to entice it in every way, still, it continually left her and ran to the house or to any person of whom it caught sight. This it persisted in doing, though beaten back with a small branch dozens of times, and, indeed, cruelly mistreated. It was also placed under the mother at night, but it again left her in the morning. The instinct of sucking is ripe in all mammals at birth, and leads to that habit of taking the breast which, in the human infant, may be prolonged by daily exercise long be, page 399, yond its usual term of a year or a year and a half. But the instinct itself is transient, in the sense that if, for any reason, the child be fed by spoon during the first few days of its life and not put to the breast, it may be no easy matter after that to make it suck at all. So of calves. If their mother die, or be dry, or refuse to let them suck for a day or two, so that they are fed by hand, it becomes hard to get them to suck at all when a new nurse is provided. The ease with which sucking creatures are weaned, by simply breaking the habit and giving them food in a new way, shows that the instinct, purely as such, must be entirely extinct. Assuredly the simple fact that instincts are transient, and that the effect of later ones may be altered by the habits which earlier ones have left behind. Is a far more philosophical explanation than the notion of an instinctive constitution vaguely deranged or thrown out of gear. I have observed a Scotch terrier, born on the floor of a stable in December, and transferred six weeks later to a carpeted house, make, when he was less than four months old, a very elaborate pretense of burying things, such as gloves, etc with which he had played till he was tired. He scratched the carpet with his four feet, dropped the object from his mouth upon the spot, and then scratched all about it, with both fore and hind feet, if I remember rightly, and finally went away and let it lie. Of course, the act was entirely useless. I saw him perform it at that age, some four or five times, and never again in his life. The conditions were not present to fix a habit which should last when the prompting instinct died away. But suppose meat instead of a glove, earth instead of a carpet, hunger pangs instead of a fresh supper a few hours later, and it is easy to see how this dog might have got into a habit of burying superfluous food, which might have lasted all his life. Who can swear that the strictly instructive part of the food burying propensity in the wild canidae may not be as short lived as it was in this terrier? A similar instance is given by Dr. H. D. Schmidt, 378, of New Orleans, p. 400. I may cite the example of a young squirrel which I had tamed, a number of years ago, when serving in the army, and when I had sufficient leisure, an opportunity to study the habits of animals. In the autumn, before the winter sets in, adult squirrels bury as many nuts as they can collect, separately, in the ground. 
holding the nut firmly between their teeth, they first scratch a hole in the ground, and, after pointing their ears in all directions to convince themselves that no enemy is near, they ram, the head, with the nut still between the front teeth. Serving as a sledgehammer the nut into the ground, and then fill up the hole by means of their paws. The whole process is executed with great rapidity, and, as it appeared to me, always with exactly the same movements, in fact, it is done so well that I could never discover the traces of the burial ground. Now, as regards the young squirrel, which, of course, never had been present at the burial of a nut, I observed that, after having eaten a number of hickory nuts to appease its appetite, it would take one between its teeth. Then sit upright and listen in all directions. Finding all right, it would scratch upon the smooth blanket on which I was playing with it as if to make a hole, then hammer with the nut between its teeth upon the blanket. And finally perform all the motions required to fill up a hole in the air. After which it would jump away, leaving the nut, of course, uncovered. The anecdote, of course, illustrates beautifully the close relation of instinct to reflex action, a particular perception calls forth particular movements, and that is all. Dr. Schmidt writes me that the squirrel in question soon passed away from his observation. It may fairly be presumed that, if he had been long retained prisoner in a cage, he would soon have forgotten his gesticulations over the hickory nuts. One might, indeed, go still further with safety, and expect that, if such a captive squirrel were then set free, he would never afterwards acquire this peculiar instinct of his tribe. 379. Leaving lower animals aside, and turning to human instincts, we see the law of transiency corroborated on the, page 401, widest scale by the alternation of different interests and passions as human life goes on. With the child, life is all play and fairy tales and learning the external properties of things. With the youth, it is bodily exercises of a more systematic sort, novels of the real world, boon fellowship and song, friendship and love, nature, travel and adventure, science and philosophy. With the man, ambition and policy, acquisitiveness, responsibility to others, and the selfish zest of the battle of life. If a boy grows up alone at the age of games and sports, and learns neither to play ball, nor row, nor sail, nor ride, nor skate, nor shoot, probably he will be sedentary to the end of his days. And, though the best of opportunities be afforded him for learning these things later, it is a hundred to one but he will pass them by and shrink back from the effort of taking those necessary first steps the prospect of which, at an earlier age, would have filled him with eager delight. The sexual passion expires after a protracted reign, but it is well known that its peculiar manifestations in a given individual depend almost entirely on the habits he may form during the early period of its activity. Exposure to bad company then makes him a loose liver all his days, chastity kept at first makes the same easy later on. In all pedagogy the great thing is to strike the iron while hot, and to seize the wave of the pupil's interest in each successive subject before its ebb has come, so that knowledge may be got and a habit of skill acquired, a headway of interest. In short, secured, on which afterward the individual may float. There is a happy moment for fixing skill in drawing, for making boys collectors in natural history, and presently dissectors and botanists, then for initiating them into the harmonies of mechanics and the wonders of physical and chemical law. Later, introspective psychology and the metaphysical and religious mysteries take their turn, and, last of all, the drama of human affairs and worldly wisdom in the widest sense of the term. In each of us a saturation point is soon reached in all these things, the impetus of our purely intellectual zeal expires, and unless the topic be one associated with some urgent personal need that keeps our wits constantly wetted about it, we, p. 402, settle into an equilibrium, and live on what we learned when our interest was fresh and instinctive, without adding to the store. Outside of their own business, the ideas gained by men before they are twenty-five are practically the only ideas they shall have in their lives. They cannot get anything new. Disinterested curiosity is past, the mental grooves and channels set, the power of assimilation gone. If by chance we ever do learn anything about some entirely new topic we are afflicted with a strange sense of insecurity, and we fear to advance a resolute opinion. 
But, with things learned in the plastic days of instinctive curiosity we never lose entirely our sense of being at home. There remains a kinship, a sentiment of intimate acquaintance, which, even when we know we have failed to keep abreast of the subject, matters us with a sense of power over it, and makes us feel not altogether out of the pale. Whatever individual exceptions might be cited to this are of the sort that prove the rule. To detect the moment of the instinctive readiness for the subject is, then, the first duty of every educator. As for the pupils, it would probably lead to a more earnest temper on the part of college students if they had less belief in their unlimited future intellectual potentialities. And could be brought to realize that whatever physics and political economy and philosophy they are now acquiring are, for better or worse, the physics and political economy and philosophy that will have to serve them to the end. The natural conclusion to draw from this transiency of instincts is that most instincts are implanted for the sake of giving rise to habits, and that, this purpose once accomplished, the instincts themselves, as such, have no raison d'etre in the psychical economy, and consequently fade away. That occasionally an instinct should fade before circumstances permit of a habit being formed, or that, if the habit be formed, other factors than the pure instinct should modify its course, need not surprise us. Life is full of the imperfect adjustment to individual cases, of arrangements which, taking the species as a whole, are quite orderly and regular. Instinct cannot be expected to escape this general risk. Page 403. Special Human Instincts. Let us now test our principles by turning to human instincts in more detail. We cannot pretend in these pages to be minute or exhaustive. But we can say enough to set all the above generalities in a more favorable light. But, first, what kind of motor reactions upon objects shall we count as instincts? This, as aforesaid, is a somewhat arbitrary matter. Some of the actions aroused in us by objects go no further than our own bodies. Such is the bristling up of the attention when a novel object is perceived, or the expression on the face or the breathing apparatus of an emotion it may excite. These movements merge into ordinary reflex actions like laughing when tickled, or making a wry face at a bad taste. Other actions take effect upon the outer world. Such are flight from a wild beast, imitation of what we see a comrade do, etc. On the whole it is best to be Catholic, since it is very hard to draw an exact line and call both of these kinds of activity instinctive, so far as either may be naturally provoked by the presence of special sorts of outward fact. Professor Prayer, in his careful little work, Die Seals Kins, says, instinctive acts are in man few in number, and, apart from those connected with the sexual passion, difficult to recognize after early youth is past. And he adds, so much the more attention should we pay to the instinctive movements of newborn babies, sucklings, and small children. That instinctive acts should be easiest recognized in childhood would be a very natural effect of our principles of transitoriness, and of the restrictive influence of habits once acquired. But we shall see how far they are from being few in number, in man. Professor Prayer divides the movements of infants into impulsive, reflex, and instinctive. By impulsive movements he means random movements of limbs, body, and voice, with no aim, and before perception is aroused. Among the first reflex movements are crying on contact with the air, sneezing, snuffling, snoring, coughing, sighing, sobbing, gagging, vomiting, hiccuping, starting, moving the limbs when tickled, touched, or blown upon, etc., etc., p. 404. Of the movements called by him instinctive in the child, Professor Prayer gives a full account. Herr Schneider does the same. And as their descriptions agree with each other and with what other writers about infancy say, I will base my own very brief statement on theirs. Sucking, almost perfect at birth. Not coupled with any congenital tendency to seek the breast, this being a later acquisition. As we have seen, sucking is a transitory instinct. Biting an object placed in the mouth, chewing and grinding the teeth, licking sugar. Making characteristic grimaces over bitter and sweet tastes, spitting out. Clasping an object which touches the fingers or toes. Later, attempts to grasp at an object seen at a distance. 
pointing at such objects, and making a peculiar sound expressive of desire, which, in my own three children, was the first manifestation of speech, occurring many weeks before other significant sounds. Carrying to the mouth of the object, when grasped. This instinct, guided and inhibited by the sense of taste, and combined with the instincts of biting, chewing, sucking, spitting out, etc. And with the reflex act of swallowing, leads in the individual to a set of habits which constitute his function of alimentación, and which may or may not be gradually modified as life goes on. Crying at bodily discomfort, hunger, or pain, and at solitude. Smiling at being noticed, fondled, or smiled at by others. It seems very doubtful whether young infants have any instinctive fear of a terrible or scowling face. I have been unable to make my own children, under a year old, change their expression when I changed mine, at most they manifested attention or curiosity. Prayer instances a protrusion of the lips, which, he says, may be so great as to remind one of that in the chimpanzee, as an instinctive expression of concentrated attention in the human infant. Turning the head aside as a gesture of rejection, a gesture usually accompanied with a frown and a bending back of the body, and withholding the breath. Holding head erect. Sitting up. Page 405. Standing. Locomotion. The early movements of children's limbs are more or less symmetrical. Later a baby will move his legs in alternation if suspended in the air. But until the impulse to walk awakens by the natural ripening of the nerve centers, it seems to make no difference how often the child's feet may be placed in contact with the ground. The legs remain limp, and do not respond to the sensation of contact in the soles by muscular contractions pressing downwards. No sooner, however, is the standing impulse born, than the child stiffens his legs and presses downward as soon as he feels the floor. In some babies this is the first locomotory reaction. In others it is preceded by the instinct to creep, which arises, as I can testify, often in a very sudden way. Yesterday the baby sat quite contentedly wherever he was put. Today it has become impossible to keep him sitting at all, so irresistible is the impulse, aroused by the sight of the floor, to throw himself forward upon his hands. Usually the arms are too weak, and the ambitious little experimenter falls on his nose. But his perseverance is dauntless, and he ends in a few days by learning to travel rapidly around the room in the quadrupedal way. The position of the legs in creeping varies much from one child to another. My own child, when creeping, was often observed to pick up objects from the floor with his mouth, a phenomenon which, as Dr. O. W. Holmes has remarked, like the early tendency to grasp with the toes, easily lends itself to interpretation as a reminiscence of pre-human ancestral habits. The walking instinct may awaken with no less suddenness, and its entire education be completed within a week's compass, barring, of course, it little grogginess in the gait. Individual infants vary enormously. But on the whole it is safe to say that the mode of development of these locomotor instincts is inconsistent with the account given by the older English associationist school, of their being results of the individual's education. Due altogether to the gradual association of certain perceptions with certain haphazard movements and certain resultant pleasures. Mr. Page 406, Bain has tried, 380, by describing the demeanor of newborn lambs, to show that locomotion is learned by a very rapid experience. But the observation recorded proves the faculty to be almost perfect from the first. And all others who have observed newborn calves, lambs, and pigs agree that in these animals the powers of standing and walking, and of interpreting the topographical significance of sights and sounds, are all but fully developed at birth. Often in animals who seem to be learning to walk or fly the semblance is elusive. The awkwardness shown is not due to the fact that experience has not yet been there to associate the successful movements and exclude the failures. But to the fact that the animal is beginning his attempts before the coordinating centers have quite ripened for their work. Mr. Spaulding's observations on this point are conclusive as to birds. Birds, B says, A do not learn to fly. Two years ago I shut up five unfledged swallows in a small box, not much larger than the nest from which they were taken. 
The little box, which had a wire front, was hung on the wall near the nest, and the young swallows were fed by their parents through the wires. In this confinement, where they could not even extend their wings, they were kept until after they were fully fledged, on going to set the prisoners free, one was found dead. The remaining four were allowed to escape one at a time. Two of these were perceptibly wavering and unsteady in their flight. One of them, after a flight of some ninety yards, disappeared among some trees. Number three and no. For it never flew against anything, nor was there, in their avoiding objects, any appreciable difference between them and the old birds. Number three swept round the Wellingtonia, and no. For rose over the hedge, just as we see the old swallows doing every hour of the day. I have this summer verified these observations. Of two swallows I had similarly confined, one, on being set free, HEW a yard or two close to the ground, rose in the direction of a beech tree, which it gracefully avoided. It was seen for a considerable time sweeping round the beaches and performing magnificent evolutions in the air high above them. The other, which was observed to beat the air with its wings more than usual, was soon lost to sight, behind some trees. Titmice, tomtits, and wrens I have made the subjects of similar observations, and with similar results. 381. In the light of this report, one may well be tempted to make a prediction about the human child, slid say that if a, p. 407, baby were kept from getting on his feet for two or three weeks after the first impulse to walk had shown itself in him, a small blister on each sole would do the business, he might then be expected to walk about as well. Through the mere ripening of his nerve centers, as if the ordinary process of learning had been allowed to occur during all the blister time. It is to be hoped that some scientific widower, left alone with his offspring at the critical moment, may ere long test this suggestion on the living subject. Climbing on trees, fences, furniture, banisters, etc., is a well marked instinctive propensity which ripens after the fourth year. Vocalization this may be either musical or significant. Very few weeks after birth the baby begins to express its spirits by emitting vowel sounds, as much during inspiration as during expiration, and will lie on its back cooing and gurgling to itself for nearly an hour. But this singing has nothing to do with speech. Speech is sound significant. During the second year a certain number of significant sounds are gradually acquired. But talking proper does not set until the instinct to imitate sounds ripens in the nervous system, and this ripening seems in some children to be quite abrupt. Then speech grows rapidly in extent and perfection. The child imitates every word he hears uttered, and repeats it again and again with the most evident pleasure at his new power. At this time it is quite impossible to talk with him, for his condition is that of echolalia, instead of answering the question, he simply reiterates it. The result is, however, that his vocabulary increases very fast. And little by little, with teaching from above, the young prattler understands, puts words together to express his own wants and perceptions, and even makes intelligent replies. From a, speechless, he has become a speaking, animal. The interesting point with regard to this instinct is the oftentimes very sudden birth of the impulse to imitate sounds. Up to the date of its awakening the child may have been as devoid of it as a dog. For days later his whole energy may be poured into this new channel. The habits of articulation formed during the plastic age of childhood are in most persons sufficient to inhibit the 4, p. 408, Matt Ion of new ones of a fundamentally different sort witness the inevitable, foreign accent which distinguishes the speech of those who learn a language after early youth. Imitation the child's first words are in part vocables of his own invention, which his parents adopt, and which, as far as they go, form a new human tongue upon the earth. And in part they are his more or less successful imitations of words he bears the parents' use. But the instinct of imitating gestures develops earlier than that of imitating sounds, unless the sympathetic crying of a baby when it hears another cry may be reckoned as imitation of a sound. Professor Prayer speaks of his child imitating the protrusion of the father's lips in its fifteenth week. The various accomplishments of infancy, making, pat a cake, saying greater than bye-bye, 
blowing out the candle, etc. Usually fall well inside the limits of the first year. Later come all the various imitative games in which childhood revels, playing, horse, soldiers, etc., etc. And from this time onward man is essentially the imitative animal. His whole educability and in fact the whole history of civilization depend on this trait, which his strong tendencies to rivalry, jealousy, and acquisitiveness reinforce. Nil humani ami alienam puto is the motto of each individual of the species. And makes him, whenever another individual shows a power or superiority of any kind, restless until he can exhibit it himself. But apart from this kind of imitation, of which the psychological roots are complex, there is the more direct propensity to speak and walk and behave like others, usually without any conscious intention of so doing. And there is the imitative tendency which shows itself in large masses of men, and produces panics, and orgies, and frenzies of violence, and which only the rarest individuals can actively withstand. This sort of imitativeness is possessed by man in common with other gregarious animals, and is an instinct in the fullest sense of the term, being a, blind impulse to act as soon as a certain perception occurs. It is particularly hard not to imitate gaping, laughing, or looking and running in a certain direction, if we see others doing so. Certain mesmerized subjects must automatically imitate whatever motion there, p. 409, operator makes before their eyes. 382, a successful piece of mimicry gives to both bystanders and mimic a peculiar kind of aesthetic pleasure. The dramatic impulse, the tendency to pretend one is someone else, contains this pleasure of mimicry as one of its elements. Another element seems to be a peculiar sense of power in stretching one's own personality so as to include that of a strange person. In young children this instinct often knows no bounds. For a few months in one of my children's third year, he literally hardly ever appeared in his own person. It was always, play I am so and so, and you are so and so, and the chair is such a thing, and then we'll do this or that. If you called him by his name, H, you invariably got the reply, I'm not H, I'm a hyena, or a horse car, or whatever the feigned object might it be. He outwore this impulse after a time. But while it lasted, it had every appearance of being the automatic result of ideas, often suggested by perceptions, working out irresistible motor effects. Imitation shades into Emulation or rivalry, a very intense instinct, especially rife with young children, or at least especially undisguised. Everyone knows it. Nine-tenth of the work of the world is done by it. We know that if we do not do the task someone else will do it and get the credit, so we do it. It has very little connection with sympathy, but rather more with pugnacity, which we proceed in turn to consider. Pugnacity, anger, resentment. In many respects man is the most ruthlessly ferocious of beasts. As with all gregarious animals, two souls, as Faust says, dwell within his breast, the one of sociability and helpfulness, the other of jealousy and antagonism to his mates. Though in a general way he cannot live without them, yet, as regards certain individuals, it often falls out that he cannot live with them either. Constrained to be a member of a tribe, he still has a right to decide, as far as in him lies, of which other members the tribe shall consist. Killing off a few, page 410, obnoxious ones may often better the chances of those that remain. And killing off a neighboring tribe from whom no good thing comes, but only competition, may materially better the lot of the whole tribe. Hence the gory cradle, the bellum onium contra omnes, in which our race was reared. Hence the fickleness of human ties, the ease with which the foe of yesterday becomes the ally of today, the friend of today the enemy of tomorrow. Hence the fact that we, the lineal representatives of the successful enactors of one scene of slaughter after another, must, whatever more pacific virtues we may also possess, still carry about with us, ready at any moment to burst into flame. The smoldering and sinister traits of character by means of which they lived through so many massacres, harming others, but themselves unharmed. Sympathy is an emotion as to whose instinctiveness psychologists have held hot debate, some of them contending that it is no primitive endowment, but, originally at least, 
the result of a rapid calculation of the good consequences to ourselves of the sympathetic act. Such a calculation, at first conscious, would grow more unconscious as it became more habitual, and at last, tradition and association aiding, might prompt to actions which could not be distinguished from immediate impulses. It is hardly needful to argue against the falsity of this view. Some forms of sympathy, that of mother with child, for example, are surely primitive, and not intelligent forecasts of board and lodging and other support to be reaped in old age. Danger to the child blindly and instantaneously stimulates the mother to actions of alarm or defense. Menace or harm to the adult beloved or friend excites us in a corresponding way, often against all the dictates of prudence. It is true that sympathy does not necessarily follow from the mere fact of gregariousness. Cattle do not help a wounded comrade, on the contrary, they are more likely to dispatch him. But a dog will lick another sick dog, and even bring him food. And the sympathy of monkeys is proved by many observations to be strong. In man, then, we may lay it down that the sight of suffering or danger to others is a direct exciter of interest, and an immediate stimulus, if, p. 411, no complication hinders, to acts of relief. There is nothing unaccountable or pathological about this, nothing to justify Professor Bain's assimilation of it to the fixed ideas of insanity, as clashing with the regular outgoings of the will. It may be as primitive as any other outgoing, and may be due to a random variation selected, quite as probably as gregariousness and maternal love are, even in Spencer's opinion, due to such variations. It is true that sympathy is peculiarly liable to inhibition from other instincts which its stimulus may call forth. The traveler whom the Good Samaritan rescued may well have prompted such instinctive fear or disgust in the priest and Levite who passed him by, that their sympathy could not come to the front. Then, of course, habits, reasoned reflections, and calculations may either check or reinforce one's sympathy, as may also the instincts of love or hate, if these exist, for the suffering individual. The hunting and pugnacious instincts, when aroused, also inhibit our sympathy absolutely. This accounts for the cruelty of collections of men hounding each other on to bait or torture a victim. The blood mounts to the eyes, and sympathy's chance is gone. 383. The hunting instinct has an equally remote origin in the evolution of the race. 384. The hunting and the fighting in, page 412, stinct combine in many manifestations. They both support the emotion of anger, they combine in the fascination which stories of atrocity have for most minds. And the utterly blind excitement of giving the rein to our fury when our blood is up, an excitement whose intensity is greater than that of any other human passion save one, is only explicable as an impulse aboriginal in character. And having more to do with immediate and overwhelming tendencies to muscular discharge than to any possible reminiscences of effects of experience or association of ideas. I say this here, because the pleasure of disinterested cruelty has been thought a paradox, and writers have sought to show that it is no primitive attribute of our nature but rather a resultant of the subtle combination of other less malignant elements of mind. This is a hopeless task. If evolution and the survival of the fittest be true at all, the destruction of prey and of human rivals must have been among the most important of man's primitive functions, the fighting and the chasing instincts must have become ingrained. Certain perceptions must immediately, and without the intervention of inferences and ideas, have prompted emotions and motor discharges. And both the latter must, from the nature of the case, have been very violent, and therefore, when unchecked, of an intensely pleasurable kind. It is just because human bloodthirstiness is such a primitive part of us that it is so hard to eradicate, especially where a fight or a hunt is promised as part of the fun. 385, p. 413. As Rochefoucauld says, there is something in the misfortunes of our very friends that does not altogether displease us. And an apostle of peace will feel a certain vicious thrill run through him, and enjoy a vicarious brutality, as he turns to the column in his newspaper at the top of which, shocking atrocity stands printed in large capitals. See how the crowd hawks round a street brawl. 
Consider the enormous annual sale of revolvers to persons, not one in a thousands of whom has any serious intention of using them, but of whom each one has his carnivorous self-consciousness agreeably tickled by the notion. As he clutches the handle of his weapon, that he will be rather a dangerous customer to meet. See the ignoble crew that escorts every great pugilist, parasites who feel as if the glory of his brutality rubbed off upon them, and whose darling hope, from day to day, is to arrange some set to of which they may share the rapture without enduring the pains. The first blows at a prize fight are apt to make a refined spectator sick. But his blood is soon up in favor of one party, and it will then seem as if the other fellow could not be banged and pounded and mangled enough, the refined spectator would like to reinforce the blows himself. Over the sinister orgies of blood of certain depraved and insane persons let a curtain be drawn, as well as over the ferocity with which otherwise fairly decent men may be animated, when, at the sacking of a town, for instance. The excitement of victory long de, p. 414, laid, the sudden freedom of rapine and of lust, the contagion of a crowd, and the impulse to imitate and outdo, all combined to swell the blind drunkenness of the killing instinct, and carry it to its extreme. No. Those who try to account for this from above downwards, as if it resulted from the consequences of the victory being rapidly inferred, and from the agreeable sentiments associated with them in the imagination, have missed the root of the matter. Our ferocity is blind, and can only be explained from below. Could we trace it back through our line of descent, we should see it taking more and more the form of a fatal reflex response, and at the same time becoming more and more the pure and direct emotion that it is. 386. In childhood it takes this form. The boys who pull out grasshoppers' legs and butterflies' wings, and disembowel every frog they catch, have no thought at all about the matter. The creatures tempt their hands to a fascinating occupation, to which they have to yield. It is with them as with the boy fiend Jesse Pomeroy, who cut a little girl's throat, just to see how she'd act. The normal provocatives of the impulse are all living beasts, great and small, toward which a contrary habit has not been formed, all human beings in whom we perceive a certain intent towards us. And a large number of human beings who offend us peremptorily, either by their look, or gait, or by some circumstance in their lives which we dislike. Inhibited by sympathy, and by reflection calling up impulses of an opposite kind, civilized men lose the habit of acting out their pugnacious instincts in a perfectly natural way, and a passing feeling of anger. With its comparatively faint bodily X, P. 415, prescience, may be the limit of their physical combativeness. Such a feeling as this may, however, be aroused by a wide range of objects. Inanimate things, combinations of color and sound, bad bills of fare, may in persons who combine fastidious taste with an irascible temperament produce real ebullitions of rage. Though the female sex is often said to have less pugnacity than the male, the difference seems connected more with the extent of the motor consequences of the impulse than with its frequency. Women take offense and get angry, if anything, more easily than men, but their anger is inhibited by fear and other principles of their nature from expressing itself in blows. The hunting dash, instinct proper seems to be decidedly weaker in them than in men. The latter instinct is easily restricted by habit to certain objects, which become legitimate, game, while other things are spared. If the hunting instinct be not exercised at all, it may even entirely die out, and a man may enjoy letting a wild creature live, even though he might easily kill it. Such a type is now becoming frequent. But there is no doubt that in the eyes of a child of nature such a personage would seem a sort of moral monster. Fear is a reaction aroused by the same objects that arouse ferocity. The antagonism of the two is an interesting study in instinctive dynamics. We both fear, and wish to kill, anything that may kill us. And the question which of the two impulses we shall follow is usually decided by some one of those collateral circumstances of the particular case, to be moved by which is the mark of superior mental natures. Of course this introduces uncertainty into the reaction, but it is an uncertainty found in the higher brutes as well as in men, and ought not to be taken as proof that we are less instinctive than they. Fear has bodily expressions of an extremely energetic kind, 
and stands, beside lust and anger, as one of the three most exciting emotions of which our nature is susceptible. The progress from brute to man is characterized by nothing so much as by the decrease in frequency of proper occasions for fear. In civilized life, in particular, it has at last become possible for large numbers of people to pass from the cradle to the grave without ever having had a pang of genu, page 416, INE fear. Many of us need an attack of mental disease to teach us the meaning of the word. Hence the possibility of so much blindly optimistic philosophy and religion. The atrocities of life become, like a tale of little meaning though the words are strong. We doubt if anything like us ever really was within the tiger's jaws, and conclude that the horrors we hear of are but a sort of painted tapestry for the chambers in which we lie so comfortably at peace with ourselves and with the world. Be this as it may, fear is a genuine instinct, and one of the earliest shown by the Lumen Child. Noises seem especially to call it forth. Most noises from the outer world, to a child bred in the house, have no exact significance. They are simply startling. To quote a good observer, M. Perez. Children between three and ten months are less often alarmed by visual than by auditory impressions. In cats, from the fifteenth day, the contrary is the case. A child, three and a half months old, in the midst of the turmoil of a conflagration, in presence of the devouring flames and ruined walls, showed neither astonishment nor fear, but smiled at the woman who was taking care of him. While his parents were busy. The noise, however, of the trumpet of the firemen, who were approaching, and that of the wheels of the engine, made him start and cry. At this age I have never yet seen an infant startled at a flash of lightning, even when intense. But I have seen many of them alarmed at the voice of the thunder. Thus fear comes rather by the ears than by the eyes, to the child without experience. It is natural that this should be reversed, or reduced, in animals organized to perceive danger afar. Accordingly, although I have never seen a child frightened at his first sight of fire, I have many a time seen young dogs, young cats, young chickens, and young birds frightened thereby. I picked up some years ago a lost cat about a year old. Some months afterward at the onset of cold weather I lit the fire in the grate of my study, which was her reception room. She first looked at the flame in a very frightened way. Brought her near to it. She leaped away and ran to hide under the bed. Although the he was lighted every day, it was not until the end of the winter that I could prevail upon her to stay upon a chair near it. The next winter, however, all apprehension had disappeared. Let us, then, conclude that there are hereditary dispositions to fear, which are independent of experience, but which experiences may end by attenuating very considerably. In the human infant I believe them to be particularly connected with the ear. 387, page 417. The effect of noise in heightening any terror we may feel in adult years is very marked. The howling of the storm, whether on sea or land, is a principal cause of our anxiety when exposed to it. The writer has been interested in noticing in his own person, while lying in bed, and kept awake by the wind outside, how invariably each loud gust of it arrested momentarily his heart. A dog, attacking us, is much more dreadful by reason of the noises he makes. Strange men, and strange animals, either large or small, excite fear, but especially men or animals advancing toward us in a threatening way. This is entirely instinctive and antecedent to experience. Some children will cry with terror at their very first sight of a cat or dog, and it will often be impossible for weeks to make them touch it. Others will wish to fondle it almost immediately. Certain kinds of vermin, especially spiders and snakes, seem to excite a fear unusually difficult to overcome. It is impossible to say how much of this difference is instinctive and how much the result of stories heard about these creatures. That the fear of vermin ripens gradually, seemed to me to be proved in a child of my own to whom I gave a live frog once, at the age of six to eight months, and again when he was a year and a half old. The first time he seized it promptly, and holding it, in spite of its struggling, at last got its head into his mouth. He then let it crawl up his breast, and get upon his face, without showing alarm. But the second time, 
although he had seen no frog and heard no story about a frog between whiles, it was almost impossible to induce him to touch it. Another child, a year old, eagerly took some very large spiders into his hand. At present he is afraid, but has been exposed meanwhile to the teachings of the nursery. One of my children from her birth upward saw daily the pet pug dog of the house, and never betrayed the slightest fear until she was, if I recall, p. 418, lecked rightly, about eight months old. Then the instinct suddenly seemed to develop, and with such intensity that familiarity had no mitigating effect. She screamed whenever the dog entered the room, and for many months remained afraid to touch him. It is needless to say that no change in the pug's unfailingly friendly conduct had anything to do with this change of feeling in the child. Prayer tells of a young child screaming with fear on being carried near to the sea. The great source of terror to infancy is solitude. The teleology of this is obvious, as is also that of the infant's expression of dismay, the never-failing cry, on waking up and finding himself alone. Black things, and especially dark places, holes, caverns, etc. Arouse a peculiarly gruesome fear. This fear, as well as that of solitude, of being lost, are explained after a fashion by ancestral experience. Says Schneider. It is a fact that men, especially in childhood, fear to go into a dark cavern or a gloomy wood. This feeling of fear arises, to be sure, partly from the fact that we easily suspect that dangerous beasts may lurk in these localities, a suspicion due to stories we have heard and read. But, on the other hand, it is quite sure that this fear at a certain perception is also directly inherited. Children who have been carefully guarded from all ghost stories are nevertheless terrified and cry if led into a dark place, especially if sounds are made there. Even an adult can easily observe that an uncomfortable timidity steals over him in a lonely wood at night, although he may have the fixed conviction that not the slightest danger is near. This feeling of fear occurs in many men even in their own house after dark, although it is much stronger in a dark cavern or forest. The fact of such instinctive fear is easily explicable when we consider that our savage ancestors through innumerable generations were accustomed to meet with dangerous beasts in caverns, especially bears, and were for the most part attacked by such beasts during the night and in the woods, and that thus an inseparable association between the perceptions of darkness of caverns and woods, and fear took place, and was inherited. 388 High places cause fear of a peculiarly sickening sort, though here, again, individuals differ enormously. The utterly blind instinctive character of the motor impulses here is shown by the fact that they are almost always, p. 419, entirely unreasonable, but that reason is powerless to one suppress them. That they are a mere incidental peculiarity of the nervous system, like liability to seasickness, or love of music, with no teleological significance, seems more than probable. The fear in question varies so much from one person to another, and its detrimental effects are so much more obvious than its uses, that it is hard to see how it could be a selected instinct. Man is anatomically one of the best fitted of animals for climbing about high places. The best psychical complement to this equipment would seem to be a level head when there, not a dread of going there at all. In fact, the teleology of fear, beyond a certain point, is very dubious. Professor Masso, in his interesting monograph, La Pora, which has been translated into French, concludes that many of its manifestations must be considered pathological rather than useful, pain, in several places, expresses the same opinion. And this, I think, is surely the view which any observer without a priori prejudices must take. A certain amount of timidity obviously adapts us to the world we live in, but the fear paroxysm is surely altogether harmful to him who is its prey. Fear of the supernatural is one variety of fear. It is difficult to assign ally normal object for this fear, unless it were a genuine ghost. But, in spite of psychical research societies, science has not yet adopted ghosts. So we can only say that certain ideas of supernatural agency, associated with real circumstances, produce a peculiar kind of horror. This horror is probably explicable as the result of a combination of simpler horrors. 
To bring the ghostly terror to its maximum, many usual elements of the dreadful must combine, such as loneliness, darkness, inexplicable sounds, especially of a dismal character, moving figures half discerned, or, if discerned, of dreadful aspect. And a vertiginous baffling of the expectation. This last element, which is intellectual, is very important. It produces a strange emotional curdle in our blood to see a process with which we are familiar deliberately taking an unwanted course. Anyone's heart would stop beating if he perceived his chair sliding unassisted across the floor. The lower animals appear to be sensitive to the mysteriously exceptional as, page 420, well as ourselves. My friend Professor W. K. Brooks, of the Johns Hopkins University, told me of his large and noble dog being frightened into a sort of epileptic fit by a bone being drawn across the floor by a thread which the dog did not see. Darwin and Romains have given similar experiences. 389. The idea of the supernatural involves that the usual should be set at naught. In the witch and hobgoblin supernatural, other elements still of fear are brought in, caverns, slime and ooze, vermin, corpses, and the like. 390. A human corpse seems normally to produce an instinctive dread, which is no doubt somewhat due to its mysteriousness, and which familiarity rapidly dispels. But, in view of the fact that cadaveric, reptilian, and underground horrors play so specific and constant a part in many nightmares and forms of delirium. It seems not altogether unwise to ask whether these forms of dreadful circumstance may not at a former period have been more normal objects of the environment than now. The ordinary cocksure evolutionist ought to have no difficulty in explaining these terrors, and the scenery that provokes them, as relapses into the consciousness of the cavemen. A consciousness usually overlaid in us by experiences of more recent date. There are certain other pathological fears, and certain peculiarities in the expression of ordinary fear, which might receive an explanatory light from ancestral conditions, even infrahuman ones. In ordinary fear, one may, p. for 21, either run, or remain semi-paralyzed. The latter condition reminds us of the so-called death-shamming instinct shown by many animals. Dar. Lindsay, in his work, Mind and Animals, says this must require great self-command in those that practice it. But it is really no feigning of death at all, and requires no self-command. It is simply a terror paralysis which has been so useful as to become hereditary. The beast of prey does not think the motionless bird, insect, or crustacean dead. He simply fails to notice them at all. Because his senses, like ours, are much more strongly excited by a moving object than by a still one. It is the same instinct which leads a boy playing, I spy, to hold his very breath when the seeker is near, and which makes the beast of prey himself in many cases motionlessly lie in wait for his victim or silently stalk it. By rapid approaches alternated with periods of immobility. It is the opposite of the instinct which makes us jump up and down and move our arms when we wish to attract the notice of someone passing far away. And makes the shipwrecked sailor frantically wave a cloth upon the raft where he is floating when a distant sail appears. Now, may not the statue-like, crouching immobility of some melancholiacs, insane with general anxiety and fear of everything, be in some way connected with this old instinct? They can give no reason for their fear to move but immobility makes them feel safer and more comfortable. Is not this the mental state of the feigning animal? Again, take the strange symptom which has been described of late years by the rather absurd name of agoraphobia. The patient is seized with palpitation and terror at the sight of any open place or broad street which he has to cross alone. He trembles, his knees bend, he may even faint at the idea. Where he has sufficient self-command he sometimes accomplishes the object by keeping safe under the lee of a vehicle going across, or joining himself to a knot of other people. But usually he slinks round the sides of the square, hugging the houses as closely as he can. This emotion has no utility in a, civilized man, but when we notice the chronic agoraphobia of our domestic cats, and see the tenacious way, p. 422, in which many wild animals, especially rodents, cling to cover. 
and only venture on a dash across the open as a desperate measure even then making for every stone or bunch of weeds which may give a momentary shelter, when we see this we are strongly tempted to ask whether such an odd kind of fear in us be not due to the accidental resurrection. Through disease, of a sort of instinct which may in some of our ancestors have had a permanent and on the whole a useful part to play. Appropriation or acquisitiveness the beginnings of acquisitiveness are seen in the impulse which very young children display, to snatch at, or beg for, any object which pleases their attention. Later, when they begin to speak, among the first words they emphasize are, me and mine. 391, their earliest quarrels with each other are about questions of ownership. And parents of twins soon learn that it conduces to a quiet house to buy all presents in impartial duplicate. Of the later evolution of the proprietary instinct I need not speak. Everyone knows how difficult a thing it is not to covet whatever pleasing thing we see, and how the sweetness of the thing often is as gall to us so long as it is another's. Then another is in possession, the impulse to appropriate the thing often turns into the impulse to harm him, what is called envy, or jealousy, ensues. In civilized life the impulse to own is usually checked by a variety of considerations, and only passes over into action under circumstances legitimated by habit and common consent. An additional example of the way in which one instinctive tendency may be inhibited by others. A variety of the proprietary instinct is the impulse to form collections of the same sort of thing. It differs much in individuals, and shows in a striking way how instinct and habit interact. 4. Al. P. 423. Though a collection of any given thing, like postage stamps, need not be begun by any given person, yet the chances are that if accidentally it be begun by a person with the collecting instinct, it will probably be continued. The chief interest of the objects, in the collector's eyes, is that they are a collection, and that they are his. Rivalry, to be sure, inflames this, as it does every other passion, yet the objects of a collector's mania need not be necessarily such as are generally in demand. Boys will collect anything that they see another boy collect, from pieces of chalk and peach pits up to books and photographs. Out of a hundred students whom I questioned, only four or five had never collected anything. 392. The associationist psychology denies that there is any blind primitive instinct to appropriate, and would explain all acquisitiveness, in the first instance, as a desire to secure the pleasures which the objects possessed may yield. And, secondly, as the association of the idea of pleasantness with the holding of the thing, even though the pleasure originally got by it was only gained through its expense or destruction. Thus the miser is shown to us as one who has transferred to the gold by which he may by the goods of this life all the emotions which the goods themselves would yield and who thereafter loves the gold for its own sake, preferring the means of pleasure to the pleasure itself. There call belittle doubt that much of this analysis a broader view of the facts would have dispelled. The miser is an abstraction. There are all kinds of misers. The common sort, the excessively niggardly man, simply exhibits the psychological law that the potential has often a far greater influence over our mind than the actual. A man will not marry now, because to do so puts an end to his indefinite potentialities of choice of a partner. He prefers the latter. He will not use open fires or wear his good clothes, because the day may come when he will have to use the furnace or dress in a worn-out coat, and then where will he be? Page 424, For him, better the actual evil than the fear of it. And so it is with the common lot of misers. Better to live poor now, with the power of living rich, than to live rich at the risk of losing the power. These men value their gold, not for its own sake, but for its powers. Demonetize it, and see how quickly they will get rid of it. The associationist theory is, as regards them, entirely at fault, they care nothing for the gold in SE. With other misers there combines itself with this preference of the power over the act the far more instinctive element of the simple collecting propensity. Every one collects money, and when a man of petty ways is smitten with the collecting mania for this object he necessarily becomes a miser. Here again the associationist psychology is wholly at fault. The hoarding instinct prevails widely among animals as well as among men. 
Professor Silliman has thus described one of the hordes of the California wood rat, made in an empty stove of an unoccupied house. I found the outside to be composed entirely of spikes, all laid with symmetry. So as to present the points of the nails outward. In the center of this mass was the nest, composed of finely divided fibers of hemp packing. Interlaced with the spikes were the following, about two dozen knives, forks, and spoons, all the butcher's knives, three in number. A large carving knife, fork, and steel, several large plugs of tobacco, an old purse containing some silver, matches, and tobacco, nearly all the small tools from the tool closets, with several large angers. All of which must have been transported some distance, as they were originally stored in different parts of the house. The outside casing of a silver watch was disposed of in one part of the pile, the glass of the same watch in another, and the works in still another. 393. In every lunatic asylum we find the collecting instinct developing itself in an equally absurd way. Certain patients will spend all their time picking pins from the floor and hoarding them. Others collect bits of thread, buttons, or rags, and prize them exceedingly. Now, the miser, par excellence of the popular imagination and of melodrama, the monster of squalor and misanthropy, is simply one of these mentally deranged persons. His intellect may in many matters be clear, but his instincts, page 425, especially that of ownership, are insane, and their insanity has no more to do with the association of ideas than with the precession of the equinoxes. As a matter of fact his hoarding usually is directed to money, but it also includes almost anything besides. Lately in a Massachusetts town there died a miser who principally hoarded newspapers. These had ended by so filling all the rooms of his good-sized house from floor to ceiling that his living space was restricted to a few narrow channels between them. Even as I write, the morning paper gives an account of the emptying of a miser's den in Boston by the City Board of Health. What the owner hoarded is thus described. A he gathered old newspapers, wrapping paper, incapacitated umbrellas, canes, pieces of common wire, cast-off clothing, empty barrels, pieces of iron, old bones, battered tinware, fractured pots. And bushels of such miscellany as is to be found only at the city dump. The empty barrels were filled, shelves were filled, every hole and corner was filled, and in order to make more storage room, the hermit covered his storeroom with a network of ropes. And hung the ropes as full as they could hold of his curious collections. There was nothing one could think of that wasn't in that room. As a wood sawyer, the old man had never thrown away a saw blade or a wood buck. The bucks were rheumatic and couldn't stand up, and the saw blades were worn down to almost nothing in the middle. Some had been actually worn in two, but the ends were carefully saved and stored away. As a coal heaver, the old man had never cast of a worn-out basket, and there were dozens of the remains of the old things, patched up with canvas and rope yarns, in the storeroom. There were at least two dozen old hats, fur, cloth, silk, and straw, etc. Of course there may be a great many associations of ideas in the miser's mind about the things he hoards. He is a thinking being, and must associate things. But, without an entirely blind impulse in this direction behind all his ideas, such practical results could never be reached. 394. Kleptomania, as it is called, is an uncontrollable impulse to appropriate, occurring in persons whose associations of ideas would naturally all be of a counteracting sort. p. 426. Kleptomaniacs often promptly restore, or permit to be restored, what they have taken, so the impulse need not be to keep, but only to take. But elsewhere hoarding complicates the result. A gentleman, with whose case I am acquainted, was discovered, after his death, to have a hoard in his barn of all sorts of articles, mainly of a trumpery sort, but including pieces of silver which he had stolen from his own dining room. And utensils which he had stolen from his own kitchen, and for which he had afterward bought substitutes with his own money. Constructiveness is as genuine and irresistible an instinct in man as in the bee or the beaver. Whatever things are plastic to his hands, those things he must remodel into shapes of his own, and the result of the remodeling, however useless it may be, 
gives him more pleasure than the original thing. The mania of young children for breaking and pulling apart whatever is given them is more often the expression of a rudimentary constructive impulse than of a destructive one. Blocks are the playthings of which they are least apt to tire. Clothes, weapons, tools, habitations, and works of art are the result of the discoveries to which the plastic instinct leads, each individual starting where his forerunners left off, and tradition preserving all that once is gained. Clothing, where not necessitated by cold, is nothing but a sort of attempt to remodel the human body itself, an attempt still better shown in the various tattooings, tooth filings, scarrings, and other mutilations that are practiced by savage tribes. As for habitation, there can be no doubt that the instinct to seek a sheltered nook, open only on one side, into which he may retire and be safe, is in man quite as specific as the instinct of birds to build a nest. It is not necessarily in the shape of a shelter from wet and cold that the need comes before him, but he feels less exposed and more at home when not altogether unenclosed than when lying all abroad. Of course the utilitarian origin of this instinct is obvious. But to stick to bare facts at present and not to trace origins, we must admit that this instinct now exists, and probably always has existed, since man was man. Habits, p. 427, of the most complicated kind are reared upon it. But even in the midst of these habits we see the blind instinct cropping out. As, for example, in the fact that we feign a shelter within a, shelter, by backing up beds in rooms with their heads against the wall. And never lying in them the other way, just as dogs prefer to get cinder or upon some piece of furniture to sleep, instead of lying in the middle of the room. The first habitations were caves and leafy grottoes, bettered by the bends, and we see children today, when playing in wild places, take the greatest delight in discovering and appropriating such retreats and playing house there. Play The impulse to play in special ways is certainly instinctive. A boy can no more help running after another boy who runs provokingly near him, than a kitten can help running after a rolling ball. A child trying to get into its own hand some object which it sees another child pick up, and the latter trying to get away with the prize, are just as much slaves of an automatic prompting as are two chickens or fishes. Of which one has taken a big morsel into its mouth and decamps with it, while the other darts after in pursuit. All simple active games are attempts to gain the excitement yielded by certain primitive instincts, through feigning that the occasions for their exercise are there. They involve imitation, hunting, fighting, rivalry, acquisitiveness, and construction, combined in various ways, their special rules are habits, discovered by accident, selected by intelligence, and propagated by tradition. But unless they were founded in automatic impulses, games would lose most of their zest. The sexes differ somewhat in their play impulses. As Schneider says, the little boy imitates soldiers, models clay into an oven, builds houses, makes a wagon out of chairs, rides on horseback upon a stick, drives nails with the hammer, harnesses his brethren and comrades together and plays the stage driver, or lets himself be captured as a wild horse by someone else. The girl, on the contrary, plays with her doll, washes and dresses it, strokes it, clasps and kisses it, puts it to bed and tucks it in, sings it a cradle song, or speaks with it as if it were a living being. This fact that a sexual difference exists in the play impulse, that a boy gets more pleasure from a horse and, p. 428, rider and a soldier than from a doll, while with the girl the opposite is the case, is proof that an hereditary connection exists between the perception of certain things, horse, doll, etc. And the feeling of pleasure, as well as between this latter and the impulse to play. 395. There is another sort of human play, into which higher aesthetic feelings enter. I refer to that love of festivities, ceremonies, ordeals, etc. Which seems to be universal in our species. The lowest savages have their dances, more or less formally conducted. The various religions have their solemn rites and exercises, and civic and military power symbolize their grandeur by processions and celebrations of diverse sorts. We have our operas and parties and masquerades. An element common to all these ceremonial games, as they may be called, 
is the excitement of concerted action as one of an organized crowd. The same acts, performed with a crowd, seem to mean vastly more than when performed alone. A walk with the people on a holiday afternoon, an excursion to drink beer or coffee at a popular resort, or an ordinary ballroom, are examples of this. Not only are we amused at seeing so many strangers, but there is a distinct stimulation at feeling our share in their collective life. The perception of them is the stimulus. And our reaction upon it is our tendency to join them and do what they are doing, and our unwillingness to be the first to leave off and go home alone. This seems a primitive element in our nature, as it is difficult to trace any association of ideas that could lead up to it. Although, once granting it to exist, it is very easy to see what its uses to a tribe might be in facilitating prompt and vigorous collective action. The formation of armies and the undertaking of military expeditions would be among its fruits. In the ceremonial games it is but the impulsive starting point. What particular things the crowd then shall do, depends for the most part on the initiative of individuals, fixed by imitation and habit, and continued by tradition. The cooperation of other aesthetic pleasures with games, ceremonial or other, has a great deal to do with the selection of such as shall become stereotyped and, page 429, habitual. The peculiar form of excitement called by Professor Bain the emotion of pursuit, the pleasure of a crescendo, is the soul of many common games. The immense extent of the play activities in human life is too obvious to be more than mentioned. 396. Curiosity. Already pretty low down among vertebrates we find that any object may excite attention, provided it be only novel, and that attention may be followed by approach and exploration by nostril, lips, or touch. Curiosity and fear form a couple of antagonistic emotions liable to be awakened by the same outward thing, and manifestly both useful to their possessor. The spectacle of their alternation is often amusing enough, as in the timid approaches and scared wheelings which sheep or cattle will make in the presence of some new object they are investigating. I have seen alligators in the water act in precisely the same way towards a man seated on the beach in front of them, gradually drawing near as long as he kept still, frantically careering back as soon as he made a movement. Inasmuch as new objects may always be advantageous, it is better that an animal should not absolutely fear them. But, inasmuch as they may also possibly be harmful, it is better that he should not be quite indifferent to them either, but on the whole remaining on the survive, ascertain as much about them, and what they may be likely to bring forth, as he can. Before settling down to rest in their presence. Some such susceptibility for being excited and irritated by the mere novelty, as such, of any movable feature of the environment must form the instinctive basis of all human curiosity. Though, of course, the superstructure absorbs contributions from so many other factors of the emotional life that the original root may be hard to find. With what, p. 430, is called a scientific curiosity, and with metaphysical wonder, the practical instinctive root has probably nothing to do. The stimuli here are not objects, but ways of conceiving objects. And the emotions and actions they give rise to are to be classed, with many other aesthetic manifestations, sensitive and motor, as incidental features of our mental life. The philosophic brain responds to an inconsistency or a gap in its knowledge, just as the musical brain responds to a discord in what it hears. At certain ages the sensitiveness to particular gaps and the pleasure of resolving particular puzzles reach their maximum, and then it is that stores of scientific knowledge are easiest and most naturally laid in. But these effects may have had nothing to do with the uses for which the brain was originally gives. And it is probably only within a few centuries, since religious beliefs and economic applications of science have played a prominent part in the conflicts of one race with another that they may have helped to select for survival a particular type of brain. I shall have to consider this matter of incidental and supernumerary faculties in Chapter 28. Sociability and Shyness As a gregarious animal, man is excited both by the absence and by the presence of his kind. To be alone is one of the greatest of evils for him. Solitary confinement is by many regarded as a mode of torture too cruel and unnatural for civilized countries to adopt. 
To one long pent up on a desert island, the sight of a human footprint or a human form in the distance would be the most tumultuously exciting of experiences. In morbid states of mind, one of the commonest symptoms is the fear of being alone. This fear may be assuaged by the presence of a little child, or even of a baby. In a case of hydrophobia known to the writer, the patient insisted on keeping his room crowded with neighbors all the while, so intense was his fear of solitude. In a gregarious animal, the perception that he is alone excites him to vigorous activity. Mr. Galton thus describes the behavior of the South African cattle whom he had such good opportunities for observing. Although the ox has little affection for, or interest in, his fellows, he cannot endure even a momentary separation from his herd. If he be separated from it by stratagem or force, he exhibits every sign of mental agony. He strives with all his might to get back again, and when he succeeds he plunges into its middle to bathe his whole body with the comfort of closest companionship. 397. Man is also excited by the presence of his kind. The bizarre actions of dogs meeting strange dogs are not altogether without a parallel in our own constitution. We cannot meet strangers without a certain tension, or talk to them exactly as to our familiars. This is particularly the case if the stranger be an important personage. It may then happen that we not only shrink from meeting his eye, but actually cannot collect our wits or do ourselves any sort of justice in his presence. This odd state of mind, says Darwin, 398, is chiefly recognized by the face reddening, by the eyes being averted or cast down, and by awkward, nervous movements of the body. Shyness seems to depend on sensitiveness to the opinion, whether good or bad, of others, more especially with respect to external appearance. Strangers neither know nor care anything about our conduct or character, but they may, and often do, criticize our appearance. The consciousness of anything peculiar, or even new, in the dress, or any slight blemish on the person, and more especially on the face, points which are likely to attract the attention of strangers makes the shy intolerably shy. 399. On the other hand, in those cases in which conduct, and not personal appearance, is concerned, we are much more apt to be shy in the presence of acquaintances whose judgment we in some degree value than in that of strangers. Some persons, however, are so sensitive that the mere act of speaking to almost any one is sufficient to rouse their self-consciousness, and a slight blush is the result. Disapprobation Causes shyness and blushing much more readily than does approbation. Persons who are exceedingly shy are rarely shy in the presence of those with whom they are quite familiar, and of whose good opinion and sympathy they are quite assured. For instance, a girl in presence of her mother. Shyness, is closely related to fear, yet it is distinct from fear in the ordinary sense. A shy man dreads the notice of strangers, but can hardly be said to be afraid of them. He may be as bold as a hero in battle, and yet hear no self-confidence about trifles in the presence of strangers. Almost every one is extremely nervous, page 432, when first addressing a public assembly, and most men remain so through their lives. As Mr. Darwin observes, a real dread of definite consequences may enter into this greater than stage fright and complicate the shyness. Even so our shyness before an important personage may be complicated by what Professor Bain calls servile terror, based on representation of definite dangers if we fail to please. But both stage fright and servile terror may exist with the most indefinite apprehensions of danger, and, in fact, when our reason tells us there is no occasion for alarm. We must, therefore, admit a certain amount of purely instinctive perturbation and constraint, clue to the consciousness that we have become objects for other people's eyes. Mr. Darwin goes on to say, shyness comes on at a very early age. In one of my own children, two years and three months old, I saw a trace of what certainly appeared to be shyness directed toward myself, after an absence from home of only a week. Every parent has noticed the same sort of thing. Considering the despotic powers of rulers in savage tribes, respect and awe must, from time immemorial, have been emotions excited by certain individuals. And stage fright servile terror, and shyness, must have had as copious opportunities for exercise as at the present time. 
whether these impulses could ever have been useful, and selected for usefulness, is a question which, it would seem, can only be answered in the negative. Apparently they are pure hindrances, like fainting at sight of blood or disease, seasickness, a dizzy head on high places, and certain squeamishnesses of aesthetic taste. They are incidental emotions, in spite of which we get along. But they seem to play an important part in the production of two other propensities, about the instinctive character of which a good deal of controversy has prevailed. I refer to cleanliness and modesty, to which we must proceed, but not before Tyre have said a word about another impulse closely allied to shyness. I mean, secretiveness, which, although often due to intelligent calculation and the dread of betraying our interests in some more or less definitely foreseen way, is quite as often a blind, p. 433, propensity, serving no useful purpose, and is so stubborn and ineradicable a part of the character as fully to deserve a place among the instincts. Its natural stimuli are unfamiliar human beings, especially those whom we respect. Its reactions are the arrest of whatever we are saying or doing when such strangers draw an eye, coupled often with the pretense that we were not saying or doing that thing, but possibly something different. Often there is added to this a disposition to mendacity when asked to give an account of ourselves. With many persons the first impulse, when the doorbell rings, or a visitor is suddenly announced, is to scuttle out of the room, so as not to be caught. When a person at whom we have been looking becomes aware of us, our immediate impulse may be to look the other way, and pretend we have not seen him. Many friends have confessed to him that this is a frequent phenomenon with them in meeting acquaintances in the street, especially unfamiliar ones. The bow is a secondary correction of the primary feint that we do not see the other person. Probably most readers will recognize in themselves, at least, the start, the nascent disposition, on many occasions, to act in each and all of these several ways. That the start is neutralized by second thought proves it to come from a deeper region than thought. There is unquestionably a native impulse in every one to conceal love affairs, and the acquired impulse to conceal pecuniary affairs seems in many to be almost equally strong. It is to be noted that even where a given habit of concealment is reflective and deliberate, its motive is far less often definite prudence than a vague aversion to have one's sanctity invaded and one's personal concerns fingered and turned over by other people. Thus, some persons will never leave anything with their name written on it, where others may pick it up even in the woods, an old envelope must not be thrown on the ground. Many cut all the leaves of a book of which they may be reading a single chapter, so that no one shall know which one they have singled out, and all this with no definite notion of harm. The impulse to conceal is more apt to be provoked by superiors than by equals or inferiors. How differently do boys talk together when their parents are not, page 434, by. Servants see more of their master's characters than masters of servants. 400. Where we conceal from our equals and familiars, there is probably always a definite element of prudential provision involved. Collective secrecy, mystery, enters into the emotional interest of many games, and is one of the elements of the importance men attach to Freemasonries of various sorts, being delightful apart from any end. Cleanliness Seeing how very filthy savages and exceptional individuals among civilized people may be, philosophers have doubted whether any genuine instinct of cleanliness exists. And whether education and habit be not responsible for whatever amount of it is found. Were it an instinct, its stimulus would be dirt, and its characteristic reaction the shrinking from contact therewith, and the cleaning of it away after contact had occurred. Now, if some animals are cleanly, men may be so, and there can be no doubt that some kinds of matter are natively repugnant, both to sight, touch, and smell, excrementitious and putrid things, blood, pus, entrails, and diseased tissues. For example, it is true that the shrinking from contact with these things may be inhibited very easily, as by a medical education. And it is equally true that the impulse to clean them away may be inhibited by so slight an obstacle as the thought of the coldness of the ablution, or the necessity of getting up to perform it. It is also true that an impulse to cleanliness, habitually checked, will become obsolete fast enough. But none of these facts prove the impulse never to have been, page 435 there. 
401, it seems to be there in all cases. And then to be particularly amenable to outside influences, the child having his own degree of squeamishness about what he shall touch or eat. And later being either hardened or made more fastidious still by the habits he is forced to acquire and the examples among which he lives. Examples get their hold on him in this way, that a, particularly evil-smelling or catarrhal or lousy comrade is rather offensive to him. And that he sees the odiousness in another of an amount of dirt to which he would have no spontaneous objection if it were on his own skin. That we dislike in others things which we tolerate in ourselves is a law of our aesthetic nature about which there can be no doubt. But as soon as generalization and reflection step in, this judging of others leads to a new way of regarding ourselves. Who taught you politeness? The impolite, is, I believe, a Chinese proverb. The concept, dirty fellow, which we have formed, becomes one under which we personally shrink from being classed. And so we greater than wash up, and set ourselves right, at moments when our social self-consciousness is awakened, in a manner toward which no strictly instinctive native prompting exists. But the standard of cleanliness attained in this way is not likely to go beyond the mutual tolerance for one another of the members of the tribe, and hence may comport a good deal of actual filth. Modesty, shame. Whether there be an instinctive impulse to hide certain parts of the body in certain acts is perhaps even more open to doubt than whether there be an instinct of cleanliness. Anthropologists have denied it, and in the utter shamelessness of infancy and of many savage tribes have seemed to find a good basis for their views. It must, however, be remembered that infancy proves nothing, and that, as far as sexual modesty goes, the sexual impulse itself works directly against it at times of excitement, and with reference to certain people, and that habits of immodesty, p. 436, contracted with those people may forever afterwards inhibit it any impulse to be modest towards them. This would account for a great deal of actual immodesty, even if an original modest impulse were there. On the other hand, the modest impulse, if it do exist, must be admitted to have a singularly ill-defined sphere of influence, both as regards the presences that call it forth, and as regards the acts to which it leads. Ethnology shows it to have very little backbone of its own, and to follow easily fashion and example. Still, it is hard to see the ubiquity of some sort of tribute to shame, however perverted, as where female modesty consists in covering the face alone or immodesty in appearing before strangers unpainted and to believe it to have no impulsive root whatever. Now, what may the impulsive root be? I believe that, for one thing, it is shyness, the feeling of dread that unfamiliar persons, as explained above, may inspire us withal. Such persons are the original stimuli to our modesty. 402, but the actions of modesty are quite different from the actions of shyness. They consist of the restraint of certain bodily functions, and of the covering of certain parts, and why do such particular actions necessarily ensue? That there may be in the human animal, as such, a greater than blind, and immediate automatic impulse to such restraints and coverings in respect inspiring presences is a possibility difficult of actual disproof. But it seems more likely, from the facts, that the actions of modesty are suggested to us in a roundabout way. And that, even more than those of cleanliness, they arise from the application in the second instance to ourselves of judgments primarily passed upon our mates. It is not easy to believe that, even among the nakedest savages, an unusual degree of cynicism and indecency in an individual should not beget a certain degree of contempt, and cheapen him in his neighbor's eyes. Human nature is sufficiently homo, page 437, genius for us to be sure that everywhere reserve must inspire some respect, and that persons who suffer every liberty are persons whom others disregard. Not to be like such people, then, would be one of the first resolutions suggested by social self-consciousness to a child of nature just emerging from the unreflective state. And the resolution would probably acquire effective pungency for the first time when the social self-consciousness was sharpened into a real fit of shyness by some person being present whom it was important not to disgust or displease. Public opinion would of course go on to build its positive precepts upon this germ. And, through a variety of examples and experiences, the ritual of modesty would grow, 
until it reached the New England pitch of sensitiveness and range, making us say stomach instead of belly, limb instead of leg, retire instead of go to bed. And forbidding us to call a female dog by name. At bottom this amounts to the admission that, though in some shape or other a natural and inevitable feature of human life, modesty need not necessarily be an instinct in the pure and simple excite motor sense of the term. Love. Of all propensities, the sexual impulses bear on their face the most obvious signs of being instinctive, in the sense of blind, automatic, and untaught. The teleology they contain is often at variance with the wishes of the individuals concerned. And the actions are performed for no assignable reason but because nature urges just that way. Here, if ever, then, we ought to find those characters of fatality, infallibility, and uniformity, which, we are told, make of actions done from instinct to class so utterly apart. But is this so? The facts are just the reverse, the sexual instinct is particularly liable to be checked and modified by slight differences in the individual stimulus, by the inward condition of the agent himself, by habits once acquired and by the antagonism of contrary impulses operating on the mind. One of these is the ordinary shyness recently described, another is what might be called the essential instinct, the instinct of personal isolation, the actual repulsiveness to us of the idea of intimate contact, p. 438, with most of the persons we meet, especially those of our own sex. 403, thus it comes about that this strongest passion of all, so far from being the most irresistible, may, on the contrary, be the hardest one to give rein to and that individuals in whom the inhibiting influences are potent may pass through life and never find an occasion to have it gratified. There could be no better proof of the truth of that proposition with which we began our study of the instinctive life in man, that irregularity of behavior may come as well from the possession of too many instincts as from the lack of any at all. The instinct of personal isolation, of which we have spoken, exists more strongly in men with respect to one another, and more strongly in women with respect to men. In women it is called coyness, and has to be positively overcome by a process of wooing before the sexual instinct inhibits it and takes its place. As Darwin has shown in his book on the descent of man and sexual selection, it has played a vital part in the amelioration of all higher animal types, and is to a great degree responsible for whatever degree of chastity the human race may show. It illustrates strikingly, however, the law of the inhibition of instincts by habits, for, once broken through with a given person, it is not apt to assert itself again. And habitually broken through, as by prostitutes, with various persons, it may altogether decay. Habit also fixes it in us towards certain individuals, nothing is so particularly displeasing as the notion of close personal contact with those whom we have long known in a respectful and distant way. The fondness of the ancients and of modern orientals for forms of unnatural vice, of which the notion affects us with horror, is probably a mere case of the way in which this instinct may be inhibited by habit. Me can hardly suppose that the ancients had by gift of nature a propensity of which we are devoid, and were all victims of what is now a pathological aberration limited to individuals. It is more probable that with them the instinct of physical aver, page 439, shown toward a certain class of objects was inhibited early in life by habits, formed under the influence of example. And that then a kind of sexual appetite, of which very likely most men possess the germinal possibility, developed itself in an unrestricted way. That the development of it in an abnormal way may check its development in a normal way, seems to be a well-ascertained medical fact. And that the direction of the sexual instinct towards one individual tends to inhibit its application to other individuals, is a law, upon which, though it suffers many exceptions, the whole regime of monogamy is based. These details are a little unpleasant to discuss, but they show so beautifully the correctness of the general principles in the light of which our review has been made, that it was impossible to pass them over unremarked. Jealousy is unquestionably instinctive. Parental love is an instinct stronger in woman than in man, at least in the early childhood of its object. I need do little more than quote Schneider's lively description of it as it exists in her. As soon as a wife becomes a mother her whole thought and feeling, her whole being, is altered. Until then she had only thought of her own well-being, 
of the satisfaction of her vanity, the whole world appeared made only for her, everything that went on about her was only noticed so far as it had personal reference to herself. She asked of everyone that he should appear interested in her, pay her the requisite attention, and as far as possible fulfill her wishes. Now, however, the center of the world is no longer herself, but her child. She does not think of her own hunger, she must first be sure that the child is fed. It is nothing to her that she herself is tired and needs rest, so long as she sees that the child's sleep is disturbed. The moment it stirs she awakes, though far stronger noises fail to arouse her now. She, who formerly could not bear the slightest carelessness of dress, and touched everything with gloves, allows herself to be soiled by the infant, and does not shrink from seizing its clouts with her naked hands. Now, she has the greatest patience with the ugly, piping cry baby, Shriholes, whereas until now every discordant sound, every slightly unpleasant noise, made her nervous. Every limb of the still hideous little being appears to her beautiful, every movement fills her with delight. She has, in one word, transferred her entire egoism to the child, and lives only in it. Thus, at least, it is in all unspoiled, naturally bred, page 440, mothers, who, alas, seem to be growing rarer, and thus it is with ah the higher animal mothers. The maternal joys of a cat, for example, are not to be disguised. With an expression of infinite comfort she stretches out her forelegs to offer her teats to her children, and moves her tail with delight when the little hungry mouths tug and suck. But not only the contact, the bare look of the offspring affords endless delight, not only because the mother thinks that the child will someday grow great and handsome and bring her many joys, but because she has received from nature an instinctive love for her children. She does not herself know why she is so happy, and why the look of the child and the care of it are so agreeable, any more than the young man can give an account of why he loves a maiden, and is so happy when she is near. Few mothers, in caring for their child, think of the proper purpose of maternal love for the preservation of the species. Such a thought may arise in the father's mind, seldom in that of the mother. The latter feels only a that it is an everlasting delight to hold the being which she has brought forth protectingly in her arms, to dress it, to wash it, to rock it to sleep, or to still its hunger. So far the worthy Schneider, to whose words may be added this remark, that the passionate devotion of a mother, in herself, perhaps, to a sick or dying child is perhaps the most simply beautiful moral spectacle that human life affords. Contemning every danger, triumphing over every difficulty, outlasting all fatigue, woman's love is here invincibly superior to anything that man can show. These are the most prominent of the tendencies which are worthy of being called instinctive in the human species. 404, page 441. It will be observed that no other mammal, not even the monkey, shows so large an array. In a perfectly rounded development, Every one of these instincts would start a habit towards certain objects and inhibit a habit towards certain others. Usually this is the case. But, in the one-sided development of civilized life, it happens that the timely age goes by in a sort of starvation of objects, and the individual then grows up with gaps in his psychic constitution which future experiences can never fill. Compare the accomplished gentleman with the poor artisan or tradesman of a city, during the adolescence of the former, objects appropriate to his growing interests, bodily and mental, were offered as fast as the interests awoke, and, as a consequence, he is armed and equipped at every angle to meet the world. Sport came to the rescue and completed his education where real things were lacking. He has tasted of the essence of every side of human life, being sailor, hunter, athlete, scholar, fighter, talker, dandy, man of affairs, etc., all in one. Over the city poor boy's youth no such golden opportunities were hung, and in his manhood no desires for most of them exist. Fortunate it is for him if gaps are the only anomalies his instinctive life presents. Perversions are too often the fruit of his unnatural bringing up. Chapter 25 The Emotions In speaking of the instincts it has been impossible to keep them separate from the emotional excitements which go with them. Objects of rage, love, fear, etc. Not only prompt a man to outward deeds, 
but provoke characteristic alterations in his attitude and visage, and affect his breathing, circulation, and other organic functions in specific ways. When the outward deeds are inhibited, these latter emotional expressions still remain, and we read the anger in the face, though the blow may not be struck, and the fear betrays itself in voice and color, though one may suppress all other signs. Instinctive reactions and emotional expressions thus shade imperceptibly into each other. Every object that excites an instinct excites an emotion as well. Emotions, however, fall short of instincts, in that the emotional reaction usually terminates in the subject's own body, whilst the instinctive reaction is apt to go farther and enter into practical relations with the exciting object. Emotional reactions are often excited by objects with which we have no practical dealings. A ludicrous object, for example, or a beautiful object are not necessarily objects to which we do anything. We simply laugh, or stand in admiration, as the case may be. The class of emotional, is thus rather larger than that of instinctive, impulses, commonly so called. Its stimuli are more numerous, and its expressions are more internal and delicate, and often less practical. The physiological plan and essence of the two classes of impulse, however, is the same. As with instincts, so with emotions, the mere memory or imagination of the object may suffice to liberate the excite, page 443, meant. One may get angrier in thinking over one's insult than at the moment of receiving it. And we melt more over a mother who is dead than we ever did when she was living. In the rest of the chapter one shall use the word object of emotion indifferently to mean one which is physically present or one which is merely thought of. It would be tedious to go through a complete list of the reactions which characterize the various emotions. For that the special treatises must be referred to. A few examples of their variety, however, ought to find a place here. Let me begin with the manifestations of grief as a Danish physiologist, C. Lang, describes them frowny face 405. The chief feature in the physiognomy of grief is perhaps its paralyzing effect on the voluntary movements. This effect is by no means as extreme as that which fright produces, being seldom more than that degree of weakening which makes it cost an effort to perform actions usually done with ease. It is, in other words, a feeling of weariness. And, as in all weariness, movements are made slowly, heavily, without strength, unwillingly, and with exertion, and are limited to the fewest possible. By this the grieving person gets his outward stamp, he walks slowly, unsteadily, dragging his feet and hanging his arms. His voice is weak and without resonance, in consequence of the feeble activity of the muscles of expiration and of the larynx. He prefers to sit still, sunken himself and silent. The tonicity or latent innervation of the muscles is strikingly diminished. The neck is bent, the head hangs, bowed down with grief, the relaxation of the cheek and jaw muscles makes the face look long and narrow, the jaw may even hang open. The eyes appear large, as is always the case where the orbicularis muscle is paralyzed, but they may often be partly covered by the upper lid which droops in consequence of the laming of its own levator. With this condition of weakness of the voluntary nerve and muscle apparatus of the whole body, there coexists, as aforesaid, just as in all states of similar motor weakness, a subjective feeling of weariness and heaviness. Of something which weighs upon one. One feels downcast, oppressed, laden, one speaks of his weight of sorrow, one must bear up under it, just as one must keep down his anger. Many there are who succumb to sorrow to such a degree that they literally cannot stand upright, but sink or lean against surrounding objects, fall on their knees, or, like Romeo in the monk's cell, throw themselves upon the earth in their despair. But this weakness of the entire voluntary motor apparatus, the so-called apparatus of animal life, is only one side of the physiology of grief. Another side, hardly less important, and in its consequences, p. 444, perhaps even more so, belongs to another subdivision of the motor apparatus, namely, the involuntary or organic muscles, especially those which are found in the walls of the blood vessels, and the use of which is, by contracting, to diminish the latter's caliber. These muscles and their nerves, forming together the vasomotor apparatus, 
act in grief contrarily to the voluntary motor apparatus. Instead of being paralyzed, like the latter, the vascular muscles are more strongly contracted than usual, so that the tissues and organs of the body become anemic. The immediate consequence of this bloodlessness is pallor and shrunkenness, and the pale color and collapsed features are the peculiarities which, in connection with the relaxation of the visage, give to the victim of grief his characteristic physiognomy, and often give an impression of emaciation which ensues too rapidly to be possibly due to real disturbance of nutrition, or waste uncompensated by repair. Another regular consequence of the bloodlessness of the skin is a feeling of cold, and shivering. A constant symptom of grief is sensitiveness to cold, and difficulty in keeping warm. In grief, the inner organs are unquestionably anemic as well as the skin. This is of course not obvious to the eye, but many phenomena prove it. Such is the diminution of the various secretions, at least of such as are accessible to observation. The mouth grows dry, the tongue sticky, and a bitter taste ensues which, it would appear, is only a consequence of the tongue's dryness. The expression, bitter sorrow, may possibly arise from this. In nursing women the milk diminishes or altogether dries up. There is one of the most regular manifestations of grief, which apparently contradicts these other physiological phenomena, and that is the weeping, with its profuse secretion of tears, its swollen reddened face, red eyes, and augmented secretion from the nasal mucous membrane. Lang goes on to suggest that this may be a reaction from a previously contracted vasomotor state. The explanation seems a forced one. The fact is that there are changeable expressions of grief. The weeping is as apt as not to be immediate, especially in women and children. Some men can never weep. The tearful and the dry phases alternate in all who can weep, sobbing storms being followed by periods of calm. And the shrunken, cold, and pale condition which Lang describes so well is more characteristic of a severe settled sorrow than of an acute mental pain. Properly we have two distinct emotions here, both prompted by the same object, it is true, but affecting different persons, or the same person at different times, and feeling quite differently whilst they last. As anyone's consciousness will testify. There is an excitement during the crying fit which is not without a certain pungent pleasure, page 445, of its own, but it would take a genius for felicity to discover any dash of redeeming quality in the feeling of dry and shrunken sorrow. Our author continues. If the smaller vessels of the lungs contract so that these organs become anemic, we have, as is usual under such conditions, the feeling of insufficient breath, and of oppression of the chest. And these tormenting sensations increase the sufferings of the griever, who seeks relief by long-drawn sighs, instinctively, like every one who lacks breath from whatever cause. 406. Page 446, the anemia of the brain in grief is shown by intellectual inertia, dullness, a feeling of mental weariness, effort, and indisposition to work, often by sleeplessness. Indeed it is the anemia of the motor centers of the brain which lies at the bottom of all that weakening of the voluntary powers of motion which we described in the first instance. My impression is that Dr. Lang simplifies and universalizes the phenomena a little too much in this description, and in particular that he very likely overdoes the anemia business. But such as it is, his account may stand as a favorable specimen of the sort of descriptive work to which the emotions have given rise. Take next another emotion, fear, and read what Mr. Darwin says of its effects. Fear is often preceded by astonishment, and is so far akin to it that both lead to the senses of sight and hearing being instantly aroused. In both cases the eyes and mouth are widely opened and the eyebrows raised. The frightened man at first stands like a statue, motionless and breathless, or crouches down as if instinctively to escape observation. The heart beats quickly and violently, so that it palpitates or knocks against the ribs. But it is very doubtful if it then works more efficiently than usual, so as to send a greater supply of blood to all parts of the body, for the skin instantly becomes pale as during incipient faintness. This paleness of the surface, however, is probably in large part, or is exclusively, 
due to the vasomotor center being affected in such a manner as to cause the contraction of the small arteries of the skin. That the skin is much affected under the sense of great fear, we see in the marvelous manner in which perspiration immediately exudes from it. This exudation is all the more remarkable, as the surface is then cold, and hence the term, a cold sweat. Whereas the sudorific glands are properly excited into action when the surface is heated. The hairs also on the skin stand erect, and the superficial muscles shiver. In connection with the disturbed action of the heart the breathing is hurried. The salivary glands act imperfectly, the mouth becomes dry and is often opened and shut. I have also noticed that under slight fear there is strong tendency to yawn. One of the best marked symptoms is the trembling of all the muscles of the body. And this is often first seen in the lips. From this cause, and from the dryness of the mouth, the voice becomes husky or indistinct or may altogether fail. Obstupui steterunt comi, e vox faucibus hasit. As fear increases into an agony of terror, we behold, as under all violent emotions, diversified results. The heart beats wild, page 447, ly or must fail to act and faintness ensue, there is a death-like pallor, the breathing is labored. The wings of the nostrils are widely dilated, there is a gasping and convulsive motion of the lips, a tremor on the hollow cheek, a gulping and catching of the throat, the uncovered and protruding eyeballs are fixed on the object of terror. Or they may roll restlessly from side to side, huck illic volens oculos totunc pararat. The pupils are said to be enormously dilated. All the muscles of the body may become rigid or may be thrown into convulsive movements. The hands are alternately clenched and opened, often with a twitching movement. The arms may be protruded as if to avert some dreadful danger, or may be thrown wildly over the head. The Reverend Mr. Hagenauer has seen this latter action in a terrified Australian. In other cases there is a sudden and uncontrollable tendency to headlong flight, and so strong is this that the boldest soldiers may be seized with a sudden panic. 407. Finally take hatred, and read the synopsis of its possible effects as given by Sig Mantagaza, frowny face 408. Withdrawal of the head backwards, withdrawal of the trunk. Projection forwards of the hands, as if to defend oneself against the hated object, contraction or closure of the eyes, elevation of the upper lip and closure of the nose, these are all elementary movements of turning away. Next threatening movements, as, intense frowning, eyes wide open, display of teeth, grinding teeth and contracting jaws, opened mouth with tongue advanced, clenched fists, threatening action of arms, stamping with the feet. Deep inspirations, panting, growling and various cries, automatic repetition of one word or syllable, sudden weakness and trembling of voice, spitting. Finally, various miscellaneous reactions and vasomotor symptoms, general trembling. Convulsions of lips and facial muscles, of limbs and of trunk, acts of violence to oneself, as biting fist or nails, sardonic laughter, bright redness of face, sudden pallor of face, extreme dilatation of nostrils, standing up of hair on head. Were we to go through the whole list of emotions which have been named by men, and study their organic manifestations, we should but ring the changes on the elements which these three typical cases involve. Rigidity of this muscle, relaxation of that, constriction of arteries here, dilatation there, breathing of this sort or that, pulse slowing or quickening, this gland secreting in that one dry, etc., etc. We should, moreover, find that our descriptions had no, page 448, absolute truth, that they only applied to the average man. That every one of us, almost, has some personal idiosyncrasy of expression, laughing or sobbing differently from his neighbor, or reddening or growing pale where others do not. We should find a like variation in the objects which excite emotion in different persons. Jokes at which one explodes with laughter nauseate another, and seem blasphemous to a third. And occasions which overwhelm me with fear or bashfulness are just what give you the full sense of ease and power. The internal shadings of emotional feeling, moreover, merge endlessly into each other. Language has discriminated some of them, as hatred, antipathy, animosity, dislike, aversion, malice, spite, vengefulness, 
abhorrence, etc., etc. But in the dictionaries of synonyms we find these feelings distinguished more by their severally appropriate objective stimuli than by their conscious or subjective tone. The result of all this flux is that the merely descriptive literature of the emotions is one of the most tedious parts of psychology. And not only is it tedious, but you feel that its subdivisions are to a great extent either fictitious or unimportant, and that its pretenses to accuracy are a sham. But unfortunately there is little psychological writing about the emotions which is not merely descriptive. As emotions are described in novels, they interest us, for we are made to share them. We have grown acquainted with the concrete objects and emergencies which call them forth, and any knowing touch of introspection which may grace the page meets with a quick and feeling response. Confessedly literary works of aphoristic philosophy also flash lights into our emotional life, and give us a fitful delight. But as far as scientific psychology of the emotions goes, I may have been surfeited by too much reading of classic works on the subject. But I should as lief read verbal descriptions of the shapes of the rocks on a New Hampshire farm as toil through them again. They give one nowhere a central point of view, or a deductive or generative principle. They distinguish and refine and specify in infinitum without ever getting on to another logical level. Whereas the beauty of all truly scientific work, p. 449, is to get to ever deeper levels. Is there no way out from this level of individual description in the case of the emotions? I believe there is a way out, but I fear that few will take it. The trouble with the emotions in psychology is that they are regarded too much as absolutely individual things. So long as they are set down as so many eternal and sacred psychic entities, like the old immutable species in natural history, so long all that can be done with them is reverently to catalogue their separate characters, points, and effects. But if we regard them as products of more general causes, as species, are now regarded as products of heredity and variation, the mere distinguishing and cataloguing becomes of subsidiary importance. Having the goose which lays the golden eggs, the description of each egg already laid is a minor matter. Now the general causes of the emotions are indubitably physiological. Professor C. Lang, of Copenhagen, in the pamphlet from which I have already quoted, published in 1885 a physiological theory of their constitution and conditioning, which I had already broached the previous year in an article in mind. None of the criticisms which I have heard of it have made me doubt its essential truth. I will therefore devote the next few pages to explaining what it is. I shall limit myself in the first instance to what may be called the coarser emotions, grief, fear, rage, love, in which every one recognizes a strong organic reverberation, and afterwards speak of the subtler emotions. Or of those whose organic reverberation is less obvious and strong. Emotion follows upon the bodily expression in the coarser emotions at least. Our natural way of thinking about these coarser emotions is that the mental perception of some fact excites the mental affection called the emotion, and that this latter state of mind gives rise to the bodily expression. My theory, on the contrary, is that the bodily changes follow directly the perception of the exciting fact, and that our feeling of the same changes as they occur is the emotion. Common sense says, we lose our fortune, are sorry and weep. We meet a, page 450, bear, are frightened and run, we are insulted by a rival, are angry and strike. The hypothesis here to be defended says that this order of sequence is incorrect, that the one mental state is not immediately induced by the other, that the bodily manifestations must first be interposed between. And that the more rational statement is that we feel sorry because we cry, angry because we strike, afraid because we tremble, and not that we cry, strike, or tremble, because we are sorry, angry, or fearful, as the case may be. Without the bodily states following on the perception, the latter would be purely cognitive in form, pale, colorless, destitute of emotional warmth. We might then see the bear, and judge it best to run, receive the insult and deem it right to strike, but we should not actually feel afraid or angry. Stated in this crude way, the hypothesis is pretty sure to meet with immediate disbelief. And yet neither many nor far-fetched considerations are required to mitigate its paradoxical character, and possibly to produce conviction of its truth. 
To begin with, no reader of the last two chapters will be inclined to doubt the fact that objects do excite bodily changes by a preorganized mechanism. Or the farther fact that the changes are so indefinitely numerous and subtle that the entire organism may be called a sounding board, which every change of consciousness, however slight, may make reverberate. The various permutations and combinations of which these organic activities are susceptible make it abstractly possible that no shade of emotion, however slight, should be without a bodily reverberation as unique, when taken in its totality. As is the mental mood itself. The immense number of parts modified in each emotion is what makes it so difficult for us to reproduce in cold blood the total and integral expression of any one of them. We may catch the trick with the voluntary muscles, but fail with the skin, glands, heart, and other viscera. Just as an artificially imitated sneeze lacks something of the reality, so the attempt to imitate an emotion in the absence of its normal instigating cause is apt to be rather hollow. The next thing to be noticed is this, that every one of the, page 451, bodily changes, whatsoever it be, is felt, acutely or obscurely, the moment it occurs. If the reader has never paid attention to this matter, he will be both interested and astonished to learn how many different local bodily feelings he can detect in himself as characteristic of his various emotional moods. It would be perhaps too much to expect him to arrest the tide of any strong gust of passion for the sake of any such curious analysis as this. But he can observe more tranquil states, and that may be assumed here to be true of the greater which is shown to be true of the less. Our whole cubic capacity is sensibly alive and each morsel of it contributes its pulsations of feeling, dim or sharp, pleasant, painful, or dubious, to that sense of personality that every one of us unfailingly carries with him. It is surprising what little items give accent to these complexes of sensibility. When worried by any slight trouble, one may find that the focus of one's bodily consciousness is the contraction, often quite inconsiderable, of the eyes and brows. When momentarily embarrassed, it is something in the pharynx that compels either a swallow, a clearing of the throat, or a slight cough, and so on for as many more instances as might be named. Our concern here being with the general view rather than with the details, I will not linger to discuss these, but, assuming the point admitted that every change that occurs must be felt, I will pass on. I now proceed to urge the vital point of my whole theory, which is this, if we fancy some strong emotion, and then try to abstract from our consciousness of it all the feelings of its bodily symptoms, we find we have nothing left behind. No, mind stuff out of which the emotion can be constituted, and that a cold and neutral state of intellectual perception is all that remains. It is true that, although most people when asked say that their introspection verifies this statement, some persist in saying theirs does not. Many cannot be made to understand the question. When you beg them to imagine away every feeling of laughter and of tendency to laugh from their consciousness of the ludicrousness of an object, and then to tell you what the feeling of its ludicrousness would be like. Whether it be anything more than the perception that the object belongs to the class, funny, p. 452, they persist in replying that the thing proposed is a physical impossibility, and that they always must laugh if they see a funny object. Of course the task proposed is not the practical one of seeing a ludicrous object and annihilating one's tendency to laugh. It is the purely speculative one of subtracting certain elements of feeling from an emotional state supposed to exist in its fullness, and saying what the residual elements are. I cannot help thinking that all who rightly apprehend this problem will agree with the proposition above laid down. What kind of an emotion of fear would be left if the feeling neither of quickened heartbeats nor of shallow breathing, neither of trembling lips nor of weakened limbs, neither of goose flesh nor of visceral stirrings, were present? It is quite impossible for me to think. Can one fancy the state of rage and picture no ebullition in the chest, no flushing of the face, no dilatation of the nostrils, no clenching of the teeth, no impulse to vigorous action, but in their stead limp muscles, calm breathing? and a placid face. The present writer, for one, certainly cannot. The rage is as completely evaporated as the sensation of its so-called manifestations, and the only thing that can possibly be supposed to take its place is some cold-blooded and dispassionate judicial sentence. Confined entirely to the intellectual realm, 
to the effect that a certain person or persons merit chastisement for their sins. In like manner of grief, what would it be without its tears, its sobs, its suffocation of the heart, its pang in the breastbone? A feelingless cognition that certain circumstances are deplorable, and nothing more. Every passion in turn tells the same story. A purely disembodied human emotion is a nonentity. I do not say that it is a contradiction in the nature of things, or that pure spirits are necessarily condemned to cold intellectual lives. But I say that for us, emotion dissociated from all bodily feeling is inconceivable. The more closely I scrutinize my states, the more persuaded I become that whatever moods, affections, and passions I have are in very truth constituted by, and made up of. Those bodily changes which we ordinarily call their expression or consequence. And the more it seems to me that if I were to become corporeally anesthetic, I should be X, page 453, clued from the life of the affections, harsh and tender alike, and drag out an existence of merely cognitive or intellectual form. Such an existence, although it seems to have been the ideal of ancient sages, is too apathetic to be keenly sought after by those born after the revival of the worship of sensibility, a few generations ago. Let not this view be called materialistic. It is neither more nor less materialistic than any other view which says that our emotions are conditioned by nervous processes. No reader of this book is likely to rebel against such a saying so long as it is expressed in general terms, and if any one still finds materialism in the thesis now defended, that must be because of the special processes invoked. They are sensational processes, processes due to inward currents set up by physical happenings. Such processes have, it is true, always been regarded by the Platonizers in psychology as having something peculiarly base about them. But our emotions must always be inwardly what they are, whatever be the physiological ground of their apparition. If they are deep, pure, worthy, spiritual facts on any conceivable theory of their physiological source, they remain no less deep, pure, spiritual, and worthy of regard on this present sensational theory. They carry their own inner measure of worth with them. And it is just as logical to use the present theory of the emotions for proving that sensational processes need not be vile and material, as to use their vileness and materiality as a proof that such a theory cannot be true. If such a theory is true, then each emotion is the resultant of a sum of elements, and each element is caused by a physiological process of a sort already well known. The elements are all organic changes, and each of them is the reflex effect of the exciting object. Definite questions now immediately arise, questions very different from those which were the only possible ones without this view. Those were questions of classification, which are the proper genera of emotion, and which the species under each, or of description, by what expression is each emotion characterized. The questions now are causal, just what changes does this object and what changes does that object, page 454, excite, and how come they to excite these particular changes and not others. We step from a superficial to a deep order of inquiry. Classification and description are the lowest stage of science. They sink into the background the moment questions of genesis are formulated, and remain important only so far as they facilitate our answering these. Now the moment the genesis of an emotion is accounted for, as the arousal by an object of a lot of reflex acts which are forthwith felt, we immediately see why there is no limit to the number of possible different emotions which may exist. And why the emotions of different individuals may vary indefinitely, both as to their constitution and as to objects which call them forth. For there is nothing sacramental or eternally fixed in reflex action. Any sort of reflex effect is possible, and reflexes actually vary indefinitely, as we know. We have all seen men dumb, instead of talkative, with joy. We have seen fright drive the blood into the head of its victim, instead of making him pale, we have seen grief run restlessly about lamenting, instead of sitting bowed down and mute, etc., etc. And this naturally enough, for one and the same cause can work differently on different men's blood vessels, since these do not always react alike. Whilst moreover the impulse on its way through the brain to the vasomotor center is differently influenced by different earlier impressions in the form of recollections or associations of ideas. 
409. In short, any classification of the emotions is seen to be as true and as natural as any other, if it only serves some purpose, and such a question as, what is the real or typical expression of anger or fear, is seen to have no objective meaning at all. Instead of it we now have the question as to how any given expression of anger or fear may have come to exist. And that is a real question of physiological mechanics on the one hand, and of history on the other, which, like all real questions, is in essence answerable, although the answer may be hard to find. On a later page I shall mention the attempts to answer it which have been made. Difficulty of testing the theory experimentally I have thus fairly propounded what seems to me the most fruitful way of conceiving of the emotions. It must, p. 455, be admitted that it is so far only a hypothesis, only possibly a true conception, and that much is lacking to its definitive proof. The only way coercively to disprove it, however, would be to take some emotion, and then exhibit qualities of feeling in it which should be demonstrably additional to all those which could possibly be derived from the organs affected at the time. But to detect with certainty such purely spiritual qualities of feeling would obviously be a task beyond human power. We have, as Professor Lang says, absolutely no immediate criterion by which to distinguish between spiritual and corporeal feelings. And, I may add, the more we sharpen our introspection, the more localized all our qualities of feeling become, see above, volume 1, page 300, and the more difficult the discrimination consequently grows. 410. A positive proof of the theory would, on the other hand, be given if we could find a subject absolutely anesthetic inside and out, but not paralytic, so that emotion-inspiring objects might evoke the usual bodily expressions from him, but who, on being consulted, should say that no subjective emotional affection was felt. Such a man would be like one who, because he eats, appears to bystanders to be hungry, but who afterwards confesses that he had no appetite at all. Cases like this are extremely hard to find. Medical literature contains reports, so far as I know, of but three. In the famous one of Remigius Lean's no mention is made by the reporters of his emotional condition. In Dr. G. Winter's case, 411, the patient is said to be inert and phlegmatic, but no particular attention, as I learn from Drive W., was paid to his psychic condition. In the extraordinary case reported by Professor Strumpel, to which I must refer later in another connection, 412, we read that the patient, a shoemaker's apprentice of 15, entirely anesthetic, inside, p. 456, and out, with the exception of one eye and one ear, had shown shame on the occasion of soiling his bed, and grief, when a formerly favorite dish was set before him, at the thought that he could no longer taste its flavor. Dar. Strumpel is also kind enough to inform me that he manifested surprise, fear, and anger on certain occasions. In observing him, however, no such theory as the present one seems to have been thought of. And it always remains possible that, just as he satisfied his natural appetites and necessities in cold blood, with no inward feeling, so his emotional expressions may have been accompanied by a quite cold heart. 413. Any new case which turns up of generalized anesthesia ought to be carefully examined as to the inward emotional sensibility as distinct from the expressions of emotion which circumstances may bring forth. Objections Considered let me now notice a few objections. The replies will make the theory still more plausible. First objection. There is no real evidence, it may be said, p. 457, for the assumption that particular perceptions do produce widespread bodily effects by a sort of immediate physical influence, antecedent to the arousal of an emotion or emotional idea. Reply. There is most assuredly such evidence. In listening to poetry, drama, or heroic narrative we are often surprised at the cutaneous shiver which like a sudden wave flows over us, and at the heart-swelling and the lacrimal effusion that unexpectedly catch us at intervals. In listening to music the same is even more strikingly true. If we abruptly see a dark moving form in the woods, our heart stops beating, and we catch our breath instantly and before any articulate idea of danger can arise. 
If our friend goes near to the edge of a precipice, we get the well-known feeling of all overishness, and we shrink back, although we positively know him to be safe, and have no distinct imagination of his fall. The writer well remembers his astonishment, when a boy of seven or eight, at fainting when he saw a horse bled. The blood was in a bucket, with a stick in it, and, if memory does not deceive him, he stirred it round and saw it drip from the stick with no feeling save that of childish curiosity. Suddenly the world grew black before his eyes, his ears began to buzz, and he knew no more. He had never heard of the sight of blood producing faintness or sickness, and he had so little repugnance to it, and so little apprehension of any other sort of danger from it, that even at that tender age, as he well remembers. He could not help wondering how the mere physical presence of a pailful of crimson fluid could occasion in him such formidable bodily effects. Professor Lang writes. No one has ever thought of separating the emotion produced by an unusually loud sound from the true inward affections. No one hesitates to call it a sort of fright, and it shows the ordinary signs of fright. And yet it is by no means combined with the idea of danger, or in any way occasioned by associations, memories, or other mental processes. The phenomena of fright follow the noise immediately without a trace of spiritual fear. Many men can never grow used to standing beside a cannon when it is fired off, although they perfectly know that there is danger neither for themselves nor for others, the bare sound is too much for them. 414. P. 458. Imagine two steel knife blades with their keen edges crossing each other at right angles, and moving to and fro. Our whole nervous organization is on edge at the thought. And yet what emotion can be there except the unpleasant nervous feeling itself, or the dread that more of it may come? The entire fund and capital of the emotion here is the senseless bodily effect which the blades immediately arouse. This case is typical of a class, where an ideal emotion seems to precede the bodily symptoms, it is often nothing but an anticipation of the symptoms themselves. One who has already fainted at the sight of blood may witness the preparations for a surgical operation with uncontrollable heart sinking and anxiety. He anticipates certain feelings, and the anticipation precipitates their arrival. In cases of morbid terror the subjects often confess that what possesses them seems, more than anything, to be fear of the fear itself. In the various forms of what Professor Payne calls, tender emotion, although the appropriate object must usually be directly contemplated before the emotion can be aroused. Yet sometimes thinking of the symptoms of the emotion itself may have the same effect. In sentimental natures the thought of, yearning, will produce real, yearning. And, not to speak of coarser examples, a mother's imagination of the caresses she bestows on her child may arouse a spasm of parental longing. In such cases as these we see plainly how the emotion both begins and ends with what we call its effects or manifestations. It has no mental status except as either the vivid feeling of the manifestations, or the idea of them. And the latter thus constitute its entire material, and sum and substance. And these cases ought to make us see how in all cases the feeling of the manifestations may play a much deeper part in the constitution of the emotion than we are wont to suppose. The best proof that the immediate cause of emotion is a physical effect on the nerves is furnished by those pathological cases in which the emotion is objectless. One of the chief merits, in fact, of the view which I propose seems to be that we can so easily formulate by its means patho, page 459, logical cases and normal cases under a common scheme. In every asylum we find examples of absolutely unmotived fear, anger, melancholy, or conceit, and others of an equally unmotived apathy which persists in spite of the best of outward reasons why it should give way. In the former cases we must suppose the nervous machinery to be so, label, in some one emotional direction that almost every stimulus, however inappropriate, causes it to upset in that way and to engender the particular complex of feelings of which the psychic body of the emotion consists. Thus, to take one special instance, if inability to draw deep breath, fluttering of the heart, and that peculiar epigastric change felt as, precordial anxiety, with an irresistible tendency to take a somewhat crouching attitude and to sit still. And with perhaps other visceral processes not now known, 
all spontaneously occur together in a certain person. His feeling of their combination is the emotion of dread, and he is the victim of what is known as morbid fear. A friend who has had occasional attacks of this most distressing of all maladies tells me that in his case the whole drama seems to center about the region of the heart and respiratory apparatus. That his main effort during the attacks is to get control of his inspirations and to slow his heart, and that the moment he attains to breathing deeply and to holding himself erect, the dread, ipso facto, seems to depart. 415. The emotion here is nothing but the feeling of a bodily state, and it has a purely bodily cause. p. 460. All physicians who have been much engaged in general practice have seen cases of dyspepsia in which constant low spirits and occasional attacks of terror rendered the patient's condition pitiable in the extreme. I have observed these cases often, and have watched them closely, and I have never seen greater suffering of any kind than I have witnessed during these attacks. Thus, a man is suffering from what we call nervous dyspepsia. Some day, we will suppose in the middle of the afternoon, without any warning or visible cause, one of these attacks of terror comes on. The first thing the man feels is great but vague discomfort. Then he notices that his heart is beating much too violently. At the same time shocks or flashes as of electrical discharges, so violent as to be almost painful, pass one after another through his body and limbs. Then in a few minutes he falls into a condition of the most intense fear. He is not afraid of anything, he is simply afraid. His mind is perfectly clear. He looks for a cause his wretched condition, but sees none. Presently his terror is such that he trembles violently and utters low moans, his body is damp with perspiration, his mouth is perfectly dry, and at this stage there are no tears in his eyes, though his suffering is intense. When the climax of the attack is reached and passed, there is a copious flow of tears, or else a mental condition in which the person weeps upon the least provocation. At this stage a large quantity of pale urine is passed. Then the heart's action becomes again normal, and the attack passes off. 416. Again. There are outbreaks of rage so groundless and unbridled that all must admit them to be expressions of disease. For the medical layman hardly anything can be more instructive than the observation of such a pathological attack of rage, especially when it presents itself pure and unmixed with other psychical disturbances. This happens in that rather rare disease named transitory mania. The patient predisposed to this otherwise an entirely reasonable person will be attacked suddenly without the slightest outward provocation and thrown, to use the words of the latest writer on the subject, O. Schwarzer, Die transitorische Topsucht, Wien, 1880, into a paroxysm of the wildest rage, with a fearful and blindly furious impulse to do violence and destroy. He flies at those about him, strikes, kicks, and throttles whomever he can catch. Dashes every object about which he can lay his hands on, breaks and crushes what is near him, tears his clothes. Shouts, howls, and roars, with eyes that flash and roll, and shows meanwhile all those symptoms of vasomotor congestion which we have learned to know as the concomitants of anger. His face is red, swollen, his cheeks hot, his eyes protuberant and their whites bloodshot, the heart beats vio, page 461, lently, the pulse marks 100 to 120 strokes a minute. The arteries of the neck are full and pulsating, the veins are swollen, the saliva flows. The fit lasts only a few hours, and ends suddenly with a sleep of from 8 to 12 hours, on waking from which the patient has entirely forgotten what has happened. 417. In these, outwardly, Causeless emotional conditions the particular paths which are explosive are discharged by any and every incoming sensation. Just as, when we are seasick, every smell, every taste, every sound, every sight, every movement, every sensible experience whatever, augments our nausea. So the morbid terror or anger is increased by each and every sensation which stirs up the nerve centers. Absolute quiet is the only treatment for the time. It seems impossible not to admit that in all this the bodily condition takes the lead, and that the mental emotion follows. The intellect may, in fact, 
be so little affected as to play the cold-blooded spectator all the while, and note the absence of a real object for the emotion. 418. A few words from Henley may close my reply to this first objection. Does it not seem as if the excitations of the bodily nerves met the ideas halfway, in order to raise the latter to the height of emotions? Note how justly this expresses our theory. That they do so is proved by the cases in which particular nerves, when specially irritable, share in the emotion and determine its quality. When one is suffering from an open wound, any grievous or horrid spectacle will cause pain in the, page 462, wound. In sufferers from heart disease there is developed a psychic excitability, which is often incomprehensible to the patients themselves, but which comes from the heart's liability to palpitate. I said that the very quality of the emotion is determined by the organs disposed to participate in it. Just as surely as a dark foreboding, rightly grounded on inference from the constellations, will be accompanied by a feeling of oppression in the chest, so surely will a similar feeling of oppression, when due to disease of the thoracic organs, be accompanied by groundless forebodings. So small a thing as a bubble of air rising from the stomach through the esophagus, and loitering on its way a few minutes and exerting pressure on the heart, is able during sleep to occasion a nightmare, and during waking to produce a vague anxiety. On the other hand, we see that joyous thoughts dilate our blood vessels, and that a suitable quantity of wine, because it dilates the vessels, also disposes us to joyous thoughts. If both the jest and the wine work together, they supplement each other in producing the emotional effect, and our demands on the jest are the more modest in proportion as the wine takes upon itself a larger part of the task. 419. Second Objection. If our theory be true, a necessary corollary of it ought to be this, that any voluntary and cold-blooded arousal of the so-called manifestations of a special emotion ought to give us the emotion itself. Now this, the objection says, is not found to be the case. An actor can perfectly simulate an emotion and yet be inwardly cold, and we can all pretend to cry and not feel grief, and feign laughter without being amused. Reply In the majority of emotions this test is inapplicable, for many of the manifestations are in organs over which we have no voluntary control. Few people in pretending to cry can shed real tears, for example. But, within the limits in which it can be verified, experience corroborates rather than disproves the corollary from our theory, upon which the present objection rests. Everyone knows how panic is increased by flight, and how the giving way to the symptoms of grief or anger increases those passions themselves. Each fit of sobbing makes the sorrow more acute, and calls forth another fit stronger still, until at last repose only ensues with lassitude and with the, page 463, apparent exhaustion of the machinery. In rage, it is notorious how we work ourselves up to a climax by repeated outbreaks of expression. Refuse to express a passion, and it dies. Count ten before venting your anger, and its occasion seems ridiculous. Whistling to keep up courage is no mere figure of speech. On the other hand, sit all day in a moping posture, sigh, and reply to everything with a dismal voice, and your melancholy lingers. There is no more valuable precept in moral education than this, as all who have experience know, if we wish to conquer undesirable emotional tendencies in ourselves, we must assiduously, and in the first instance cold-bloodedly, go through the outward movements of those contrary dispositions which we prefer to cultivate. The reward of persistency will infallibly come, in the fading out of the sullenness or depression, and the advent of real cheerfulness and kindliness in their stead. Smooth the brow, brighten the eye, contract the dorsal rather than the ventral aspect of the frame, and speak in a major key, pass the genial compliment, and your heart must be frigid indeed if it do not gradually thaw. This is recognized by all psychologists, only they fail to see its full import. Professor Bain writes, for example. We find that a feeble, emotional, wave, is suspended inwardly by being arrested outwardly. The currents of the brain and the agitation of the centers die away if the external vent is resisted at every point. It is by such restraint that we are in the habit of suppressing pity, anger, fear, pride, on many trifling occasions. 
If so, it is a fact that the suppression of the actual movements has a tendency to suppress the nervous currents that incite them, so that the external quiescence is followed by the internal. The effect would not happen in any case if there were not some dependence of the cerebral wave upon the free outward vent or manifestation. By the same interposition we may summon up a dormant feeling. By acting out the external manifestations, we gradually infect the nerves leading to them, and finally waken up the diffusive current by a sort of action of extra. Thus it is that we are sometimes able to assume a cheerful tone of mind by forcing a hilarious expression, 420. Page 464, we have a mass of other testimony of similar effect. Burke, in his treatise on the sublime and beautiful, writes as follows of the physiognomist Campanella. This man, it seems, had not only made very accurate observations on human faces, but was very expert in mimicking such as were in any way remarkable. When he had a mind to penetrate into the inclinations of those Lie had to deal with, he composed his face, his gesture, and his whole body, as nearly as he could, into the exact similitude of the person he intended to examine. And then carefully observed what turn of mind he seemed to acquire by the change. So that, says my author, he was able to enter into the dispositions and thoughts of people as effectually as if he had been changed into the very men. I have often observed, Burke now goes on in his own person, that, on mimicking the looks and gestures of angry, or placid, or frightened, or daring men, I have involuntarily found my mind turned to that passion whose appearance I strove to imitate. Nay, I am convinced it is hard to avoid it, though one strove to separate the passion from its corresponding gestures. 421. Against this it is to be said that many actors who perfectly mimic the outward appearances of emotion in face, gait, and voice declare that they feel no emotion at all. Others, however, according to Mr. W. M. Archer, who has made a very instructive statistical inquiry among them, say that the emotion of the part masters them whenever they play it well, 422, thus. I often turn pale, writes Miss Isabel Bateman, in scenes of terror or great excitement. I have been told this many times, and I can feel myself getting very cold and shivering and pale in thrilling situations. When I am playing rage or terror, writes Mr. Lionel Broff, I believe I do turn pale. My mouth gets dry, my tongue cleaves to my palate. In Bob Akers, for instance, in the last act, I, page 465, have to continually moisten my mouth, or I shall become inarticulate. I have to swallow the lump, as I call it. All artists who have had much experience of emotional parts are absolutely unanimous. Playing with the brain, says Miss Alma Murray, is far less fatiguing than playing with the heart. An adventurous taxes the physique far less than a sympathetic heroine. Muscular exertion has comparatively little to do with it. Emotion while acting, writes Mr. Howe, will induce perspiration much more than physical exertion. I always perspired profusely while acting Joseph Surface, which requires little or no exertion. I suffer from fatigue, writes Mr. Forbes Robertson, in proportion to the amount of emotion I may have been called upon to go through, and not from physical exertion. Though I have played Othello, writes Mr. Coleman, ever since I was seventeen, at nineteen I had the honor of acting the more to McCready's Iago, husband my resources as I may, this is the one part, the part of parts, which always leaves me physically prostrate. I have never been able to find a pigment that would stay on my face, though I have tried every preparation in existence. Even the titanic Edwin Forrest told me that he was always knocked over in Othello, and I have heard Charles Keane, Phelps, Brooke, Dillian, say the same thing. On the other hand, I have frequently acted Richard III. Without turning a hair. 423. The explanation for the discrepancy amongst actors is probably that which these quotations suggest. The visceral and organic part of the expression can be suppressed in some men, but not in others, and on this it is probable that the chief part of the felt emotion depends. Coquelin and the other actors who are inwardly cold are probably able to affect the dissociation in a complete way. Prof. Sikorsky of Kiev has contributed an important article on the facial expression of the insane to the Neurologisches Centralblatt for 1887. 
having practiced facial mimicry himself a great deal, he says. When I contract my facial muscles in any mimetic combination, I feel no emotional excitement, so that the mimicry is in the fullest sense of the word artificial. Although quite irreproachable from the expressive point of view. 424. We find, however, from the context that Professor S. S. practice before the mirror has developed in him such a virtuosity in the control of his facial muscles that he can entirely disregard their natural association and contract them in any order of grouping, on either side of the face isolatedly, p. 466, and each one alone. Probably in him the facial mimicry is an entirely restricted and localized thing, without sympathetic changes of any sort elsewhere. Third Objection Manifesting an emotion, so far from increasing it, makes it cease. Rage evaporates after a good outburst, it is pent-up emotions that work like madness in the brain. Reply The objection fails to discriminate between what is felt during and what is felt after the manifestation. During the manifestation the emotion is always felt. In the normal course of things this, being the natural channel of discharge, exhausts the nerve centers, and emotional calm ensues. But if tears or anger are simply suppressed, whilst the object of grief or rage remains unchanged before the mind, the current which would have invaded the normal channels turns into others, for it must find some outlet of escape. It may then work different and worse effects later on. Thus vengeful brooding may replace a burst of indignation, a dry heat may consume the frame of one who fain would weep, or he may, as Dante says, turn to stone within. And then tears or a storming fit may bring a grateful relief. This is when the current is strong enough to strike into a pathological path when the normal one is damned. When this is so, an immediate outpour may be best. But here, to quote Prof. Bain again. There is nothing more implied than the fact that an emotion may be too strong to be resisted, and we only waste our strength in the endeavor. If we are really able to stem the torrent, there is no more reason for refraining from the attempt than in the case of weaker feelings. And undoubtedly the habitual control of the emotions is not to be attained without a systematic restraint, extended to weak and strong. When we teach children to repress their emotional talk and display, it is not that they may feel more, quite the reverse. It is that they may think more. For, to a certain extent, whatever currents are diverted from the regions below, must swell the activity of the thought tracks of the brain. In apoplexies and other brain injuries we get the opposite condition and obstruction, namely, to the passage, p. 467, of currents among the thought tracks, and with this an increased tendency of objects to start downward currents into the organs of the body. The consequence is tears, laughter, and temper fits, on the most insignificant provocation, accompanying a proportional feebleness in logical thought and the power of volitional attention and decision. Just the sort of thing from which we try to wean our child. It is true that we say of certain persons that, they would feel more if they expressed less. And in another class of persons the explosive energy with which passion manifests itself on critical occasions seems correlated with the way in which they bottle it up during the intervals. But these are only eccentric types of character, and within each type the law of the last paragraph prevails. The sentimentalist is so constructed that gushing is his or her normal mode of expression. Putting a stopper on the gush will only to a limited extent cause more real activities to take its place in the main it will simply produce listlessness. On the other hand, the ponderous and bilious, slumbering volcano, let him repress the expression of his passions as he will, will find them expire if they get no vent at all. Whilst if the rare occasions multiply which he deems worthy of their outbreak, he will find them grow in intensity as life proceeds. On the whole, I cannot see that this third objection carries any weight. If our hypothesis is true, it makes us realize more deeply than ever how much our mental life is knit up with our corporeal frame, in the strictest sense of the term. Rapture, love, ambition, indignation, and pride, considered as feelings, are fruits of the same soil with the grossest bodily sensations of pleasure and of pain. But the reader will remember that we agreed at the outset to affirm this only of what we then called the coarser emotions. 
and that those inward states of emotional sensibility which appeared devoid at first sight of bodily results should be left out of our account. We must now say a word or two about these latter feelings, the, the subtler emotions, as we then agreed to call them. Page 468, The Subtler Emotions. These are the moral, intellectual, and aesthetic feelings. Concords of sounds, of colors, of lines, logical consistencies, teleological fitnesses, affect us with a pleasure that seems ingrained in the very form of the representation itself. And to borrow nothing from any reverberation surging up from the parts below the brain. The Herbartian psychologists have distinguished feelings due to the form in which ideas may be arranged. A mathematical demonstration may be as pretty, and an act of justice as neat, as a drawing or a tune, although the prettiness and neatness seem to have nothing to do with sensation. We have, then, or some of us seem to have, genuinely cerebral forms of pleasure and displeasure, apparently not agreeing in their mode of production with the coarser emotions we have been analyzing. And it is certain that readers whom our reasons have hitherto failed to convince will now start up at this admission, and consider that by it we give up our whole case. Since musical perceptions, since logical ideas, can immediately arouse a form of emotional feeling, they will say, is it not more natural to suppose that in the case of the so-called coarser emotions, prompted by other kinds of objects, the emotional feeling is equally immediate, and the bodily expression something that comes later and is added on. In reply to this we must immediately insist that aesthetic emotion, pure and simple, the pleasure given us by certain lines and masses, and combinations of colors and sounds, is an absolutely sensational experience. An optical or auricular feeling that is primary, and not due to the repercussion backwards of other sensations elsewhere consecutively aroused. To this simple primary and immediate pleasure in certain pure sensations and harmonious combinations of them, there may, it is true, be added secondary pleasures. And in the practical enjoyment of works of art by the masses of mankind these secondary pleasures play a great part. The more classic one's taste is, however, the less relatively important are the secondary pleasures felt to be in comparison with those of the primary sensation as it, page 469, comes in. 425, Classicism and Romanticism have their battles over this point. Complex suggestiveness, the awakening of, page 470, vistas of memory in association, and the stirring of our flesh with picturesque mystery and gloom, make a work of art romantic. The classic taste brands these effects as coarse and tawdry, and prefers the naked beauty of the optical and auditory sensations, unadorned with frippery or foliage. To the romantic mind, on the contrary, the immediate beauty of these sensations seems dry and thin. I am of course not discussing which view is right, but only showing that the discrimination between the primary feeling of beauty, as a pure incoming sensible quality, and the secondary emotions which are grafted thereupon, is one that must be made. These secondary emotions themselves are assuredly for the most part constituted of other incoming sensations aroused by the diffusive wave of reflex effects which the beautiful object sets up. A glow, a pang in the breast, a shudder, a fullness of the breathing, a flutter of the heart, a shiver down the back, a moistening of the eyes, a stirring in the hypogastrium, and a thousand unnameable symptoms besides. May be felt the moment the beauty excites us. And these symptoms also result when we are excited by moral perceptions, as of pathos, magnanimity, or courage. The voice breaks and the sob rises in the struggling chest, or the nostril dilates and the fingers tighten, whilst the heart beats, etc. etc. As far as these ingredients of the subtler emotions go, then, the latter form no exception to our account, but rather an additional illustration thereof. In all cases of intellectual or moral rapture we find that, unless there be coupled a bodily reverberation of some kind with the mere, page 471, thought of the object and cognition of its quality. Unless we actually laugh at the neatness of the demonstration or witticism, unless we thrill at the case of justice, or tingle at the act of magnanimity, our state of mind can hardly be called emotional at all. It is in fact a mere intellectual perception of how certain things are to be called, neat, right, witty, generous, and the like. Such a judicial state of mind as this is to be classed among awarenesses of truth, 
it is a cognitive act. As a matter of fact, however, the moral and intellectual cognitions hardly ever do exist thus unaccompanied. The bodily sounding board is at work, as careful introspection will show, far more than we usually suppose. Still, where long familiarity with a certain class of effects, even aesthetic ones, has blunted mere emotional excitability as much as it has sharpened taste and judgment, we do get the intellectual emotion, if such it can be called. Pure and undefiled. And the dryness of it, the paleness, the absence of all glow, as it may exist in a thoroughly expert critic's mind, not only shows us what an altogether different thing it is from the coarser emotions we considered first but makes us suspect that almost the entire difference lies in the fact that the bodily sounding board, vibrating in the one case, is in the other mute. Not so very bad is, in a person of consummate taste, apt to be the highest limit of approving expression. Rain Enemy Choke is said to have been Chopin's superlative of praise of new music. A sentimental layman would feel, and ought to feel, horrified, on being admitted into such a, critic's mind, to see how cold, how thin, how void of human significance, are the motives for favor or disfavor that there prevail. The capacity to make a nice spot on the wall will outweigh a picture's whole content, a foolish trick of words will preserve a poem. An utterly meaningless fitness of sequence in one musical composition set at not any amount of expressiveness in another. I remember seeing an English couple sit for more than an hour on a piercing February day in the Academy at Venice before the celebrated Assumption by Titian. And when I, after being chased from room to room by the cold, concluded to get into the sunshine as fast as possible, p. 472, and let the pictures go, but before leaving drew reverently near to them to learn with what superior forms of susceptibility they might be endowed, all I overheard was the woman's voice murmuring what a deprecatory expression her face wears. What self-abnegation! How unworthy she feels of the honor she is receiving! Their honest hearts had been kept warm all the time by a glow of spurious sentiment that would have fairly made old Titian sick. Mr. Ruskin somewhere makes the, for him terrible, admission that religious people as a rule care little for pictures, and that when they do care for them they generally prefer the worst ones to the best. Yes. In every art, in every science, there is the keen perception of certain relations being right or not, and there is the emotional flush and thrill consequent thereupon. And these are two things, not one. In the former of them it is that experts and masters are at home. The latter accompaniments are bodily commotions that they may hardly feel, but that may be experienced in their fullness by Cretans and Philistines in whom the critical judgment is at its lowest ebb. The marvels of science, about which so much edifying popular literature is written, are apt to be caviar to the men in the laboratories. And even divine philosophy itself, which common mortals consider so sublime an occupation, on account of the vastness of its data and outlook, is too apt to the practical philosopher himself to heed but a sharpening and tightening business. A matter of points, of screwing down things, of splitting hairs, and of the intent rather than the extent of conceptions. Very little emotion here. Except the effort of setting the attention fine, and the feeling of ease and relief, mainly in the breathing apparatus, when the inconsistencies are overcome and the thoughts run smoothly for a while. Emotion and cognition seem then parted even in this last retreat and cerebral processes are almost feelingless, so far as we can judge, until they summon help from parts below. No special brain centers for emotion. If the neural process underlying emotional consciousness be what I have now sought to prove it, the Fissi, page 473, ology of the brain becomes a simpler matter than has been hitherto supposed. Sensational, associational, and motor elements are all that the organ need contain. The physiologists who, during the past few years, have been so industriously exploring the brain's functions, have limited their explanations to its cognitive and volitional performances. Dividing the brain into sensory and motor centers, they have found their division to be exactly paralleled by the analysis made by empirical psychology of the perceptive and volitional parts of the mind into their simplest elements. 
But the emotions have been so ignored in all these researches that one is tempted to suppose that if these investigators were asked for a theory of them in brain terms, they would have to reply. Either that they had as yet bestowed no thought upon the subject, or that they had found it so difficult to make distinct hypotheses that the matter lay among the problems of the future. Only to be taken up after the simpler ones of the present should have been definitively solved. And yet it is even now certain that of two things concerning the emotions, one must be true. Either separate and special centers, affected to them alone, are their brain seat, or else they correspond to processes occurring in the motor and sensory centers already assigned, or in others like them, not yet known. If the former be the case, we must deny the view that is current, and hold the cortex to be something more than the surface of projection for every sensitive spot and every muscle in the body. If the latter be the case, Rai must ask whether the emotional process in the sensory or motor center be an altogether peculiar one, or whether it resembles the ordinary perceptive processes of which those centers are already recognized to be the seat. Now if the theory I have defended be true, the latter alternative is all that it demands. Supposing the cortex to contain parts, liable to be excited by changes in each special sense organ, in each portion of the skin, in each muscle, each joint, and each viscous, and to contain absolutely nothing else. We still have a scheme capable of representing the process of the emotions. An object falls on a sense organ, affects a cortical part, and is perceived, page 474, or else the latter, excited inwardly, gives rise to an idea of the same object. Quick as a flash, the reflex currents pass down through their preordained channels, alter the condition of muscle, skin, and viscous. And these alterations, perceived, like the original object, in as many portions of the cortex, combine with it in consciousness and transform it from an object simply apprehended into an object emotionally felt. No new principles have to be invoked, nothing postulated beyond the ordinary reflex circuits, and the local centers admitted in one shape or another by all to exist. Emotional Differences Between Individuals The revivability in memory of the emotions, like that of all the feelings of the lower senses, is very small. We can remember that we underwent grief or rapture, but not just how the grief or rapture felt. This difficult ideal revivability is, however, more than compensated in the case of the emotions by a very easy actual revivability. That is, we can produce, not remembrances of the old grief or rapture, but new griefs and raptures, by summoning up a lively thought of their exciting cause. The cause is now only an idea, but this idea produces the same organic irradiations, or almost the same, which were produced by its original, so that the emotion is again a reality. We have recaptured it. Shame, love, and anger are particularly liable to be thus revived by ideas of their object. Professor Bain admits, 426, that, in their strict character of emotion proper, they, the emotions, have the minimum of revivability. But being always incorporated with the sensations of the higher senses, they share in the superior revivability of sights and sounds. But he fails to point out that the revived sights and sounds may be ideal without ceasing to be distinct. Whilst the emotion, to be distinct, must become real again. Professor Bain seems to forget that an ideal emotion and a real emotion prompted by an ideal object are two very different things. p. 475, an emotional temperament on the one hand, and a lively imagination for objects and circumstances on the other, are thus the conditions, necessary and sufficient, for an abundant emotional life. No matter how emotional the temperament may be, if the imagination be poor, the occasions for touching off the emotional trains will fail to be realized, and the life will be pro tanto cold and dry. This is perhaps a reason why it may be better that a man of thought should not have too strong a visualizing power. He is less likely to have his trains of meditation disturbed by emotional interruptions. It will be remembered that Mr. Galton found the members of the Royal Society and of the French Academy of Sciences to be below par in visualizing power. If I may speak of myself, I am far less able to visualize now, at the age of 46, than in my earlier years. 
and I am strongly inclined to believe that the relative sluggishness of my emotional life at present is quite as much connected with this fact as it is with the invading torpor of hoary ELD. Or with the omnibus horse routine of settled professional and domestic life. I say this because I occasionally have a flash of the old stronger visual imagery, and I notice that the emotional commentary, so to call it, is then liable to become much more acute than is its present wont. Charcot's patient, whose case is given above on page 58 ff, complained of his incapacity for emotional feeling after his optical images were gone. His mother's death, which in former times would have wrung his heart, left him quite cold. Largely, as he himself suggests, because he could form no definite visual image of the event, and of the effect of the loss on the rest of the family at home. One final generality about the emotions remains to be noted, they blunt themselves by repetition more rapidly than any other sort of feeling. This is due not only to the general law of accommodation, to their stimulus which we saw to obtain of all feelings whatever, but to the peculiar fact that the diffusive wave of reflex effects tends always to become more narrow. It seems as if it were essentially meant to be a provisional arrangement, on the basis of which precise and determinate reactions might arise. The more we exercise ourselves at anything, the fewer muscles, page 476, we employ. And just so, the oftener we meet an object, the more definitely we think and behave about it, and the less is the organic perturbation to which it gives rise. The first time we saw it we could perhaps neither act nor think at all, and had no reaction but organic perturbation. The emotions of startled surprise, wonder, or curiosity were the result. Now we look on with absolutely no emotion. 427. This tendency to economy in the nerve paths through which our sensations and ideas discharge, is the basis of all growth in efficiency, readiness, and skill. Where would the general, the surgeon, the presiding chairman, be, if their nerve currents kept running down into their viscera, instead of keeping up amid their convolutions? But what they gain for practice by this law, they lose, it must be confessed, for feeling. For the world-worn and experienced man, the sense of pleasure which he gets from the free and powerful flow of thoughts, overcoming obstacles as they arise, is the only compensation for that freshness of the heart which he once enjoyed. This free and powerful flow means that brain paths of association and memory have more and more organized themselves in him. And that through them the stimulus is drafted off into nerves which lead merely to the writing finger or the speaking tongue. 428 the trains of intellectual association, the memories, the logical relations, may, page 477, however, be voluminous in the extreme. Past emotions may be among the things remembered. The more of all these trains an object can set going in us, the richer our cognitive intimacy with it is. This cerebral sense of richness seems itself to be a source of pleasure, possibly even apart from the euphoria which from time to time comes up from respiratory organs. If there be such a thing as a purely spiritual emotion, I should be inclined to restrict it to this cerebral sense of abundance and ease, this feeling, as Sir W. Hamilton would call it, of unimpeded and not overstrained activity of thought. Under ordinary conditions, it is a fine and serene but not an excited state of consciousness. In certain intoxications it becomes exciting, and it may be intensely exciting. I can hardly imagine a more frenzied excitement than that which goes with the consciousness of seeing absolute truth, which characterizes the coming to from nitrous oxide drunkenness. Chloroform, ether, and alcohol all produce this deepening sense of insight into truth, and with all of them it may be a strong emotion. But then there also come with it all sorts of strange bodily feelings and changes in the incoming sensibilities. I cannot see my way to affirming that the emotion is independent of these. I will concede, however, that if its independence is anywhere to be maintained, these theoretic raptures seem the place at which to begin the defense. The Genesis of the Various Emotions On a former page, pp. 453-4, I said that two questions, and only two, are important, if we regard the emotions as constituted by feelings due to the diffusive wave. 1. What special diffusive effects do the various special objective and subjective experiences excite? And 2. How come they to excite them? 
The works on physiognomy and expression are all of them attempts to answer question 1. As is but natural, that, page 478, effects upon the face have received the most careful attention. The reader who wishes details additional to those given above on pages 443 to 7 is referred to the works mentioned in the note below, 429. As regards question 2, some little progress has of recent years been made in answering it. Two things are certain. A. The facial muscles of expression are not given us simply for expression's sake wink with a frown 430. B. Each muscle is not affected to some one emotion exclusively, as certain writers have thought. Some movements of expression can be accounted for as weakened repetitions of movements which formerly, when they were stronger, were of utility to the subject. Others are similarly weakened repetitions of movements which under other conditions were physiologically necessary effects. Of the latter reactions the respiratory disturbances in anger and fear might be taken as examples, organic reminiscences, as it were, reverberations in imagination of the blowings of the man making a series of combative efforts. Of the pantings of one in precipitate flight. Such at least is a suggestion made by Mr. Spencer which has found approval. And he also was the first, so far as I know, to suggest that other movements in anger and fear could be explained by the nascent excitation of formerly useful acts. To have in a slight degree, he says, such psychical states as accompany the reception of wounds, and are experienced during flight, is to be in a state of what we call fear. And to have in a slight degree such psychical states as the processes of catching, killing, and eating imply, is to have the desires to catch, kill, and eat. That the propensities to the acts are nothing else than nascent excitations of the p. 479, psychical state involved in the acts, is proved by the natural language of the propensities. Fear, when strong, expresses itself in cries, in efforts to escape, in palpitations, in tremblings. And these are just the manifestations that go along with an actual suffering of the evil feared. The destructive passion is shown in a general tension of the muscular system, in gnashing of teeth and protrusion of the claws, in dilated eyes and nostrils, in growls, and these are weaker forms of the actions that accompany the killing of prey. To such objective evidences every one can add subjective evidences. Every one can testify that the psychical state called fear consists of mental representations of certain painful results. And that the one called anger consists of mental representations of the actions and impressions which would occur while inflicting some kind of pain. 431. About fear I shall have more to say presently. Meanwhile the principle of revival in weakened form of reactions useful in more violent dealings with the object inspiring the emotion, has found many applications. So slight a symptom as the snarl or sneer, the one-sided uncovering of the upper teeth, is accounted for by Darwin as a survival from the time when our ancestors had large canines, and unfleshed them, as dogs now do, for attack. Similarly the raising of the eyebrows in outward attention, the opening of the mouth in astonishment, come, according to the same author, from the utility of these movements in extreme cases. The raising of the eyebrows goes with the opening of the eye for better vision, the opening of the mouth with the intensest listening, and with the rapid catching of the breath which precedes muscular effort. The distension of the nostrils in anger is interpreted by Spencer as an echo of the way in which our ancestors had to breathe when, during combat, their mouth was filled up by a part of an antagonist's body that had been seized. The trembling of fear is supposed by Mantegaza to be for the sake of warming the blood. The reddening of the face and neck is called by Wundt a compensatory arrangement for relieving the brain of the blood pressure which the simultaneous excitement of the heart brings with it. The effusion of tears is explained both by this author and by Darwin to be a blood withdrawing agency of a similar sort. The contraction of the muscles around the eyes, of which the primitive use is to p. 480 protect those organs from being too much gorged with blood during the screaming fits of infancy, survives in adult life in the shape of the frown, which instantly comes over the brow when anything difficult or displeasing presents itself either to thought or action. As the habit of contracting the brows has been followed by infants during innumerable generations, at the commencement of every crying or screaming fit, 
says Darwin. It has become firmly associated with the incipient sense of something distressing or disagreeable. Hence, under similar circumstances, it would be apt to be continued during maturity, although never then developed, into a crying fit. Screaming or weeping begins to be voluntarily restrained at an early period of life, whereas frowning is hardly ever restrained at any age. 432. The intermittent expirations which constitute laughter have, according to Dr. Hecker, the purpose of counteracting the anemia of the brain, which he supposes to be brought about by the action of the joyous or comic stimulus upon the vasomotor nerves, 433, a smile is the weak vestige of a laugh. The tight closure of the mouth in all effort is useful for retaining the air in the lungs so as to fix the chest and give a firm basis of insertion for the muscles of the flanks. Accordingly, we see the lips compress themselves upon every slight occasion of resolve. The blood pressure has to be high during the sexual embrace, hence the palpi, p. 481, tat ions, and hence also the tendency to caressing action, which accompanies tender emotion in its fainter forms. Other examples might be given. But these are quite enough to show the scope of the principle of revival of useful action in weaker form. Another principle, to which Darwin perhaps hardly does sufficient justice, may be called the principle of reacting similarly to analogous feeling stimuli. There is a whole vocabulary of descriptive adjectives common to impressions belonging to different sensible spheres, experiences of all classes are sweet, impressions of all classes rich or solid, sensations of all classes sharp. Wundt and Pitteret accordingly explain many of our most expressive reactions upon moral causes as symbolic gustatory movements. As soon as any experience arises which has an affinity with the feeling of sweet, or bitter, or sour, the same movements are executed which would result from the taste in point. 434. All the states of mind which language designates by the metaphors bitter, harsh, sweet, combine themselves, therefore, with the corresponding mimetic movements of the mouth. Certainly the emotions of disgust and satisfaction do express themselves in this mimetic way. Disgust is an incipient regurgitation or retching, limiting its expression often to the grimace of the lips and nose. Satisfaction goes with a sucking smile, or tasting motion of the lips. In Mantegaza's loose if learned work, the attempt is made, much less successfully, to bring in the eye and ear as additional sources of symbolically expressive reaction. The ordinary gesture of negation, among us, moving the head about its axis from side to side, is a reaction originally used by babies to keep disagreeables from getting into their mouth, and may be observed in perfection in any nursery. 435, p. 482, it is now evoked here the stimulus is only an unwelcome idea. Similarly the nod forward in affirmation is after the analogy of taking food into the mouth. The connection of the expression of moral or social disdain or dislike, especially in women, with movements having a perfectly definite original olfactory function, is too obvious for comment. Winking is the effect of any threatening surprise, not only of what puts the eyes in danger, and a momentary aversion of the eyes is very apt to be one's first symptom of response to an unexpectedly unwelcome proposition. These may suffice as examples of movements expressive from analogy. But if certain of our emotional reactions can be explained by the two principles invoked and the reader will himself have felt how conjectural and fallible in some of the instances the explanation is, there remain many reactions which cannot so be explained at all. And these we must write down for the present as purely idiopathic effects of the stimulus. Amongst them are the effects on the viscera and internal glands, the dryness of the mouth and diarrhea and nausea of fear, the liver disturbances which sometimes produce jaundice after excessive rage, the urinary secretion of sanguine excitement. And the bladder contraction of apprehension, the gaping of expectancy, the lump in the throat of grief, the tickling there and the swallowing of embarrassment, the precordial anxiety of dread, the changes in the pupil. The various sweatings of the skin, cold or hot, local or general, and its flushings, together with other symptoms which probably exist but are too hidden to have been noticed or named. It seems as if even the changes of blood pressure and heartbeat during emotional excitement might, instead of being teleologically determined, 
prove to be purely mechanical or physiological outpourings through the easiest drainage channels, the pneumogastrics and sympathetic nerves happening under ordinary circumstances to be such channels. Page 483, Mr. Spencer argues that the smallest muscles must be such channels. And instances the tail in dogs, cats, and birds, the ears in horses, the crest in parrots, the face and fingers in man, as the first organs to be moved by emotional stimuli. 436, this principle, if it be one, would apply still more easily to the muscles of the smaller arteries, though not exactly to the heart. Whilst the great variability of the circulatory symptoms would also suggest that they are determined by causes into which utility does not enter. The quickening of the heart lends itself, it is true, rather easily to explanation by inherited habit, organic memory of more violent excitement, and Darwin speaks in favor of this view, see his expression, etc., pages 74 to 5. But, on the other hand, we have so many cases of reaction which are indisputably pathological, as we may say, and which could never be serviceable or derived from what was serviceable. That I think we should be cautious about pushing our explanations of the varied heartbeat too far in the teleological direction. Trembling, which is found in many excitements besides that of terror, is, pace Mr. Spencer and Sig Mantegaza, quite pathological. So are terror's other strong symptoms. Professor Masso, as the total result of his study, writes as follows. We have seen that the graver the peril becomes, the more do the reactions which are positively harmful to the animal prevail in number and in efficacy. We already saw that the trembling and the palsy make it incapable of flight or defense, we have also convinced ourselves that in the most decisive moments of danger we are less able to see, or to think, than when we are tranquil. In face of such facts we must admit that the phenomena of fear cannot all be accounted for by selection. Their extreme degrees are morbid phenomena which show an imperfection in the organism. We might almost say that nature had not been, p. 484, able to frame a substance which should be excitable enough to compose the brain and spinal marrow. And yet which should not be so excited by exceptional stimulation as to overstep in its reactions those physiological bounds which are useful to the conservation of the creature. 437. Professor Bain, if I mistake not, had long previously commented upon fear in a similar way. Mr. Darwin accounts for many emotional expressions by what he calls the principle of antithesis. In virtue of this principle, if a certain stimulus prompted a certain set of movements, then a contrary feeling stimulus would prompt exactly the opposite movements, although these might otherwise have neither utility nor significance. It is in this wise that Darwin explains the expression of impotence, raised eyebrows, and shrugged shoulders, dropped arms and open palms, as being the antithesis of the frowning brow, the thrown back shoulders, and clenched fists of rage. Which is the emotion of power? No doubt a certain number of movements can be formulated under this law, but whether it expresses a causal principle is more than doubtful. It has been by most critics considered the least successful of Darwin's speculations on this subject. To sum up, we see the reason for a few emotional reactions, for others a possible species of reason may be guessed, but others remain for which no plausible reason can even be conceived. These may be reactions which are purely mechanical results of the way in which our nervous centers are framed, reactions which, although permanent in us now, may be called accidental as far as their origin goes. In fact, in an organism as complex as the nervous system there must be many such reactions, incidental to others evolved for utility's sake, but which would never themselves have been evolved independently, for any utility they might possess. Sea sickness, the love of music, of the various intoxicants, nay, the entire aesthetic life of man, we have already traced to this accidental origin. It would be foolish to suppose that none of the reactions called emotional could have arisen in this quasi-accidental way. Page 485, this is all I have to say about the emotions. If one should seek to name each particular one of them of which the human heart is the seat, it is plain that the limit to their number would lie in the introspective vocabulary of the seeker. Each race of men having found names for some shade of feeling which other races have left undiscriminated. If then we should seek to break the emotions, thus enumerated, into groups, 
according to their affinities, it is again plain that all sorts of groupings would be possible, according as we chose this character or that as a basis. And that all groupings would be equally real and true. The only question would be, does this grouping or that suit our purpose best? The reader may then class the emotions as he will, as sad or joyous, sthenic or aesthetic, natural or acquired, inspired by animate or inanimate things, formal or material, sensuous or ideal, direct or reflective, egoistic or non-egoistic. Retrospective, prospective or immediate, organismally or environmentally initiated, or what more besides. All these are divisions which have been actually proposed. Each of them has its merits, and each one brings together some emotions which the others keep apart. For a fuller account, and for other classificatory schemes, I refer to the appendix to Bain's Emotions and the Will, and to Mercier's, Stanley's, and Reed's articles on the emotions, in Mind, Volumes 9, X, and 11. In Volume 9. P. For 21 there is also an article by the lamented Edmund Gurney in criticism of the view which in this chapter 1 continue to defend. Chapter 26. Will. Desire, wish, will, are states of mind which everyone knows, and which no definition can make plainer. We desire to feel, to have, to do, all sorts of things which at the moment are not felt, had, or done. If with the desire there goes a sense that attainment is not possible, we simply wish, but if we believe that the end is in our power, we will that the desired feeling, having, or doing shall be real. And real it presently becomes, either immediately upon the willing or after certain preliminaries have been fulfilled. The only ends which follow immediately upon our willing seem to be movements of our own bodies. Whatever feelings and havings we may will to get, come in as results of preliminary movements which we make for the purpose. This fact is too familiar to need illustration. So that we may start with the proposition that the only direct outward effects of our will are bodily movements. The mechanism of production of these voluntary movements is what befalls us to study now. The subject involves a good many separate points which it is difficult to arrange in any continuous logical order. I will treat of them successively in the mere order of convenience. Trusting that at the end the reader will gain a clear and connected view. The movements we have studied hitherto have been automatic and reflex, and, on the first occasion of their performance, at any rate, unforeseen by the agent. The movements to the study of which we now address ourselves, being desired and intended beforehand, are of course done, page 487, with full provision of what they are to be. It follows from this that voluntary movements must be secondary, not primary functions of our organism. This is the first point to understand in the psychology of volition. Reflex, instinctive, and emotional movements are all primary performances. The nerve centers are so organized that certain stimuli pull the trigger of certain explosive parts, and a creature going through one of these explosions for the first time undergoes an entirely novel experience. The other day I was standing at a railroad station with a little child, when an express train went thundering by. The child, who was near the edge of the platform, started, winked, had his breathing convulsed, turned pale, burst out crying, and ran frantically towards me and hit his face. I have no doubt that this youngster was almost as much astonished by his own behavior as he was by the train, and more than I was, who stood by. Of course if such a reaction has many times occurred we learn what to expect of ourselves, and can then foresee our conduct, even though it remain as involuntary and uncontrollable as it was before. But if, involuntary action properly so called, the act must be foreseen, it follows that no creature not endowed with divinatory power can perform an act voluntarily for the first time. Well, we are no more endowed with prophetic vision of what movements lie in our power, then we are endowed with prophetic vision of what sensations we are capable of receiving. As we must wait for the sensations to be given us, so we must wait for the movements to be performed involuntarily, 438, before we can frame ideas of what either of these things are. We learn all our possibilities by the way of experience. When a particular movement, having once occurred in a random, reflex, or involuntary way, has left an image of itself in the memory, then the movement can be desired again, proposed as an end, 
and deliberately willed. But it is impossible to see how it could be willed before. p. 488. A supply of ideas of the various movements that are possible left in the memory by experiences of their involuntary performance is thus the first prerequisite of the voluntary life. Now the same movement involuntarily performed may leave many different kinds of ideas of itself in the memory. If performed by another person, we of course see it, or we feel it if the moving part strikes another part of our own body. Similarly we have an auditory image of its effects if it produces sounds, as for example when it is one of the movements made in vocalization, or in playing on a musical instrument. All these remote effects of the movement, as we may call them, are also produced by movements which we ourselves perform, and they leave innumerable ideas in our mind by which we distinguish each movement from the rest. It looks distinct. It feels distinct to some distant part of the body which it strikes or it sounds distinct. These remote effects would then, rigorously speaking, suffice to furnish the mind with the supply of ideas required. But in addition to these impressions upon remote organs of sense, we have, whenever we perform a movement ourselves, another set of impressions, those, namely, which come up from the parts that are actually moved. These kinoesthetic impressions, as Dr. Bastian has called them, are so many resident effects of the motion. Not only are our muscles supplied with afferent as well as with efferent nerves, but the tendons, the ligaments, the articular surfaces, and the skin about the joints are all sensitive, and being stretched and squeezed in ways characteristic of each particular movement, give us as many distinctive feelings as there are movements possible to perform. It is by these resident impressions that we are made conscious of passive movements, movements communicated to our limbs by others. If you lie with closed eyes, and another person noiselessly places your arm or leg in any arbitrarily chosen attitude, you receive an accurate feeling of what attitude it is. And can immediately reproduce it yourself in the arm or leg of the opposite side. Similarly a man waked suddenly from sleep in the dark is aware of how he finds himself lying. At least this is what happens, page 489, when the nervous apparatus is normal. But in cases of disease we sometimes find that the resident impressions do not normally excite the centers, and that then the sense of attitude is lost. It is only recently that pathologists have begun to study these anesthesias with the delicacy which they require, and we have doubtless yet a great deal to learn about them. The skin may be anesthetic, and the muscles may not feel the cramp-like pain which is produced by phoratic currents sent through them, and yet the sense of passive movement may be retained. It seems, in fact, to persist more obstinately than the other forms of sensibility, for cases are comparatively common in which all the other feelings in the limb but this one of attitude are lost. In chapter 20 I have tried to make it appear that the articular surfaces are probably the most important source of the resident kinesthetic feelings. But the determination of their special organ is indifferent to our present quest. It is enough to know that the existence of these feelings cannot be denied. When the feelings of passive movement as well as all the other feelings of a limb are lost, we get such results as are given in the following account by Professor A. Strumple of his wonderful anesthetic boy, whose only sources of feeling were the right eye and the left ear frowny face 439. Passive movements could be imprinted on all the extremities to the greatest extent, without attracting the patient's notice. Only in violent forced hyperextension of the joints, especially of the knees, there arose a dull vague feeling of strain, but this was seldom precisely localized. We have often, after bandaging the eyes of the patient, carried him about the room, laid him on a table, given to his arms and legs the most fantastic and apparently the most inconvenient attitudes, without his having a suspicion of it. The expression of astonishment in his face, when all at once the removal of the handkerchief revealed his situation, is indescribable in words. Only when his head was made to hang away down he immediately spoke of dizziness, but could not assign its ground. Later he sometimes inferred from the sounds connected with the manipulation that something special was being done with him. He had no feelings of muscular fatigue. If, with his eyes shut, we told him to raise his arm and to keep it up, he did so without trouble. After one or two minutes, however, the arm began to, page 490, tremble and sink without his being aware of it. 
he asserted still his ability to keep it up. Passively holding still his fingers did not affect him. He thought constantly that he opened and shut his hand, whereas it was really fixed. Or we read of cases like this. Voluntary movements cannot be estimated the moment the patient ceases to take note of them by his eyes. Thus, after having made him close his eyes, if one asks him to move one of his limbs either wholly or in part, he does it but cannot tell whether the affected movement is large or small, strong or weak, or even if it has taken place at all. And when he opens his eyes after moving his leg from right to left, for example, he declares that he had a very inexact notion of the extent of the affected movement. If, having the intention of executing a certain movement, I prevent him, he does not perceive it, and supposes the limb to have taken the position he intended to give it. 440. Or this. The patient, when his eyes were closed in the middle of an unpracticed movement, remained with the extremity in the position it had when the eyes closed and did not complete the movement properly. Then after some oscillations the limb gradually sank by reason of its weight, the sense of fatigue being absent. Of this the patient was not aware, and wondered, when he opened his eyes, at the altered position of his limb. 441. A similar condition can be readily reproduced experimentally in many hypnotic subjects. All that is needed is to tell a suitably predisposed person during the hypnotic trance that he cannot feel his limb, and he will be quite unaware of the attitudes into which you may throw it. 442. All these cases, whether spontaneous or experimental, show the absolute need of guiding sensations of some kind for the successful carrying out of a concatenated series of movements. It is, in fact, easy to see that, just as where the chain of movements is automatic, see above, volume 1, page 116, each later movement of the chain has to be discharged by the impression which the next earlier one makes in being, p. 491, executed, so also, where the chain is voluntary, we need to know at each movement just where we are in it, if we are to will intelligently what the next link shall be. A man with no feeling of his movements might lead off never so well, and yet be sure to get lost soon and go astray, 443, but patients like those described, who get no kinesthetic impressions, can still be guided by the sense of sight. Thus Strumpel says of his boy. One could always observe how his eye was directed first to the object held before him, then to his own arm, and how it never ceased, page 492, to follow the latter during its entire movement. All his voluntary movements took place under the unremitting lead of the eye, which as an indispensable guide, was never untrue to its functions. So in the Landry case. With his eyes open, he easily opposes the thumb to each of the other fingers, with his eyes closed, the movement of opposition occurs, but the thumb only by chance meets the finger which it seeks. With his eyes open he is able, without hesitation, to bring his two hands together, but when his eyes are closed his hands seek one another in space, and only meet by chance. In Charles Bell's well-known old case of anesthesia the woman could only hold her baby safely in her arms so long as she looked at it. I have myself reproduced a similar condition in two hypnotic subjects whose arm and hand were made anesthetic without being paralyzed. They could write their names when looking, but not when their eyes were closed. The modern mode of teaching deaf mutes to articulate consists in making them attentive to certain laryngeal, labial, thoracic, and other sensations, the reproduction of which becomes a guide to their vocalization. Normally it is the remoter sensations which we receive by the ear which keep us from going astray in our speech. The phenomena of aphasia show this to be the usual case. 444. This is perhaps all that need be said about the existence of passive sensations of movement and their indispensableness for our voluntary activity. We may consequently set it down as certain that, whether or no there be anything else in the mind at the moment when we consciously will a certain act, a mental conception made up of memory images of these sensations. Defining which special act it is, must be there. Now is there anything else in the mind when we will to do an act? We must proceed in this chapter from the simpler to the more complicated cases. My first thesis accordingly is, that there need be nothing else, and that in perfectly simple vol, p. 493, 
Untary acts there is nothing else, in the mind but the kinoesthetic idea, thus defined, of what the act is to be. A powerful tradition in psychology will have it that something additional to these images of passive sensation is essential to the mental determination of a voluntary act. There must, of course, be a special current of energy going out from the brain into the appropriate muscles during the act. And this outgoing current, it is supposed, must have in each particular case a feeling sway generous attached to it, or else, it is said, the mind could never tell which particular current, the current to this muscle or the current to that one, was the right one to use. This feeling of the current of outgoing energy has received from Wundt the name of the feeling of innervation. I disbelieve in its existence, and must proceed to criticize the notion of it, at what I fear may to some prove tedious length. At first sight there is something extremely plausible in the feeling of innervation. The passive feelings of movements with which we have hitherto been dealing all come after the movement's performance. But wherever a movement is difficult and precise, we become, as a matter of fact, acutely aware in advance of the amount and direction of energy which it is to involve. One has only to play ten pins or billiards, or throw a ball, to catch his will in the act, as it were, of balancing tentatively its possible efforts, and ideally rehearsing various muscular contractions nearly correct. Until it gets just the right one before it, when it says, now go. This premonitory weighing feels so much like a succession of tentative sallyings forth of power into the outer world, followed by correction just in time to avoid the irrevocable deed. That the notion that outgoing nerve currents rather than mere vestiges of former passive sensibility accompany it, is a most natural one to entertain. We find accordingly that most authors have taken the existence of feelings of innervation as a matter of course. Bain, Wundt, Helmholtz, and Mach defend them most explicitly. But in spite of the authority which such writers deservedly wield, I cannot help thinking that they are in this instance wrong, that the discharge into the motor nerves is insentient, and that all our ideas of movement, in, p. 494, including those of effort which it requires, as well as those of its direction, its extent, its strength, and its velocity, are images of peripheral sensations, either remote or resident in the moving parts, or in other parts which sympathetically act with them in consequence of the diffusive wave. A priori, as I shall show, there is no reason why there should be a consciousness of the motor discharge, and there is a reason why there should not be such a consciousness. The presumption is thus against the existence of the feeling of innervation, and the burden of proving it falls upon those who believe in it. If the positive empirical evidence which they offer prove also insufficient, then their case falls to the ground, and the feeling in question must be ruled out of court. In the first place, then, let me show that the assumption of the feeling of innervation is unnecessary. I cannot help suspecting that the scholastic prejudice that the effect must be already in some way contained in the cause has had something to do with making psychologists so ready to admit the feeling of innervation. The outgoing current being the effect, what psychic antecedent could contain or prefigure it better than a feeling of it? But if we take a wide view, and consider the psychic antecedents of our activities at large, we see that the scholastic maxim breaks down everywhere, and that its verification in this instance would rather violate than illustrate the general rule. In the diffusive wave, in reflex action, and in emotional expression, the movements which are the effects are in no manner contained by anticipation in the stimuli which are their cause. The latter are subjective sensations or objective perceptions, which do not in the slightest degree resemble or prefigure the movements. But we get them, and, presto! There the movements are. They are knocked out of us, they surprise us. It is just cause for wonder, as our chapter on instinct has shown us, that such bodily consequences should follow such mental antecedents. We explain the mystery tant bien que mal by our evolutionary theories, saying that lucky variations and heredity have generally brought it about that, page 495, this particular pair of terms should have grown into a uniform sequence. Meanwhile why any state of consciousness at all should precede a movement, we know not, the two things seem so essentially discontinuous. But if a state of consciousness there must be, why then it may, for aught we can see, as easily be one sort of a state as another. 
It is swallowing a camel and straining at a gnat for a man, all of whose muscles will on certain occasions contract at a sudden touch or sound, to suppose that on another occasion the idea of the feelings about to be produced by their contraction is an insufficient mental signal for the latter. And to insist that an additional antecedent is needed in the shape of a feeling of the outgoing discharge. No. For aught we can see, and in the light of general analogy, the kinesthetic ideas, as we have defined them, or images of incoming feelings of attitude and motion, are as likely as any feelings of innervation are. To be the last psychic antecedents and determiners of the various currents downwards into the muscles from the brain. The question, what are the antecedents and determinants, is a question of fact, to be decided by whatever empirical evidence may be found. 445. P. 496. But before considering the empirical evidence, let me go on to show that there is a certain a priori reason why the kinoesthetic images ought to be the last psychic antecedents of the outgoing currents. And why we should expect these currents to be insentient. Why, in short, the soidizon feelings of innervation should not exist. It is a general principle in psychology that consciousness deserts all processes where it can no longer be of use. The tendency of consciousness to a minimum of complication is in fact a dominating law. The law of parsimony in logic is only its best known case. We grow unconscious of every feeling which is useless as a sign to lead us to our ends, and where one sign will suffice others drop out, and that one remains, to work alone. We observe this in the whole history of sense perception, and in the acquisition of every art. We ignore which eye we see with, because a fixed mechanical association has been formed between our motions and each retinal image. Our motions are the ends of our seeing, our retinal images the signals to these ends. If each retinal image, whichever it be, can suggest automatically a motion in the right direction, what need for us to know whether it be in the right eye or the left? Page 497, that knowledge would be superfluous complication. So in acquiring any art or voluntary function. The marksman ends by thinking only of the exact position of the goal, the singer only of the perfect sound, the balancer only of the point of the pole whose oscillations he must counteract. The associated mechanism has become so perfect in all these persons that each variation in the thought of the end is functionally correlated with the one movement fitted to bring the latter about. Whilst they were tyros, they thought of their means as well as their end, the marksman of the position of his gun or bow, or the weight of his stone, the pianist of the visible position of the note on the keyboard. The singer of his throat or breathing, the balancer of his feet on the rope, or his hand or chin under the pole. But little by little they succeeded in dropping all this supernumerary consciousness, and they became secure in their movements exactly in proportion as they did so. Now if we analyze the nervous mechanism of voluntary action, we shall see that by virtue of this principle of parsimony in consciousness the motor discharge ought to be devoid of sentience. If we call this immediate psychic antecedent of a movement the latter's mental cue, all that is needed for invariability of sequence on the movement's part is a fixed connection between each several mental cue, and one particular movement. For a movement to be produced with perfect precision, it suffices that it obey instantly its own mental cue and nothing else, and that this mental cue be incapable of awakening any other movement. Now the simplest possible arrangement for producing voluntary movements would be that the memory images of the movement's distinctive peripheral effects, whether resident or remote, 446, themselves should severally constitute the mental cues. And that no other psychic facts should intervene or be mixed up with them. For a million different voluntary movements, we should then need a million dis, page 498, Distinct processes in the brain cortex, each corresponding to the idea or memory image of one movement, and a million distinct paths of discharge. Everything would then be unambiguously determined, and if the idea were right, the movement would be right too. Everything after the idea might then be quite insentient, and the motor discharge itself could be unconsciously performed. The partisans of the feeling of innervation, however, say that the motor discharge itself must be felt, and that it, and not the idea of the movement's distinctive effects, must be the proper mental cue. Thus the principle of parsimony is sacrificed, and all economy and simplicity are lost. 
For what can be gained by the interposition of this relay of feeling between the idea of the movement and the movement? Nothing on the score of economy of nerve tracts. For it takes just as many of them to associate a million ideas of movement with a million motor centers, each with a specific feeling of innervation attached to its discharge. As to associate the same million ideas with a million insentient motor centers. And nothing on the score of precision. For the only conceivable way in which the feelings of innervation might further precision would be by giving to a mind whose idea of a movement was vague. A sort of halting stage with sharper imagery on which to collect its wits before uttering its fiat. But not only are the conscious discriminations between our kinesthetic ideas much sharper than any one pretends the shades of difference between feelings of innervation to be, but even were this not the case. It is impossible to see how a mind with its ideas vaguely conceived could tell out of a lot of innervations gefully, were they never so sharply differentiated, which one fitted that idea exactly, and which did not. A sharply conceived idea will, on the other hand, directly awaken a distinct movement as easily as it will awaken a distinct feeling of innervation. If feelings can go astray through vagueness, surely the fewer steps of feeling there are interposed the more securely we shall act. We ought then, on a priori grounds alone, to regard the innervation scaffold as a pure encumbrance, and to presume that the peripheral ideas of movement are sufficient mental cues. P. For 99, the presumption being thus against the feelings of innervation, those who defend their existence are bound to prove it by positive evidence. The evidence might be direct or indirect. If we could introspectively feel them as something plainly distinct from the peripheral feelings and ideas of movement which nobody denies to be there, that would be evidence both direct and conclusive. Unfortunately it does not exist. There is no introspective evidence of the feeling of innervation. Wherever we look for it and think we have grasped it, we find that we have really got a peripheral feeling or image instead, an image of the way in which we feel when the innervation is over, and the movement is in process of doing or is done. Our idea of raising our arm, for example, or of crooking our finger, is a sense, more or less vivid, of how the raised arm or the crooked finger feels. There is no other mental material out of which such an idea might be made. We cannot possibly have any idea of our ear's motion until our ears have moved, and this is true of every other organ as well. Since the time of Hume it has been a commonplace in psychology that we are only conversant with the outward results of our volition, and not with the hidden inner machinery of nerves and muscles which are what it primarily sets at work. 447. The believers in the feeling of innervation readily admit this, but seem hardly alive to its consequences. It seems to me that one immediate consequence ought to be to make us doubt the existence of the feeling in dispute. Whoever says that in raising his arm he is ignorant of how many muscles he contracts, in what order of sequence, and in what degrees of intensity, expressively avows a colossal amount of unconsciousness of the processes of motor discharge. Each separate muscle at any rate cannot have its distinct feeling of innervation. Wundt, 448 who make such enormous use of these hypo, p. 500, thetical feelings in his psychologic construction of space, is himself led to admit that they have no differences of quality, but feel alike in all muscles, and vary only in their degrees of intensity. They are used by the mind as guides, not of which movement, but of how strong a movement, it is making, or shall make. But does not this virtually surrender their existence altogether? 449. For if anything be obvious to introspection it is that the degree of strength of our muscular contractions is completely revealed to us by afferent feelings coming from the muscles themselves and their insertions. From the vicinity of the joints, and from the general fixation of the larynx, chest, face, and body, in the phenomenon of effort, objectively considered. When a certain degree of energy of contraction rather than another is thought of by us, this complex aggregate of afferent feelings, forming the material of our thought, renders absolutely precise and distinctive our mental image of the exact strength of movement to be made, and the exact amount of resistance to be overcome. Let the reader try to direct his will towards a particular movement, and then notice what constituted the direction of the will. Was it anything over and above the notion of the different feelings to which the movement when effected would give rise? 
If we abstract from these feelings, will any sign, principle, or means of orientation be left by which the will may innervate the right muscles with the right intensity, and not go astray into the wrong ones? Strip off these images of result, and so far from leaving us with a complete assortment of directions into which our will may launch itself, you leave our consciousness in an absolute and total vacuum. If I will to write, Peter, rather than, Paul, it is the thought of certain digital sensations, of certain alphabetic sounds, of certain appearances on the paper, and of no others, which immediately precedes the motion of my pen. P. 501, if I will to utter the word Paul rather than Peter, it is the thought of my voice falling on my ear, and of certain muscular feelings in my tongue, lips, and larynx, which guide the utterance. All these are incoming feelings, and between the thought of them, by which the act is mentally specified with all possible completeness, and the act itself, there is no room for any third order of mental phenomenon. There is indeed the fiat, the element of consent, or resolve that the act shall ensue. This, doubtless, to the reader's mind, as to my own, constitutes the essence of the voluntariness of the act. This fiat will be treated of in detail farther on. It may be entirely neglected here, for it is a constant coefficient, affecting all voluntary actions alike, and incapable of serving to distinguish them. No one will pretend that its quality varies according as the right arm, for example, or the left is used. An anticipatory image, then, of the sensorial consequences of a movement, plus, on certain occasions, the fiat that these consequences shall become actual is the only psychic state which introspection lets us discern as the forerunner of our voluntary acts. There is no introspective evidence whatever of any still later or concomitant feeling attached to the efferent discharge. The various degrees of difficulty with which the fiat is given form a complication of the utmost importance, to be discussed farther on. Now the reader may still shake his head and say, but can you seriously mean that all the wonderfully exact adjustment of my action's strength to its ends is not a matter of outgoing innervation? Here is a cannonball, and here a pasteboard box, instantly and accurately I lift each from the table, the ball not refusing to rise because my innervation was too weak, the box not flying abruptly into the air because it was too strong. Could representations of the movement's different sensory effects in the two cases be so delicately foreshadowed in the mind? Or being there, is it credible that they should, all unaided, so delicately graduate the stimulation of the unconscious motor centers to their work? Even so. I reply to both queries. We have a most extremely delicate foreshadowing of the sensory effects. Why else the, p. 502, start of surprise that runs through us if someone has filled the light seeming box with sand before we try to lift it, or has substituted for the cannonball which we know a painted wooden imitation. Surprise can only come from getting a sensation which differs from the one we expect. But the truth is that when we know the objects well, the very slightest difference from the expected weight will surprise us, or at least attract our notice. With unknown objects we begin by expecting the weight made probable by their appearance. The expectation of this sensation innervates our lift, and we, set, it rather small at first. An instant verifies whether it is too small. Our expectation rises, i.e., we think in a twinkling of a setting of the chest and teeth, a bracing of the back, and a more violent feeling in the arms. Quicker than thought we have them, and with them the burden ascends into the air. 450, Bernhard, 451, has shown in a rough experimental way that our estimation of the amount of a resistance is as delicately graduated when our wills are passive, and our limbs made to contract by direct local ferritization, as when we our, p. 503, selves innervate them. Ferrier, 452, has repeated and verified the observations. They admit of no great precision, and too much stress should not be laid upon them either way. But at the very least they tend to show that no added delicacy would accrue to our perception from the consciousness of the efferent process, even if it existed. Since there is no direct introspective evidence for the feelings of innervation, is there any indirect or circumstantial evidence? Much is offered, but on critical examination it breaks down. Let us see what it is. 
Wundt says that were our motor feelings of an afferent nature. It ought to be expected that they would increase and diminish with the amount of outer or inner work actually affected in contraction. This, however, is not the case, but the strength of the motor sensation is purely proportional to the strength of the impulse to movement, which starts from the central organ innervating the motor nerves. This may be proved by observations made by physicians in cases of morbid alteration in the muscular effect. A patient whose arm or leg is half paralyzed, so that he can only move the limb with great effort, has a distinct feeling of this effort, the limb seems to him heavier than before, appearing as if weighted with lead. He has, therefore, a sense of more work affected than formerly, and yet the affected work is either the same or even less. Only he must, to get even this effect, exert a stronger innervation, a stronger motor impulse, than formerly. 453. In complete paralysis, also, patients will be conscious of putting forth the greatest exertion to move a limb which remains absolutely still upon the bed, and from which of course no afferent muscular or other feelings can come, 454. But the R. Ferrier in his Functions of the Brain, A.M. Ed., page 504, pages 222-4, disposes very easily of this line of argument. He says, It is necessary, however, to exclude movements altogether before such an explanation, as Wundt's, can be adopted. Now, though the hemiplegic patient cannot move his paralyzed limb, though he is conscious of trying hard, yet he will be found to be making powerful muscular exertion of some kind. Volpian has called attention to the fact, and I have repeatedly verified it, that when a hemiplegic patient is desired to close his paralyzed fist, in his endeavors to do so he unconsciously performs this action with the sound one. It is, in fact, almost impossible to exclude such a source of complication, and unless this is taken into account very erroneous conclusions as to the cause of the sense of effort may be drawn. In the fact of muscular contraction and the concomitant centripetal impressions, even though the action is not such as is desired. The conditions of the consciousness of effort exist without our being obliged to regard it as depending on central innervation or outgoing currents. It is, however, easy to make an experiment of a simple nature which will satisfactorily account for the sense of effort, even when these unconscious contractions of the other side, such as hemiplegics make, are entirely excluded. If the reader will extend his right arm and hold his forefinger in the position required for pulling the trigger of a pistol, he may without actually moving his finger, but by simply making believe, experience a consciousness of energy put forth. Here, then, is a clear case of consciousness of energy without actual contraction of the muscles either of the one hand or the other, and without any perceptible bodily strain. If the reader will again perform the experiment, and pay careful attention to the condition of his respiration, he will observe that his consciousness of effort coincides with a fixation of the muscles of his chest. And that in proportion to the amount of energy he feels he is putting forth, he is keeping his glottis closed and actively contracting his respiratory muscles. Let him place his finger as before, and continue breathing all the time, and he will find that however much he may direct his attention to his finger. He will experience not the slightest trace of consciousness of effort until he has actually moved the finger itself, and then it is referred locally to the muscles in action. It is only when this essential and ever-present respiratory factor is, as it has been, overlooked, that the consciousness of effort can with any degree of plausibility be ascribed to the outgoing current. In the contraction of the respiratory muscles there are the necessary conditions of centripetal impressions, and these are capable of originating the general sense of effort. When these active efforts are withheld, no consciousness of effort ever arises, except in so far as it is conditioned by the local contraction of the group of muscles towards which the attention is directed, p. 505, or by other muscular contractions called unconsciously into play in the attempt. I am unable to find a single case of consciousness of effort which is not explicable in one or other of the ways specified. In all instances the consciousness of effort is conditioned by the actual fact of muscular contraction. That it is dependent on centripetal impressions generated by the act of contraction, I have already endeavored to show. When the paths of the centripetal impressions or the cerebral centers of the same are destroyed, there is no vestige of a muscular sense. 
that the central organs for the apprehension of the impressions originating from muscular contraction are different from those which send out the motor impulse, has already been established. But when Wundt argues that this cannot be so, because then the sensation would always keep pace with the energy of muscular contraction, he overlooks the important factor of the fixation of the respiratory muscles, which is the basis of the general sense of effort in all its varying degrees. To these remarks of Ferrier's I have nothing to add. 455, any one may verify them, and they prove conclusively that the consciousness of muscular exertion, being impossible without movement effected somewhere, must be an afferent and not an efferent sensation. A consequence, and not an antecedent, of the movement itself. An idea of the amount of muscular exertion requisite to perform a certain movement can consequently be nothing other than an anticipatory image of the movement's sensible effects. p. 506, driven thus from the body at large, where next shall the circumstantial evidence for the feeling of innervation lodge itself? Where but in the muscles of the eye, from which small retreat it judges itself inexpugnable? Nevertheless, that fastness too must fall, and by the lightest of bombardments. But, before trying the bombardment, let us recall our general principles about optical vertigo, or illusory appearance of movement in objects. We judge that an object moves under two distinct sets of circumstances. One, when its image moves on the retina, and we know that the eye is still. Two, when its image is stationary on the retina, and we know that the eye is moving. In this case we feel that we follow the object. In either of these cases a mistaken judgment about the state of the eye will produce optical vertigo. If in case one we think our eye is still when it is really moving, we get a movement of the retinal image which we judge to be due to a real outward motion of the object. This is what happens after looking at rushing water, or through the windows of a moving railroad car, or after turning on one's heel to giddiness. The eyes, without our intending to move them, go through a series of involuntary rotations, continuing those they were previously obliged to make to keep objects in view. If the objects have been whirling by to our right, our eyes when turned to stationary objects will still move slowly towards the right. The retinal image upon them will then move like that of an object passing to the left. We then try to catch it by voluntarily and rapidly rotating the eyes to the left, when the involuntary impulse again rotates the eyes to the right, continuing the apparent motion, and so the game goes on. See above, pages 89 to 91. If in case two we think our eyes moving when they are in reality still, we shall judge that we are following a moving object when we are but fixating a steadfast one. Illusions of this kind occur after sudden and complete paralysis of special eye muscles, and the partisans of feelings of efferent, page 507, innervation regard them as experimenta crucis. Helmholtz writes frowny face 456. When the external rectus muscle of the right eye, or its nerve, is paralyzed, the eye can no longer be rotated to the right side. So long as the patient turns it only to the nasal side it makes regular movements, and he perceives correctly the position of objects in the visual field. So soon, however, as he tries to rotate it outwardly, i.e. towards the right, it ceases to obey his will, stands motionless in the middle of its course, and the objects appear flying to the right, although position of eye and retinal image are unaltered. 457. In such a case the exertion of the will is followed neither by actual movement of the eye, nor by contraction of the muscle in question, nor even by increased tension in it. The act of will produced absolutely no effect beyond the nervous system, and yet we judge of the direction of the line of vision as if the will had exercised its normal effects. We believe it to have moved to the right, and since the retinal image is unchanged, we attribute to the object the same movement we have erroneously ascribed to the eye. These phenomena leave no room for doubt that we only judge the direction of the line of sight by the effort of will with which we strive to change the position of our eyes. There are also certain weak feelings in our eyelids. And furthermore in excessive lateral rotations we feel a fatiguing strain in the muscles. But all these feelings are too faint and vague to be of use in the perception of direction. We feel then what impulse of the will, and how strong a one, we apply to turn our eye into a given position. 
partial paralysis of the same muscle, paresis, as it has been called, seems to point even more conclusively to the same inference, that the will to innervate is felt independently of all its afferent results. I will quote the account given by a recent authority, 458, of the effects of this accident. When the nerve going to an eye muscle, e.g. the external rectus of one side, falls into a state of paresis, the first result is that the same volitional stimulus, which under normal circumstances would have perhaps rotated the eye to its extreme position outwards, now is competent to effect only a moderate outward rotation, say of 20 degrees. If now, shutting the sound eye, the patient looks at an object situated just so far out, p. 508, wards from the paretic eye that this latter turn 20 degrees in order to see it distinctly, the patient will feel as if he had moved it not only 20 degrees towards the side, but into its extreme lateral position. For the impulse of innervation requisite for bringing it into view is a perfectly conscious act, whilst the diminished state of contraction of the paretic muscle lies for the present out of the ken of consciousness. The test proposed by von Grefe, of localization by the sense of touch, serves to render evident the error which the patient now makes. If we direct him to touch rapidly the object looked at, with the forefinger of the hand of the same side, the line through which the finger moves will not be the line of sight directed 20 degrees outward. But will approach more nearly to the extreme possible outward line of vision. A stone cutter with the external rectus of the left eye paralyzed, will strike his hand instead of his chisel with his hammer, until experience has taught him wisdom. It appears as if here the judgment of direction could only arise from the exclusive innervation of the rectus when the object is looked at. All the afferent feelings must be identical with those experienced and the eye is sound and the judgment is correct. The eyeball is rotated just 20 degrees in the one case as in the other, the image falls on the same part of the retina, the pressures on the eyeball and the tensions of the skin and conjunctiva are identical. There is only one feeling which can vary, and lead us to our mistake. That feeling must be the effort which the will makes, moderate in the one case, excessive in the other, but in both cases an efferent feeling, pure and simple. Beautiful and clear as this reasoning seems to be, it is based on an incomplete inventory of the afferent data. The writers have all omitted to consider what is going on in the other eye. This is kept covered during the experiments, to prevent double images, and other complications. But if its condition under these circumstances be examined, it will be found to present changes which must result in strong afferent feelings. And the taking account of these feelings demolishes in an instant all the conclusions which the authors from whom I have quoted base upon their supposed absence. This I will now proceed to show, 459. P. 509, take first the case of complete paralysis and assume the right eye affected. Suppose the patient desires to rotate his gaze to an object situated in the extreme right of the field of vision. As Herring has so beautifully shown, both eyes move by a common act of innervation, and in this instance both move towards the right. But the paralyzed right eye stops short in the middle of its course, the object still appearing far to the side of its fixation point. The left sound eye, meanwhile, although covered, continues its rotation until the extreme rightward limit thereof has been reached. To an observer looking at both eyes the left will seem to squint. Of course this continued and extreme rotation produces afferent feelings of rightward motion in the eyeball, which momentarily overpower the faint feelings of central position in the diseased and uncovered eye. The patient feels by his left eyeball as if he were following an object which by his right retina he perceives he does not overtake. All the conditions of optical vertigo are here present, the image stationary on the retina, and the erroneous conviction that the eyes are moving. The objection that a feeling in the left eyeball ought not to produce a conviction that the right eye moves, will be considered in a moment. Let us meanwhile turn to the, page 510, case of simple paresis with apparent translocation of the field. Here the right eye succeeds in fixating the object, but observation of the left eye will reveal to an observer the fact that it squints just as violently inwards as in the former case. The direction which the finger of the patient takes in pointing to the object, is the direction of this squinting in covered left eye. As Grefe says, 
although he fails to seize the true import of his own observation, it appears to have been by no means sufficiently noticed how significantly the direction of the line of sight of the secondarily deviating eye, i.e. of the left, and the line of direction of the pointed finger agree. The translocation would, in a word, be perfectly explained could we suppose that the sensation of a certain degree of rotation in the left eyeball were able to suggest to the patient the position of an object whose image falls on the right retina alone. 460. Can, then, a feeling in one eye, page 511, be confounded with a feeling in the other? It most assuredly can, for not only Donders and Adamuk, by their vivisections, but Herring by his exquisite optical experiments, have proved that the apparatus of innervation for both eyes is single. And that they function as one organ, a double eye, according to Herring, or what Helmholtz calls a cyclopenage. The retinal feelings of this double organ, singly innervated, are naturally undistinguished as respects are knowing whether they belong to the left retina or to the right. We use them only to tell us where their objects lie. It takes long practice directed specially ad hoc to teach us on which retina the sensations severally fall. Similarly the different sensations which arise from the positions of the eyeballs are used exclusively as signs of the position of objects. An object directly fixated being localized habitually at the intersection of the two optical axes, but without any separate consciousness on our part that the position of one axis is different from another. All we are aware of is a consolidated feeling of a certain strain in the eyeballs, accompanied by the perception that just so far in front and so far to the right or to the left there is an object which we see. So that a muscular process in one eye is as likely to combine with a retinal process in the other eye to affect a perceptive judgment, as two processes in one eye are likely so to combine. Another piece of circumstantial evidence for the feelings of innervation is that adduced by Professor Mach, as follows. If we stand on a bridge, and look at the water flowing beneath, we usually feel ourselves at rest. Whilst the water seems in motion. Prolonged looking at the water, however, commonly has for its result to make the bridge with the observer and surroundings suddenly seem to move in the direction opposed to that of the water. Whilst the water itself assumes the appearance of standing still. The relative motion of the objects is in both cases the same, and there must therefore be some. Page 512, Adequate Physiological Ground Why Sometimes One, Sometimes the Other Part of Them Is Felt to Move. In order to investigate the matter conveniently, I had the simple apparatus constructed which is represented in figure 86. An oil cloth with a simple pattern is horizontally stretched over two cylinders, each two meters long and three feet apart, and kept in uniform motion by the help of a crank across the cloth, and some 30 centimeters. Above it, is stretched a string, with a knot X, which serves as a fixation point for the eye of the observer. If the observer follow with his eyes the pattern of the cloth as it moves, he sees it in movement, himself and the surroundings at rest. But if he looks at the knot, he soon feels as if the entire room were moving contrary to the direction of the cloth, whilst the latter seems to stand still. This change in the mode of looking comes about in more or less time according to one's momentary disposition, but usually it takes but a few seconds. If one once understands the point, one can make the two appearances alternate at will. Every following of the oilcloth makes the observer stationary, every fixation of the knot or inattention to the oilcloth, so that its pattern becomes blurred, sets him in apparent motion. 461. Professor Mach proceeds to explain the phenomenon as follows. Moving objects exert, as is well known, a peculiar motor stimulation upon the eye, they draw our attention and our look after them. If the look really follows them, we assume that they move. But if the eye, instead of following the moving objects, remains steadfastly at rest, it must be that the constant stimulus to motion which it receives is neutralized by an equally constant current of innervation flowing into its motor apparatus. But this is just what would happen if the steadfastly fixated point were itself moving uniformly in the other direction, and we were following it with our eyes. When this comes about, whatever motionless things are looked at must appear in motion. 462. The knot X, the string, we ourselves, and all our STA, P. 
513, Tyanary surroundings thus appear in movement, according to Mach, because we are constantly innervating our eyeballs to resist the drag exerted upon them by the pattern or the flowing waves. I have myself repeated the observation many times above flowing streams, but have never succeeded in getting the full illusion as described by Mach. I gain a sense of the movement of the bridge and of my own body, but the river never seems absolutely to stop, it still moves in one direction, whilst I float away in the other. But, be the illusion partial or complete, a different explanation of it from Professor Mox seems to me the more natural one to adopt. The illusion is said to cease when, our attention being fully fixed on the moving oilcloth, we perceive the latter for what it is. And to recommence, on the contrary, when we perceive the oilcloth as a vaguely moving background behind an object which we directly fixate and whose position with regard to our own body is unchanged. This, however, is the sort of consciousness which we have whenever we are ourselves born in a vehicle, on horseback, or in a boat. As we and our belongings go one way, the whole background goes the other. I should rather, therefore, explain Professor Mach's illusion as similar to the illusion at railroad stations described above on page 90. The other train moves, but it makes ours seem to move, because, filling the window as it does, it stands for the time being as the total background. So here, the water or oilcloth stands for us as background overhopped whenever we seem to ourselves to be moving over it. The relative motion felt by the retina is assigned to that one of its components which we look at more in itself and less as a mere repoussoir. This may be the knot above the oilcloth or the bridge beneath our feet, or it may be, on the other hand, the oilcloth as pattern or the surface of the swirling stream. Similar changes may be produced in the apparent motion of the moon and the clouds through which it shines, by similarly altering the attention. Such alterations, however, in our conception of which part of the visual field is substantive object and which part background, seem to have no connection with feelings of innervation. I, page 514, cannot, therefore, regard the observation of Prof. Mach as any proof that the latter feelings exist, 463. The circumstantial evidence for the feeling of innervation thus seems to break down like the introspective evidence. But not only can we rebut experiments intended to prove it, we can also adduce experiments which disprove it. A person who moves a limb voluntarily must innervate it in any case, and if he feels the innervation he ought to be able to use the feeling to define what his limb is about, even though the limb itself were anesthetic. If, however, the limb be totally anesthetic, it turns out that he does not know at all how much work it performs in its contraction, in other words, he has no perception of the amount of innervation which he exerts. A patient examined by Messrs. Glay and Marillier beautifully showed this. His entire arms, and his trunk down to the navel, were insensible both superficially and deeply, but his arms were not paralyzed. We take three stones bottles, two of them are empty and weigh each 250 grams. The third is full of mercury and weighs 1850 grams. We ask L to estimate their weight and tell us which is heaviest. He declares that he finds them all three alike. With many days of interval we made two series of six experiments each. The result was always the same. The experiment, it need hardly be said, was arranged in, page 515, such wise that he could be informed neither by sight nor by hearing. He even declared, holding in his hand the bottle full of mercury, that he found it to have no weight. We place successively in his hand, his eyes being still bandaged, a piece of modeling wax, a stick of hard wood, a thick india rubber tube, a newspaper folded up lengthwise and rumpled, and we make him squeeze these several objects. He feels no difference of resistance and does not even perceive that anything is in his hand. 464. Mr. Glay in another place, 465, quotes experiments by Diar. Block which prove that the sense which we have of our limbs position owes absolutely nothing to the feeling of innervation put forth. Diar. Block stood opposite the angle of a screen whose sides made an angle of about 90 degrees, and tried to place his hand symmetrically, or so that both should fall on corresponding spots of the two screen sides. Which were marked with squares for the purpose. The average error being noted, 
one hand was then passively carried by an assistant to a spot on its screen side, and the other actively sought the corresponding spot on the opposite side. The accuracy of the correspondence proved to be as great as when both arms were innervated voluntarily, showing that the consciousness of innervation in the first of the two experiments added nothing to the sense of the limb's position. Dar. Block then tried, pressing a certain number of pages of a book between the thumb and forefinger of one hand, to press an equal number between the same fingers of the other hand. He did this just as well when the fingers in question were drawn apart by India rubber bands as when they were uninterfered with. Showing that the physiologically much greater innervation current required in the former case had no effect upon the consciousness of the movement made, so far as its spatial character at any rate was concerned. 466. Page 516, on the whole, then, it seems as probable as anything can well be, that these feelings of innervation do not exist. P. 517. If the motor cells are distinct structures, they are as insentient as the motor nerve trunks are after the posterior roots are cut. If they are not distinct structures, but are only the last sensory cells, those at the mouth of the funnel, 467, then their consciousness is that of kinesthetic ideas and sensations merely. And this consciousness accompanies the rise of activity in them rather than its discharge. The entire content and material of our consciousness, consciousness of movement, as of all things else, is thus of peripheral origin, and came to us in the first instance through the peripheral nerves. If it be asked what we gain by this sensationalistic conclusion, I reply that we gain at any rate simplicity and uniformity. In the chapters on space, on belief, on the emotions, we found sensation to be a much richer thing than is commonly supposed, and this chapter seems at this point to fall into line with those. Then, as for sensationalism being a degrading belief, which abolishes all inward originality and spontaneity, there is this, p. 518, to be said, that the advocates of inward spontaneity may be turning their backs on its real citadel, when they make a fight, on its behalf, for the consciousness of energy put forth in the outgoing discharge. Let there be no such consciousness. Let all our thoughts of movements be of sensational constitution. Still in the emphasizing, choosing, and espousing of one of them rather than another, in the saying to it, Be thou the reality for me, there is ample scope for our inward initiative to be shown. Here, it seems to me, the true line between the passive materials and the activity of the spirit should be drawn. It is certainly false strategy to draw it between such ideas as are connected with the outgoing and such as are connected with the incoming neural wave. 468. If the ideas by which we discriminate between one movement and another, at the instant of deciding in our mind which one we shall perform, are always of sensorial origin, then the question arises, of which sensorial order need they be? It will be remembered that we distinguished two orders of kinesthetic impression, the remote ones, made by the movement on the eye or ear or distant skin, etc., and the resident ones, made on the moving parts themselves, muscles, joints, etc. Now do resident images, exclusively, form what I have called the mental cue, or will remote ones equally suffice? There can be no doubt whatever that the mental cue may be either an image of the resident or of the remote kind. Although, at the outset of our learning a movement, it would seem that the resident feelings must come strongly before consciousness, cf page 487, later this need not be the case. The rule, in fact, would seem to be that they tend to lapse, p. 519, more and more from consciousness, and that the more practiced we become in a movement, the more, remote, do the ideas become which form its mental cue. What we are interested in is what sticks in our consciousness. Everything else we get rid of as quickly as we can. Our resident feelings of movement have no substantive interest for us at all, as a rule. What interest us are the ends which the movement is to attain. Such an end is generally an outer impression on the eye or ear, or sometimes on the skin, nose, or palate. Now let the idea of the end associate itself definitely with the right motor innervation. And the thought of the innervation's resident effects will become as great an encumbrance as we formerly concluded that the feeling of the innervation itself would be. The mind does not need it, the end alone is enough. 
The idea of the end, then, tends more and more to make itself all-sufficient. Or, at any rate, if the kinesthetic ideas are called up at all, they are so swamped in the vivid kinesthetic feelings by which they are immediately overtaken that we have no time to be aware of their separate existence. As I write, I have no anticipation, as a thing distinct from my sensation, of either the look or the digital feel of the letters which flow from my pen. The words chime on my mental ear, as it were, before I write them, but not on my mental eye or hand. This comes from the rapidity with which often repeated movements follow on their mental cue. An end consented to as soon as conceived innervates directly the center of the first movement of the chain which leads to its accomplishment, and then the whole chain rattles off quasi-reflexly, as was described on pages 115-6 of Volume 1. The reader will certainly recognize this to be true in all fluent and unhesitating voluntary acts. The only special fiat there is at the outset of the performance. A man says to himself, I must change my shirt, and involuntarily he has taken off his coat, and his fingers are at work in their accustomed manner on his waistcoat buttons, etc. Or we say, I must go downstairs, and ere we know it we have risen, walked, and turned the handle of the door, all through the idea of an end coupled with a series of guiding, page 520, sensations which successively arise. It would seem indeed that we fail of accuracy and certainty in our attainment of the end whenever we are preoccupied with much ideal consciousness of the means. We walk a beam the better the less we think of the position of our feet upon it. We pitch or catch, we shoot or chop the better the less tactile and muscular, the less resident, and the more exclusively optical, the more remote, our consciousness is. Keep your eye on the place aimed at, and your hand will fetch it. Think of your hand, and you will very likely miss your aim. Drive Southard found that he could touch a spot with a pencil point more accurately with a visual than with a tactile mental cue. In the former case he looked at a small object and closed his eyes before trying to touch it. In the latter case he placed it with closed eyes, and then after removing his hand tried to touch it again. The average error with touch, when the results were most favorable, was 17.13 mm. With sight it was only 12.37 mm, 469, all these are plain results of introspection and observation. By what neural machinery they are made possible we need not, at this present stage, inquire. In chapter 18 we saw how enormously individuals differ in respect to their mental imagery. In the type of imagination called tactile by the French authors, it is probable that the kinesthetic ideas are more prominent than in my account. We must not expect too great a uniformity in individual accounts, nor wrangle over much as to which one truly represents the process. 470. p. 521. I trust that I have now made clear what that idea of a movement is which must precede it in order that it be voluntary. It is not the thought of the innovation which the movement requires. It is the anticipation of the movement sensible effects, resident, or remote, and sometimes very remote indeed. Such anticipations, to say the least, determine what our movements shall be. I have spoken all along as if they also might determine that they shall be. This, no doubt, has disconcerted many readers, for it certainly seems as if a special fiat, or consent to the movement were required in addition to the mere conception of it, in many cases of volition. And this fiat I have altogether left out of my account. This leads us to the next point in the page 522, Psychology of the Will. It can be the more easily treated now that we have got rid of so much tedious preliminary matter. Ideomotor Action The question is this, is the bare idea of a movement sensible affects its sufficient mental cue, p. For 97, or must there be an additional mental antecedent, in the shape of a fiat, decision, consent, volitional mandate, or other synonymous phenomenon of consciousness, before the movement can follow? I answer, sometimes the bare idea is sufficient, but sometimes an additional conscious element, in the shape of a fiat, mandate, or express consent, has to intervene and precede the movement. The cases without a fiat constitute the more fundamental, because the more simple, variety. The others involve a special complication, which must be fully discussed at the proper time. 
For the present let us turn to ideomotor action, as it has been termed, or the sequence of movement upon the mere thought of it, as the type of the process of volition. Whenever movement follows unhesitatingly and immediately the notion of it in the mind, we have ideomotor action. We are then aware of nothing between the conception and the execution. All sorts of neuromuscular processes come between, of course, but we know absolutely nothing of them. We think the act, and it is done, and that is all that introspection tells us of the matter. Dar. Carpenter, who first used, I believe, the name of ideomotor action, placed it, if I mistake not, among the curiosities of our mental life. The truth is that it is no curiosity, but simply the normal process stripped of disguise. Whilst talking I become conscious of a pin on the floor, or of some dust on my sleeve. Without interpreting the conversation I brush away the dust or pick up the pin. I make no express resolve, but the mere perception of the object and the fleeting notion of the act seem of themselves to bring the latter about. Similarly, I sit at table after dinner and find myself from time to time taking nuts or raisins out of the dish and eating them. My dinner properly is over and in the heat of the conversation I am hardly aware of what I, p. 523, do, but the perception of the fruit and the fleeting notion that I may eat it seem fatally to bring the act about. There is certainly no express fiat here. Any more than there is in all those habitual goings and comings and rearrangements of ourselves which fill every hour of the day and which incoming sensations instigate so immediately that it is often difficult to decide whether not to call them reflex rather than voluntary acts. We have seen in Chapter 4 that the intermediary terms of an habitual series of acts leading to an end are apt to be of this quasi-automatic sort. As Lotzi says, We see in writing or piano playing a great number of very complicated movements following quickly one upon the other, the instigative representations of which remained scarcely a second in consciousness. Certainly not long enough to awaken any other volition than the general one of resigning oneself without reserve to the passing over of representation into action. All the acts of our daily life happen in this wise, our standing up, walking, talking, all this never demands a distinct impulse of the will, but is adequately brought about by the pure flux of thought. 471. In all this the determining condition of the unhesitating and resistless sequence of the act seems to be the absence of any conflicting notion in the mind. Either there is nothing else at all in the mind, or what is there does not conflict. The hypnotic subject realizes the former condition. Ask him what he is thinking about, and ten to one he will reply nothing. The consequence is that he both believes everything he is told, and performs every act that is suggested. The suggestion may be a vocal command, or it may be the performance before him of the movement required. Hypnotic subjects in certain conditions repeat whatever they, page 524, hear you say, and imitate whatever they see you do. Dar. Fear says that certain waking persons of neurotic type, if one repeatedly close and open one's hand before their eyes, soon begin to have corresponding feelings in their own fingers and presently begin irresistibly to execute the movements which they see. Under these conditions of preparation, Dr. Fear found that his subjects could squeeze the hand dynamometer much more strongly than when abruptly invited to do so. A few passive repetitions of a movement will enable many enfeebled patients to execute it actively with greater strength. These observations beautifully show how the mere quickening of kinesthetic ideas is equivalent to a certain amount of tension towards discharge in the centers. 472. We know what it is to get out of bed on a freezing morning in a room without a fire, and how the very vital principle within us protests against the ordeal. Probably most persons have lain on certain mornings for an hour at a time unable to brace themselves to the resolve. We think how late we shall be, how the duties of the day will suffer, we say, I must get up, this is ignominious, etc. But still the warm couch feels too delicious, the cold outside too cruel, and resolution faints away and postpones itself again and again just as it seemed on the verge of bursting the resistance and passing over into the decisive act. Now how do we ever get up under such circumstances? If I may generalize from my own experience, we more often than not get up without any struggle or decision at all. 
we suddenly find that we have got up. A fortunate lapse of consciousness occurs. We forget both the warmth and the cold, we fall into some reverie connected with the day's life, in the course of which the idea flashes across us, hollow. I must lie here no longer, an idea which at that lucky instant awakens no contradictory or paralyzing suggestions. And consequently produces immediately its appropriate motor effects it was our acute consciousness of both the warmth and the cold during the period of struggle, p. 525, which paralyzed our activity then and kept our idea of rising in the condition of wish and not of will. The moment these inhibitory ideas ceased, the original idea exerted its effects. This case seems to me to contain in miniature form the data for an entire psychology of volition. It was in fact through mediating on the phenomenon in my own person that I first became convinced of the truth of the doctrine which these pages present, and which I need here illustrate by no farther examples. 473 the reason why that doctrine is not a self-evident truth is that we have so many ideas which do not result in action. But it will be seen that in every such case, without exception, that is because other ideas simultaneously present rob them of their impulsive power. But even here, and when a movement is inhibited from completely taking place by contrary ideas, it will incipiently take place. To quote Lotzi once more. The spectator accompanies the throwing of a billiard ball, or the thrust of the swordsman, with slight movements of his arm, the untaught narrator tells his story with many gesticulations. The reader while absorbed in the perusal of a battle scene feels a slight tension run through his muscular system, keeping time as it were with the actions he is reading of. These results become the more marked the more we are absorbed in thinking of the movements which suggest them. They grow fainter exactly in proportion as a complex consciousness, under the dominion of a crowd of other representations, withstands the passing over of mental contemplation into outward action. The willing game, the exhibitions of so-called mind-reading, or more properly muscle-reading, which have lately grown so fashionable, are based on this incipient obedience of muscular contraction to idea. Even when the deliberate intention is that no contraction shall occur. 474. Page 526, we may then lay it down for certain that every representation of a movement awakens in some degree the actual movement which is the object. And awakens it in a maximum degree whenever it is not kept from so doing by an antagonistic representation present simultaneously to the mind. The express fiat, or act of mental consent to the movement, comes in when the neutralization of the antagonistic and inhibitory idea is required. But that there is no express fiat needed when the conditions are simple, the reader ought now to be convinced. Lest, however, he should still share the common prejudice that voluntary action without exertion of will power is Hamlet with the prince's part left out, I will make a few farther remarks. The first point to start from in understanding voluntary action, and the possible occurrence of it with no fiat or express resolve, is the fact that consciousness is in its very nature impulsive. 475, we do not have a sensation or a thought and then have to add something dynamic to it to get a movement. Every pulse of feeling which we have is the correlate of some neural activity that is already on its way to instigate a movement. Our sensations and thoughts are but cross-sections, as it were, of currents whose essential consequence is motion, and which no sooner run in at one nerve than they run out again at another. The popular notion that mere consciousness as such is not essentially a forerunner of activity, that the latter must result from some superadded will force, is a very natural inference from those special cases in which we think of an act for an indefinite length of time without the action taking place. These cases, however, are not the norm, they are cases of inhibition by antagonistic, page 527, thoughts. When the blocking is released we feel as if an inward spring were let loose, and this is the additional impulse or fiat upon which the act effectively succeeds. We shall study anon the blocking and its release. Our higher thought is full of it. But where there is no blocking, there is naturally no hiatus between the thought process and the motor discharge. Movement is the natural immediate effect of feeling, irrespective of what the quality of the feeling may be. It is so in reflex action, it is so in emotional expression, it is so in the voluntary life. 
ideomotor action is thus no paradox, to be softened or explained away. It obeys the type of all conscious action, and from it one must start to explain action in which a special fiat is involved. It may be remarked in passing, that the inhibition of a movement no more involves an express effort or command than its execution does. Either of them may require it. But in all simple and ordinary cases, just as the bare presence of one idea prompts a movement, so the bare presence of another idea will prevent its taking place. Try to feel as if you were crooking your finger, whilst keeping it straight. In a minute it will fairly tingle with the imaginary change of position, yet it will not sensibly move, because it's not really moving is also a part of what you have in mind. Drop this idea, think of the movement purely and simply, with all breaks off, and, presto. It takes place with no effort at all. A waking man's behavior is thus at all times the resultant of two opposing neural forces. With unimaginable fineness some currents among the cells and fibers of his brain are playing on his motor nerves, whilst other currents, as unimaginably fine, are playing on the first currents, damming or helping them. Altering their direction or their speed. The upshot of it all is, that whilst the currents must always end by being drained off through some motor nerves, they are drained off sometimes through one set and sometimes through another. And sometimes they keep each other in equilibrium so long that a superficial observer may think they are not drained off at all. Such an observer must remember, however, that from the physiological point of view a gesture, an expression of the brow, or an expul, page 528, shown of the breath are movements as much as an act of locomotion is. A king's breath slays as well as an assassin's blow, and the outpouring of those currents which the magic imponderable streaming of our ideas accompanies need not always be of an explosive or otherwise physically conspicuous kind. Action after deliberation. We are now in a position to describe what happens in deliberate action, or when the mind is the seat of many ideas related to each other in antagonistic or in favorable ways, 476, one of the ideas is that of an act. By itself this idea would prompt a movement, some of the additional considerations, however, which are present to consciousness block the motor discharge, whilst others, on the contrary, solicit it to take place. The result is that peculiar feeling of inward unrest known as indecision. Fortunately it is too familiar to need description, for to describe it would be impossible. As long as it lasts, with the various objects before the attention, we are said to deliberate. And when finally the original suggestion either prevails and makes the movement take place, or gets definitively quenched by its antagonists, we are said to decide, or to utter our voluntary fight in favor of one or the other course. The reinforcing and inhibiting ideas meanwhile are termed the reasons or motives by which the decision is brought about. The process of deliberation contains endless degrees of complication. At every moment of it our consciousness is of an extremely complex object, namely the existence of the whole set of motives and their conflict, as explained on page 275 of volume 1. Of this object, the totality of which is realized more or less dimly all the while, certain parts stand out more or less sharply at one moment in the p. 529, foreground, and at another moment other parts, in consequence of the oscillations of our attention, and of the associative flow of our ideas. But no matter how sharp the foreground reasons may be, or how imminently close to bursting through the dam and carrying the motor consequences their own way, the background, however dimly felt, is always there. And its presence, so long as the indecision actually lasts, serves as an effective check upon the irrevocable discharge. The deliberation may last for weeks or months, occupying at intervals the mind. The motives which yesterday seemed full of urgency and blood and life today feel strangely weak and pale and dead. But as little today as tomorrow is the question finally resolved. Something tells us that all this is provisional. That the weakened reasons will wax strong again, and the stronger weaken, that equilibrium is unreached. That testing our reasons, not obeying them, is still the order of the day, and that we must wait a while, patient or impatiently, until our mind is made up, for good and all. This inclining first to one then to another future, both of which we represent as possible, 
resembles the oscillations to and fro of a material body within the limits of its elasticity. There is inward strain, but no outward rapture. And this condition, plainly enough, is susceptible of indefinite continuance, as well in the physical mass as in the mind. If the elasticity give way, however, if the dam ever do break, and the currents burst the crust, vacillation is over and decision is irrevocably there. The decision may come in either of many modes. I will try briefly to sketch the most characteristic types of it, merely warning the reader that this is only an introspective account of symptoms and phenomena, and that all questions of causal agency, whether neural or spiritual, are relegated to a later page. The particular reasons for or against action are of course infinitely various in concrete cases. But certain motives are more or less constantly in play. One of these is impatience of the deliberative state. Or to express it otherwise, proneness to act or to decide merely because action and, page 530, decision are, as such, agreeable, and relieve the tension of doubt and hesitancy. Thus it comes that we will often take any course whatever which happens to be most vividly before our minds, at the moment when this impulse to decisive action becomes extreme. Against this impulse we have the dread of the irrevocable, which often engenders a type of character incapable of prompt and vigorous resolve, except perhaps when surprised into sudden activity. These two opposing motives twine round whatever other motives may be present at the moment when decision is imminent, and tend to precipitate or retard it. The conflict of these motives so far as they alone affect the matter of decision is a conflict as to when it shall occur. One says, now, the other says, not yet. Another constant component of the web of motivation is the impulse to persist in a decision once made. There is no more remarkable difference in human character than that between resolute and irresolute natures. Neither the physiological nor the psychical grounds of this difference have yet been analyzed. Its symptom is that whereas in the irresolute all decisions are provisional and liable to be reversed, in the resolute they are settled once for all and not disturbed again. Now into every one's deliberations the representation of one alternative will often enter with such sudden force as to carry the imagination with itself exclusively, and to produce an apparently settled decision in its own favor. These premature and spurious decisions are of course known to everyone. They often seem ridiculous in the light of the considerations that succeed them. But it cannot be denied that in the resolute type of character the accident that one of them has once been made does afterwards enter as a motive additional to the more genuine reasons why it should not be revoked, or if provisionally revoked. Why it should be made again. How many of us persist in a precipitate course which, but for a moment of heedlessness, we might never have entered upon, simply because we hate to change our mind. Five Types of Decision Turning now to the form of the decision itself, we may distinguish four chief types. The first may be called the reasonable type. It is that of those cases in which the arguments for and against a given course seem gradually and almost insensibly to settle themselves in the mind and to end by leaving a clear balance in favor of one alternative. Which alternative we then adopt without effort or constraint. Until this rational balancing of the books is consummated we have a calm feeling that the evidence is not yet all in, and this keeps action in suspense. But some day we wake with the sense that we see the thing rightly, that no new light will be thrown on the subject by farther delay, and that the matter had better be settled now. In this easy transition from doubt to assurance we seem to ourselves almost passive, the reasons which decide us appearing to flow in from the nature of things, and to owe nothing to our will. We have, however, a perfect sense of being free, in that we are devoid of any feeling of coercion. The conclusive reason for the decision in these cases usually is the discovery that we can refer the case to a class upon which we are accustomed to act unhesitatingly in a certain stereotyped way. It may be said in general that a great part of every deliberation consists in the turning over of all the possible modes of conceiving the doing or not doing of the act in point. The moment we hit upon a conception which lets us apply some principle of action which is a fixed and stable part of our ego, our state of doubt is at an end. Persons of authority, who have to make many decisions in the day, carry with them a set of heads of classification, each bearing its motor consequence, and under these they seek as far as possible to range each new emergency as it occurs. 
It is where the emergency belongs to a species without precedent, to which consequently no cut and dried maxim will apply, that we feel most at a loss, and are distressed at the indeterminateness of our task as soon, however. As we see our way to a familiar classification, we are at ease again. In action as in reasoning, then, the great thing is the quest of the right conception. The Concrete Dilemma, page 532, Moss do not come to us with labels gummed upon their backs. We may name them by many names. The wise man is he who succeeds in finding the name which suits the needs of the particular occasion best. A reasonable character is one who has a store of stable and worthy ends, and who does not decide about an action till he has calmly ascertained whether it be ministerial or detrimental to any one of these. In the next two types of decision, the final fiat occurs before the evidence is all in. It often happens that no paramount and authoritative reason for either course will come. Either seems a case of a good, and there is no umpire as to which good should yield its place to the other. We grow tired of long hesitation and inconclusiveness, and the hour may come when we feel that even a bad decision is better than no decision at all. Under these conditions it will often happen that some accidental circumstance, supervening at a particular movement upon our mental weariness, will upset the balance in the direction of one of the alternatives. To which then we feel ourselves committed, although an opposite accident at the same time might have produced the opposite result. In the second type of case our feeling is to a certain extent that of letting ourselves drift with a certain indifferent acquiescence in a direction accidentally determined from without, with the conviction that, after all, we might as well stand by this course as by the other, and that things are in any event sure to turn out sufficiently right. In the third type the determination seems equally accidental, but it comes from within, and not from without. If often happens, when the absence of imperative principle is perplexing and suspense distracting, that we find ourselves acting, as it were, automatically, and as if by a spontaneous discharge of our nerves. In the direction of one of the horns of the dilemma. But so exciting is this sense of motion after our intolerable pent-up state, that we eagerly throw ourselves into it. Forward now, we inwardly cry, though the heavens fall. This reckless and exultant ES, p. 533, pousal of an energy so little premeditated by us that we feel rather like passive spectators cheering on the display of some extraneous force than like voluntary agents, is a type of decision too abrupt and tumultuous to occur often in humdrum and cool-blooded natures. But it is probably frequent in persons of strong emotional endowment and unstable or vacillating character. And in men of the world-shaking type, the Napoleons, Luthers, etc. In whom tenacious passion combines with ebullient activity, when by any chance the passion's outlet has been damned by scruples or apprehensions, the resolution is probably often of this catastrophic kind. The flood breaks quite unexpectedly through the dam. That is should so often do so is quite sufficient to account for the tendency of these characters to a fatalistic mood of mind. And the fatalistic mood itself is sure to reinforce the strength of the energy just started on its exciting path of discharge. There is a fourth form of decision, which often ends deliberation as suddenly as the third form does. It comes when, in consequence of some outer experience or some inexplicable inward charge, we suddenly pass from the easy and careless to the sober and strenuous mood, or possibly the other way. The whole scale of values of our motives and impulses then undergoes a change like that which a change of the observer's level produces on a view. The most sobering possible agents are objects of grief and fear. When one of these affects us, all light fantastic notions lose their motive power, all solemn ones find theirs multiplied manifold. The consequence is an instant abandonment of the more trivial projects with which we had been dallying, and an instant practical acceptance of the more grim and earnest alternative which till then could not extort our mind's consent. All those, changes of heart, awakenings of conscience, etc., which make new men of so many of us, may be classed under this head. The character abruptly rises to another level, and deliberation comes to an immediate end, 477. P. 534, in the fifth and final type of decision, the feeling that the evidence is all in, 
and that reason has balanced the books, may be either present or absent. But in either case we feel, in deciding, as if we ourselves by our own willful act inclined the beam, in the former case by adding our living effort to the weight of the logical reason which, taken alone, seems powerless to make the act discharge. In the latter by a kind of creative contribution of something instead of a reason which does a reason's work. The slow dead heave of the will that is felt in these instances makes of them a class altogether different subjectively from all the three preceding classes. What the heave of the will betokens metaphysically, what the effort might lead us to infer about a willpower distinct from motives, are not matters that concern us yet. Subjectively and phenomenally, the feeling of effort, absent from the former decisions, accompanies these. Whether it be the dreary resignation for the sake of austere and naked duty of all sorts of rich mundane delights, or whether it be the heavy resolve that of two mutually exclusive trains of future fact, both sweet and good. And with no strictly objective or imperative principle of choice between them, one shall forevermore become impossible, while the other shall become reality, it is a desolate and acrid sort of act, an excursion into a lonesome moral wilderness. If examined closely, its chief difference from the three former cases appears to be that in those cases the mind at the moment of deciding on the triumphant alternative dropped the other one wholly or nearly out of sight. Whereas here both alternatives are steadily held in view, and in the very act of murdering the vanquished possibility the chooser realizes how much in that instant he is making himself lose. It is deliberately driving a thorn into one's flesh. And the sense of inward effort with which the act is accompanied is an element which sets the fourth type of decision in strong contrast with the previous three varieties, and makes of it an altogether peculiar sort of mental phenomenon. The immense majority of human decisions are decisions without effort. In comparatively few of them, in most people, does effort accompany the final act. We are, I think, misled into supposing that, p. 535, Effort is more frequent than it is, by the fact that during deliberation we so often have a feeling of how great an effort it would take to make a decision now. Later, after the decision has made itself with ease, we recollect this and erroneously suppose the effort also to have been made then. The existence of the effort as a phenomenal fact in our consciousness cannot of course be doubted or denied. Its significance, on the other hand, is a matter about which the gravest difference of opinion prevails. Questions as momentous as that of the very existence of spiritual causality, as vast as that of universal predestination or free will, depend on its interpretation. It therefore becomes essential that we study with some care the conditions under which the feeling of volitional effort is found. The feeling of effort. When, a while back, p. 526, I said that consciousness, or the neural process which goes with it, is in its very nature impulsive, I added in a note the proviso that it must be sufficiently intense. Now there are remarkable differences in the power of different sorts of consciousness to excite movement. The intensity of some feelings is practically apt to be below the discharging point, whilst that of others is apt to be above it. By practically apt, I mean apt under ordinary circumstances. These circumstances may be habitual inhibitions, like that comfortable feeling of the dolce far niente which gives to each and all of us a certain dose of laziness only to be overcome by the acuteness of the impulsive spur. Or they may consist in the native inertia, or internal resistance, of the motor centers themselves making explosion impossible until a certain inward tension has been reached and overpassed. These conditions may vary from one person to another and in the same person from time to time. The neural inertia may wax or wane, and the habitual inhibitions dwindle or augment. The intensity of particular thought processes and stimulations may also change independently, and particular paths of association grow more pervious or less so. There thus result great possibilities of alteration in the actual impulse. p. 536, Civ efficacy of particular motives compared with others. It is where the normally less efficacious motive becomes more efficacious and the normally more efficacious one less so that actions ordinarily effortless, or abstinences ordinarily easy, either become impossible or are effected, if at all, by the expenditure of effort. A little more description will make it plainer what these cases are. There is a certain normal ratio in the impulsive power of different sorts of motive, 
which characterizes what may be called ordinary healthiness of will, and which is departed from only at exceptional times or by exceptional individuals. The states of mind which normally possess the most impulsive quality are either those which represent objects of passion, appetite, or emotion, objects of instinctive reaction, in short, or they are feelings or ideas of pleasure or of pain or ideas which for any reason we have grown accustomed to obey so that the habit of reacting on them is ingrained, or finally, in comparison with ideas of remoter objects, they are ideas of objects present or near in space and time. Compared with these various objects, all far-off considerations, all highly abstract conceptions, unaccustomed reasons, and motives foreign to the instinctive history of the race, have little or no impulsive power. They prevail, when they ever do prevail, with effort, and the normal, as distinguished from the pathological, sphere of effort is thus found wherever non-instinctive motives to behavior are to rule the day. Healthiness of will moreover requires a certain amount of complication in the process which precedes the fiat or the act. Each stimulus or idea, at the same time that it wakens its own impulse, must arouse other ideas, associated and consequential, with their impulses, and action must follow, neither too slowly nor too rapidly. As the resultant of all the forces thus engaged. Even when the decision is very prompt, there is thus a sort of preliminary survey of the field and a vision of which course is best before the fiat comes. And where the will is healthy, the vision must be right, i.e. The motives must be on the whole in a normal, page 537, or not too unusual ratio to each other and the action must obey the vision's lead. Unhealthiness of will may thus come about in many ways. The action may follow the stimulus or idea too rapidly, leaving no time for the arousal of restraining associates, we then have a precipitate will. Or, although the associates may come, the ratio which the impulsive and inhibitive forces normally bear to each other may be distorted, and we then have a will which is perverse. The perversity, in turn, may be due to either of many causes, too much intensity, or too little, here, too much or too little inertia there, or elsewhere too much or too little inhibitory power. If we compare the outward symptoms of perversity together, they fall into two groups, in one of which normal actions are impossible, and in the other abnormal ones are irrepressible. Briefly, we may call them respectively the obstructed and the explosive will. It must be kept in mind, however, that since the resultant action is always due to the ratio between the obstructive and the explosive forces which are present, we never can tell by the mere outward symptoms to what elementary cause the perversion of a man's will may be due, whether to an increase of one component or a diminution of the other. One may grow explosive as readily by losing the usual breaks as by getting up more of the impulsive steam, and one may find things impossible as well through the enfeeblement of the original desire as through the advent of new lions in the path. As Dr. Clouston says, the driver may be so weak that he cannot control well-broken horses, or the horses may be so hard-mouthed that no driver can pull them up. In some concrete cases, whether of explosive or of obstructed will, it is difficult to tell whether the trouble is due to inhibitory or to impulsive change. Generally, however, we can make a plausible guess at the truth. The explosive will. There is a normal type of character, for example, in which impulses seem to discharge so promptly into movements that inhibitions get no time to arise. These are the P. 538, daredevil and mercurial temperaments, overflowing with animation, and fizzling with talk, which are so common in the Latin and Celtic races, and with which the cold-blooded and long-headed English character forms so marked a contrast. Monkeys these people seem to us, whilst we seem to them reptilian. It is quite impossible to judge, as between an obstructed and an explosive individual, which has the greatest sum of vital energy. An explosive Italian with good perception and intellect will cut a figure as a perfectly tremendous fellow, on an inward capital that could be tucked away inside of an obstructed Yankee and hardly let you know that it was there. He will be king of his company, sing all the songs and make all the speeches, lead the parties, carry out the practical jokes, kiss all the girls, fight the men, and, if need be, lead the forlorn hopes and enterprises. 
so that an onlooker would think he has more life in his little finger than can exist in the whole body of a correct judicious fellow. But the judicious fellow all the while may have all these possibilities and more besides, ready to break out in the same or even a more violent way, if only the brakes were taken off. It is the absence of scruples, of consequences, of considerations, the extraordinary simplification of each moment's mental outlook, that gives to the explosive individual such motor energy and ease. It need not be the greater intensity of any of his passions, motives, or thoughts. As mental evolution goes on, the complexity of human consciousness grows ever greater, and with it the multiplication of the inhibitions to which every impulse is exposed. But this predominance of inhibition has a bad as well as a good side. And if a man's impulses are in the main orderly as well as prompt, if he has courage to accept their consequences, and intellect to lead them to a successful end, he is all the better for his hair-trigger organization. And for not being sicklied o'er with the pale cast of thought. Many of the most successful military and revolutionary characters in history have belonged to this simple but quick-witted impulsive type. Problems come much harder to reflective and inhibitive minds. They can, it is true, solve much vaster problems, and they can avoid many a mistake to which the men of impulse are exposed. But when, p. 539, the latter do not make mistakes, or when they are always able to retrieve them, theirs is one of the most engaging and indispensable of human types. 478. In infancy, and in certain conditions of exhaustion as well as in peculiar pathological states, the inhibitory power may fail to arrest the explosions of the impulsive discharge. We have then an explosive temperament temporarily realized in an individual who at other times may be of a relatively obstructed type. I cannot do better here than copy a few pages from Dr. Clouston's excellent work Frowny Face 479. Take a child of six months, and there is absolutely no such brain power existent as mental inhibition, no desire or tendency is stopped by a mental act. At a year old the rudiments of the great faculty of self-control are clearly apparent in most children. They will resist the desire to seize the gas flame, they will not upset the mild jug, they will obey orders to sit still when they want to run about, all through a higher mental inhibition. But the power of control is just as gradual a development as the motions of the hands. Look at a more complicated act, that will be recognized by any competent physiologist to be automatic and beyond the control of any ordinary inhibitory power, e.g. Irritate and tease a child of one or two years sufficiently, and it will suddenly strike out at you. Suddenly strike at a man, and he will either perform an act of defense or offense, or both, quite automatically, and without power of controlling himself. Place a bright tempting toy before a child of a year, and it will be instantly appropriated. Place cold water before a man dying of thirst, and he will take and drink it without power of doing otherwise. X, page 540, Hostion of nervous energy always lessens the inhibitory power. Who is not conscious of this? Irritability is one manifestation of this. Many persons have so small a stock of reserve brain power, that most valuable of all brain qualities, that it is soon used up, and you see at once that they lose their power of self-control very soon. They are angels or demons just as they are fresh or tired. That surplus store of energy or resistive force which provides, in persons normally constituted, that moderate excesses in all directions shall do no great harm so long as they are not too often repeated, not being present in these people, overwork. Overdrinking, or small debauches leave them at the mercy of their morbid impulses without power of resistance. Woe to the man who uses up his surplus stock of brain inhibition too near the bitter end, or too often. The physiological word inhibition can be used synonymously with the psychological and ethical expression self-control, or with the will when exercised in certain directions. It is the characteristic of most forms of mental disease for self-control to be lost, but this loss is usually part of a general mental affection with melancholic, maniacal, demented, or delusional symptoms as the chief manifestation of the disease. There are other cases, not so numerous, where the loss of the power of inhibition is the chief and by far the most marked symptom. I shall call this form inhibitory insanity. 
Some of these cases have uncontrollable impulses to violence and destruction, others to homicide, others to suicide prompted by no depressed feelings, others to acts of animal gratification, satyriasis, nymphomania, erotomania, bestiality. Others to drinking too much alcohol, dipsomania, other towards setting things on fire, pyromania, others to stealing, kleptomania, and others towards immoralities of all sorts. The impulsive tendencies and morbid desires are innumerable in kind. Many of these varieties of insanity have been distinguished by distinct names. To dig up and eat dead bodies, necrophilism, to wander from home and throw off the restraints of society, planomania, to act like a wild beast, lycanthropia, etc. Action from impulse in all these directions may take place from a loss of controlling power in the higher regions of the brain, which the normal power of inhibition cannot control. The driver may be so weak that he cannot control well-broken horses, or the horses may be so hard-mouthed that no driver can pull them up. Both conditions may arise from purely cerebral disorder. Or may be reflex. The ego, the man, the will, may be non-existent for the time. The most perfect examples of this are murders done during somnambulism or epileptic unconsciousness, or acts done in the hypnotic state. There is no conscious desire to attain the object at all in such cases. In other cases there is consciousness and memory present, but no power of restraining action. The simplest example of this is where an imbecile or dement, seeing something glittering, appropriates it to himself, or when he commits indecent sexual acts. Through disease a previously sane and vigorous-minded person may get into the p. 541, same state. The motives that would lead other persons not to do such acts do not operate in such persons. I have known a man steal who said he had no intense longing for the article he appropriated at all, at least consciously, but his will was in abeyance, and he could not resist the ordinary desire of possession common to all human nature. It is not only those technically classed imbeciles and dements who exhibit this promptitude of impulse and tardiness of inhibition. Ask half the common drunkards you know why it is that they fall so often a prey to temptation, and they will say that most of the time they cannot tell. It is a sort of vertigo with them. Their nervous centers have become a sluice way pathologically unlocked by every passing conception of a bottle and a glass. They do not thirst for the beverage, the taste of it may even appear repugnant. And they perfectly foresee the morrow's remorse. But when they think of the liquor or see it, they find themselves preparing to drink, and do not stop themselves, and more than this they cannot say. Similarly a man may lead a life of incessant lovemaking or sexual indulgence, though what spurs him thereto seems rather to be suggestions and notions of possibility than any overweening strength in his affections or lusts. He may even be physically impotent all the while. The paths of natural, or it may be unnatural, impulse are so pervious in these characters that the slightest rise in the level of innervation produces an overflow. It is the condition recognized in pathology as irritable weakness. The phase known as nascency or latency is so short in the excitement of the neural tissues that there is no opportunity for strain or tension to accumulate within them. And the consequence is that with all the agitation and activity, the amount of real feeling engaged may be very small. The hysterical temperament is the playground par excellence of this unstable equilibrium. One of these subjects will be filled with what seems the most genuine and settled aversion to a certain line of conduct, and the very next instant follow the stirring of temptation and plunge in it up to the neck. Professor Rabot well gives the name of Le Regni de Caprices to the chapter in which he describes the hysterical temperament in his interesting little monograph, The Diseases of the Will. P. 542, disorderly and impulsive conduct may, on the other hand, come about where the neural tissues preserve their proper inward tone, and where the inhibitory power is normal or even unusually great. In such cases the strength of the impulsive idea is preternaturally exalted, and what would be for most people the passing suggestion of a possibility becomes a gnawing, craving urgency to act. Works on insanity are full of examples of these morbid insistent ideas, in obstinately struggling against which the unfortunate victim's soul often sweats with agony, ere at last it gets swept away. 
One instance will stand for many, M. Ribot quotes it from Kamal, Frowny Face 480. Glenadal, having lost his father in infancy, was brought up by his mother, whom he adored. At sixteen, his character, till then good and docile, changed. He became gloomy and taciturn. Pressed with questions by his mother, he decided at last to make a confession. To you, said he, I owe everything, I love you with all my soul, yet for some time past an incessant idea drives me to kill you. Prevent so terrible a misfortune from happening, in case some day the temptation should overpower me, allow me to enlist. Notwithstanding pressing solicitations, he was firm in his resolve, went off, and was a good soldier. Still a secret impulse stimulated him without cessation to desert in order to come home and kill his mother. At the end of his term of service the idea was as strong as on the first day. He enlisted for another term. The murderous instinct persisted, but substituted another victim. He no longer thought of killing his mother, the horrible impulse pointed day and night towards his sister-in-law. In order to resist the second impulse, he condemned himself to perpetual exile. At this time one of his old neighbors arrived in the regiment. Glenadal confesses all his trouble. Be at rest, said the other. Your crime is impossible. Your sister-in-law has just died. At these words Glenadal rises like a delivered captive. Joy fills his heart. He travels to the home of his childhood, unvisited for so many years. But as he arrives he sees his sister-in-law living. He gives a cry, and the terrible impulse seizes him again as a prey. That very evening he makes his brother tie him fast. Take a solid rope, bind me like a wolf in the barn, and go and tell Dr. Kamel. From him he got admission to an insane asylum. The evening before his entrance he wrote to the director of the establishment, Sir, I am to become an inmate of your house. I shall behave there as if I were in the regiment. You will think me cured. At moments perhaps I shall pretend to be so. Never believe me. Never let me out on any pretext. If I beg to be released, double, page 543, your watchfulness, the only use I shall make of my liberty will be to commit a crime which I abhor. 481. The craving for drink in real dipsomaniacs, or for opium or chloral in those subjugated, is of a strength of which normal persons can form no conception. Were a keg of rum in one corner of a room and were a cannon constantly discharging balls between me and it, I could not refrain from passing before that cannon in order to get the rum. If a bottle of brandy stood at one hand and the pit of hell yawned at the other, and I were convinced that I should be pushed in as sure as I took one glass, I could not refrain such statements abound in dipsomaniac's mouths. Dar. Mussey of Cincinnati relates this case. A few years ago a tripler was put into an almshouse in this state. Within a few days he had devised various expedients to procure rum, but failed. At length, however, he hit upon one which was successful. He went into the woodyard of the establishment, placed one hand upon the block, and with an axe in the other, struck it off at a single blow. With the stump raised and streaming he ran into the house and cried, Get some rum. Get some rum. My hand is off. In the confusion and bustle of the occasion a bowl of rum was brought, into which he plunged the bleeding member of his body, then raising the bowl to his mouth, drank freely, and exultingly exclaimed, Now I am satisfied. Dr. J. E. Turner tells of a man who, while under treatment for inebriety, during four weeks secretly drank the alcohol from six jars containing morbid specimens. On asking him why he had committed this loathsome act, he replied, Sir, it is as impossible for me to control this diseased appetite as it is for me to control the pulsations of my heart. 482. The passion of love may be called a monomania to which all of us are subject, however otherwise sane. It can coexist with contempt and even hatred for the object which inspires it, and whilst it lasts the whole life of the man is altered by its presence. Alfieri thus describes the struggles of his unusually powerful inhibitive power with his abnormally excited impulses toward a certain lady. Contemptible in my own eyes, I fell into such a state of melancholy as would, 
if long continued. Inevitably have led to insanity or p. 544, death. I continued to wear my disgraceful fetters till towards the end of January, 1775, when my rage, which had hitherto so often been restrained within bounds, broke forth with the greatest violence. On returning one evening from the opera, the most insipid and tiresome amusement in Italy, where I had passed several hours in the box of the woman who was by turns the object of my antipathy and my love. I took the firm determination of emancipating myself forever from her yoke. Experience had taught me that flight, so far from enabling me to persevere in my resolutions, tended on the contrary to weaken and destroy them. I was inclined therefore to subject myself to a still more severe trial. Imagining from the obstinacy and peculiarity of my character that I should succeed most certainly by the adoption of such measures as would compel me to make the greatest efforts. I determined never to leave the house, which, as I have already said, was exactly opposite that of the lady. To gaze at her windows, to see her go in and out every day, to listen to the sound of her voice, though firmly resolved that no advances on her part, either direct or indirect, no tender remembrances nor in short any other means which might be employed, should ever again tempt me to a revival of our friendship. I was determined to die or liberate myself from my disgraceful thraldom. In order to give stability to my purpose, and to render it impossible for me to waver without the imputation of dishonor, I communicated my determination to one of my friends, who was greatly attached to me, and whom I highly esteemed. He had lamented the state of mind into which I had fallen, but not wishing to give countenance to my conduct, and seeing the impossibility of inducing me to abandon it, he had for some time ceased to visit at my house. In the few lines which I addressed to him, I briefly stated the resolution I had adopted, and as a pledge of my constancy I sent him a long tress of my ugly red hair. I had purposely caused it to be cut off in order to prevent my going out, as no one but clowns and sailors then appeared in public with short hair. I concluded my billet by conjuring him to strengthen and aid my fortitude by his presence and example. Isolated in this manner in my own house, I prohibited all species of intercourse, and passed the first fifteen days in uttering the most frightful lamentations and groans. Some of my friends came to visit me, and appeared to commiserate my situation, perhaps because I did not myself complain, but my figure and whole appearance bespoke my sufferings. Wishing to read something I had recourse to the gazettes, whole pages of which I frequently ran over without understanding a single word. I passed more than two months till the end of March 1775, in a state bordering on frenzy. But about this time a new idea darted into my mind, which tended to assuage my melancholy. This was the idea of poetical composition, at which Alfieri describes his first attempts, made under these diseased circumstances, and goes on. P. 545, the only good that occurred to me from this whim was that of gradually detaching me from love, and of awakening my reason which had so long lain dormant. I no longer found it necessary to cause myself to be tied with cords to a chair, in order to prevent me from leaving my house and returning to that of my lady. This had been one of the expedients I devised to render myself wise by force. The cords were concealed under a large mantle in which I was enveloped, and only one hand remained at liberty. Of all those who came to see me, not one suspected I was bound down in this manner. I remained in this situation for whole hours. Elias, who was my jailer, was alone entrusted with the secret. He always liberated me, as he had been enjoined, whenever the paroxysms of my rage subsided. Of all the whimsical methods which I employed, however, the most curious was that of appearing in masquerade at the theatre towards the end of the carnival. Habited as Apollo, I ventured to present myself with a lyre, on which I played as well as I was able and sang some bad verses of my own composing. Such effrontery was diametrically opposite to my natural character. The only excuse I can offer for such scenes was my inability to resist an imperious passion. I felt that it was necessary to place an insuperable barrier between its object and me. And I saw that the strongest of all was the shame to which I should expose myself by renewing an attachment which I had so publicly turned into ridicule. 483. Often the insistent idea is of a trivial sort, 
but it may wear the patient's life out. His hands feel dirty, they must be washed. He knows they are not dirty, yet to get rid of the teasing idea he washes them. The idea, however, returns in a moment, and the unfortunate victim, who is not in the least deluded intellectually, will end by spending the whole day at the wash stand. Or his clothes are not rightly put on. And to banish the thought he takes them off and puts them on again, till his toilet consumes two or three hours of time. Most people have the potentiality of this disease. To few has it not happened to conceive, after getting into bed, that they may have forgotten to lock the front door, or to turn out the entry gas. And few of us have not on some occasion got up to repeat the performance, less because they believed in the reality of its omission than because only so could they banish the worrying doubt and get to sleep. 484. Page 546, The Obstructed Will. In striking contrast with the cases in which inhibition is insufficient or impulsion in excess are those in which impulsion is insufficient or inhibition of in excess. We all know the condition described on page 404 of volume. I, in which the mind for a few moments seems to lose its focusing power and to be unable to rally its attention to any determinate thing. At such times we sit blankly staring and do nothing. The objects of consciousness fail to touch the quick or break the skin. They are there, but do not reach the level of effectiveness. This state of non-efficacious presence is the normal condition of some objects, in all of us. Great fatigue or exhaustion may make it the condition of almost all objects, and an apathy resembling that then brought about is recognized in asylums under the name of abulia as a symptom of mental disease. The healthy state of the will requires, as aforesaid, both that vision should be right and that action should obey its lead. But in the morbid condition in question the vision may be wholly unaffected, and the intellect clear, and yet the act either fails to follow or follow in some other way. Video miliora provoke, deteriora sequor, is the classic expression of the latter condition of mind. The former it is to which the name abulia peculiarly applies. The patients, says Goyce Lane, are able to will inwardly, mentally, according to the dictates of reason. They experience the desire to act, but they are powerless to act as they should. Their will cannot overpass certain limits, one would say that the force of action within them is blocked up, the eye will does not transform itself into impulsive volition, into active determination. Some of these patients wonder themselves at the impotence with which their will is smitten. If you abandon them to themselves, they pass whole days in their bed or on a chair. If one speaks to them or excites them, they express themselves properly though briefly, and judge of things pretty well. 485. In Chapter 21, as will be remembered, it was said that the sentiment of reality with which an object appealed to the mind is proportionate, amongst other things, to its efficacy as a stimulus to the will. Here we get the p. 547, obverse side of the truth. Those ideas, objects, considerations, which, in these lethargic states, fail to get to the will, fail to draw blood, seem, in so far forth, distant and unreal. The connection of the reality of things with their effectiveness as motives is a tale that has never yet been fully told. The moral tragedy of human life comes almost wholly from the fact that the link is ruptured which normally should hold between vision of the truth and action, and that this pungent sense of effective reality will not attach to certain ideas. Men do not differ so much in their mere feelings and conceptions. Their notions of possibility and their ideals are not as far apart as might be argued from their differing fates. No class of them have better sentiments or feel more constantly the difference between the higher and the lower path in life than the hopeless failures, the sentimentalists, the drunkards, the schemers, the deadbeats. Whose life is one long contradiction between knowledge and action, and who, with full command of theory, never get to holding their limp characters erect. No one eats of the fruit of the tree of knowledge as they do, as far as moral insight goes, in comparison with them, the orderly and prosperous Philistines whom they scandalize are sucking babes. And yet their moral knowledge, always their grumbling and rumbling in the background, discerning, commenting, protesting, longing, half-resolving, never wholly resolves, never gets its voice out of the minor into the major key. 
or its speech out of the subjunctive into the imperative mood, never breaks the spell, never takes the helm into its hands. In such characters as Rousseau and Ristiff it would seem as if the lower motives had all the impulsive efficacy in their hands. Like trains with the right of way, they retain exclusive possession of the track. The more ideal motives exist alongside of them in profusion, but they never get switched on. And the man's conduct is no more influenced by them than an express train is influenced by a wafer standing by the roadside and calling to be taken aboard. They are an inert accompaniment to the end of time, and the consciousness of inward hollowness that accrues from habitually seeing the better only to do the worse, is one of, p. 548, the saddest feelings one can bear with him through this veil of tears. We now see at one view when it is that effort complicates volition. It does so whenever a rarer and more ideal impulse is called upon to neutralize others of a more instinctive and habitual kind, it does so whenever strongly explosive tendencies are checked, or strongly obstructive conditions overcome. The aim bien ne, the child of the sunshine, at whose birth the fairies made their gifts, does not need much of it in his life. The hero and the neurotic subject, on the other hand, do. Now our spontaneous way of conceiving the effort, under all these circumstances, is as an active force adding its strength to that of the motives which ultimately prevail. When outer forces impinge upon a body, we say that the resultant motion is in the line of least resistance, or of greatest traction. But it is a curious fact that our spontaneous language never speaks of volition with effort in this way. Of course if we proceed a priori and define the line of least resistance as the line that is followed, the physical law must also hold good in the mental sphere. But we feel, in all hard cases of volition, as if the line taken, when the rarer and more ideal motives prevail, were the line of greater resistance, and as if the line of coarser motivation were the more pervious and easy one. Even at the moment when we refuse to follow it. He who under the surgeon's knife represses cries of pain, or he who exposes himself to social obloquy for duty's sake, feels as if he were following the line of greatest temporary resistance. He speaks of conquering and overcoming his impulses and temptations. But the sluggard, the drunkard, the coward, never talk of their conduct in that way or say they resist their energy, overcome their sobriety, conquer their courage, and so forth. If in general we class all springs of action as propensities on the one hand and ideals on the other, the sensualist never says of his behavior that it results from a victory over his ideals. But the moralist always speaks of his as a victory over his propensities. The sensualist uses terms of inactivity, says he forgets his ideals, is deaf to, page 549, duty, and so forth. Which terms seem to imply that the ideal motives per se can be annulled without energy or effort, and that the strongest mere traction lies in the line of the propensities. The ideal impulse appears, in comparison with this, a still small voice which must be artificially reinforced to prevail. Effort is what reinforces it, making things seem as if, while the force of propensity were essentially fixed quantity, the ideal force might be of various amount. But what determines the amount of the effort when, by its aid, an ideal motive becomes victorious over a great sensual resistance? The very greatness of the resistance itself. If the sensual propensity is small, the effort is small. The latter is made great by the presence of a great antagonist to overcome. And if a brief definition of ideal or moral action were required, none could be given which would better fit the appearances than this, it is action in the line of the greatest resistance. The facts may be most briefly symbolized thus, P standing for the propensity, I for the ideal impulse, and E for the effort. I per se less than P. I plus E greater than P. In other words, if E adds itself to I, P immediately offers the least resistance, and motion occurs in spite of it. But the E does not seem to form an integral part of the I. It appears adventitious and indeterminate in advance. We can make more or less as we please, and if we make enough we can convert the greatest mental resistance into the least. Such, at least, is the impression which the facts spontaneously produce upon us. But we will not discuss the truth of this impression at present, let us rather continue our descriptive detail. Pleasure and pain as springs of action. 
Objects and thoughts of objects start our action, but the pleasures and pains which action brings modify its course and regulate it, and later the thoughts of the pleasures and the pains acquire themselves impulsive and in, page 550, hibitive power. Not that the thought of a pleasure need be itself a pleasure, usually it is the reverse, nesen magir dolor, as Dante says, and not that the thought of pain need be a pain, for, as Homer says, griefs are often afterwards an entertainment. But as present pleasures are tremendous reinforcers, and present pains tremendous inhibitors of whatever action leads to them, so the thoughts of pleasures and pains take rank amongst the thoughts which have most impulsive and inhibitive power. The precise relation which these thoughts hold to other thoughts is thus a matter demanding some attention. If a movement feels agreeable, we repeat and repeat it as long as the pleasure lasts. If it hurts us, our muscular contractions at the instant stop. So complete is the inhibition is this latter case that it is almost impossible for a man to cut or mutilate himself slowly and deliberately, his hand invincibly refusing to bring on the pain. And there are many pleasures which, when once we have begun to taste them, make it all but obligatory to keep up the activity to which they are due. So widespread and searching is this influence of pleasures and pains upon our movements that a premature philosophy has decided that these are our only spurs to action, and that wherever they seem to be absent. It is only because they are so far on among the remoter images that prompt the action that they are overlooked. This is a great mistake, however. Important as is the influence of pleasures and pains upon our movements, they are far from being our only stimuli. With the manifestations of instinct and emotional expression, for example, they have absolutely nothing to do. Who smiles for the pleasure of the smiling, or frowns for the pleasure of the frown? Who blushes to escape the discomfort of not blushing? Or who in anger, grief, or fear is actuated to the movements which he makes by the pleasures which they yield? In all these cases the movements are discharged fatally by the vis a turgohitch the stimulus exerts upon a nervous system framed to respond in just that way. The objects of our rage, love, or terror, the occasions of our tears and smiles, p. 551, whether they be present to our senses, or whether they be merely represented in idea, have this peculiar sort of impulsive power. The impulsive quality of mental states is an attribute behind which we cannot go. Some states of mind have more of it than others, some have it in this direction, and some in that. Feelings of pleasure and pain have it, and perceptions and imaginations of fact have it, but neither have it exclusively or peculiarly. It is of the essence of all consciousness, or of the neural process which underlies it, to instigate movement of some sort. That with one creature and object it should be of one sort, with others of another sort, is a problem for evolutionary history to explain. However the actual impulsions may have arisen, they must now be described as they exist. And those persons obey a curiously narrow teleological superstition who think themselves bound to interpret them in every instance as effects of the secret solicitancy of pleasure and repugnancy of pain. 486. P. 552, it might be that to reflection such a narrow teleology would justify itself, that pleasures and pains might seem the only comprehensible and reasonable motives for action, the only motives on which we ought to act. That is an ethical proposition, in favor of which a good deal may be said. But it is not a psychological proposition, and nothing follows from it as to the motives upon which as a matter of fact we do act. These motives are supplied by innumerable objects, which innervate our voluntary muscles by a process as automatic as that by which they light a fever in our breasts. If the thought of pleasure can impel to action, surely other thoughts may. Experience only can decide which thoughts do. The chapters on instinct and emotion have shown us that their name is legion, and with this verdict we ought to remain contented, and not seek an illusory simplification at the cost of half the facts. If in these our first acts pleasures and pains bear no part, as little do they bear in our last acts, or those artificially acquired performances which have become habitual. p. 553, all the daily routine of life, our dressing and undressing, the coming and going from our work or carrying through of its various operations, is utterly without mental reference to pleasure and pain, except under rarely realized conditions. It is ideal motor action. 
as I do not breathe for the pleasure of the breathing, but simply find that I am breathing, so I do not write for the pleasure of the writing, but simply because I have once begun. And being in a state of intellectual excitement which keeps venting itself in that way, find that I am writing still. Who will pretend that when he idly fingers his knife handle at the table, it is for the sake of any pleasure which it gives him, or pain which he thereby avoids. We do all these things because at the moment we cannot help it. Our nervous systems are so shaped that they overflow in just that way, and for many of our idle or purely nervous and fidgety performances we can assign absolutely no reason at all. Or what shall be said of a shy and unsociable man who receives point-blank an invitation to a small party? The thing is to him an abomination. But your presence exerts a compulsion on him, he can think of no excuse, and so says yes, cursing himself the while for what he does. He is unusually sway compass who does not every week of his life fall into some such blundering act as this. Such instances of voluntas in vita show not only that our acts cannot all be conceived as effects of represented pleasure, but that they cannot even be classed as cases of represented good. The class, goods, contains many more generally influential motives to action than the class, pleasants. Pleasures often attract us only because we deem them goods. Mr. Spencer, e.g., urges us to court pleasures for their influence upon health, which comes to us as a good. But almost as little as under the form of pleasures do our acts invariably appear to us under the form of goods. All diseased impulses and pathological fixed ideas are instances to the contrary. It is the very badness of the act that gives it then its vertiginous fascination. Remove the prohibition, and the attraction stops. In my university days a student threw himself from an upper entry window of one of the college buildings and was nearly killed. Another, P. 554, student, a friend of my own, had to pass the window daily in coming and going from his room, and experienced a dreadful temptation to imitate the deed. Being a Catholic, he told his director, who said, All right. If you must, you must, and added, Go ahead and do it, thereby instantly quenching his desire. This director knew how to minister to a mind diseased. But we need not go to minds diseased for examples of the occasional tempting power of simple badness and unpleasantness as such. Everyone who has a wound or hurt anywhere, a sore tooth, e.g., will ever and anon press it just to bring out the pain. If we are near a new sort of stink, we must sniff it again just to verify once more how bad it is. This very day I have been repeating over and over to myself a verbal jingle whose mawkish silliness was the secret of its haunting power. I loathed yet could not banish it. Believers in the pleasure and pain theory must thus, if they are candid, make large exceptions in the application of their creed. Action from fixed ideas is accordingly a terrible stumbling block to the candid Professor Bain. Ideas have in his psychology no impulsive but only a guiding function, whilst the proper stimulus of the will, namely, some variety of pleasure and pain, is needed to give the impetus. The intellectual link is not sufficient for causing the deed to rise at the back of the idea, except in case of an pide fix. But, should any pleasure spring up or be continued, by performing an action that we clearly conceive, the causation is then complete, both the directing and the moving powers are present. 487. Pleasures and pains are for Professor Bain the genuine impulses of the will. 488. Without an antecedent of pleasurable or painful feeling, actual or ideal, primary or derivative, the will cannot be stimulated. Fru, p. 555, all the disguises that wrap up what we call motives, something of one or other of these two grand conditions can be detected. 489. Accordingly, where Professor Bain finds an exception to this rule, he refuses to call the phenomenon a genuinely voluntary impulse. The exceptions, he admits, are those furnished by never-dying spontaneity, habits, and fixed ideas. 490. Fixed ideas, traverse the proper course of volition. 491. Disinterested impulses are wholly distinct from the attainment of pleasure and the avoidance of pain. The theory of disinterested action, is the only form that I can conceive it, 
supposes that the action of the will and the attainment of happiness do not square throughout. 492. Sympathy has this in common with the fixed idea, that is clashes with the regular outgoings of the will in favor of our pleasures. 493. Professor Bain thus admits all the essential facts. Pleasure and pain are motives of only part of our activity. But he prefers to give to that part of the activity exclusively which these feelings prompt the name of regular outgoings and genuine impulses of the will, 494, and to treat all the rest as mere paradoxes and anomalies. Of which nothing rational can be said. This amounts to taking one species of a genus, calling it alone by the generic name, and ordering the other coordinate species to find what names they may. At bottom this is only verbal play. How much more conducive to clearness and insight it is to take the genus springs of action and treat it as a whole, and then to distinguish within it the species, pleasure and pain, from whatever other species may be found. There is, it is true, a complication in the relation of pleasure to action, which partly excuses those who make it the exclusive spur. This complication deserves some notice at our hands. An impulse which discharges itself immediately is generally quite neutral as regards pleasure or pain, the breath, page 556, ing impulse, for example. If such an impulse is arrested, however, by an extrinsic force, a great feeling of uneasiness is produced, for instance, the dyspnea of asthma. And in proportion as the arresting force is then overcome, relief accrues, as when we draw a breath again after the asthma subsides. The relief is a pleasure and the uneasiness a pain. And thus it happens that round all our impulses, merely as such, there twine, as it were, secondary possibilities of pleasant and painful feeling, involved in the manner in which the act is allowed to occur. These pleasures and pains of achievement, discharge, or fruition exist, no matter what the original spring of action be. We are glad when we have successfully got ourselves out of a danger, though the thought of the gladness was surely not what suggested to us to escape. To have compassed the steps towards a proposed sensual indulgence also makes us glad, and this gladness is a pleasure additional to the pleasure originally proposed. On the other hand, we are chagrined and displeased when any activity, however investigated, is hindered whilst in process of actual discharge. We are uneasy till the discharge starts up again. And this is just as true when the action is neutral, or has nothing but pain in view as its result, as when it was undertaken for pleasure's express sake. The moth is probably as annoyed if hindered from getting into the lamp flame as the roué is if interrupted in his debauch. And we are chagrined if prevented from doing some quite unimportant act which would have given us no noticeable pleasure if done, merely because the prevention itself is disagreeable. Let us now call the pleasure for the sake of which the act may be done the pursued pleasure. It follows that, even when no pleasure is pursued by an act, the act itself may be the pleasantest line of conduct when once the impulse has begun. On account of the incidental pleasure which then attends its successful achievement and the pain which would come of interruption. A pleasant act and an act pursuing a pleasure are in themselves, however, two perfectly distinct conceptions, though they coalesce in one concrete phenomenon whenever a pleasure is deliberately pursued. I cannot help thinking that it is the confusion of pursued pleasure, page 557, with mere pleasure of achievement which makes the pleasure theory of action so plausible to the ordinary mind. We feel an impulse, no matter whence derived. We proceed to act, if hindered, we feel displeasure, and if successful, relief. Action in the line of the present impulse is always for the time being the pleasant course. And the ordinary hedonist expresses this fact by saying that we act for the sake of the pleasantness involved. But who does not see that for this sort of pleasure to be possible, the impulse must be there already as an independent fact. The pleasure of successful performance is the result of the impulse, not its cause. You cannot have your pleasure of achievement unless you have managed to get your impulse under headway beforehand by some previous means. It is true that on special occasions, so complex is the human mind, the pleasure of achievement may itself become a pursued pleasure, and these cases form another point on which the pleasure theory is apt to rally. Take a football game or a fox hunt. 
who in cold blood wants the fox for its own sake, or cares whether the ball be at this goal or that. We know, however, by experience, that if we can once rouse a certain impulsive excitement in ourselves, whether to overtake the fox, or to get the ball to one particular goal, the successful venting of it over the counteracting checks will fill us with exceeding joy. We therefore get ourselves deliberately and artificially into the hot impulsive state. It takes the presence of various instinct arousing conditions to excite it, but little by little, once we are in the field, it reaches its paroxysm. And we reap the reward of our exertions in that pleasure of successful achievement which, far more than the dead fox or the Golgot ball, was the object we originally pursued. So it often is with duties. Lots of actions are done with heaviness all through, and not till they are completed does pleasure emerge, in the joy of being done with them. Like Hamlet we say of each such successive task. A cursed spite. That ever I was born to set it right. And then we often add to the original impulse that set us on, this additional one, that, we shall feel so glad when, page 558, well through with it, that thought also having its impulsive spur. But because a pleasure of achievement can thus become a pursued pleasure upon occasion, it does not follow that everywhere and always that pleasure must be what is pursued. This, however, is what the pleasure philosophers seem to suppose. As well might they suppose, because no steamer can go to sea without incidentally consuming coal, and because some steamers may occasionally go to sea to try their coal. That therefore no steamer can go to sea for any other motive than that of coal consumption. 495. As we need not act for the sake of gaining the pleasure of achievement, no neither need we act for the sake of escaping the uneasiness of arrest. This uneasiness is altogether due to the fact that the act is already tending to occur on other grounds. And these original grounds are what impel to its continuance, even though the uneasiness of the arrest may upon occasion add to their impulsive power. To conclude, I am far from denying the exceeding prominence and importance of the part which pleasures and pains, both felt and represented, play in the motivation of our conduct. But I must insist that it is no exclusive part, and that coordinately with these mental object innumerable others have an exactly similar impulsive and inhibitive power. 496. If one must have a single name for the condition upon which the impulsive and inhibitive quality of objects depends, one had better call it their interest. The interest, p. 559, ing, is a title which covers not only the pleasant and the painful, but also the morbidly fascinating, the tediously haunting, and even the simply habitual, inasmuch as the attention usually travels on habitual lines. And what we attend to and what interests us are synonymous terms. It seems as if we ought to look for the secret of an idea's impulsiveness, not in any peculiar relations which it may have with paths of motor discharge, for all ideas have relations with some such paths, but rather in a preliminary phenomenon. The urgency, namely, with which it is able to compel attention and dominate in consciousness. Let it once so dominate, let no other ideas succeed in displacing it, and whatever motor effects belong to it by nature will inevitably occur, its impulsion, in short, will be given to boot, and will manifest itself as a matter of course. This is what we have seen in instinct, in emotion, in common ideomotor action, in hypnotic suggestion, in morbid impulsion, and in voluntas in vita, the impelling idea is simply the one which possesses the attention. It is the same where pleasure and pain are the motor spurs, they drive other thoughts from consciousness at the same time that they instigate their own characteristic, volitional, effects. And this is also what happens at the moment of the fiat, in all the five types of decision which we have described. In short, one does not see any case in which the steadfast occupancy of consciousness does not appear to be the prime condition of impulsive power. It is still more obviously the prime condition of inhibitive power. What checks our impulses is the mere thinking of reasons to the contrary, it is their bare presence to the mind which gives the veto, and makes acts, otherwise seductive, impossible to perform. If we could only forget our scruples, our doubts, our fears, what exultant energy we should for a while display. Will is a relation between the mind and its ideas. In closing in, therefore, after all these preliminaries, 
upon the more intimate nature of the volitional process, we find ourselves driven more and more exclusively to consider the conditions which make ideas prevail in the mind. p. 560, with the prevalence, once there is a fact, of the motive idea the psychology of volition properly stops. The movements which ensue are exclusively physiological phenomena, following according to physiological laws upon the neuro events to which the idea corresponds. The willing terminates with the prevalence of the idea. And whether the act then follows or not is a matter quite immaterial, so far as the willing itself goes. I will to write, and the act follows. I will to sneeze, and it does not. I will that the distant table slide over the floor towards me. It also does not. My willing representation can no more instigate my sneezing center than it can instigate the table to activity. But in both cases it is as true and good willing as it was when I willed to write. 497. In a word, volition is a psychic or moral fact pure and simple, and is absolutely completed when the stable state of the idea is there. The supervention of motion is a supernumerary phenomenon depending on executive ganglia whose function lies outside the mind. In St. Vitus' dance, in locomotor ataxy, the representation of a movement and the consent to it take place normally. But the inferior executive centers are deranged, and although the ideas discharge them, they do not discharge them so as to reproduce the precise sensations anticipated. In aphasia the patient has an image of certain words which he wishes to utter, but when he opens his mouth he hears himself making quite unintended sounds. This may fill him with rage and despair, which passions only show how, p. 561, intact his will remains. Paralysis only goes a step farther. The associated mechanism is not only deranged but altogether broken through. The volition occurs, but the hand remains as still as the table. The paralytic is made aware of this by the absence of the expected change in his afferent sensations. He tries harder, i.e., he mentally frames the sensation of muscular effort, with consent that it shall occur. It does so, he frowns, he heaves his chest, he clinches his other fist, but the palsied arm lies passive as before. 498. We thus find that we reach the heart of our inquiry into volition when we ask by what process it is that the thought of any given objects comes to prevail stably in the mind. Where thoughts prevail without effort, we have sufficiently studied in the several chapters on sensation, association, and attention, the laws of their advent before consciousness and of their stay. We will not go over that ground again, for we know that interest and association are the words, let their worth be what it may, on which our explanations must perforce rely. Where, on the other hand, the prevalence of the thought is accompanied by the phenomenon of effort, the case is much less clear. Already in the chapter on attention we postpone the final consideration of voluntary attention with effort to a later place. We have now brought things to a point at which we see that attention with effort is all that any case of volition implies. The essential achievement of the will, in short, when it is most voluntary, is to attend to a difficult object and hold it fast before the mind. The so doing is the fiat. And it is a mere physiological incident that when the object is thus attended to, immediate motor consequences should ensue. A resolve, whose contemplated motor consequences are not to ensue until some possibly far distant future condition shall have been fulfilled, involves all the psychic elements of a motor fiat except the word now. And it is the same with many of, page 562, our purely theoretic beliefs. We saw in effect in the appropriate chapter, how in the last resort belief means only a peculiar sort of occupancy of the mind, and relation to the self felt in the thing believed. And we know in the case of many beliefs how constant an effort of the attention is required to keep them in this situation and protect them from displacement by contradictory ideas, 499, compare above, page 321. Effort of attention is thus the essential phenomenon of will, 500, every reader must know by his own experience that this is so, for every reader must have felt some fiery passion's grasp. What constitutes the difficulty for a man laboring under an unwise passion of acting as if the passion, page 563, were unwise? Certainly there is no physical difficulty. 
It is as easy physically to avoid a fight as to begin one, to pocket one's money as to squander it on one's cupidities, to walk away from as towards a coquette's door. The difficulty is mental. It is that of getting the idea of the wise action to stay before our mind at all. When any strong emotional state whatever is upon us the tendency is for no images but such as are congruous with it to come up. If others by chance offer themselves, they are instantly smothered and crowded out. If we be joyous, we cannot keep thinking of those uncertainties and risks of failure which abound upon our path. If lugubrious, we cannot think of new triumphs, travels, loves, and joys, nor if vengeful, of our oppressor's community of nature with ourselves. The cooling advice which we get from others when the fever fit is on us is the most jarring and exasperating thing in life. Reply we cannot, so we get angry. For by a sort of self-preserving instinct which our passion has, it feels that these chill objects, if they once but gain a lodgment, will work and work until they have frozen the very vital spark from out of all our mood and brought our airy castles in ruin to the ground. Such is the inevitable effect of reasonable ideas over others, if they can once get a quiet hearing, and passion's cue accordingly is always and everywhere to prevent their still small voice from being heard at all. Let me not think of that. Don't speak to me of that. This is the sudden cry of all those who in a passion perceive some sobering considerations about to check them in mid-career. Hoek tibi erit genuoletti, we feel. There is something so icy in this cold water bath, something which seems so hostile to the movement of our life, so purely negative, in reason, when she lays her corpse-like finger on our heart and says, Halt. Give up. Leave off. Go back. Sit down, that it is no wonder that to most men the steadying influence seems, for the time being, a very minister of death. The strong-willed man, however, is the man who hears the still small voice unflinchingly, and who, when the death-bringing consideration comes, looks at its face, consents to its presence, clings to it, affirms it, and holds it fast. In spite of the host of exciting mental images which, p. 564, rise in revolt against it and would expel it from the mind. Sustained in this way by a resolute effort of attention, the difficult object ere long begins to call up its own congruers and associates and ends by changing the disposition of the man's consciousness altogether. And with his consciousness, his action changes, for the new object, once stably in possession of the field of his thoughts, infallibly produces its own motor effects. The difficulty lies in the gaining possession of that field. Though the spontaneous drift of thought is all the other way, the attention must be kept strained on that one object until at last it grows, so as to maintain itself before the mind with ease. This strain of the attention is the fundamental act of will. And the will's work is in most cases practically ended when the bare presence to our thought of the naturally unwelcome object has been secured. For the mysterious tie between the thought and the motor centers next comes into play, and, in a way which we cannot even guess at, the obedience of the bodily organs follows as a matter of course. In all this one sees how the immediate point of application of the volitional effort lies exclusively in the mental world. The whole drama is a mental drama. The whole difficulty is a mental difficulty, a difficulty with an object of our thought. If I may use the word idea without suggesting associationist or herbartian fables, I will say that it is an idea to which our will applies itself, an idea which if we let it got would slip away, but which we will not let go. Consent to the idea's undivided presence, this is effort's sole achievement. Its only function is to get this feeling of consent into the mind. And for this there is but one way. The idea to be consented to must be kept from flickering and going out. It must be held steadily before the mind until it fills the mind. Such filling of the mind by an idea, with its congruous associates, is consent to the idea and to the fact which the idea represents. If the idea be that, or include that, of a bodily movement of our own, then we call the consent thus laboriously gained a motor volition. For nature here backs us instantaneously and follows up our inward willingness by outward changes on her own part. She does this in no other instance. Pity she should not, p. 565, have been more generous, 
nor made a world whose other parts were as immediately subject to our will. On page 531, in describing the reasonable type of decision, it was said that it usually came when the right conception of the case was found. Where, however, the right conception is an anti-impulsive one, the whole intellectual ingenuity of the man usually goes to work to crowd it out of sight, and to find names for the moment may sound sanctified. And sloth or passion may reign unchecked. How many excuses does the drunkard find when each new temptation comes? It is a new brand of liquor which the interests of intellectual culture in such matters oblige him to test, moreover it is poured out and it is sin to waste it. Or others are drinking and it would be churlishness to refuse, or it is but to enable him to sleep, or just to get through this job of work, or it isn't drinking, it is because he feels so cold, or it is Christmas Day. Or it is a means of stimulating him to make a more powerful resolution in favor of abstinence than any he has hitherto made, or it is just this once, and once doesn't count, etc., etc. Ad libitum, it is, in fact, anything you like except being a drunkard. That is the conception that will not stay before the poor soul's attention. But if he once gets able to pick out that way of conceiving, from all the other possible ways of conceiving, from all the other possible ways of conceiving the various opportunities which occur. If through thick and thin he holds to it that this is being a drunkard and is nothing else, he is not likely to remain one long. The effort by which he succeeds in keeping the right name unwaveringly present to his mind proves to be his saving moral act. 501. Everywhere then the function of the effort is the same, to keep affirming and adopting a thought which, if left to itself, would slip away. It may be cold and flat when the spontaneous mental drift is towards excitement, or great and arduous when the spontaneous drift is towards repose. In the one case the effort has to inhibit an explosive, in the, p. 566, other to arouse an obstructed will. The exhausted sailor on a wreck has a will which is obstructed. One of his ideas is that of his sore hands, of the nameless exhaustion of his whole frame which the act of farther pumping involves, and of the deliciousness of sinking into sleep. The other is that of the hungry sea engulfing him, rather the aching toil, he says, and it becomes reality then, in spite of the inhibiting influence of the relatively luxurious sensations which he gets from lying still. But exactly similar in form would be his consent to lie and sleep. Often it is the thought of sleep and what leads to it which is the hard one to keep before the mind. If a patient afflicted with insomnia can only control the whirling chase of his thoughts so far as to think of nothing at all, which can be done. Or so far as to imagine one letter after another of a verse of scripture or poetry spelt slowly and monotonously out, it is almost certain that here, too, specific bodily effects will follow, and that sleep will come. The trouble is to keep the mind upon a train of objects naturally so insipid. To sustain a representation, to think, is, in short, the only moral act, for the impulsive and the obstructed, for sane and lunatics alike. Most maniacs know their thoughts to be crazy, but find them too pressing to be withstood. Compared with them the sane truths are so deadly sober, so cadaverous, that the lunatic cannot bear to look them in the face and say, let these alone be my reality. But with sufficient effort, as Dr. Wigan says, such a man can for a time wind himself up, as it were, and determine that the notions of the disordered brain shall not be manifested. Many instances are on record similar to that told by Pinel, where an inmate of the Bicetre, having stood a long cross-examination, and given every mark of restored reason, signed his name to the paper authorizing his discharge, Jesus Christ. And then went off into all the vagaries connected with that delusion. In the phraseology of the gentleman whose case is related in an early part of this, Wiggins, work he had, held himself tight, during the examination in order to attain his object. This once accomplished he let himself down, again, and, if even conscious of his delusion, could not control it. I have observed with such persons that it requires a considerable time to wind themselves up to the pitch of complete self-control, that the effort is a painful tension of the mind. When thrown off their guard by any accidental remark or worn out by the length of the examination, they, page 567, let themselves go, and cannot gather themselves up again without preparation. 
Lord Erskine relates the story of a man who brought an action against Dr. Monroe for confining him without cause. He underwent the most rigid examination by the counsel for the defendant without discovering any appearance of insanity, till a gentleman asked him about a princess with whom he corresponded in cherry juice, and he became instantly insane. 502. To sum it all up in a word, the terminus of the psychological process in volition, the point to which the will is directly applied, is always an idea. There are at all times some ideas from which we shy away like frightened horses the moment we get a glimpse of their forbidding profile upon the threshold of our thought. The only resistance which our will can possibly experience is the resistance which such an idea offers to being attended to at all. To attend to it is the volitional act, and the only inward volitional act which we ever perform. I have put the thing in this ultra-simple way because I want more than anything else to emphasize the fact that volition is primarily a relation, not between ourself and, p. 568, extramental matter, as many philosophers still maintain, but between ourself and our own states of mind. But when, a short while ago, I spoke of the filling of the mind with an idea as being equivalent to consent to the idea's object, I said something which the reader doubtless questioned at the time and which certainly now demands some qualification ere we pass beyond. It is unqualifiedly true that if any thought do fill the mind exclusively, such filling is consent. The thought, for that time at any rate, carries the man and his will with it. But it is not true that the thought need fill the mind exclusively for consent to be there, for we often consent to things whilst thinking of other things, even of hostile things. And we saw in fact that precisely what distinguishes our fifth type of decision from the other types, cp. 534, is just this coexistence with the triumphant thought of other thoughts which would inhibit it but for the effort which makes it prevail. The effort to attend is therefore only a part of what the word will covers. It covers also the effort to consent to something to which our attention is not quite complete. Often, when an object has gained our attention exclusively, and its motor results are just on the point of setting in. It seems as if the sense of their imminent irrevocability were enough of itself to start up the inhibitory ideas and to make us pause. Then we need a new stroke of effort to break down the sudden hesitation which seizes upon us, and to preserve. So that although attention is the first and fundamental thing in volition, express consent to the reality of what is attended to is often an additional and quite distinct phenomenon involved. The reader's own consciousness tells him of course just what these words of mine denote. And I freely confess that I am impotent to carry the analysis of the matter any farther, or to explain in other terms of what this consent consists. It seems a subjective experience sway generis, which we can designate but not define. We stand here exactly where we did in the case of belief. When an idea stings us in a certain way, makes as it were a certain electric connection without self, we believe that it is a reality. When it stings us in another way, makes another connection with, page 569, ourself, we say, let it be a reality. To the word is, and to the words let it be, there correspond peculiar attitudes of consciousness which it is vain to seek to explain. The indicative and the imperative moods are as much ultimate categories of thinking as they are of grammar. The quality of reality which these moods attach to things is not like other qualities. It is a relation to our life. It means our adoption of the things, our caring for them, our standing by them. This at least is what it practically means for us. What it may mean beyond that we do not know. And the transition from merely considering an object as possible, to deciding or willing it to be real, the change from the fluctuating to the stable personal attitude concerning it. From the, don't care, state of mind to that in which, we mean business, is one of the most familiar things in life. We can partly enumerate its conditions. And we can partly trace its consequences, especially the momentous one that when the mental object is a movement of our own body, it realizes itself outwardly when the mental change in question has occurred. But the change itself as a subjective phenomenon is something which we can translate into no simpler terms. The question of, free will. Especially must we, when talking about it, rid our mind of the fabulous warfare of separate agents called, ideas. The brain processes may be agents, 
and the thought as such may be an agent. But what the ordinary psychologies call ideas, are nothing but parts of the total object of representation. All that is before the mind at once, no matter how complex a system of things and relations it may be, is one object for the thought. Thus, A, and, B, and, their, mutual, incompatibility, and, the, fact, that, one, alone, can, be, true, or, can, become, real, notwithstanding, the, probability, or, desirability, of, both, may be such a complex object. And where the thought is deliberative its object has always some such form as this. When, now, we pass from deliberation to decision, that total object undergoes a change. We either dismiss A altogether and its relations to B, and think of B exclusively, or after thinking of both as posse, page 570, abilities, we next think that A is impossible, and that B is or forthwith shall be real. In either case a new object is before our thought, and where effort exists, it is where the change from the first object to the second one is hard. Our thought seems to turn in this case like a heavy door upon its hinges. Only, so far as the effort feels spontaneous, it turns, not as if by someone helping, but as if by an inward activity, born for the occasion, of its own. The psychologists who discussed the muscular sense at the International Congress at Paris in 1889 agreed at the end that they needed to come to a better understanding in regard to this appearance of internal activity at the moment when a decision is made. M. Fouillet, in an article which I find more interesting and suggestive than coherent or conclusive, 503, seems to resolve our sense of activity into that of our very existence as thinking entities. At least so I translate his words. 504, but we saw in chapter 10 how hard it is to lay a verifying finger plainly upon the thinking process as such, and to distinguish it from certain objects of the stream. M. Fouillet admits this. But I do not think he fully realizes how strong would be the position of a man who should suggest, see Volume 1, p. 301, that the feeling of moral activity itself which accompanies the advent of certain objects before the mind is nothing but certain other objects, constrictions, namely, in the brows, eyes, throat, and breathing apparatus, present then. But absent from other pulses of subjective change. Were this the truth, then a part, at any rate, of the activity of which we become aware in effort would seem merely to be that of our body. And many thinkers would probably thereupon conclude that this settles the claims of inner activity, and dismisses the whole notion of such a thing as a superfluity in psychological science. I cannot see my way to so extreme a view. Even although I must repeat the confession made on pages 296-7 to of Volume 1, that I do not fully understand how we come to our unshakable belief that thinking exists as a special kind of p. 571, immaterial process alongside of the material processes of the world. It is certain, however, that only by postulating such thinking do we make things currently intelligible. And it is certain that no psychologist has as yet denied the fact of thinking, the utmost that has been denied being its dynamic power. But if we postulate the fact of the thinking at all, I believe that we must postulate its power as well. Nor do I see how we can rightly equalize its power with its mere existence, and say, as M. Fouillet seems to say, that for the thought process to go on at all is an activity, and an activity everywhere the same. For certain steps forward in this process seem prima facie to be passive, and other steps, as where an object comes with effort, seem prima facie to be active in a supreme degree. If we admit, therefore, that our thoughts exist, we ought to admit that they exist after the fashion in which they appear, as things, namely, that supervene upon each other, sometimes with effort and sometimes with ease. The only questions being, is the effort where it exists a fixed function of the object, which the latter imposes on the thought? Or is it such an independent, variable, that with a constant object more or less of it may be made. It certainly appears to us indeterminate, and as if, even with an unchanging object, we might make more or less, as we choose. If it be really indeterminate, our future acts are ambiguous or unpredestinate, in common parlance, our wills are free. If the amount of effort be not indeterminate, 
but be related in a fixed manner to the objects themselves, in such wise that whatever object at any time fills our consciousness was from eternity bound to fill it then and there. And compel from us the exact effort, neither more nor less, which we bestow upon it, then our wills are not free, and all our acts are foreordained. The question of fact in the free will controversy is thus extremely simple. It relates solely to the amount of effort of attention or consent which we can at any time put forth. Are the duration and intensity of this effort fixed functions of the object, or are they not? Now, as I just said, it seems as if the effort were an independent variable, as if we might exert more or less of it in any given case. When a man has let his thoughts go for, page 572, days and weeks until at last they culminate in some particularly dirty or cowardly or cruel act, it is hard to persuade him, in the midst of his remorse, that he might not have reined them in. Hard to make him believe that this whole goodly universe, which his act so jars upon, required and exacted it of him at that fatal moment, and from eternity made aught else impossible. But, on the other hand, there is the certainty that all his effortless volitions are resultants of interests and associations whose strength and sequence are mechanically determined by the structure of that physical mass, his brain. And the general continuity of things and the monistic conception of the world may lead one irresistibly to postulate that a little fact like effort can form no real exception to the overwhelming reign of deterministic law. Even in effortless volition we have the consciousness of the alternative being also possible. This is surely a delusion here, why is it not a delusion everywhere? My own belief is that the question of free will is insoluble on strictly psychologic grounds. After a certain amount of effort of attention has been given to an idea, it is manifestly impossible to tell whether either more or less of it might have been given or not. To tell that, we should have to ascend to the antecedents of the effort, and defining them with mathematical exactitude, prove, by laws of which we have not at present even an inkling, that the only amount of sequent effort which could possibly comport with them was the precise amount which actually came. Measurements, whether of psychic or of neural quantities, and deductive reasonings such as this method of proof implies, will surely be forever beyond human reach. No serious psychologist or physiologist will venture even to suggest a notion of how they might be practically made. We are thrown back therefore upon the crude evidences of inception, and, on the other hand, upon a priori postulates and probabilities. He who loves to balance nice doubts need be in no hurry to decide the point. Like Mephistopheles to Faust, he can say to himself, Does who has to knock ein lang frist, for from generation to generation the reasons adduced on both sides will grow more voluminous, page 573, and the discussion more refined. But if our speculative delight be less keen, if the love of a part one pre outweighs that of keeping questions open, or if, as a French philosopher of genius says, l'amour de la vie que essendine de tant de discours, awakens in us. Craving the sense of either peace or power, then, taking the risk of error on our head, we must project upon one of the alternative views the attribute of reality for us. We must so fill our mind with the idea of it that it becomes our settled creed. The present writer does this for the alternative of freedom, but since the grounds of his opinion are ethical rather than psychological, he prefers to exclude them from the present book. 505. A few words, however, may be permitted about the logic of the question. The most that any argument can do for determinism is to make it a clear and seductive conception, which a man is foolish not to espouse, so long as he stands by the great scientific postulate that the world must be one unbroken fact. And that prediction of all things without exception must be ideally, even if not actually, possible. It is a moral postulate about the universe, the postulate that what ought to be can be, and that bad acts cannot be fated, but that good ones must be possible in their place, which would lead one to espouse the contrary view. But when scientific and moral postulates war thus with each other an objective proof is not to be had, the only course is voluntary choice, for skepticism itself, if systematic, is also voluntary choice. If, meanwhile, the will be undetermined, it would seem only fitting that the belief in its indetermination should be voluntarily chosen from amongst other possible beliefs. Freedom's first deed should be to affirm itself. 
we ought never to hope for any other method of getting at the truth if indeterminism be a fact. Doubt of this particular truth will therefore probably be open to us to the end of time, and the utmost that a p. 574, believer in free will can ever do will be to show that the deterministic arguments are not coercive. That they are seductive, I am the last to deny. Nor do I deny that effort may be needed to keep the faith in freedom, when they press upon it, upright in the mind. There is a fatalistic argument for determinism, however, which is radically vicious. When a man has let himself go time after time, he easily becomes impressed with the enormously preponderating influence of circumstances, hereditary habits, and temporary bodily dispositions over what might seem a spontaneity born for the occasion. All is fate, he then says, all is resultant of what pre-exists. Even if the moment seems original, it is but the instable molecules passively tumbling in their pre-appointed way. It is hopeless to resist the drift, vain to look for any new force coming in, and less, perhaps, than anywhere else under the sun is there anything really mine in the decisions which I make. This is really no argument for simple determinism. There runs throughout it the sense of a force which might make things otherwise from one moment to another, if it were only strong enough to breast the tide. A person who feels the impotence of free effort in this way has the acutest notion of what is meant by it, and of its possible independent power. How else could he be so conscious of its absence and of that of its effects? But genuine determinism occupies a totally different ground, not the impotence but the unthinkability of free will is what it affirms. It admits something phenomenal called free effort, which seems to breast the tide, but it claims this as a portion of the tide. The variations of the effort cannot be independent, it says. They cannot originate ex nihilo, or come from a fourth dimension, they are mathematically fixed functions of the ideas themselves, which are the tide. Fatalism, which conceives of effort clearly enough as an independent variable that might come from a fourth dimension, if it would come but that does not come, is a very dubious ally for determinism. It strongly imagines that very possibility which determinism denies. But what, quite as much as the inconceivability of absolutely independent variables, persuades modern men, p. 575, of science that their efforts must be predetermined, is the continuity of the latter with other phenomena whose predetermination no one doubts. Decisions with effort merge so gradually into those without it that it is not easy to say where the limit lies. Decisions without effort merge again into ideomotor, and these into reflex acts. So that the temptation is almost irresistible to throw the formula which covers so many cases over absolutely all. Where there is effort just as where there is none, the ideas themselves which furnish the matter of deliberation are brought before the mind by the machinery of association. And this machinery is essentially a system of arcs and paths, a reflex system, whether effort be amongst its incidents or not. The reflex way is, after all, the universal way of conceiving the business. The feeling of ease is a passive result of the way in which the thoughts unwind themselves. Why is not the feeling of effort the same? Professor Lips, in his admirably clear deterministic statement, so far from admitting that the feeling of effort testifies to an increment of force exerted, explains it as a sign that force is lost. We speak of effort, according to him, whenever a force expends itself, wholly or partly, in neutralizing another force, and so fails of its own possible outward effect. The outward effect of the antagonistic force, however, also fails in corresponding measure, so that there is no effort without counter-effort. An effort and counter-effort signify only that causes are mutually robbing each other of effectiveness. 506, where the forces are ideas, both sets of them, strictly speaking, are the seed of effort, both those which tend to explode, and those which tend to check them. We, however, call the more abundant mass of ideas ourselves. And, talking of its effort as our effort, and of that of the smaller mass of ideas as the resistance, 507, we say that our effort sometimes overcomes the resistances offered by the inertias of an obstructed, and sometimes, p. 576, those presented by the impulsions of an explosive, will. 
Really both effort and resistance are ours, and the identification of ourself with one of these factors is an illusion and a trick of speech. I do not see how anyone can fail, especially when the mythologic dynamism of separate ideas, which Professor Lips cleaves to, is translated into that of brain processes, to recognize the fascinating simplicity of some such view as his. Nor do I see why for scientific purposes one need give it up even if indeterminate amounts of effort really do occur. Before their indeterminism, science simply stops. She can abstract from it altogether, then. For in the impulses and inhibitions with which the effort has to cope there is already a larger field of uniformity than she can ever practically cultivate. Her provision will never foretell, even if the effort be completely predestinate, the actual way in which each individual emergency is resolved. Psychology will be psychology, 508, and science science, as much as ever, as much and no more, in this world, whether free will be true in it or not. Science, however, must be constantly reminded that her purposes are not the only purposes, and that the order of uniform causation which she has used for, and is therefore right in postulating, may be enveloped in a wider order. On which she has no claims at all. We can therefore leave the free will question altogether out of our account. As we said in Chapter 6, p. 453, the operation of free effort, if it existed, could only be to hold some one ideal object, or part of an object, a little longer or a little more intensely before the mind. Amongst the alternatives which present themselves as genuine posse, p. 577, bless, it would thus make one effective. 509, and although such quickening of one idea might be morally and historically momentous, yet, if considered dynamically, it would be an operation amongst those physiological infinitesimals which calculation must forever neglect. But whilst eliminating the question about the amount of, p. 578, our efforts as one which psychology will never have a practical call to decide, I must say one word about the extraordinarily intimate and important character which the phenomenon of effort assumes in our own eyes as individual men. Of course we measure ourselves by many standards. Our strength and our intelligence, our wealth and even our good luck, are things which warm our heart and make us feel ourselves a match for life. But deeper than all such things, and able to suffice unto itself without them, is the sense of the amount of effort which we can put forth. Those are, after all, but effects, products, and reflections of the outer world within. But the effort seems to belong to an altogether different realm, as if it were the substantive thing which we are, and those were but externals which we carry. If the searching of our heart and reins be the purpose of this human drama, then what is sought seems to be what effort we can make. He who can make none is but a shadow, he who can make much is a hero. The huge world that girdles us about puts all sorts of questions to us, and tests us in all sorts of ways. Some of the tests we meet by actions that are easy, and some of the questions we answer in articulately formulated words. But the deepest question that is ever asked admits of no reply but the dumb turning of the will and tightening of our heartstrings as we say, yes, I will even have it so. When a dreadful object is presented, or when life as a whole turns up its dark abysses to our view, then the worthless ones among us lose their hold on the situation altogether, and either escape from its difficulties by averting their attention. Or if they cannot do that, collapse into yielding masses of plaintiveness and fear. The effort required for facing and consenting to such objects is beyond their power to make. But the heroic mind does differently. To it, too, the objects are sinister and dreadful, unwelcome, incompatible with wished-for things. But it can face them if necessary, without for that losing its hold upon the rest of life. The world thus finds in the heroic man its worthy match and mate. And the effort which he is able to put forth to hold himself erect and keep his heart unshaken is the direct measure of his worth, page 579, and function in the game of human life. He can stand this universe. He can meet it and keep up his faith in it in presence of those same features which lay his weaker brethren low. He can still find a zest in it, not by ostrich-like forgetfulness, but by pure inward willingness to face the world with those deterrent objects there. 
and hereby he becomes one of the masters and the lords of life. He must be counted with henceforth, he forms a part of human destiny. Neither in the theoretic nor in the practical sphere do we care for, or go for help to, those who have no head for risks, or sense for living on the perilous edge. Our religious life lies more, our practical life lies less, than it used to, on the perilous edge. But just as our courage is so often a reflex of another's courage, so our faith is apt to be, as Moss Muller somewhere says, a faith in someone else's faith. We draw new life from the heroic example. The prophet has drunk more deeply than anyone of the cup of bitterness, but his countenance is so unshaken and he speaks such mighty words of cheer that his will becomes our will, and our life is kindled at his own. Thus not only our morality but our religion, so far as the latter is deliberate, depend on the effort which we can make. Will you or won't you have it so, is the most probing question we are ever asked. We are asked at every hour of the day, and about the largest as well as the smallest, the most theoretical as well as the most practical, things. We answer by consents or non-consents and not by words. What wonder that these dumb responses should seem our deepest organs of communication with the nature of things. What wonder if the effort demanded by them be the amount which we accord of it be the one strictly underived and original contribution which we make to the world. The education of the will. The education of the will may be taken in a broader or a narrower sense. In the broader sense, it means the whole of one's training to moral and prudential conduct, and of one's learning to adapt means to ends, involving the association of ideas, in all its varieties and complications, to p. 580, gather with the power of inhibiting impulses irrelevant to the ends desired, and of initiating movements contributory thereto. It is the acquisition of these latter powers which I mean by the education of the will in the narrower sense. And it is in this sense alone that it is worth while to treat the matter here. 510. Since a willed movement is a movement preceded by an idea of itself, the problem of the will's education is the problem of how the idea of a movement can arouse the movement itself. This, as we have seen, is a secondary kind of process. For framed as we are, we can have no a priori idea of a movement, no idea of a movement which we have not already performed. Before the idea can be generated, the movement must have occurred in a blind, unexpected way, and left its idea behind. Reflex, instinctive, or random execution of a movement must, in other words, precede its voluntary execution. Reflex and instinctive movements have already been considered sufficiently for the purposes of this book. Random movements are mentioned so as to include quasi-accidental reflexes from inner causes, or movements possibly arising from such overflow of nutrition in special centers as Prof. Bain postulates in his explanation of those spontaneous discharges by which he set such great store in his derivation of the voluntary life. 511. Now how can the sensory process which a movement has previously produced, discharge, when excited again, into the center for the movement itself. On the movement's original occurrence the motor discharge came first and the sensory process second, now in the voluntary repetition the sensory process, excited in weak or ideational form, comes first, and the motor discharge comes second. To tell how this comes to pass would be to answer the problem of the education of the will in physiological terms. Evidently the problem is that of the formation of new paths, and the p. 581, only thing to do is to make hypotheses, till we find some which seem to cover all the facts. How is a fresh path ever formed? All paths are paths of discharge, and the discharge always takes place in the direction of least resistance, whether the cell which discharges be motor or sensory. The connate paths of least resistance are the paths of instinctive reaction. And I submit as my first hypothesis that these paths all run one way, that is from sensory cells into motor cells and from motor cells into muscles, without ever taking the reverse direction. A motor cell, for example, never awakens a sensory cell directly, but only through the incoming current caused by the bodily movements to which its discharge gives rise. And a sensory cell always discharges or normally tends to discharge towards the motor region. 
let this direction be called the, the forward direction. I call the law an hypothesis, but really it is an indubitable truth. No impression of idea of eye, ear, or skin comes to us without occasioning a movement, even though the movement be no more than the accommodation of the sense organ. And all our trains of sensation and sensational imagery have their terms alternated and interpenetrated with motor processes, of most of which we practically are unconscious. Another way of stating the rule is to say that, primarily or connately, all currents through the brain run towards the Rolandic region, and that there they run out, and never return upon themselves. From this point of view the distinction of sensory and motor cells has no fundamental significance. All cells are motor, we simply call those of the Rolandic region, those nearest the mouth of the funnel, the motor cells par excellence. A corollary of this law is that sensory cells do not awaken each other connately. That is, that no one sensible property of things has any tendency, in advance of experience, to awaken in us the idea of any other sensible properties which in the nature of things may go with it. There is no a priori calling up of one idea by another, the only a priori couplings are of ideas with movements. All suggestions of one sensible fact by another, page 582, take place by secondary paths which experience has formed. The diagram, figure 87, 512, shows what happens in a nervous system ideally reduced to the fewest possible terms. A stimulus reaching the sense organ awakens the sensory cell, S. This by the connate or instinctive path discharges the motor cell, M, which makes the muscle contract. And the contraction arouses the second sensory cell, K, which may be the organ either of a resident or kinesthetic, or of a remote sensation. See above, page 488. This cell K again discharges into M. If this were the entire nervous mechanism, the movement, once begun, would be self-maintaining, and would stop only when the parts were exhausted. And this, according to M. Pierre Janet, is what actually happens in catalepsy. A cataleptic patient is anesthetic, speechless, motionless. Consciousness, so far as we can judge, is abolished. Nevertheless the limbs will retain whatever position is impressed upon them from without, and retain it so long that if it be a strained and unnatural position. The phenomenon is regarded by Charcot as one of the few conclusive tests against hypnotic subjects shamming, since hypnotics can be made catalep, p. 583, tick, and then keep their limbs outstretched for a length of time quite unattainable by the waking will. M. Janet thinks that in all these cases the outlying ideational processes in the brain are temporarily thrown out of gear. The kinesthetic sensation of the raised arm, for example, is produced in the patient when the operator raises the arm, this sensation discharges into the motor cell, which through the muscle reproduces the sensation, etc. The currents running in this closed circle until they grow so weak, by exhaustion of the parts, that the member slowly drops. We may call this circle from the muscle to K, from K to M, and from M to the muscle again, the motor circle. We should all be cataleptics and never stop a muscular contraction once begun, were it not that other processes simultaneously going on inhibit the contraction. Inhibition is therefore not an occasional accident. It is an essential and unremitting element of our cerebral life. It is interesting to note that Dr. Mercier, by a different path of reasoning, is also led to conclude that we owe to outside inhibitions exclusively our power to arrest a movement once begun. 513. One great inhibitor of the discharge of K into M seems to be the painful or otherwise displeasing quality of the sensation itself of K. And conversely, when this sensation is distinctly pleasant, that fact tends to further K's discharge into M, and to keep the primordial motor circle a-going. Tremendous as the part is which pleasure and pain play in our psychic life, we must confess that absolutely nothing is known of their cerebral conditions. It is hard to imagine them as having special centers. It is harder still to invent peculiar forms of process in each and every center, to which these feelings may be due. And let one try as one will to represent the cerebral activity in exclusively mechanical terms, I, for one, 
find it quite impossible to enumerate what seem to be the facts and yet to make no mention of the psychic side which they possess. However it be with other drainage currents and discharges, the drainage currents and discharges of the brain are not purely physical facts. They are psychophysical facts, and the p. 584, spiritual quality of them seems a co-determinant of their mechanical effectiveness. If the mechanical activities in a cell, as they increase, give pleasure, they seem to increase all the more rapidly for that fact. If they give displeasure, the displeasure seems to dampen the activities. The psychic side of the phenomenon thus seems, somewhat like the applause or hissing at a spectacle, to be an encouraging or adverse comment on what the machinery brings forth. The soul presents nothing herself, creates nothing. Is at the mercy of the material forces for all possibilities, but amongst these possibilities she selects, and by reinforcing one and checking others, she figures not as an epiphenomenon, but as something from which the play gets moral support. I shall therefore never hesitate to invoke the efficacy of the conscious comment, where no strictly mechanical reason appears why a current escaping from a cell should take one path rather than another. 514. But the existence of the current, and its tendency towards either path, I feel bound to account for by mechanical laws. Having now considered a nervous system reduced to its lowest possible terms, in which all the paths are connate, and the possibilities of inhibition not extrinsic, but due solely to the agreeableness or disagreeableness of the feeling aroused. Let us turn to the conditions under which new paths may be formed. Potentialities of new paths are furnished by the fibers which connect the sensory cells amongst themselves. But these fibers are not originally pervious. And have to be made so by a process which I proceed hypothetically to state as follows, each discharge from a sensory cell in the forward direction, 515, tends to drain the cells lying behind the discharging one of whatever tension they may possess. The drainage from the rearward cells is what for the first time makes the fibers pervious. The result is a new formed path, running from the cells which were rearward to the cell which was forward on that occasion. Which path, if on future occasions the rearward cells are independently excited, will tend to carry off their activity in the same direction so as to excite the page 585 forward cell, and will deepen itself more and more every time it is used. Now the rearward cells, so far, stand for all the sensory cells of the brain other than the one which is discharging. But such an indefinitely broad path would practically be no better than no path, so here I make a third hypothesis, which, taken together with the others, seems to me to cover all the facts. It is that deepest paths are formed from the most drainable to the most draining cells, that the most drainable cells are those which have just been discharging. And that the most draining cells are those which are now discharging or in which the tension is rising towards the point of discharge, 516, another diagram, figure 88, will make the matter clear. Take the operation represented by the previous diagram at the moment when, the muscular contraction having occurred, the cell K is discharging forward into M. Through the dotted line P it will, according to our third hypothesis, drain S, which, in the supposed case, has just discharged into M by the connate path P, and caused the muscular contraction. And the result is that P will now remain as a new path open from S to K. When next S is excited from without it will tend not only to discharge into M, but into K as well. K thus gets excited directly by S before it gets excited by the incoming current from the muscle. Or, translated into psychic terms, when a sensation has once produced a movement in us, the next time we have the sensation, it tends to suggest the idea of the movement, even before the movement occurs. 517. p. 586. The same principles also apply to the relations of K and M, M, lying in the forward direction, drains K, and the path KM, even though it be no primary or a connate path, becomes a secondary or habitual one. Hereafter K may be aroused in any way whatsoever, not as before from S or from without, and still it will tend to discharge into M. Or, to express it again in psychic terms, the idea of the movement M sensory effects will have become an immediately antecedent condition to the production of the movement itself. Here, 
then, we have the answer to our original question of how a sensory process which, the first time it occurred, was the effect of a movement, can later figure as the movement's cause. It is obvious on this scheme that the cell which we have marked K may stand for the seat of either a resident or a remote sensation occasioned by the motor discharge. It may indifferently be a tactile, a visual, or an auditory cell. The idea of how the arm feels when raised may cause it to rise, but no less may the idea of some sound which it makes in rising, or of some optical impression which it produces. Thus we see that the mental cue may belong to either of various senses, and that what our diagrams lead us to infer is what really happens. Namely, that in our movements, such as that of speech, for example, in some of us it is the tactile, in others the acoustic, effects build, or memory image, which seems most concerned in starting the articulation, volume 1, pages 54 to 5. The primitive starters, however, of all our movements are not effects builder at all, but sensations and objects, and subsequently ideas derived therefrom. Let us now turn to the more complex and serially concatenated movements which oftenest meet us in real life. The object of our will is seldom a single muscular contraction. It is almost always an orderly sequence of contractions, ending with a sensation which tells us that the goal is reached. But the several contractions of the sequence are not each distinctly willed. Each earlier one seems rather, by the sensation it produces, to call its follower up, after the fashion described in chapter 6, where we spoke of, p. 587, habitual concatenated movements being due to a series of secondarily organized reflex arcs, volume 1, page 116. The first contraction is the one distinctly willed, and after willing it we let the rest of the chain rattle off of its own accord. How now is such an orderly concatenation of movements originally learned? Or in other words, how are paths formed for the first time between one motor center and another, so that the discharge of the first center makes the others discharge in due order all along the line? The phenomenon involves a rapid alternation of motor discharges and resultant afferent impressions, for as long a time as it lasts. They must be associated in one definite order, and the order must once have been learned, i.e. It must have been picked out and held to more and more exclusively out of the many other random orders which first presented themselves. The random afferent impressions fell out, those that felt right were selected and grew together in the chain. A chain which we actively teach ourselves by stringing a lot of right-feeling impressions together differs in no essential respect from a chain which we passively learn from someone else who gives us impressions in a certain order. So to make our ideas more precise, let us take a particular concatenated movement for an example, and let it be the recitation of the alphabet, which someone in our childhood taught us to say by heart. What we have seen so far is how the idea of the sound or articulatory feeling of A may make us say, A, that of B, B, and so on. But what we now want to see is why the sensation that A is uttered should make us say, B, why the sensation that B is uttered should make us say, C, and so on. To understand this we must recall what happened and we first learned the letters in their order. Someone repeated A, B, C, D to us over and over again, and we imitated the sounds. Sensory cells corresponding to each letter were awakened in succession in such wise that each one of them, by virtue of our second law, must have drained the cell just previously excited and left a path by which that cell tended even afterwards to discharge into the cell that drained it. Let SA, SB, SC in figure 89 stand for three of these cells. Each later one of them, as it discharges, page 588, motor wards, draws a current from the previous one, SB from SA, and SC from SB. Cell SB having thus drained SA, if SA ever gets excited again, it tends to discharge into SB, whilst SC having drained SB, SB later discharges into SC, etc., etc., all through the dotted lines. Let now the idea of the letter A arise in the mind, or, in other words, let SA be aroused, what happens? A current runs from SA not only into the motor cell MA for pronouncing that letter, but also into the cell SB. When, a moment later, the effect of MA's discharge comes back by the afferent nerve and re-excites SA, this latter cell is inhibited from discharging again into MA. 
and reproducing the primordial motor circle, which in this case would be the continued utterance of the letter A, by the fact that the process in SB, already under headway intending to discharge into its own motor associate MB, is. Under the existing conditions, the stronger drainage channel for SAW's excitement. The result is that MB discharges and the letter B is pronounced, whilst at the same time SC receives some of SB's overflow, and, a moment later, P. 589, when the sound of B enters the ear, discharges into the motor cell for pronouncing C, by a repetition of the same mechanism as before, and so on ad libtum. Figure 90 represents the entire set of processes involved. The only thing that one does not immediately see is the reason why, under the existing conditions the path from SA to SB should be the stronger drainage channel for SA's excitement. If the cells and fibers in the figure constituted the entire brain we might suppose either a mechanical or a psychical reason. The mechanical reason might lie in a general law that cells like SB and MB, whose excitement is in a rising phase, are stronger drainers than cells like MA, which have just discharged. Or it might lie in the fact that an irradiation of the current beyond SB into SC and MC has already begun also, and in a still farther law that drainage tends in the direction of the widest irradiations. Either of these suppositions would be a sufficient mechanical reason why, having once said A, we should not say it again. But we must not forget that the process has a psychical side, nor close our eyes to the possibility that the sort of feeling aroused by incipient currents may be the reason why certain of them are instantly inhibited and others help to flow. There is no doubt that before we have uttered a single letter, the general intention to recite the alphabet is already there. Nor is there any doubt that to that intention corresponds a widespread premonitory rising of tensions along the entire system of cells and fibers which are later to be aroused. So long as this rise of tensions feels good, so long every current which increases it is furthered, and every current which diminishes it is checked. And this may be the chief one of the existing conditions which make the drainage channel from SA to SB temporarily so strong. 518. The new paths between the sensory cells of which we have studied the formation are paths of association, and we now see why associations run always is the forward, page 590, direction. Why, for example, we cannot say the alphabet backward, and why, although SB discharges into SC, there is no tendency for SC to discharge into SB, or at least no more than for it to discharge into SA. 519, the first formed paths had, according to the principles which we invoked, to run from cells that had just discharged to those that were discharging. And now, to get currents to run the other way, we must go through a new learning of our letters with their order reversed. There will then be two sets of association pathways, either of them possible, between the sensible cells. I represent them in figure 91, leaving out the motor features for simplicity's sake. The dotted lines are the paths in the backward direction, newly organized from the reception by the ear of the letters in the order C, B, A. The same principles will explain the formation of new paths successively concatenated to no matter how great an extent, but it would obviously be folly to pretend to illustrate by more intricate examples. I will therefore only bring back the case of the child and flame, volume 1, page 25, to show how easily it admits of explanation as a purely cortical transaction, Ibid page 80. The sight of the flame stimulates the cortical center S1 which discharges by an instinctive reflex path into the center M1 for the grasping move, page 591, meant. This movement produces the feeling of burn, as its effects come back to the center S2. And this center by a second connate path discharges into M2, the center for withdrawing the hand. The movement of withdrawal stimulates the center S3, and this, as far as we are concerned, is the last thing that happens. Now the next time the child sees the candle, the cortex is in possession of the secondary paths which the first experience left behind. S2, having been stimulated immediately after S1, drained the latter, and now S1 discharges into S2 before the discharge of M1 has had time to occur. In other words, the sight of the flame suggests the idea of the burn before it produces its own natural reflex effects. The result is an inhibition of M1, or an overtaking of it before it is completed, 
by M2. The characteristic physiological feature in all these acquired systems of paths lies in the fact that the new formed sensory irradiations keep draining things forward, and so breaking up the motor circles which would otherwise accrue. But, even apart from catalepsy, we see the motor circle every now and then come back. An infant learning to execute a simple movement at will, without regard to other movements beyond it, keeps repeating it till tired. How reiteratively they babble each new learned word. And we adults often catch ourselves reiterating some meaningless word over and over again, if by chance we once begin to utter it, absent-mindedly, that is, without thinking of any ulterior train of words to which it may belong. One more observation before closing these already two protracted physiological speculations. Already, Volume 1, page 71, I have tried to shadow forth a reason why collateral inner, p. 592, that ion should establish itself after loss of brain tissue, and why incoming stimuli should find their way out again, after an interval, by their former paths. I can now explain this a little better. Let S1 be the dog's hearing center when he receives the command, give your paw. This used to discharge into the motor center M1, of whose discharge S2 represents the kinesthetic effect. But now M1 has been destroyed by an operation, so that S1 discharges as it can, into other movements of the body, whimpering, raising the wrong paw, etc. The kinesthetic center S2 meanwhile has been awakened by the order S1, and the poor animal's mind tingles with expectation and desire of certain incoming sensations which are entirely at variance with those which the really executed movements give. None of the latter sensations arouse a motor circle, for they are displeasing and inhibitory. But when, by random accident, S1 and S2 do discharge into a path leading through M2, by which the paw is again given, and S2 is excited at last from without as well as from within. There are no inhibitions and the motor circle is formed, S1 discharges into M2 over and over again. And the path from the one spot to the other is so much deepened that at last it becomes organized as the regular channel of efflux when S1 is aroused. No other path has a chance of being organized in like degree. Chapter 27 Hypnotism Modes of Operating and Susceptibility The hypnotic, mesmeric, or magnetic trance can be induced in various ways, each operator having his pet method. The simplest one is to leave the subject seated by himself, telling him that if he close his eyes and relax his muscles and, as far as possible, think of vacancy, in a few minutes he will go off. On returning in ten minutes you may find him effectually hypnotized. Braid used to make his subjects look at a bright button held near their forehead until their eyes spontaneously closed. The older mesmerists made passes in a downward direction over the face and body, but without contact. Stroking the skin of the head, face, arms and hands, especially that of the region round the bruise and eyes, will have the same effect. Staring into the eyes of the subject until the latter droop, making him listen to a watch's ticking or simply making him close his eyes for a minute whilst you describe to him the feeling of falling into sleep, talk sleep, to him, are equally efficacious methods in the hands of some operators. Whilst with trained subjects any method whatever from which they have been led by previous suggestion to expect results will be successful. 520, the touching of an object, p. 594, which they are told has been magnetized, the drinking of magnetized water, the reception of a letter ordering them to sleep, etc., are means which have been frequently employed. Recently M. Legiois has hypnotized some of his subjects at a distance of one and a half kilometers by giving them an intimation to that effect through a telephone. With some subjects, if you tell them in advance that at a certain hour of a certain day they will become entranced, the prophecy is fulfilled. Certain hysterical patients are immediately thrown into hypnotic catalepsy by any violent sensation, such as a blow on a gong or the flashing of an intense light in their eyes. Pressure on certain parts of the body, called zones hypnones by M. Petries, rapidly produces hypnotic sleep in some hysterics. These regions, which differ in different subjects, are oftenest found on the forehead and about the root of the thumbs. Finally, 
persons in ordinary sleep may be transferred into the hypnotic condition by verbal intimation or contact, performed so gently as not to wake them up. Some operators appear to be more successful than others in getting control of their subjects. I am informed that Mr. Gurney, who made valuable contributions to the theory of hypnotism, was never able himself to hypnotize, and had to use for his observations the subjects of others. On the other hand, Leibold claims that he hypnotizes 92% of all comers, and Wetterstrand in Stockholm says that amongst 718 persons there proved to be only 18 whom he failed to influence. Some of this disparity is unquestionably due to differences in the personal authority of the operator, for the prime condition of success is that the subject should confidently expect to be entranced. Much also depends on the operator's tact in interpreting the physiognomy of his subjects, so as to give the right commands, and crowd it on to the subject, at just the propitious moments. These conditions account for the fact that operators grow more, page 595, successful the more they operate. Bernheim says that whoever does not hypnotize 80% of the persons whom he tries has not yet learned to operate as he should. Whether certain operators have over and above this a peculiar, magnetic power, is a question which I leave at present undecided. 521. Children under 3 or 4, and insane persons, especially idiots, are unusually hard to hypnotize. This seems due to the impossibility of getting them to focus their attention continuously on the idea of the coming trance. All ages above infancy are probably equally hypnotizable, as are all races and both sexes. A certain amount of mental training, sufficient to aid concentration of the attention, seems a favorable condition, and so does a certain momentary indifference or passivity as to the result. Native strength or weakness of will have absolutely nothing to do with the matter. Frequent trances enormously increase the susceptibility of a subject, and many who resist at first succumb after several trials. Dar. Maul says he has more than once succeeded after forty fruitless attempts. Some experts are of the opinion that every one is hypnotizable essentially, the only difficulty being the more habitual presence in some individuals of hindering mental preoccupations, which, however, may suddenly at some moment be removed. The trance may be dispelled instantaneously by saying in a rousing voice, All right, wake up, or words of similar purport. At the Salopetriere they awaken subjects by blowing on their eyelids. Upward passes have an awakening effect. Sprinkling cold water ditto. Anything will awaken a patient who expects to be awakened by that thing. Tell him that he will wake after counting five, and he will do so. Tell him to waken in five minutes, and he is very likely to do so punctually, even though he interrupt thereby some exciting histrionic performance which you may have suggested. As Dr. Moll says, any theory which pretends to p. 596, explain the physiology of the hypnotic state must keep account of the fact that so simple a thing as hearing the word, wake, will end it. Theories about the hypnotic state. The intimate nature of the hypnotic condition, when once induced, can hardly be said to be understood. Without entering into details of controversy, one may say that three main opinions have been held concerning it, which we may call respectively the theories of 1. Animal magnetism 2. Of neurosis, and finally of 3. Suggestion According to the animal magnetism theory there is a direct passage of force from the operator to the subject, whereby the latter becomes the former's puppet. This theory is nowadays given up as regards all the ordinary hypnotic phenomena, and is only held to by some persons as an explanation of a few effects exceptionally met with. According to the neurosis theory, the hypnotic state is a peculiar pathological condition into which certain predisposed patients fall, and in which special physical agents have the power of provoking special symptoms. Quite apart from the subjects mentally expecting the effect. Professor Charcot and his colleagues at the Salpetriere Hospital admit that this condition is rarely found in typical form. They call it then le grand hypnotism, and say that it accompanies the disease hysteroepilepsy. If a patient subject to this sort of hypnotism hear a sudden loud noise, or look at a bright light unexpectedly, she falls into the cataleptic trance. 
Her limbs and body offer no resistance to movements communicated to them, but retain permanently the attitudes impressed. The eyes are staring, there is insensibility to pain, etc., etc. If the eyelids be forcibly closed, the cataleptic gives place to the lethargic condition, characterized by apparent abolition of consciousness. An absolute muscular relaxation except where the muscles are needed or the tendon struck by the operator's hand, or certain nerve, p. 597, trunks are pressed upon. Then the muscles in question, or those supplied by the same nerve trunk enter into a more or less steadfast tonic contraction. Charcot calls this symptom by the name of neuromuscular hyperexcitability. The lethargic state may be primarily brought on by fixedly looking at anything, or by pressure on the closed eyeballs. Friction on the top of the head will make the patient pass from either of the two preceding conditions into the somnambulic state, in which she is alert, talkative, and susceptible to all the suggestions of the operator. The somnambulic state may also be induced primarily, by fixedly looking at a small object. In this state the accurately limited muscular contractions characteristic of lethargy do not follow upon the above-described manipulations, but instead of them there is a tendency to rigidity of entire regions of the body, which may upon occasion develop into general tetanus, and which is brought about by gently touching the skin or blowing upon it. M. Charcot calls this by the name of cutaneomuscular hyperexcitability. Many other symptoms, supposed by their observers to be independent of mental expectation, are described, of which I only will mention the more interesting. Opening the eyes of a patient in lethargy causes her to pass into catalepsy. If one eye only be opened, the corresponding half of the body becomes cataleptic, whilst the other half remains in lethargy. Similarly, rubbing one side of the head may result in a patient becoming hemilethargic or hemicataleptic and hemisomnambulic. The approach of a magnet, or certain metals, to the skin causes these half-states, and many others, to be transferred to the opposite sides. Automatic repetition of every sound heard, echolalia, is said to be produced by pressure on the lower cervical vertebrae or on the epigastrium. Aphasia is brought about by rubbing the head over the region of the speech center. Pressure behind the occiput determines movements of imitation. Heidenhain describes a number of curious automatic tendencies to movement, which are brought about by stroking various portions of the vertebral column. Certain other symptoms have been frequently noticed, such as a flushed face and cold hands, brilliant and congested eyes, dilated pupils. Dilated ready, page 598, NAL vessels and spasm of the accommodation are also reported. The theory of suggestion denies that there is any special hypnotic state worthy of the name of trance or neurosis. All the symptoms above described, as well as those to be described hereafter, are results of that mental susceptibility which we all to some degree possess, of yielding assent to outward suggestion, of affirming what we strongly conceive, and of acting in accordance with what we are made to expect. The bodily symptoms of the celepatria patients are all of them results of expectation and training. The first patients accidentally did certain things which their doctors thought typical and caused to be repeated. The subsequent subjects caught on and followed the established tradition. In proof of this the fact is urged that the classical three stages and their grouped symptoms have only been reported as spontaneously occurring, so far, at the salpetrier, though they may be superinduced by deliberate suggestion. In patients anywhere found. The ocular symptoms, the flushed face, accelerated breathing, etc., are said not to be symptoms of the passage into the hypnotic state as such, but merely consequences of the strain on the eyes when the method of looking at a bright object is used. They are absent in the subjects at Nancy, where simple verbal suggestion is employed. The various reflex effects, aphasia, echolalia, imitation, etc., are but habits induced by the influence of the operator, who unconsciously urges the subject into the direction in which he would prefer to have him go. The influence of the magnet, the opposite effects of upward and downward passes, etc., are similarly explained. Even that sleepy and inert condition, the advent of which seems to be the prime condition of farther symptoms being developed, is said to be merely due to the fact that the mind expects it to come. 
whilst its influence on the other symptoms is not physiological, so to speak, but psychical, its own easy realization by suggestion simply encouraging the subject to expect that ulterior suggestions will be realized with equal ease. The radical defenders of the suggestion theory are thus led to deny the very exist, p. 599, ints of the hypnotic state, in the sense of a peculiar trance-like condition which deprives the patient of spontaneity and makes him passive to suggestion from without. The trance itself is only one of the suggestions, and many subjects in fact can be made to exhibit the other hypnotic phenomena without the preliminary induction of this one. The theory of suggestion may be said to be quite triumphant at the present day over the neurosis theory as held at the Salpetrier, with its three states. And its definite symptoms supposed to be produced by physical agents apart from cooperation of the subject's mind. But it is one thing to say this, and it is quite another thing to say that there is no peculiar physiological condition whatever worthy of the name of hypnotic trance, no peculiar state of nervous equilibrium, hypotaxy, dissociation or whatever you please to call it, during which the subject's susceptibility to outward suggestion is greater than at ordinary times. All the facts seem to prove that, until this trance-like state is assumed by the patient, suggestion produces very insignificant results, but that, when it is once assumed, there are no limits to suggestion's power. The state in question has many affinities with ordinary sleep. It is probable, in fact, that we all pass through it transiently whenever we fall asleep. And one might most naturally describe the usual relation of operator and subject by saying that the former keeps the latter suspended between making and sleeping by talking to him enough to beep his slumber from growing profound. And yet not in such a way as to wake him up. A hypnotized patient, left to himself, will either fall sound asleep or wake up entirely. The difficulty in hypnotizing refractory persons is that of catching them at the right moment of transition and making it permanent. Fixing the eyes and relaxing the muscles of the body produce the hypnotic state just as they facilitate the advent of sleep. The first stages of ordinary sleep are characterized by a peculiar dispersed attitude of the attention. Images come before consciousness which are entirely incongruous with our ordinary beliefs and habits of thought. The latter either vanish altogether or withdraw, as it were, p. 600, inertly into the background of the mind, and let the incongruous images reign alone. These images acquire, moreover, an exceptional vivacity, they become first, hypnagogic hallucinations, and then, as the sleep grows deeper, dreams. Now the monoidism, or else the impotency and failure to rally on the part of the background ideas, which thus characterize somnolescence, are unquestionably the result of a special physiological change occurring in the brain at that time. Just so that similar monoidism, or dissociation of the reigning fancy from those other thoughts which might possibly act as its reductives, which characterize the hypnotic consciousness, must equally be due to a special cerebral change. The term, hypnotic trance, which I employ, tells us nothing of what the change is, but it marks the fact that it exists, and is consequently a useful expression. The great vivacity of the hypnotic images, as gauged by their motor effects, the oblivion of them when normal life is resumed, the abrupt awakening, the recollection of them again in subsequent trances. The anesthesia and hyperesthesia which are so frequent, all point away from our simple waking credulity and suggestibility, as the type by which the phenomena are to be interpreted, and make us look rather towards sleep and dreaming. Or towards those deeper alterations of the personality known as automatism, double consciousness, or second personality for the true analogues of the hypnotic trance. 522. Even the best hypnotic subjects pass through life without anyone suspecting them to possess such a remarkable susceptibility, until by deliberate experiment it is made manifest. The operator fixes their eyes or their attention a short time to develop the propitious phase, holds them in it by his talk, and the state being there, makes them the puppets of all his suggestions. But no ordinary suggestions of waking life ever took such control of their mind. Page 601. The suggestion theory may therefore be approved as correct, provided we grant the trance state as its prerequisite. The three states of Charcot, the strange reflexes of Heidenheim, and all the other bodily phenomena which have been called direct consequences of the trance state itself, 
are not such. They are products of suggestion, the trance state having no particular outward symptoms of its own, but without the trance state there, those particular suggestions could never have been successfully made. 523. The Symptoms of the Trance This accounts for the altogether indefinite array of symptoms which have been gathered together as characteristic of the hypnotic state. The law of habit dominates hypnotic subjects even more than it does waking ones. Any sort of personal peculiarity, any trick accidentally fallen into in the first instance by some one subject, may, by attracting attention, become stereotyped, serve as a pattern for imitation, and figure as the type of a school. The first subject trains the operator, the operator trains the succeeding subjects, all of them in perfect good faith conspiring together to evolve a perfectly arbitrary result. With the extraordinary perspicacity and subtlety of perception which subjects often display for all that concerns the operator with whom they are en rapport, it is hard to keep them ignorant of anything which he expects. Thus it happens that one easily verifies on new subjects what one has already seen on old ones, or any desired symptom of which one may have heard or read. The symptoms earliest observed by writers were all thought to be typical. But with the multiplication of OB, page 602, served phenomena, the importance of most particular symptoms as marks of the state has diminished. This lightens very much our own immediate task. Proceeding to enumerate the symptoms of the hypnotic trance, I may confine myself to those which are intrinsically interesting, or which differ considerably from the normal functions of man. First of all comes amnesia. In the earlier stages of hypnotism the patient remembers what has happened, but with successive sittings he sinks into a deeper condition, which is commonly followed by complete loss of memory. He may have been led through the liveliest hallucinations and dramatic performances, and have exhibited the intensest apparent emotion, but on waking he can recall nothing at all. The same thing happens on waking from sleep in the midst of a dream, it quickly eludes recall. But just as we may be reminded of it, or of parts of it, by meeting persons or objects which figure therein, so on being adroitly prompted, the hypnotic patient will often remember what happened in his trance. One cause of the forgetfulness seems to be the disconnection of the trance performances with the system of waking ideas. Memory requires a continuous train of association. M. Del Boeuf, reasoning in this way, woke his subjects in the midst of an action begun during trance, washing the hands, e.g., and found that they then remembered the trance. The act in question bridged over the two states. But one call often make them remember by merely telling them during the trance that they shall remember. Acts of one trance, moreover, are usually recalled, either spontaneously or at command, during another trance, provided that the contents of the two trances be not mutually incompatible. Suggestibility The patient believes everything which his hypnotizer tells him, and does everything which the latter commands. Even results over which the will has normally no control, such as sneezing, secretion, reddening and growing pale, alterations of temperature and heartbeat, menstruation, action of the bowels, etc may take place in consequence of the operator's firm assertions during the hypnotic trance, and the resulting conviction on the, page 603, part of the subject, that the effects will occur. Since almost all the phenomena yet to be described are effects of this heightened suggestibility, I will say no more under the general head, but proceed to illustrate the peculiarity in detail. Effects on, the voluntary muscles seem to be those most easily got, and the ordinary routine of hypnotizing consists in provoking them first. Tell the patient that he cannot open his eyes or his mouth, cannot unclasp his hands or lower his raised arm, cannot rise from his seat or pick up a certain object from the floor. And he will be immediately smitten with absolute impotence in these regards. The effect here is generally due to the involuntary contraction of antagonizing muscles. But one can equally well suggest paralysis, of an arm for example, in which case it will hang perfectly placid by the subject's side. Cataleptic and tetanic rigidity are easily produced by suggestion, aided by handling the parts. One of the favorite shows at public exhibitions is that of a subject stretched stiff as a board with his head on one chair and his heels on another. The cataleptic retention of impressed attitudes differs from voluntary assumption of the same attitude. 
An arm voluntarily held out straight will drop from fatigue after a quarter of an hour at the at most, and before it falls the agent's distress will be made manifest by oscillations in the arm, disturbances in the breathing, etc. But Charcot has shown that an arm held out in hypnotic catalepsy, though it may as soon descend, yet does so slowly and with no accompanying vibration, whilst the breathing remains entirely calm. He rightly points out that this shows a profound physiological change, and is proof positive against simulation, as far as this symptom is concerned. A cataleptic attitude, moreover, may be held for many hours. Sometimes an expressive attitude, clinching of the fist, contraction of the brows, will gradually set up a sympathetic action of the other muscles of the body, so that at last a tableau vivant of fear, anger, disdain, prayer or other emotional condition, is produced with rare perfection. This effect would seem to be due to the suggestion of the mental state by the first contraction. Stammering, aphasia, or, page 604, inability to utter certain words, pronounce certain letters, are readily producible by suggestion. Hallucinations of all the senses and delusions of every conceivable kind can be easily suggested to good subjects. The emotional effects are then often so lively, and the pantomimic display so expressive, that it is hard not to believe in a certain, psychic hyperexcitability, as one of the concomitants of the hypnotic condition. You call make the subject think that he is freezing or burning, itching or covered with dirt, or wet, you can make him eat a potato for a peach or drink a cup of vinegar for a glass of champagne, 524, ammonia will smell to him like cologne water. A chair will be a lion, a broomstick a beautiful woman, a noise in the street will be an orchestral music, etc., etc., with no limit except your powers of invention and the patience of the lookers-on. 525. Illusions and hallucinations form the pieces de resistance at public exhibitions. The comic effect is at its climax when it is successfully suggested to the subject that his personality is changed into that of a baby, of a street boy, of a young lady dressing for a party, of a stump orator, or of Napoleon the Great. He may even be transformed into a beast, or an inanimate thing like a chair or a carpet, and in every case will act out all the details of the part with a sincerity and intensity seldom seen at the theatre. The excellence of the performance is in these cases the best reply to the suspicion that the subject may be shamming, so skillful a shammer must long since have found his true function in life upon the stage. Hallucinations and histrionic delusions generally go with a certain depth of the trance, and are followed, page 605, by complete forgetfulness. The subject awakens from them at the command of the operator with a sudden start of surprise, and may seem for a while a little dazed. Subjects in this condition will receive and execute suggestions of crime, and act out a theft, forgery, arson, or murder. A girl will believe that she is married to her hypnotizer, etc. It is unfair, however, to say that in these cases the subject is a pure puppet with no spontaneity. His spontaneity is certainly not in abeyance so far as things go which are harmoniously associated with the suggestion given him. He takes the text from his operator, but he may amplify and develop it enormously as he acts it out. His spontaneity is lost only for those systems of ideas which conflict with the suggested delusion, the latter is thus systematized. The rest of consciousness is shut off, excluded, dissociated from it. In extreme cases the rest of the mind would seem to be actually abolished and the hypnotic subject to be literally a changed personality, a being in one of those second states which we studied in chapter 10. But the reign of the delusion is often not as absolute as this. If the thing suggested be too intimately repugnant, the subject may strenuously resist and get nervously excited in consequence, even to the point of having an hysterical attack. The conflicting ideas slumber in the background and merely permit those in the foreground to have their way until a real emergency arises, then they assert their rights. As M. Delboeuf says, the subject surrenders himself good-naturedly to the performance, stabs with the pasteboard dagger you give him because he knows what it is, and fires off the pistol because he knows it has no ball. But for a real murder he would not be your man. It is undoubtedly true that subjects are often well aware that they are acting a part. They know that what they do is absurd. 
They know that the hallucination which they see, describe, and act upon, is not really there. They may laugh at themselves, and they always recognize the abnormality of their state when asked about it, and call it, sleep. One often notices a sort of mocking smile upon them, as if they mere playing a comedy, and they may even say on, coming to, that they were sham, page 606, Ming all the while. These facts have misled ultra-skeptical people so far as to make them doubt the genuineness of any hypnotic phenomena at all. But, save the consciousness of, sleep, they do not occur in the deeper conditions. And when they do occur they are only a natural consequence of the fact that the thumanoidism is incomplete. The background thoughts still exist, and have the power of comment on the suggestions, but no power to inhibit their motor and associative effects. A similar condition is frequent enough in the waking state, when an impulse carries us away and our will looks on wonderingly like an impotent spectator. These shammers continue to sham in just the same way, every new time you hypnotize them, until at last they are forced to admit that if shamming there be, it is something very different from the free voluntary shamming of waking hours. Real sensations may be abolished as well as false ones suggested. Legs and breasts may be amputated, children born, teeth extracted, in short the most painful experiences undergone, with no other anesthetic than the hypnotizer's assurance that no pain shall be felt. Similarly morbid pains may be annihilated, neuralgias, toothaches, rheumatisms cured. The sensation of hunger has thus been abolished, so that a patient took no nourishment for fourteen days. The most interesting of these suggested anesthesias are close limited to certain objects of perception. Thus a subject may be made blind to a certain person and to him alone, or deaf to certain words but to no others. 526, in this case the anesthesia, or negative hallucination, as it has been called, is apt to become systematized. Other things related to the person to whom one has been made blind may also be shut out of consciousness. What he says is not heard, his contact is not felt, objects which he takes from his pocket are not seen, etc. Objects which he screens are seen as if he were transparent. Facts about him are forgotten, his name is not recognized when pronounced. Of course there is great variety in the calm, page 607, pleatness of this systematic extension of the suggested anesthesia, but one may say that some tendency to it always exists. When one of the subject's own limbs is made anesthetic, for example, memories as well as sensations of its movements often seem to depart. An interesting degree of the phenomenon is found in the case related by M. Binet of a subject to whom it was suggested that a certain M. C. was invisible. She still saw M. C., but saw him as a stranger, having lost the memory of his name and his existence. Nothing is easier than to make subjects forget their own name and condition in life. It is one of the suggestions which most promptly succeed, even with quite fresh ones. A systematized amnesia of certain periods of one's life may also be suggested, the subject placed, for instance, where he was a decade ago with the intervening years obliterated from his mind. The mental condition which accompanies these systematized anesthesias and amnesias is a very curious one. The anesthesia is not a genuine sensorial one, for if you make a real red cross, say, on a sheet of white paper invisible to an hypnotic subject, and yet cause him to look fixedly at a dot on the paper on or near the cross, he will. On transferring his eye to a blank sheet, see a bluish-green afterimage of the cross. This proves that it has impressed his sensibility. He has felt it, but not perceived it. He had actively ignored it, refused to recognize it, as it were. Another experiment proves that he must distinguish it first in order thus to ignore it. Make a stroke on paper or blackboard, and tell the subject it is not there, and he will see nothing but the clean paper or board. Next, he not looking, surround the original stroke with other strokes exactly like it, and ask him what he sees. He will point out one by one all the new strokes slid omit the original one every time, no matter how numerous the new strokes may be, or in what order they are arranged. Similarly, if the original single stroke to which he is blind be doubled by a prism of sixteen degrees placed before one of his eyes, both being kept open, he will say that he now sees one stroke. 
and point in the direction in which the image seen through the prism lies. Page 608. Obviously, then, he is not blind to the kind of stroke in the least. He is blind only to one individual stroke of that kind in a particular position on the board or paper, that is, to a particular complex object. And, paradoxical as it may seem to say so, he must distinguish it with great accuracy from others like it, in order to remain blind to it when the others are brought near. He apperceives it as a preliminary to not seeing it at all. How to conceive of this state of mind is not easy. It would be much simpler to understand the process, if adding new strokes made the first one visible. There would then be two different objects apperceived as totals, paper with one stroke, paper with two strokes. And, blind to the former, he would see all that was in the latter, because he would have apperceived it as a different total in the first instance. A process of this sort occurs sometimes, not always, when the new strokes, instead of being mere repetitions of the original one, are lines which combine with it into a total effect, say a human face. The subject of the trance then may regain his sight of the line to which he had previously been blind, by seeing it as part of the face. When by a prism before one eye a previously invisible line has been made visible to that eye, and the other eye is closed or screened, its closure makes no difference, the line still remains visible. But if then the prism is removed, the line will disappear even to the eye which a moment ago saw it, and both eyes will revert to their original blind state. We have, then, to deal in these cases neither with a sensorial anesthesia, nor with a mere failure to notice, but with something much more complex, namely, an active counting out and positive exclusion of certain objects. It is as when one cuts an acquaintance, ignores a claim, or refuses to be influenced, by a consideration of whose existence one remains aware. Thus a lover of nature in America finds himself able to overlook and ignore entirely the board and rail fences and general roadside raggedness, and revel in the beauty and picturesqueness of the other elements of the landscape. Whilst to a newly, p. 609, arrived European the fences are so aggressively present as to spoil enjoyment. Messrs. Gurney, Janet, and Binet have shown that the ignored elements are preserved in a split-off portion of the subject's consciousness which can be tapped in certain ways, and made to give an account of itself, see Volume 1, page 209. Hyperesthesia of the senses is as common a symptom as anesthesia. On the skin two points can be discriminated at less than the normal distance. The sense of touch is so delicate that, as M. Delboeuf informs me, a subject after simply poising on her fingertips a blank card drawn from a pack of similar ones can pick it out from the pack again by its weight. We approach here the line where, to many persons, it seems as if something more than the ordinary senses, however sharpened, were required in explanation. I have seen a coin from the operator's pocket repeatedly picked out by the subject from a heap of twenty others, 527, by its greater weight in the subject's language. Auditory hyperesthesia may enable a subject to hear a watch tick, or his operator speak, in a distant room. One of the most extraordinary examples of visual hyperesthesia is that reported by Bergson, in which a subject who seemed to be reading through the back of a book held and looked at by the operator, was really proved to be reading the image of the page reflected on the latter's cornea. The same subject was able to discriminate with the naked eye details in a microscopic preparation. Such cases of hyperesthesia of vision as that reported by Taget and Saver, where subjects could see things mirrored by non-reflecting bodies, or through opaque pasteboard, would seem rather to belong to psychical research than to the present category. The ordinary test of visual hyperacuteness in hypnotism is the favorite trick of giving a subject the hallucination of a picture on a blank sheet of cardboard, and then mixing the latter with a lot of other similar sheets. The subject will always find the picture on the original sheet again, and recognize infallibly if it has been turned, page 610, over, or upside down, although the bystanders have to resort to artifice to identify it again. The subject notes peculiarities on the card, too small for waking observation to detect. 528, if it be said that the spectators guide him by their manner, their breathing, etc., 
that is only another proof of his hyperesthesia. For he undoubtedly is conscious of subtler personal indications, of his operator's mental states especially, than he could notice in his waking state. Examples of this are found in the so-called magnetic rapport. This is a name for the fact that in deep trance, or in lighter trance whenever the suggestion is made, the subject is deaf and blind to everyone but the operator or those spectators to whom the latter expressly awakens his senses. The most violent appeals from anyone else are for him as if non-existent, whilst he obeys the faintest signals on the part of his hypnotizer. If in catalepsy, his limbs will retain their attitude only when the operator moves them. When others move them they fall down, etc. A more remarkable fact still is that the patient will often answer anyone whom his operator touches, or at whom he even points his finger, in however concealed a manner. All which is rationally explicable by expectation and suggestion, if only it be farther admitted that his senses are acutely sharpened for all the operator's movements. 529. He often shows great anxiety and restlessness if the latter is out of the room. A favorite experiment of Mr. E. Gurney's was to put the subject's hands through an opaque screen and cause the operator to point at one finger. That finger presently grew insensible or rigid. A bystander pointing simultaneously at another finger never made that insensible or rigid. Of course the elective rapport with their operator had been developed in these, p. 611, trained subjects during the hypnotic state, but the phenomenon then occurred in some of them during the waking state, even when their consciousness was absorbed in animated conversation with a fourth party. 530. I confess that when I saw these experiments I was impressed with the necessity for admitting between the emanations from different people differences for which we have no name. And a discriminative sensibility for them of the nature of which we can form no clear conception, but which seems to be developed in certain subjects by the hypnotic trance. The enigmatic reports of the effect of magnets and metals, even if they be due, as many contend, to unintentional suggestion on the operator's part, certainly involve hypersthetic perception. For the operator seeks as well as possible to conceal the moment when the magnet is brought into play, and yet the subject not only finds it out that moment in a way difficult to understand, but may develop effects which, in the first instance certainly, the operator did not expect to find. Unilateral contractures, movements, paralyses, hallucinations, etc., are made to pass to tile other side of the body, hallucinations to disappear, or to change to the complementary color, suggested emotions to pass into their opposites, etc. Many Italian observations agree with the French ones, and the upshot is that if unconscious suggestion lie at the bottom of this matter, the patients show an enormously exalted power of divining what it is they are expected to do. This hypersthetic perception is what concerns us now. 531. Its modus cannot yet be said to be defined. Page 612. Changes in the nutrition of the tissues may be produced by suggestion. These effects lead into therapeutics a subject which I do not propose to treat of here. But I may say that there seems no reasonable ground for doubting that in certain chosen subjects the suggestion of a congestion, a burn, a blister, a raised papule, or a bleeding from the nose or skin, may produce the effect. Messrs, Bonis, Bergen, Bernheim, Buru, Burette, Charcot, Delboeuf, Dumontpelier, Fakashan, Farrell, Yendrasik, Kraft Tebein, Leibolt, Legiois, Lip, Mabil, and others have recently vouched for one or other of these effects. Messrs. Delboeuf and Legiois have annulled by suggestion, one the effects of a burn, the other of a blister. Delboeuf was led to his experiments after seeing a burn on the skill produced by suggestion, at the Salopetriere, by reasoning that if the idea of a pain could produce inflammation it must be because pain was itself an inflammatory irritant. And that the abolition of it from a real burn ought therefore to entail the absence of inflammation. He applied the actual cautery, as well as vesicants, to symmetrical places on the skin, affirming that no pain should be felt on one of the sides. The result was a dry scorch on that side, with, as he assures me, no aftermark, but on the other side a regular blister with suppuration and a subsequent scar. This explains the inacuity of certain assaults made on subjects during trance. 
To test stimulation, recourse is often had to sticking pills under their fingernails or through their tongue, to inhalations of strong ammonia, and the like. These irritations, when not felt by the subject, seem to leave no after consequences. One is reminded of the reported non-inflammatory character of the wounds made on themselves by dervishes in their pious orgies. On the other hand, the reddenings and bleedings of the skin along certain lines, suggested by tracing lines or pressing objects thereupon, put the accounts handed down to us of the stigmata of the cross appearing oil the hands, feet, sides, and forehead of certain Catholic mystics in a new light. As so often happens, a fact is denied until a welcome interpretation comes with it. Then it is admitted readily enough, an evidence judged quite insufficient to back a claim, so long as the Church had an interest in making it, proves to p. 613, be quite sufficient for modern scientific enlightenment, the moment it appears that a reputed saint can thereby be classed as a case of hysteroepilepsy. There remain two other topics, this. Post-hypnotic effects of suggestion, and effects of suggestion in the waking state. Post-hypnotic, or deferred, suggestions are such as are given to the patients during trance, to take effect after waking. They succeed with a certain number of patients even when the execution is named for a remote period, months or even a year, in one case reported by M. Legiois. In this way one can make the patient feel a pain, or be paralyzed, or be hungry or thirsty, or have an hallucination, positive or negative, or perform some fantastic action after emerging from his trance. The effect in question may be ordered to take place not immediately, but after an interval of time has elapsed, and the interval may be left to the subject to measure, or may be marked by a certain signal. The moment the signal occurs, or the time is run out, the subject, who until then seems in a perfectly normal waking condition, will experience the suggested effect. In many instances, whilst thus obedient to the suggestion, he seems to fall into the hypnotic condition again. This is proved by the fact that the moment the hallucination or suggested performance is over he forgets it, denies all knowledge of it, and so forth. And by the further fact that he is suggestible during its performance, that is, will receive new hallucinations, etc., at command. A moment later and this suggestibility has disappeared. It cannot be said, however, that relapse into the trance is an absolutely necessary condition for the post-hypnotic carrying out of commands, for the subject may be neither suggestible nor amnesic, and may struggle with all the strength of his will against the absurdity of this impulse which he feels rising in him, he knows not why. In these cases, as in most cases, he forgets the circumstance of the impulse having been suggested to him in a previous trance, regards it as arising within himself and often improvises, as he yields to it, some more or less plausible or ingenious motive by which to justify it to, page 614, the lookers-on. He acts, in short, with his usual sense of personal spontaneity and freedom. And the disbelievers in the freedom of the will have naturally made much of these cases in their attempts to show it be an illusion. The only really mysterious feature of these deferred suggestions is the patient's absolute ignorance during the interval preceding their execution that they have been deposited in his mind. They will often surge up at the pre-appointed time, even though you have vainly tried a while before to make him recall the circumstances of their production. The most important class of post-hypnotic suggestions are, of course, those relative to the patient's health, bowels, sleep, and other bodily functions. Among the most interesting, apart from the hallucinations, are those relative to future trances. One can determine the hour and minute, or the signal, at which the patient will of his own accord lapse into trace again. One can make him susceptible in the future to another operator who may have been unsuccessful with him in the past. Or more important still in certain cases, one can, by suggesting that certain person shall never be able hereafter to put him to sleep, remove him for all future time from hypnotic influences which might be dangerous. This, indeed, is the simple and natural safeguard against those dangers of hypnotism, of which uninstructed persons talk so vaguely. A subject who knows himself to be ultra-susceptible should never allow himself to be entranced by an operator in whose moral delicacy he lacks complete confidence. 
and he can use a trusted operator's suggestions to protect himself against liberties which others, knowing his weakness, might tempt it to take with him. The mechanism by which the command is retained until the moment for its execution arrives is a mystery which give rise to much discussion. The experiments of Gurney and the observations of M. Pierre Janet and others on certain hysterical somnambulists seem to prove that it is stored up in consciousness. Not simply organically registered, but that the consciousness which thus retains it is split off, dissociated from the rest of the subject's mind. We have here, in short, an experimental production of one of those second states of the personality of which we have spoken so often. Only here that, page 615, second state coexists as well as alternates with the first. Gurney had the brilliant idea of tapping this second consciousness by means of the planchette. He found that certain persons, who were both hypnotic subjects and automatic writers, would if their hands were placed on a planchette, after being wakened from a trance in which they had received the suggestion of something to be done at a later time, write out unconsciously the order, or something connected with it. This shows that something inside of them, which could express itself through the hand alone, was continuing to think of the order, and possibly of it alone. These researchers have opened a new vista of possible experimental investigations into the so-called second states of the personality. Some subjects seem almost as obedient to suggestion in the waking state as in sleep, or even more so, according to certain observers. Not only muscular phenomena, but changes of personality and hallucinations are recorded as the result of simple affirmation on the operator's part, without the previous ceremony of magnetizing or putting into the mesmeretic sleep. These are all trained subjects, however, so far as I know, and the affirmation must apparently be accompanied by the patient concentrating his attention and gazing, however briefly, into the eyes of the operator. It is probable therefore that an extremely rapidly induced condition of trance is a prerequisite for success in these experiments. I have now made mention of all the more important phenomena of the hypnotic trance. Of their therapeutic or forensic bearings this is not the proper place to speak. The recent literature of the subject is quite voluminous, but much of it consists in repetition. The best compendious work on the subject is, Der Hypnoismus, by Dr. A. Moll, Berlin, 1889, and just translated into English, N.Y., 1890, which is extraordinarily complete and judicious. The other writings most recommendable apes subjoined in the note. 532. Most of them contain a historical sketch and much bibliography. A complete bibliography has been published by M. Desoir, Berlin, 1888. Chapter 28. Necessary Truths and the Effects of Experience In this final chapter one shall treat of what has sometimes been called psychogenesis. And try to ascertain just how far the connections of things in the outward environment can account for our tendency to think of, and to react upon, certain things in certain ways and in no others. Even though personally we have had of the things in question no experience, or almost no experience, at all. It is a familiar truth that some propositions are necessary. We must attach the predicate equal to the subject opposite sides of a parallelogram if we think those terms together at all, whereas we need not in any such way attach the predicate rainy, for example, to the subject tomorrow. The dubious sort of coupling of terms is universally admitted to be due to experience, the certain sort is ascribed to the organic structure of the mind. This structure is in turn supposed by the so-called a priorists to be of transcendental origin, or at any rate not to be explicable by experience. Whilst by evolutionary empiricists it is supposed to be also due to experience, only not to the experience of the individual, but to that of his ancestors as far back as one may please to go. Our emotional and instinctive tendencies, our irresistible impulses to couple certain movements with the perception or thought of certain things, are also features of our connate mental structure, and like the necessary judgments, are interpreted by the a priorists and the empiricists in the same warring ways. I shall try in the course of the chapter to make plain three things. One, that, taking the word experience as it is universally understood, the experience of the race can no more account, p. 618, 
for our necessary or a priori judgments than the experience of the individual can. 2. That there is no good evidence for the belief that our instinctive reactions are fruits of our ancestors' education in the midst of the same environment, transmitted to us at birth. 3. That the features of our organic mental structure cannot be explained at all by our conscious intercourse with the outer environment, but must rather be understood as congenital variations, accidental, 533, in the first instance. But then transmitted as fixed features of the race. On the whole, then, the account which the a priorists give of the facts is that which I defend, although I should contend, as will hereafter appear, for a naturalistic view of their cause. The first thing I have to say is that all schools, however they otherwise differ, must allow that the elementary qualities of cold, heat, pleasure, pain, red, blue, sound, silence, etc. are original, innate, or a priori properties of our subjective nature, even though they should require the touch of experience to waken them into actual consciousness, and should slumber, to all eternity, without it. This is so on either of the two hypotheses we may make concerning the relation of the feelings to the realities at whose touch they become alive. For in the first place, if a feeling do not mirror the reality which wakens it and to which we say it corresponds, if it mirror no reality whatever outside of the mind, it of course is a purely mental product. By its very definition it can be nothing else. But in the second place, even if it do mirror the reality exactly, Still it is not that reality itself, it is a duplication of it, the result of a mental reaction. And that the mind should have the power of reacting in just that duplicate way can only be stated as a harmony between its nature and the nature of the truth outside of it, a harmony whereby it follows that the qualities of both parties match. p. 619. The originality of these elements is not, then, a question for dispute. The warfare of philosophers is exclusively relative to their forms of combination. The empiricist maintains that these forms can only follow the order of combination in which the elements were originally awakened by the impressions of the external world. The a priorists insist, on the contrary, that some modes of combination, at any rate, follow from the natures of the elements themselves, and that no amount of experience can modify this result. What is meant by experience? The phrase, organic mental structure, names the matter in dispute. Has the mind such a structure or not? Are its contents arranged from the start, or is the arrangement they may possess simply due to the shuffling of them by experience in an absolutely plastic bed? Now the first thing to make sure of is that when we talk of, experience, we attach a definite meaning to the word. Experience means experience of something foreign supposed to impress us, whether spontaneously or in consequence of our own exertions and acts. Impressions, as we well know, affect certain orders of sequence and coexistence, and the mind's habits copy the habits of the impressions. So that our images of things assume a time and space arrangement which resembles the time and space arrangements outside. To uniform outer coexistences and sequences correspond constant conjunctions of ideas, to fortuitous coexistences and sequences casual conjunctions of ideas. We are sure that fire will burn and water wet us, less sure that thunder will come after lightning, not at all sure whether a strange dog will bark at us or let us go by. In these ways experience molds us every hour, and makes of our minds a mirror of the time and space connections between the things in the world. The principle of habit within us so fixes the copy at last that we find it difficult even to imagine how the outward order could possibly be different from what it is, and we continually divine from the present what the future is to be. These habits of transition, from one thought to another, are features of mental structure which were lack, page 620, ing in us at birth. We can see their growth under experience's molding finger, and we can see how often experience undoes her own work, and for an earlier order substitutes a new one. The order of experience, in this matter of the time and space conjunctions of things, is thus an indisputably vera causa of our forms of thought. It is our educator, our sovereign helper and friend. And its name, standing for something with so real and definite a use, ought to be kept sacred and encumbered with no vaguer meaning. If all the connections among ideas in the mind could be interpreted as so many combinations of sense data wrought into fixity in this way from without. 
then experience in the common and legitimate sense of the word would be the sole fashioner of the mind. The empirical school in psychology has in the main contended that they can be so interpreted. Before our generation, it was the experience of the individual only which was meant. But when one nowadays says that the human mind owes its present shape to experience, he means the experience of ancestors as well. Mr. Spencer's statement of this is the earliest emphatic one. And deserves quotation in full frowny face 534. The supposition that the inner cohesions are adjusted to the outer persistences by accumulated experience of those outer persistences is in harmony with all our actual knowledge of mental phenomena. Though in so far as reflex actions and instincts are concerned, the experience hypothesis seems insufficient, yet its seeming insufficiency occurs only where the evidence is beyond our reach. Nay, even here such few facts as we can get point to the conclusion that automatic psychical connections result from the registration of experiences continued for numberless generations. In brief, the case stands thus, it is agreed that all psychical relations, save the absolutely indissoluble, are determined by experiences. Their various strengths are admitted, other things equal, to be proportionate to the multiplication of experiences. It is an unavoidable, page 621, corollary that an infinity of experiences will produce a, psychical relation that is indissoluble. Though such infinity of experiences cannot be received by a single individual, yet it may be received by the succession of individuals forming a race. And if there is a transmission of induced tendencies in the nervous system, it is inferable that all psychical relations whatever, from the necessary to the fortuitous, result from the experiences of the corresponding external relations. And are so brought into harmony with them. Thus, the experience hypothesis furnishes an adequate solution. The genesis of instinct, the development of memory and reason out of it, and the consolidation of rational actions and inferences into instinctive ones are alike explicable on the single principle that the cohesion between psychical states is proportionate to the frequency with which the relation between the answering external phenomena has been repeated in experience. The universal law that, other things equal, the cohesion of psychical states is proportionate to the frequency with which they have followed one another in experience, supplies an explanation of the so-called forms of thought. As soon as it is supplemented by the law that habitual psychical successions entail some hereditary tendency to such successions, which, under persistent conditions, will become cumulative in generation after generation. We saw that the establishment of those compound reflex actions called instincts is comprehensible on the principle that inner relations are, by perpetual repetition, organized into correspondence with outer relations. We have now to observe that the establishment of those consolidated, those indissoluble, those instinctive mental relations constituting our ideas of space and time is comprehensible on the same principle. For if even to external relations that are often experienced during the life of a single organism, answering internal relations are established that become next to automatic if such a combination of psychical changes as that which guides a savage in hitting a bird with an arrow becomes, by constant repetition, so organized as to be performed almost without thought of the processes of adjustment gone through and if skill of this kind is so far transmissible that particular races of men become characterized by particular aptitudes, which are nothing else than partially organized psychical connections. Then, if there exist certain external relations which are experienced by all organisms at all instants of their waking lives, relations which are absolutely constant, absolutely universal, there will be established answering internal relations that are absolutely constant, absolutely universal. Such relations we have in those of space and time. The organization of subjective relations adjusted to these objective relations has been cumulative, not in each race of creatures only, but throughout successive races of creatures. And such subjective relations have, therefore, become more consolidated than all others. Being experienced in every perception and every action of each creature, these connections among outer existences must, for this reason too, be, p. 622, responded to by connections among inner feelings, that are, above all others, indissoluble. As the substrata of all other relations in the non-ego, 
they must be responded to by conceptions that are the substrata of all other relations in the ego. Being the constant and infinitely repeated elements of thought, they must become the automatic elements of thought, the elements of thought which it is impossible to get rid of, the forms of intuition. Such, it seems to me, is the only possible reconciliation between the experience hypothesis and the hypothesis of the transcendentalists, neither of which is tenable by itself. Insurmountable difficulties are presented by the Kantian doctrine, as we shall, hereafter see, and the antagonist doctrine, taken alone, presents difficulties that are equally insurmountable. To rest with the unqualified assertion that, antecedent to experience, the mind is a blank, is to ignore the questions, whence comes the power of organizing experiences? Whence arise the different degrees of that power possessed by different races of organisms, and different individuals of the same race? If, at birth, there exists nothing but a passive receptivity of impressions, why is not a horse as educable as a man? Should it be said that language makes the difference, then why do not the cat and the dog, reared in the same household, arrive at equal degrees and kinds of intelligence. Understood in its current form, the experience hypothesis implies that the presence of a definitely organized nervous system is a circumstance of no moment a fact not needing to be taken into account. Yet it is the all-important fact the fact to which, in one sense, the criticisms of Leibniz and others pointed, the fact without which an assimilation of experiences is inexplicable. Throughout the animal kingdom in general, the actions are dependent on the nervous structure. The physiologist shows us that each reflex movement implies the agency of certain nerves and ganglia. That a development of complicated instincts is accompanied by complication of the nervous centers and their commissural connections. That the same creature in different stages, as larva and imago for example, changes its instincts as its nervous structure changes. And that as we advance to creatures of high intelligence, a vast increase in the size and in the complexity of the nervous system takes place. What is the obvious inference? It is that the ability to coordinate impressions and to perform the appropriate actions always implies the pre-existence of certain nerves arranged in a certain way. What is the meaning of the human brain? It is that the many established relations among its parts stand for so many established relations among the psychical changes. Each of the constant connections among the fibers of the cerebral masses answers to some constant connection of phenomena in the experiences of the race. Just as the organized arrangement subsisting between the sensory nerves of the nostrils and the motor nerves of the respiratory muscles not only makes possible a sneeze, but also, in the newly born infant, implies sneezings to be hereafter performed. So, all the organized arrangements subsisting among the nerves of the P. 623, infant's brain not only make possible certain combinations of impressions, but also imply that such combinations will hereafter be made, imply that there are answering combinations in the outer world imply a preparedness to cognize these combinations imply faculties of comprehending them. It is true that the resulting compound psychical changes do not take place with the same readiness and automatic precision as the simple reflex action instanced, it is true that some individual experiences seem required to establish them. But while this is partly due to the fact that these combinations are highly involved, extremely varied in their modes of occurrence, made up therefore of psychical relations less completely coherent, and hence need further repetitions to perfect them. It is in a much greater degree due to the fact that at birth the organization of the brain is incomplete, and does not cease its spontaneous progress for twenty or thirty years afterwards. Those who contend that knowledge results wholly from the experiences of the individual, ignoring as they do the mental evolution which accompanies the autogenous development of the nervous system, fall into an error as great as if they were to ascribe all bodily growth and structure to exercise, forgetting the innate tendency to assume the adult form. Were the infant born with a full-sized and completely constructed brain, their position would be less untenable. But, as the case stands, the gradually increasing intelligence displayed throughout childhood and youth is more attributable to the completion of the cerebral organization than to the individual experiences, a truth proved by the fact that in adult life there is sometimes displayed a high endowment of some faculty which during education, was never brought into play. 
Doubtless, experiences received by the individual furnish the concrete materials for all thought. Doubtless, the organized and semi-organized arrangements existing among the cerebral nerves can give no knowledge until there has been a presentation of the external relations to which they correspond. And doubtless the child's daily observations and reasonings aid the formation of those involved nervous connections that are in process of spontaneous evolution, just as its daily gambles aid the development of its limbs. But saying this is quite a different thing from saying that its intelligence is wholly produced by its experiences. That is an utterly inadmissible doctrine, a doctrine which makes the presence of a brain meaningless, a doctrine which makes idiocy, sick, unaccountable. In the sense, then, that there exist in the nervous system certain pre-established relations answering to relations in the environment, there is truth in the doctrine of forms of intuition, not the truth which its defenders suppose. But a parallel truth. Corresponding to absolute external relations, there are established in the structure of the nervous system absolute internal relations, relations that are potentially present before birth in the shape of definite nervous connections. That are antecedent to, and independent of, individual experiences, and that are automatically disclosed along with the first cognitions. And, p. 624, as here understood, it is not only these fundamental relations which are thus predetermined, but also hosts of other relations of a more or less constant kind, which are congenitally represented by more or less complete nervous connections. But these predetermined internal relations, though independent of the experiences of the individual, are not independent of experiences in general, they have been determined by the experiences of preceding organisms. The corollary here drawn from the general argument is that the human brain is an organized register of infinitely numerous experiences received during the evolution of life. Or rather during the evolution of that series of organisms through which the human organism has been reached. The effects of the most uniform and frequent of these experiences have been successively bequeathed, principal and interest and have slowly amounted to that high intelligence which lies latent in the brain of the infant, which the infant in afterlife exercises and perhaps strengthens or further complicates and which, with minute additions, it bequeaths to future generations. And thus it happens that the European inherits from 20 to 30 cubic inches more brain than the Papuan. Thus it happens that faculties, as of music, which scarcely exist in some inferior human races, become congenital in superior ones. Thus it happens that out of savages unable to count up to the number of their fingers, and speaking a language containing only nouns and verbs, arise at length our Newtons and Shakespeare's. This is a brilliant and seductive statement, and it doubtless includes a good deal of truth. Unfortunately it fails to go into details. And when the details are scrutinized, as they soon must be by us, many of them will be seen to be inexplicable in this simple way, and the choice will then remain to us either of denying the experiential origin of certain of our judgments, or of enlarging the meaning of the word experience so as to include these cases among its effects. Two modes of origin of brain structure. If we adopt the former course we meet with a controversial difficulty. The experience philosophy has from time immemorial been the opponent of theological modes of thought. The word experience has a halo of anti-supernaturalism about it, so that if anyone expressed dissatisfaction with any function claimed for it, he is liable to be treated as if he could only be animated by loyalty to the p. 625, catechism, or in some way have the interests of obscurantism at heart. I am entirely certain that, on this ground alone, what I have ere allowing, sick, to say will make this a sealed chapter to many of my readers. He denies experience. They will exclaim, denies science, believes the mind created by miracle, is a regular old partisan of innate ideas. That is enough. We'll listen to such antediluvian twaddle no more. Regrettable as is the loss of readers capable of such wholesale discipleship, I feel that a definite meaning for the word experience is even more important than their company. Experience does not mean every natural, as opposed to every supernatural, cause. It means a particular sort of natural agency, alongside of which other more recondite natural agencies may perfectly well exist. With the scientific animus of anti-supernaturalism we ought to agree, 
but we ought to free ourselves from its verbal idols and bugbears. Nature has many methods of producing the same effect. She may make a born and draftsman or singer by tipping in a certain direction at an opportune moment the molecules of some human ovum, or she may bring forth a child ungifted and make him spend laborious but successful years at school. She may make our ears ring by the sound of a bell, or by a dose of quinine, make us see yellow by spreading a field of buttercups before our eyes, or by mixing a little santonine powder with our food. Fill us with terror of certain surroundings by making them really dangerous, or by a blow which produces a pathological alteration of our brain. It is obvious that we need two words to designate these two modes of operating. In the one case the natural agents produce perceptions which take cognizance of the agents themselves, in the other case, they produce perceptions which take cognizance of something else. What is taught to the mind by the experience, in the first case, is the order of the experience itself, the inner relation, in Spencer's phrase, corresponds to the outer relation, which produced it, by remembering and knowing the latter. But in the case of the other sort of natural agency, what is taught to the mind has nothing to do with the agency, page 626, itself, but with some different outer relation altogether. A diagram will express the alternatives. B stands for our human brain in the midst of the world. All the little O's with arrows proceeding from them are natural objects, like sunsets, etc. Which impress it through the senses, and in the strict sense of the word give it experience, teaching it by habit and association what is the order of their ways. All the little X's inside the brain and all the little X's outside of it are other natural objects and processes, in the ovum, in the blood, etc., which equally modify the brain, but mold it to no cognition of themselves. The tinnitus aureum discloses no properties of the quinine, the musical endowment teaches no embryology, the morbid dread, of solitude, perhaps, no brain pathology. But the way in which a dirty sunset and a rainy morrow hang together in the mind copies and teaches the sequences of sunsets and rainfall in the outer world. In zoological evolution we have two modes in which an animal race may grow to be a better match for its environment. First, the so-called way of adaptation, in which the environment may itself modify its inhabitant by exercising, hardening, and habituating him to certain sequences, and these habits may, it is often maintained, become hereditary. Second, the way of accidental variation, as Mr. Darwin termed it, in which certain young are born with peculiarities that help them and their progeny to survive. That variations of this sort tend to become hereditary, no one doubts. P. 627, the first mode is called by Mr. Spencer direct, the second indirect, equilibration. Both equilibrations must of course be natural and physical processes, but they belong to entirely different physical spheres. The direct influences are obvious and accessible things. The causes of variation in the young are, on the other hand, molecular and hidden. The direct influences are the animal's experiences, in the widest sense of the term. Where what is influenced by them is the mental organism, they are conscious experiences, and become the objects as well as the causes of their effects. That is, the effect consists in a tendency of the experience itself to be remembered, or to have its elements thereafter coupled in imagination just as they were coupled in the experience. In the diagram these experiences are represented by the O's exclusively. The X's, on the other hand, stand for the indirect causes of mental modification, causes of which we are not immediately conscious as such, and which are not the direct objects of the effects they produce. Some of them are molecular accidents before birth, some of them are collateral and remote combinations, unintended combinations, one might say, of more direct effects wrought in the unstable and intricate brain tissue. Such a result is unquestionably the susceptibility to music, which some individuals possess at the present day. It has no zoological utility, it corresponds to no object in the natural environment. It is a pure incident of having a hearing organ, an incident depending on such instable and inessential conditions that one brother may have it and another brother not. Just so with the susceptibility to seasickness, which, so far from being engendered by long experience of its object, if a heaving deck can be called its object, is ere long annulled thereby. 
Our higher aesthetic, moral, and intellectual life seems made up of affections of this collateral and incidental sort, which have entered the mind by the back stairs, as it were, or rather have not entered the mind at all. But got surreptitiously born in the house. No one can successfully treat of psychogenesis, or the factors of mental evolution, without distinguishing between these two ways in which the mind is assailed. Page 628, The way of experience proper is the front door, the door of the five senses. The agents which affect the brain in this way immediately become the mind's objects. The other agents do not. It would be simply silly to say of two men with perhaps equal effective skill in drawing, one an untaught natural genius, the other a mere obstinate plotter in the studio, that both alike owe their skill to their experience. The reasons of their several skills lie in wholly disparate natural cycles of causation. 535. I will then, with the reader's permission, restrict the word experience to processes which influence the mind by the front doorway of simple habits and association. What the back door effects may be will probably grow clearer, p. 629, as we proceed, so I will pass right on to a scrutiny of the actual mental structure which we find. The Genesis of the Elementary Mental Categories We find, 1. Elementary sorts of sensation, and feelings of personal activity. 2. Emotions Desires, instincts, ideas of worth, aesthetic ideas. 3. Ideas of time and space and number. 4. Ideas of difference and resemblance, and of their degrees. 5. Ideas of causal dependence among events of end and means, of subject and attribute. 6. Judgments affirming, denying, doubting, supposing any of the above ideas. 7. Judgments that the former judgments logically involve, exclude, or are indifferent to, each other. Now we may postulate at the outset that all these forms of thought have a natural origin, if we could only get at it. That assumption must be made at the outset of every scientific investigation, or there is no temptation to proceed. But the first account of their origin which we are likely to hit upon is a snare. All these mental affections are ways of knowing objects. Most psychologists nowadays believe that the objects first, in some natural way, engendered a brain from out of their midst, and then imprinted these various cognitive affections upon it. But how? The ordinary evolutionist answer to this question is exceedingly simple-minded. The idea of most speculators seems to be that, since it suffices now for us to become acquainted with a complex object, that it should be simply present to us often enough, so it must be fair to assume universally that, with time enough given, the mere presence of the various objects and relations to be known must end by bringing about the latter's cognition, and that in this way all mental structure was from first to last evolved. Any ordinary Spencerite will tell you that just as the experience of blue objects wrought into our mind the color blue, and hard objects got it to feel hardness, so the presence of large and small objects in the world gave it the notion of, p. 630, size, moving objects made it aware of motion, and objective successions taught it time. Similarly in a world with different impressing things, the mind had to acquire a sense of difference, whilst the like parts of the world as they fell upon it kindled in it the perception of similarity. Outward sequences which sometimes held good, and sometimes failed, naturally engendered in it doubtful and uncertain forms of expectation, and ultimately gave rise to the disjunctive forms of judgment. Whilst the hypothetic form, if A, then B, was sure to ensue from sequences that were invariable in the outer world. On this view, if the outer order suddenly were to change its elements and modes, we should have no faculties to cognize the new order by. At most we should feel a sort of frustration and confusion. But little by little the new presence would work on us as the old one did, and in course of time another set of psychic categories would arise, fitted to take cognizance of the altered world. This notion of the outer world inevitably building up a sort of mental duplicate of itself if we only give it time, is so easy and natural in its vagueness that one hardly knows how to start to criticize it. One thing, however, is obvious, namely that the manner in which we now become acquainted with complex objects need not in the least resemble the manner in which the original elements of our consciousness grew up. 
Now, it is true, a new sort of animal need only be present to me, to impress its image permanently on my mind. But this is because I am already in possession of categories for knowing each and all of its several attributes, and of a memory for retracing the order of their conjunction. I now have preformed categories for all possible objects. The objects need only awaken these from their slumber. But it is a very different matter to account for the categories themselves. I think we must admit that the origin of the various elementary feelings is a recondite history, even after some sort of neural tissue is there for the outer world to begin its work on. The mere existence of things to be known is even now not, as a rule, sufficient to bring about a knowledge of them. Our abstract and general discoveries usually come to us as lucky fancies, and it is only a prey, p. 631, coup that we find that they correspond to some reality. What immediately produced them were previous thoughts, with which, and with the brain processes of which, that reality had not to do. Why may it not have been so of the original elements of consciousness, sensation, time, space, resemblance, difference, and other relations? Why may they not have come into being by the backdoor method, by such physical processes as lie more in the sphere of morphological accident, of inward summation of effects, than in that of the sensible presence of objects? Why may they not, in short, be pure idiosyncrasies, spontaneous variations, fitted by good luck, those of them which have survived, to take cognizance of objects, that is, to steer us in our active dealings with them? without being in any intelligible sense immediate derivatives from them? I think we shall find this view gain more and more plausibility as we proceed, 536. All these elements are subjective duplicates of outer objects. They are not the outer objects. The secondary qualities among them are not supposed by any educated person even to resemble the objects. Their nature depends more on the reacting brain than on the stimuli which touch it off. This is even more palpably true of the natures of pleasure and pain, effort, desire and aversion, and of such feelings as those of cause and substance, of denial and of, page 632, doubt. Here then is a native wealth of inner forms whose origin is shrouded in mystery, and which at any rate were not simply impressed from without, in any intelligible sense of the verb, to impress. Their time and space relations, however, are impressed from without for two outer things at least the evolutionary psychologist must believe to resemble our thoughts of them, these are the time and space in which the objects lie. The time and space relations between things do stamp copies of themselves within. Things juxtaposed in space impress us, and continue to be thought, in the relation in which they exist there. Things sequent in time, ditto. And thus, through experience in the legitimate sense of the word, there can be truly explained an immense number of our mental habitudes, many of our abstract beliefs, and all our ideas of concrete things, and of their ways of behavior. Such truths as that fire burns and water wets, that glass refracts, heat melts snow, fishes live in water and die on land, and the like, form no small part of the most refined education. And are the all in all of education amongst the brutes and lowest men? Here the mind is passive and tributary, a servile copy, fatally and unresistingly fashioned from without. It is the merit of the associationist school to have seen the wide scope of these effects of neighborhood in time and space. And their exaggerated applications of the principle of mere neighborhood ought not to blind us to the excellent service it has done to psychology in their hands. As far as a large part of our thinking goes, then, it can intelligibly be formulated as a mere lot of habits impressed upon us from without. The degree of cohesion of our inner relations, is, in this part of our thinking, proportionate, in Mr. Spencer's phrase, to the degree of cohesion of the outer relations, the causes and the objects of our thought are one. And we are, in so far forth, what the materialistic evolutionists would have us altogether, mere offshoots and creatures of our environment, and not besides, 537. p. 633. But now the plot thickens, for the images impressed upon our memory by the outer stimuli are not restricted to the mere time and space relations, in which they originally came. But revive in various manners, dependent on the intricacy of the brain paths and the instability of the tissue thereof, 
and form secondary combinations such as the forms of judgment, which, taken per se, are not congruent either with the forms in which reality exists or in those in which experiences befall us, but which may nevertheless be explained by the way in which experiences befall in a mind gifted with memory, expectation, and the possibility of feeling doubt, curiosity, belief, and denial. The conjunctions of experience befall more or less invariably, variably, or never. The idea of one term will then engender a fixed, a wavering, or a negative expectation of another, giving affirmative, the hypothetical, disjunctive, interrogative, and negative judgments. And judgments of actuality and possibility about certain things. The separation of attribute from subject in all judgments, which violates the way in which nature exists, may be similarly explained by the piecemeal order in which our perceptions come to us, a vague nucleus growing gradually more detailed as we attend to it more and more. These particular secondary mental forms have had ample justice done them by associationists from Hume downwards. Associationists have also sought to account for discrimination, abstraction, and generalization by the rates of frequency in which attributes come to us conjoined. With much less success, I think. In the chapter on discrimination, I have, under the law of dissociation by varying concomitants, sought to explain as much as possible by the passive order of experience. But the reader saw how much was left for active interest and unknown forces to do. In the chapter on imagination I have similarly striven to do justice to the blended image theory of generalization and abstraction. So I need say no more of these matters here. The Genesis of the Natural Sciences Our scientific ways of thinking the outer reality are highly abstract ways. The essence of things for science is, p. 634, not to be what they seem, but to be atoms and molecules moving to and from each other according to strange laws. Nowhere does the account of inner relations produced by outer ones in proportion to the frequency with which the latter have been met, more egregiously break down than in the case of scientific conceptions. The order of scientific thought is quite incongruent either with the way in which reality exists or with the way in which it comes before us. Scientific thought goes by selection and emphasis exclusively. We break the solid plenitude of fact into separate essences, conceive generally what only exists particularly, and by our classifications leave nothing in its natural neighborhood, but separate the contiguous, and join what the poles divorce. The reality exists as a plenum. All its parts are contemporaneous, each is as real as any other, and each is essential for making the whole just what it is and nothing else. But we can neither experience nor think this plenum. What we experience, what comes before us, is a chaos of fragmentary impressions interrupting each other wink with a frown 538, what we think is an abstract system of hypothetical data and laws, 539. p. 635, this sort of scientific algebra, little as it immediately resembles the reality given to us, turns out, strangely, page 636, enough, applicable to it. That is, it yields expressions which, at given places and times, can be translated into real values, or interpreted as definite portions of the chaos that falls upon our sense. It becomes thus a practical guide to our expectations as well as a theoretic delight. But I do not see how anyone with a sense for the facts can possibly call our systems immediate results of experience, in the ordinary sense. Every scientific conception is in the first instance a spontaneous variation, in someone's brain, 540, for one that proves useful and applicable there are a thousand that perish through their worthlessness. Their genesis is strictly akin to that of the flashes of poetry and sallies of wit to which the instable brain paths equally give rise. But whereas the poetry and wit, like the science of the ancients, are their own excuse for being, and have to run the gauntlet of no farther test, that a scientific conceptions must prove their worth by being verified. This test, however, is the cause of their preservation, not that of their production. And one might as well account for the origin of Artemis Ward's jokes by the cohesion of subjects with predicates in proportion to the persistence of the outer relations to which they correspond as to treat the genesis of scientific conceptions. 
in the same ponderously unreal way. The most persistent outer relations which science believes in are never matters of experience at all, but have to be disengaged from under experience by a process of elimination, that is, by ignoring conditions which are always present. The elementary laws of mechanics, physics, and chemistry are all of this sort. The principle of uniformity in nature is of this sort, it has to be sought under and in spite of the most rebellious appearances, and our convict, p. 637, tie-in of its truth is far more like a religious faith than like assent to a demonstration. The only cohesions which experience in the literal sense of the word produces in our mind are, as we contended some time back, the proximate laws of nature, and habitudes of concrete things, that heat melts ice, that salt preserves meat. That fish die out of water, and the like. 541, such empirical truths as these we, page 638, admitted to form an enormous part of human wisdom. The scientific truths have to harmonize with these truths, or be given up as useless. But they arise in the mind in no such passive associative way as that in which the simpler truths arise. Even those experiences which are used to prove a scientific truth are for the most part artificial experiences of the laboratory gained after the truth itself has been conjectured. Instead of experiences engendering the inner relations, the inner relations are what engender the experiences here. What happens in the brain after experience has done its utmost is what happens in every material mass which has been fashioned by an outward force, in every pudding or mortar, for example, which I may make with my hands. The fashioning from without brings the elements into collocations which set new internal forces free to exert their effects in turn. And the random irradiations and resettlements of our ideas, which supervene upon experience, and constitute our free mental play, are due entirely to these secondary internal processes, which vary enormously from brain to brain. Even though the brains be exposed to exactly the same outer relations. The higher thought processes owe their being to causes which correspond far more to the sourings and fermentations of dough, the setting of mortar, or the subsidence of sediments in mixtures. Than to the manipulations by which these physical aggregates came to be compounded. Our study of similar association and reasoning taught us that the whole superiority of man depended on the facility with which in his brain the paths worn by the most frequent outer cohesions could be ruptured. The causes of the instability, the reasons why now this point and now that become in him the seed of rupture, page 639, we saw to be entirely obscure. Volume 1, page 580, Volume 2, page 364. The only clear thing about the peculiarity seems to be its interstitial character, and the certainty that no mere appeal to man's experience suffices to explain it. When we pass from scientific to aesthetic and ethical systems, every one readily admits that, although the elements are matters of experience, the peculiar forms of relation into which they are woven are incongruent with the order of passively received experience. The world of aesthetics and ethics is an ideal world, a utopia a world which the outer relations persist in contradicting, but which we as stubbornly persist in striving to make actual. Why do we thus invincibly crave to alter the given order of nature? Simply because other relations among things are far more interesting to us and more charming than the mere rates of frequency of their time and space conjunctions. These other relations are all secondary and brain-born, spontaneous variations most of them, of our sensibility, whereby certain elements of experience, and certain arrangements in time and space, have acquired an agreeableness which otherwise would not have been felt. It is true that habitual arrangements may also become agreeable. But this agreeableness of the merely habitual is felt to be a mere ape and counterfeit of real inward fitness, and one sign of intelligence is never to mistake the one for the other. There are then ideal and inward relations amongst the objects of our thought which can in no intelligible sense whatever be interpreted as reproductions of the order of outer experience. In the aesthetic and ethical realms they conflict with its order the early Christian with his kingdom of heaven, and the contemporary anarchist with his abstract dream of justice, will tell you that the existing order must perish, root and branch. Ere the true order can come. 
Now the peculiarity of those relations among the objects of our thought which are dubbed scientific, is this, that although they no more are inward reproductions of the outer order than the ethical and aesthetic relations are. Yet they do not conflict with that order, but, once having sprung up by the play of the inward forces, are found, some of them at least, namely the only ones which have survived long enough to p. 640, be matters of record, to be congruent with the time and space relations which our impressions affect. In other words, though nature's materials lend themselves slowly and discouragingly to our translation of them into ethical forms, but more readily into aesthetic forms. To translation into scientific forms they lend themselves with relative ease and completeness. The translation, it is true, will probably never be ended. The perceptive order does not give way, nor the right conceptive substitute for it arise, at our bare word of command, 542, it is often a deadly fight. And many a man of science can say, like Johannes Muller, after an investigation, es klet blood and der Arbeit. But victory after victory makes us sure that the essential doom of our enemy is defeat, 543. Page 641, The Genesis of the Pure Sciences. I have now stated in general terms the relation of the natural sciences to experience strictly so called, and shall complete what I have to say by reverting to the subject on a later page. At present I will pass to the so called pure or a priori sciences of classification, logic, and mathematics. My thesis concerning these is that they are even less than the natural sciences effects of the order of the world as it comes to our experience. The pure sciences express results of comparison exclusively. Comparison is not a conceivable effect of the order in which outer impressions are experienced, it is one of the houseborn, page 627, portions of our mental structure. Therefore the pure sciences form a body of propositions with whose genesis experience has nothing to do. First, consider the nature of comparison. The relations of resemblance and difference among things have nothing to do with the time and space order in which we may experience the latter. Suppose a hundred beings created by God and gifted with the faculties of memory and comparison. Suppose that upon each of them the same lot of sensations are imprinted, but in different orders. Let some, page 642, of them have no single sensation more than once. Let some have this one and others that one repeated. Let every conceivable permutation prevail. And then let the magic lantern show die out, and keep the creatures in a void eternity, with naught but their memories to muse upon. Inevitably in their long leisure they will begin to play with the items of their experience and rearrange them, make classificatory series of them, place gray between white and black, orange between red and yellow and trace all other degrees of resemblance and difference. And this new construction will be absolutely identical in all the hundred creatures, the diversity of the sequence of the original experiences having no effect as regards this rearrangement. Any and every form of sequence will give the same result, because the result expresses the relation between the inward natures of the sensations, and to that the question of their outward succession is quite irrelevant. Black will differ from white just as much in a world in which they always come close together as in one in which they always come far apart, just as much in one in which they appear rarely as in one in which they appear all the time. But the advocate of persistent outer relations may still return to the charge, these are what make us so sure that white and black differ, he may say. For in a world where sometimes black resembled white and sometimes differed from it, we could never be so sure. It is because in this world black and white have always differed that the sense of their difference has become a necessary form of thought. The pair of colors on the one hand and the sense of difference on the other, inseparably experienced, not only by ourselves but by our ancestors, have become inseparably connected in the mind. Not through any essential structure of the mind, which made difference the only possible feeling which they could arouse. No, but because they simply did differ so often that at last they begot in us an impotency to imagine them doing anything else, and made us accept such a fabulous account as that just presented. Of creatures to whom a single experience would suffice to make us feel the necessariness of this relation. Page 643, I know not whether Mr. Spencer would subscribe to this or not, nor do I care, 
for there are mysteries which press more for solution than the meaning of this vague writer's words. But to me such an explanation of our difference judgment is absolutely unintelligible. We now find black and white different, the explanation says, because we have always have so found them. But why should we always have so found them? Why should difference have popped into our heads so invariably with the thought of them? There must have been either a subjective or an objective reason. The subjective reason can only be that our minds were so constructed that a sense of difference was the only sort of conscious transition possible between black and white. The objective reason can only be that difference was always there, with these colors, outside the mind as an objective fact. The subjective reason explains outer frequency by inward structure, not inward structure by outer frequency. And so surrenders the experience theory. The objective reason simply says that if an outer difference is there the mind must needs know it, which is no explanation at all, but a mere appeal to the fact that somehow the mind does know what is there. The only clear thing to do is to give up the sham of a pretended explanation, and to fall back on the fact that the sense of difference has arisen, in some natural manner doubtless, but in a manner which we do not understand. It was by the backstairs way, at all events. And, from the very first, happened to be the only mode of reaction by which consciousness could feel the transition from one term to another of what, in consequence of this very reaction, we now call a contrasted pair. In noticing the differences and resemblances of things, and their degrees, the mind feels its own activity, and has given the name of comparison thereto. It need not compare its materials, but if once roused to do so, it can compare them with but one result, and this a fixed consequence of the nature of the materials themselves. Difference and resemblance are thus relations between ideal objects or conceptions as such. To learn whether black and white differ, page 644, I need not consult the world of experience at all, the mere idea suffice. What I mean by black differs from what I mean by white, whether such colors exist extra mentem meme or not. If they ever do so exist, they will differ. White things may blacken, but the black of them will differ from the white of them, so long as I mean anything definite by these three words. 544. I shall now in what follows call all propositions which express time and space relations empirical propositions, and I shall give the name of rational propositions to all propositions which express the results of a comparison. The latter denomination is in a sense arbitrary, for resemblance and difference are not usually held to be the only rational relations between things. I will next proceed to show, however, how many other rational relations commonly supposed distinct can be resolved into these, so that my definition of rational propositions will end, I trust, by proving less arbitrary than it now appears to be. Series of Even Difference and Mediate Comparison in chapter 12 we saw that the mind can at successive moments mean the same, and that it gradually comes into possession of a stock of permanent and fixed meanings, ideal objects, or conceptions, some of which are universal qualities. Like the black and white of out example, and some, individual things. We now see that not only are the objects permanent mental possessions, but the results of their comparison are permanent too. The objects and their differences together form an immutable system. The same objects, compared in the same way, always give the same results, page 645, if the result be not the same, then the objects are not those originally meant. This last principle, which we may call the axiom of constant result, holds good throughout all our mental operations, not only when we compare, but when we add, divide, class, or infer a given matter in any conceivable way. Its most general expression would be, the same operated on in the same way gives the same. In mathematics it takes the form of equals added to or subtracted from equals give equals, and the like. We shall meet with it again. The next thing which we observe is that the operation of comparing may be repeated on its own results. In other words, that we can think of the various resemblances and differences which we find and compare them with each other, making differences and resemblances of a higher order. The mind thus becomes aware of sets of similar differences, and forms series of terms with the same kind and amount of difference between them, terms which, as they succeed each other, maintain a constant direction of serial increase. 
This sense of constant direction in a series of operations we saw in chapter 13, page 490, to be a cardinal mental fact. A differs from B differs from C differs from D, etc., makes a series only when the differences are in the same direction. In any such different series all terms differ in just the same way from their predecessors. The numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, the notes of the chromatic scale in music, are familiar examples. As soon as the mind grasps such a series as a whole, it perceives that two terms taken far apart differ more than two terms taken near together, and that any one term differs more from a remote than from a near successor. And this no matter what the terms may be, or what the sort of difference may be, provided it is always the same sort. This principle of mediate comparison might be briefly, though obscurely, expressed by the formula, more than the more is more than the less, the words more and less standing simply for degrees of increase along a constant direction of differences. Such a formula would cover all possible cases, as, earlier than early is earlier than late, page 646, worse than bad is worse than good, east of east is east of west, etc., etc., ad libitum, 545, symbolically, we might write it as a less than b less than c less than d. And say that any number of intermediaries may be expunged without obliging us to alter anything in what remains written. The principle of mediate comparison is only one form of a law which holds in many series of homogeneously related terms, the law that skipping intermediary terms leaves relations the same. This axiom of skipped intermediaries or of transferred relations occurs, as we soon shall see, in logic as the fundamental principle of inference, in arithmetic as the fundamental property of the number series. In geometry as that of the straight line, the plane and the parallel. It seems to be on the whole the broadest and deepest law of man's thought. In certain lists of terms the result of comparison may be to find no difference, or equality in place of difference. Here also intermediaries may be skipped, and mediate comparison be carried on with the general result expressed by the axiom of mediate equality, equals of equals are equal, which is the great principle of the mathematical sciences. This too as a result of the mind's mere acuteness, and in utter independence of the order in which experiences come associated together. Symbolically, again, A equals B equals C equals D. With the same consequence as regards expunging terms which we saw before. Classificatory series. Thus we have a rather intricate system of necessary and immutable ideal truths of comparison, a system applicable to terms experienced in any order of sequence or frequency, or even to terms never experienced or to be experienced. Such as the mind's imaginary constructions would be. These truths of comparison result in classifications. It is, for some unknown reason, a, great aesthetic delight for the mind to break the order of experience, and class its materials in serial orders, proceeding from step to step of difference. And to contemplate untiringly the crossings and inosculations of the, p. 647, series among themselves. The first steps in most of the sciences are purely classificatory. Where facts fall easily into rich and intricate series, as plants and animals and chemical compounds do, the mere sight of the series fill the mind with a satisfaction sway generous. And a world whose real materials naturally lend themselves to serial classification is pro tanto a more rational world, a world with which the mind will feel more intimate, than with a world in which they do not. By the pre-evolutionary naturalists, whose generation has hardly passed away, classifications were supposed to be ultimate insights into God's mind, filling us with adoration of his ways. The fact that nature lets us make them was a proof of the presence of his thought in her bosom. So far as the facts of experience cannot be serially classified, therefore, so far experience fails to be rational in one of the ways, at least, which we crave. The logic series. Closely akin to the function of comparison is that of judging, predicating, or subsuming. In fact, these elementary intellectual functions run into each other so, that it is often only a question of practical convenience whether we shall call a given mental operation by the name of one or of the other. Comparisons result in groups of like things, and presently, through discrimination and abstraction, in conceptions of the respects in which the likenesses obtain. 
The groups are genera, or classes, the respects are characters or attributes. The attributes again may be compared, forming genera of higher orders, and their characters singled out, so that we have a new sort of series, that of predication, or of kind including kind. Thus horses are quadrupeds, quadrupeds animals, animals machines, machines liable to wear out, etc. In such a series as this the several couplings of terms may have been made out originally at widely different times and under different circumstances. But memory may bring them together afterwards. And whenever it does so, our faculty of apprehending serial increase makes us conscious, p. 648 of them as a single system of successive terms united by the same relation. 546. Now whenever we become thus conscious, we may become aware of an additional relation which is of the highest intellectual importance, inasmuch as upon it the whole structure of logic is reared. The principle of mediate predication or subsumption is only the axiom of skipped intermediaries applied to a series of successive predications. It expresses the fact that any earlier term in the series stands to any later term in the same relation in which it stands to any intermediate term, in other words, that whatever has an attribute has all the attributes of that attribute. Or more briefly still, that whatever is of a kind is of that kind's kind. A little explanation of this statement will bring out all that it involves. We learned in the chapter on reasoning what our great motive is for abstracting attributes and predicating them. It is that our varying practical purposes require us to lay hold of different angles of the reality at different times. But for these we should be satisfied to see it whole, and always alike. The purpose, however, makes one aspect essential. So, to avoid dispersion of the attention, we treat the reality as if for the time being it were nothing but that aspect, and we let its supernumerary determinations go. In short, we substitute the aspect for the whole real thing. For our purpose the aspect can be substituted for the whole, and the two treated as the same. And the word is, which couples the whole with its aspect or attribute in the categoric judgment, expresses, among other things, the identifying operation performed. The predication series A is B, B is C, C is D closely resembles for certain practical purposes the equation series A equals B, B equals C, C equals D, etc. But what is our purpose in predicating? Ultimately, it may be anything we please. But proximately and immediately, it is always the gratification of a certain curry, page 649, osity as to whether the object in hand is or is not of a kind connected with that ultimate purpose. Usually the connection is not obvious, and we only find that the object S is of a kind connected with P, after first finding that it is of a kind M, which itself is connected with P. Thus, to fix our ideas by an example, we have a curiosity, our ultimate purpose being conquest over nature, as to how Sirius may move. It is not obvious whether Sirius is a kind of thing which moves in the line of sight or not. When, however, we find it to be a kind of thing in whose spectrum the hydrogen line is shifted, and when we reflect that that kind of thing is a kind of thing which moves in the line of sight, we conclude that Sirius does so move. Whatever Sirius's attribute is, Sirius is, its adjective's adjective can supersede its own adjective in our thinking, and this with no loss to our knowledge, so long as we stick to the definite purpose in view. Now please note that this elimination of intermediary kinds and transfer of is along the line, results from our insight into the very meaning of the word is, and into the constitution of any series of terms connected by that relation. It has not to do with what any particular thing is or is not, but, whatever any given thing may be, we see that it also is whatever that is, indefinitely. To grasp in one view a, succession of is is to apprehend this relation between the terms which they connect, just as to grasp a list of successive equals is to apprehend their mutual equality throughout. The principle of mediate subsumption thus expresses relations of ideal objects as such. It can be discovered by a mind left at leisure with any set of meanings, however originally obtained, of which some are predicable of others. The moment we string them in a serial line, that moment we see that we can drop intermediaries, use remote terms just like near ones, and put a genus in the place of a species. 
This shows that the principle of mediate subsumption has nothing to do with the particular order of our experiences, or with the outer coexistences and sequences of terms. Were it a mere outgrowth of habit and association, we should be forced to regard it as having no universal validity, for every hour of the day we meet, p. 650, things which we consider to be of this kind or of that, but later learn that they have none of the kind's properties, that they do not belong to the kind's kind. Instead, however, of correcting the principle by these cases, we correct the cases by the principle. We say that if the thing we named an M has not M's properties, then we were either mistaken in calling it an M, or mistaken about M's properties. Or else that it is no longer M, but has changed. But we never say that it is an M without M's properties. For by conceiving a thing as of the kind M I mean that it shall have M's properties, be of M's kind, even though I should never be able to find in the real world anything which is an M. The principle emanates from my perception of what a lot of successive is mean. This perception can no more be confirmed by one set, or weakened by another set, of outer facts, than the perception that black is not white can be confirmed by the fact that snow never blackens. Or weakened by the fact that photographer's paper blackens as soon as you lay it in the sun. The abstract scheme of successive predications, extended indefinitely, with all the possibilities of substitution which it involves, is thus an immutable system of truth which flows from the very structure and form of our thinking. If any real terms ever do fit into such a scheme, they will obey its laws, whether they do is a question as to nature's facts, the answer to which can only be empirically ascertained. Formal logic is the name of the science which traces in skeleton form all the remote relations of terms connected by successive is with each other, and enumerates their possibilities of mutual substitution. To our principle of mediate subsumption she has given various formulations, of which the best is perhaps this broad expression, that the same can be substituted for the same in any mental operation. 547. The ordinary logical series contains but three terms, page 651, Socrates, man, mortal. But we also have, Sorites, Socrates, man, animal, machine, run down, mortal, etc. And it violates psychology to represent these as syllogisms with terms suppressed. The ground of there being any logic at all is our power to grasp any series as a whole, and the more terms it holds the better. This synthetic consciousness of an uniform direction of advance through a multiplicity of terms is, apparently, what the brutes and lower men cannot accomplish, and what gives to us our extraordinary power of ratiocinative thought. The mind which can grasp a string of is as a whole, the objects linked by them may be ideal or real, physical, mental, or symbolic, indifferently, can also apply to it the principle of skipped intermediaries. The logic list is thus in its origin and essential nature just like those graded classificatory lists which we erewhile described. The rational proposition, which lies at the basis of all reasoning, the dictum de omni et nullo in all the various forms in which it may be expressed, the fundamental law of thought, is thus only the result of the function of comparison in a mind which has come by some lucky variation to apprehend a series of more than two terms at once. 548, so far, then, both systematic classification and logic are seen to be incidental results of the mere capacity for discerning difference and likeness, which capacity is a thing with which the order of experience, properly so styled, has absolutely nothing to do. But how comes it, it may next be asked, when systematic classifications have so little ultimate theoretic importance for the conceiving of things according to their mere degrees of resemblance always yields to other modes of conceiving when these can be obtained that the logical relations among things should form such a mighty engine for dealing with the facts of life. Chapter 22 already gave the reason, see page 335, above. This world might be a world in which all things differed, and in which what properties there were were page 652, ultimate and had no farther predicates. In such a world there would be as many kinds as there were separate things. We could never subsume a new thing under an old kind, or if we could, no consequences would follow. Or, again, this might be a world in which innumerable things were of a kind, but in which no concrete thing remained of the same kind long, but all objects were in a flux. 
Here again, though we could subsume and infer, our logic would be of no practical use to us, for the subjects of our propositions would have changed whilst we were talking. In such worlds, logical relations would obtain, and be known, doubtless, as they are now, but they would form a merely theoretic scheme and be of no use for the conduct of life. But our world is no such world. It is a very peculiar world, and plays right into logic's hands. Some of the things, at least, which it contains are of the same kind as other things, some of them remain always of the kind of which they once were. And some of the properties of them cohere indissolubly and are always found together. Which things these latter things are we learn by experience in the strict sense of the word, and the results of the experience are embodied in empirical propositions. Whenever such a thing is met with by us now, our sagacity notes it to be of a certain kind, our learning immediately recalls that kind's kind, and then that kind's kind, and so on. So that a moment's thinking may make us aware that the thing is of a kind so remote that we could never have directly perceived the connection. The flight to this last kind over the heads of the intermediaries is the essential feature of the intellectual operation here. Evidently it is a pure outcome of our sense for apprehending serial increase. And, unlike the several propositions themselves which make up the series, and which may all be empirical, it has nothing to do with the time and space order in which the things have been experienced. Mathematical Relations So much for the a priori necessities called systematic classification and logical inference. The other couplings of data which pass for a priori necessities of thought are the mathematical judgments and certain metaphysical prop. p. 653, Ossitians. These latter we shall consider farther on. As regards the mathematical judgments, they are all rational propositions in the sense defined on page 644, for they express results of comparison and nothing more. The mathematical sciences deal with similarities and equalities exclusively, and not with coexistences and sequences. Hence they have, in the first instance, no connection with the order of experience. The comparisons of mathematics are between numbers and extensive magnitudes, giving rise to arithmetic and geometry respectively. Number seems to signify primarily the strokes of our attention in discriminating things. These strokes remain in the memory in groups, large or small, and the groups can be compared. The discrimination is, as we know, psychologically facilitated by the mobility of the thing as a total, page 173. But within each thing we discriminate parts, so that the number of things which any one given phenomenon may be depends in the last instance on our way of taking it. A globe is one, if undivided, two, if composed of hemispheres. A sand heap is one thing, or twenty thousand things, as we may choose to count it. We amuse ourselves by the counting of mere strokes, to form rhythms, and these we compare and name. Little by little in our minds the number series is formed. This, like all lists of terms in which there is a direction of serial increase, carries with it the sense of those mediate relations between its terms which we expressed by the axiom, the more than the more is more than the less. That axiom seems, in fact, only a way of stating that the terms do form an increasing series. But, in addition to this, we are aware of certain other relations among our strokes of counting. We may interrupt them where we like, and go on again. All the while we feel that the interruption does not alter the strokes themselves. We may count twelve straight through, or count seven and pause, and then count five, but still the strokes will be the same. We thus distinguish between our acts of counting and those of interrupting or grouping, as between an unchanged matter and an operation of mere shuffling performed on it. The matter is the original units or strokes, p. 654 which all modes of grouping or combining simply give us back unchanged. In short, combinations of numbers are combinations of their units, which is the fundamental axiom of arithmetic, 549, leading to such consequences as that 7 plus 5 is equal to 8 plus 4 because both equals 12. The general axiom of mediate equality, that equals of equals are equal, comes in here. 550, the principle of constancy in our meanings, when applied to strokes of counting, also gives rise to the axiom that the same number, operated on, interrupted, 
grouped, in the same way will always give the same result or be the same. How shouldn't it? Nothing is supposed changed. Arithmetic and its fundamental principles are thus independent of our experiences or of the order of the world. The matter of arithmetic is mental matter. Its principles flow from the fact that the matter forms a series, which can be cut into by us wherever we like without the matter changing. The empiricist school has strangely tried to interpret the truths of number as results of coexistences among outward things. John Mill calls number a physical property of things. One, according to Mill, means one sort of passive sensation which we receive, two, another, three, a third. The same things, however, can give us different number sensations. Three things arranged thus, degree degree degree, for example, impress us differently from three things arranged thus. But experience tells us that every real object group which can be arranged in one of these ways can always be arranged in the other also, and that 2 plus 1 and 3 are thus modes of numbering things which coexist invariably with each other. The indefeasibility of our belief in their coexistence, which is Mill's word for their equivalence, is due solely to the enormous amount of experience we have of it. For all things, whatever other sensations they may give us, give us at any rate number sensations. Those number sensations which the same thing may be successively made to arouse are the numbers which we deem, page 655, equal to each other. Those which the same thing refuses to arouse are those which we deem unequal. This is as clear a restatement as I can make of Mill's doctrine, 551, and its failure is written upon its front. Woe to arithmetic, were such the only grounds for its validity. The same real things are countable in numberless ways, and pass from one numerical form, not only to its equivalent, as Mill implies, but to its other, as the sport of physical accidents or of our mode of attending may decide. How could our notion that one and one are eternally and necessarily two ever maintain itself in a world where every time we add one drop of water to another we get not two but one again? In a world where every time we add a drop to a crumb of quicklime we get a dozen or more? Had it no better warrant than such experiences? At most we could then say that one and one are usually two. Our arithmetical propositions would never have the confident tone which they now possess. That confident tone is due to the fact that they deal with abstract and ideal numbers exclusively. What we mean by one plus one is two, we make two out of it. And it would mean two still even in a world where physically, according to a conceit of Mills, a third thing was engendered every time one thing came together with another. We are masters of our meanings, and discriminate between the things we mean and our ways of taking them, between our strokes of numeration themselves, and our bundlings and separatings thereof. Mill ought not only to have said, all things are numbered. He ought, in order to prove his point, to have shown that they are unequivocally numbered, which they notoriously are not. Only the abstract numbers themselves are unequivocal, only those which we create mentally and hold fast to as ideal objects always the same. A concrete natural thing can always be numbered in a great variety of ways. We need only conceive a thing divided into four equal parts, and all things may be conceived as so divided, as, page 656, Mill is himself compelled to say, to find the number four in it, and so on. The relation of numbers to experience is just like that of kinds in logic. So long as an experience will keep its kind we can handle it by logic. So long as it will keep its number we can deal with it by arithmetic. Sensibly, however, things are constantly changing their numbers, just as they are changing their kinds. They are forever breaking apart and fusing. Compounds and their elements are never numerically identical, for the elements are sensibly many in the compound sensibly one. Unless our arithmetic is to remain without application to life, we must somehow make more numerical continuity than we spontaneously find. Accordingly Lavoisier discovers his weight units which remain the same in compounds and elements, though volume units and quality units all have changed. A great discovery. And modern science outdoes it by denying that compounds exist at all. There is no such thing as water for science, 
that is only a handy name for H2 and O when they have got into the position HOH and then affect our senses in a novel way. The modern theories of atoms, of heat, and of gases are, in fact, only intensely artificial devices for gaining that constancy in the numbers of things which sensible experience will not show. Sensible things are not the things for me, says science, because in their changes they will not keep their numbers the same. Sensible qualities are not the qualities for me, because they can with difficulty be numbered at all. These hypothetic atoms, however, are the things, these hypothetic masses and velocities are the qualities for me, they will stay numbered all the time. By such elaborate inventions, and at such a cost to the imagination, do men succeed in making for themselves a world in which real things shall be coerced per fas aut nifas under arithmetical law. The other branch of mathematics is geometry. Its objects are also ideal creations. Whether nature contains circles or not, I can know what I mean by a circle and can stick to my meaning, and when I mean two circles I, page 657, mean two things of an identical kind. The axiom of constant results, see above, page 645, holds in geometry. The same forms, treated in the same way, added, subtracted, or compared, give the same results, how shouldn't they? The axioms of mediate comparison, page 645, of logic, p. 648, and of number, page 654, all apply to the forms which we imagine in space, inasmuch as these resemble or differ from each other, form kinds, and are numerable things. But in addition to these general principles, which are true of space forms only as they are of other mental conceptions, there are certain axioms relative to space forms exclusively, which we must briefly consider. Three of them give marks of identity among straight lines, planes, and parallels. Straight lines which have two points, planes which have three points, parallels to a given line which have one point, in common, coalesce throughout. Some say that the certainty of our belief in these axioms is due to repeated experiences of their truth, others that it is due to an intuitive acquaintance with the properties of space. It is neither. We experience lines enough which pass through two points only to separate again, only we won't call them straight. Similarly of planes and parallels. We have a definite idea of what we mean by each of these words. And when something different is offered us, we see the difference. Straight lines, planes, and parallels, as they figure in geometry, are mere inventions of our faculty for apprehending serial increase. The farther continuations of these forms, we say, shall bear the same relation to their last visible parts which these did to still earlier parts. It thus follows, from that axiom of skipped intermediaries which obtains in all regular series, that parts of these figures separated by other parts must agree in direction, just as contiguous parts do. This uniformity of direction throughout is, in fact, all that makes us care for these forms, gives them their beauty, and stamps them into fixed conceptions in our mind. But obviously if two lines, or two planes, with a common segment, were to part company beyond the segment, it could only be because the direction of at least one of them had changed. Parting company in lines and planes means changing direction, means assuming, page 658, a new relation to the parts that pre-exist, and assuming a new relation means ceasing to be straight or plain. If we mean by a parallel a line that will never meet a second line. And if we have one such line drawn through a point, any third line drawn through that point which does not coalesce with the first must be inclined to it, and if inclined to it must approach the second, i.e., cease to be parallel with it. No properties of outlying space need come in here, only a definite conception of uniform direction, and constancy in sticking to one's point. The other two axioms peculiar to geometry are that figures can be moved in space without change, and that no variation in the way of subdividing a given amount of space alters its total quantity. 552 this last axiom is similar to what we found to obtain in numbers. The whole is equal to its parts is an abridged way of expressing it. A man is not the same biological whole if we cut him in two at the neck as if we divide him at the ankles. But geometrically he is the same whole, no matter in which place we cut him. The axiom about figures being movable in space is rather a postulate than an axiom. 
so far as they are so movable, then certain fixed equalities and differences obtain between forms, no matter where placed. But if translation through space warped or magnified forms, then the relations of equality, etc. would always have to be expressed with a position qualification added. A geometry as absolutely certain as ours could be invented on the supposition of such a space, if the laws of its warping and deformation were fixed. It would, however, be much more complicated than our geometry, which makes the simplest possible supposition, and finds, luckily enough, that it is a supposition with which the space of our experience seems to agree. By means of these principles, all playing into each other's hands, the mutual equivalences of an immense number of forms can be traced, even of such as at first sight bear hardly any resemblance to each other. We move and, p. 659, turn them mentally, and find that parts of them will superpose. We add imaginary lines which subdivide or enlarge them, and find that the new figures resemble each other in ways which show us that the old ones are equivalent to. We thus end by expressing all sorts of forms in terms of other forms, enlarging our knowledge of the kinds of things which certain other kinds of things are, or to which they are equivalent. The result is a new system of mental objects which can be treated as identical for certain purposes, a new series of is almost indefinitely prolonged, just like the series of equivalencies among numbers. Part of which the multiplication table expresses. And all this is in the first instance regardless of the coexistences and sequences of nature, and regardless of whether the figures we speak of have ever been outwardly experienced or not. Consciousness of series is the basis of rationality. Classification, logic, and mathematics all result, then, from the mere play of the mind comparing its conceptions, no matter whence the latter may have come. The essential condition for the formation of all these sciences is that we should have grown capable of apprehending series as such, and of distinguishing them as homogeneous or heterogeneous. And as possessing definite directions of what I have called increase. This consciousness of series is a human perfection which has been gradually evolved, and which varies amazingly from one man to another. No accounting for it as a result of habitual associations among outward impressions, so we must simply ascribe it to the factors, whatever they be, of inward cerebral growth. Once this consciousness attained to, however, mediate thought becomes possible, with our very awareness of a series may go an awareness that dropping terms out of it will leave identical relations between the terms that remain. And thus arises a perception of relations between things so naturally separate that we should otherwise never have compared them together at all. The axiom of skipped intermediaries applies, however, only to certain particular series, and among them to those, p. 660, which we have considered, in which the recurring relation is either of difference, of likeness, of kind, of numerical addition, or of prolongation in the same linear or plane direction. It is therefore not a purely formal law of thinking, but flows from the nature of the matters thought about. It will not do to say universally that in all series of homogeneously related terms the remote members are related to each other as the near ones are, for that will often be untrue. The series A is not B is not C is not D. Does not permit the relation to be traced between remote terms. From two negations no inference can be drawn. Nor, to become more concrete, does the lover of a woman generally love her beloved, or the contradictor of a contradictor contradict whomever he contradicts. The slayer of a slayer does not slay the latter's victim. The acquaintances or enemies of a man need not be each other's acquaintances or enemies, nor are two things which are on top of a third thing necessarily on top of each other. All skipping of intermediaries and transfer of relations occurs within homogeneous series. But not all homogeneous series allow of intermediaries being skipped and relations transferred. It depends on which series they are, on what relations they contain. 553. Let it not be said that it is a mere matter of verbal association, due to the fact that language sometimes permits us to transfer the name of a relation over skipped intermediaries, and sometimes does not. As where we call men, progenitors, of their remote as well as of their immediate posterity, but refuse to call them fathers thereof. There are relations which are intrinsically transferable, whilst others are not. 
The relation of condition, e.g., is intrinsically transferable. What conditions a condition conditions what it conditions cause of cause is cause of effect. The relations of negation and frustration, on the other hand, are not transferable. What frustrates a frustration does not frustrate what it frustrates. No changes of terminology would annul the intimate difference between these two cases. p. 661. Nothing but the clear sight of the ideas themselves shows whether the axiom of skipped intermediaries applies to them or not. Their connections, immediate and remote, flow from their inward natures. We try to consider them in certain ways, to bring them into certain relations, and we find that sometimes we can and sometimes we cannot. The question whether there are or are not inward and essential connections between conceived objects as such, really is the same thing as the question whether we can get any new perception from mentally coupling them together. Or pass from one to another by a mental operation which gives a result. In the case of some ideas and operations we get a result, but no result in the case of others. Where a result comes, it is due exclusively to the nature of the ideas and of the operation. Take blueness and yellowness, for example. We can operate on them in some ways, but not in other ways. We can compare them, but we cannot add one to or subtract it from the other. We can refer them to a common kind, color. But we cannot make one a kind of the other, or infer one from the other. This has nothing to do with experience. For we can add blue pigment to yellow pigment, and subtract it again, and get a result both times. Only we know perfectly that this is no addition or subtraction of the blue and yellow qualities or natures themselves. 554. There is thus no denying the fact that the mind is filled with necessary and eternal relations which it finds between certain of its ideal conceptions, and which form a determinate system. Independent of the order of frequency in which experience may have associated the conceptions originals in time and space. Shall we continue to call these sciences, intuitive, innate, or, a priori, bodies of truth, or not, 555, personally, page 662, I should like to do so. But I hesitate to use the terms, on account of the odium which controversial history has made the whole of their connotation for many worthy persons. The most politic way not to alienate these readers is to flourish the name of the immortal Locke. For in truth I have done nothing more in the previous pages than to make a little more explicit the teachings of Locke's fourth book. The immutability of the same relations between the same immutable things is now the idea that shows him that if the three angles of a triangle were once equal to two right angles, they will always be equal to two right ones. And hence he comes to be certain that what was once true in the case is always true, what ideas once agreed will always agree. Upon this ground it is that particular demonstrations in mathematics afford general knowledge. If, then, the perception that the same ideas will eternally have the same habitudes and relations be not a sufficient ground of knowledge, there could be no knowledge of general propositions in mathematics. All general knowledge lies only in our own thoughts, and consists barely in the contemplation of our abstract ideas. Wherever we perceive any agreement or disagreement amongst them, there we have general knowledge. And by putting the names of those ideas together accordingly in propositions, can with certainty pronounce general truths. What is once known of such ideas will be perpetually and forever true. So that, as to all general knowledge, we must search and find it only in our own minds and it is only the examining of our own ideas that furnisheth us with that. Truths belonging to essences of things, that is, to abstract ideas, are, p. 663, eternal, and are to be found out only by the contemplation of those essences. Knowledge is the consequence of the ideas, be they what they will, that are in our minds, producing their certain general propositions. Such propositions are therefore called eternal truths. Because, being once made about abstract ideas so as to be true, they will, whenever they can be supposed to be made again, at any time past or to come, by a mind having those ideas, always actually be true. For names being supposed to stand perpetually for the same ideas, and the same ideas having immutably the same habitudes one to another, 
propositions concerning any abstract ideas that are once true must needs be eternal verities. But what are these eternal verities, these agreements, which the mind discovers by barely considering its own fixed meanings, except what I have said? Relations of likeness and difference, immediate or mediate, between the terms of certain series. Classification is serial comparison, logic mediates assumption, arithmetic mediate equality of different bundles of attention strokes, geometry mediate equality of different ways of carving space. None of these eternal verities has anything to say about facts, about what is or is not in the world. Logic does not say whether Socrates, men, mortals or immortals exist, arithmetic does not tell us where her sevens, fives, and twelves are to be found. Geometry affirms not that circles and rectangles are real. All that these sciences make us sure of is, that if these things are anywhere to be found, the eternal verities will obtain of them. Locke accordingly never tires of telling us that the universal propositions of whose truth or falsehood we can have certain knowledge, concern not existence. These universal and self-evident principles, being only our constant, clear, and distinct knowledge of our own ideas more general or comprehensive, can assure us of nothing that passes without the mind. Their certainty is founded only upon the knowledge of each idea by itself, and of its distinction from others, about which we cannot be mistaken whilst they are in our minds. The mathematician considers the truth and properties belonging to a rectangle or circle only as they are an idea in his own mind. For it is possible he never found either of them existing mathematically, i.e., precisely true, in his life. But yet the knowledge he has of any truths or properties belonging to a circle, or any other mathematical figure, are nevertheless true and certain even of real things existing. Because real things are no farther concerned or intended to be meant by any such propositions, than as things really agree to those archetypes in his mind. Is it true of the idea of a triangle, that it's, p. 664, three angles are equal to two right ones? It is true also of a triangle wherever it really exists. Whatever other figure exists that is not exactly answerable to that idea in his mind is not at all concerned in that proposition. And therefore he is certain all his knowledge concerning such ideas is real knowledge, because, intending things no farther than they agree with those his ideas. He is sure what he knows concerning those figures when they have barely an ideal existence in his mind will hold true of them also when they have a real existence in matter. But, that any or what bodies do exist, that we are left to our senses to discover to us as far as they can. 556. Locke accordingly distinguishes between mental truth and real truth. 557. The former is intuitively certain the latter dependent on experience. Only hypothetically can we affirm intuitive truths of real things, by supposing, namely, that real things exist which correspond exactly with the ideal subjects of the intuitive propositions. If our senses corroborate the supposition all goes well. But note the strange descent in Locke's hands of the dignity of a priori propositions. By the ancients they were considered, without farther question, to reveal the constitution of reality. Archetypal things existed, it was assumed, in the relations in which we had to think them. The mind's necessities were a warrant for those of being. And it was not till Descartes' time that skepticism had so advanced, in dogmatic circles, that the warrant must itself be warranted, and the veracity of the deity invoked as a reason for holding fast to our natural beliefs. But the intuitive propositions of Locke leave us as regards outer reality none the better for their possession. We still have to go to our senses to find what the reality is. The vindication of the intuitionist position is thus a barren victory. The eternal verities which the very structure of our mind lays hold of do not necessarily themselves lay hold on extramental being, nor have they, as Kant pretended later, 558, a legislating character even, page 665, for all possible experience. They are primarily interesting only as subjective facts. They stand waiting in the mind, forming a beautiful ideal network. And the most we can say is that we hope to discover realities over which the network may be flung so that ideal and real may coincide.
And this brings us back to the science from which we diverted our attention so long ago, see page 640. Science thinks she has discovered the objective realities in question. Atoms and ether, with no properties but masses and velocities expressible by numbers, and paths expressible by analytic formulas, these at last are things over which the mathematical-logical network may be flung. And by supposing which instead of sensible phenomena science becomes yearly more able to manufacture for herself a world about which rational propositions may be framed. Sensible phenomena are pure delusions for the mechanical philosophy. The things and qualities we instinctively believe in do not exist. The only realities are swarming solids in everlasting motion, undulatory or continued, whose expressionless and meaningless changes of position form the history of the world. And are deducible from initial collocations and habits of movement hypothetically assumed. Thousands of years ago men started to cast the chaos of nature's sequences and juxtapositions into a form that might seem intelligible. Many were their ideal prototypes of rational order, teleological and aesthetic ties between things, causal and substantial bonds, as well as logical and mathematical relations. The most promising of these ideal systems at first were of course the richer ones, the sentimental ones. The baldest and least promising were the mathematical ones. But the history of the latter's application is a history of steadily advancing successes, whilst that of the sentimentally richer, page 666, systems is one of relative sterility and failure. 559. Take those aspects of phenomena which interest you as a human being most, and class the phenomena as perfect and imperfect, as ends and means to ends, as high and low, beautiful and ugly, positive and negative, harmonious and discordant. Fit and unfit, natural and unnatural, etc. And barren are all your results. In the ideal world the kind, precious, has characteristic properties. What is precious should be preserved, unworthy things should be sacrificed for its sake, exceptions made on its account. Its preciousness is a reason for other things' actions, and the like. But none of these things need happen to your precious object in the real world. Call the things of nature as much as you like by sentimental, moral, and aesthetic names, no natural consequences follow from the naming. They may be of the kinds you allege, but they are not of the kind's kind. And the last great system maker of this sort, Hegel, was obliged explicitly to repudiate logic in order to make any inferences at all from the names he called things by. But when you give things mathematical and mechanical names and call them just so many solids in just such positions, describing just such paths with just such velocities, all is changed. Your sagacity finds its reward in the verification by nature of all the deductions which you may next proceed to make. Your things realize all the consequences of the names by which you class them. The modern mechanico-physical philosophy of which we are all so proud, because it includes the nebular cosmogony, the conservation of energy, the kinetic theory of heat and, page 667, gases, etc., etc begins by saying that the only facts are collocations and motions of primordial solids, and the only laws the changes of motion which changes in collocation bring. The ideal which this philosophy strives after is a mathematical world formula, by which, if all the collocations and motions at a given moment were known, it would be possible to reckon those of any wished for future moment. By simply considering the necessary geometrical, arithmetical, and logical implications. Once we have the world in this bare shape, we can fling our net of a priori relations over all its terms, and pass from one of its phases to another by inward thought necessity. Of course it is a world with a very minimum of rational stuff. The sentimental facts and relations are butchered at a blow. But the rationality yielded is so superbly complete in form that to many minds this atones for the loss, and reconciles the thinker to the notion of a purposeless universe, in which all the things and qualities men love, dulcissima mundi nomina, are but illusions of our fancy attached to accidental clouds of dust which the eternal cosmic weather will dissipate as carelessly as it has formed them. The popular notion that science is forced on the mind of extra, and that our interests have nothing to do with its constructions, is utterly absurd. 
the craving to believe that the things of the world belong to kinds which are related by inward rationality together, is the parent of science as well as of sentimental philosophy. And the original investigator always preserves a healthy sense of how plastic the materials are in his hands. Once for all, says Helmholtz in beginning that little work of his which laid the foundations of the conservation of energy. It is the task of the physical sciences to seek for laws by which particular processes in nature may be referred to general rules, and deduced from such again. Such rules, for example the laws of reflection or refraction of light, or that of Marriott and Galesac for gas volumes, are evidently nothing but generic concepts for embracing whole classes of phenomena. The search for them is the business of the experimental division of our science. Its theoretic division, on the other hand, tries to discover the unknown causes of processes from their visible effects. Tries to understand them by the law of causality. The ultimate goal of theoretic physics is to find the last unchanging causes, page 668, of the processes in nature. Whether all processes be really ascribable to such causes, whether, in other words, nature be completely intelligible, or whether there be changes which would elude the law of a necessary causality, and fall into a realm of spontaneity or freedom. Is not here the place to determine, but at any rate it is clear that the science whose aim it is to make nature appear intelligible, die natur zu begriffen, James' insertion, must start with the assumption of her intelligibility. And draw consequences in conformity with this assumption, until irrefutable facts show the limitations of this method. The postulate that natural phenomena must be reduced to changeless ultimate causes next shapes itself so that forces unchanged by time must be found to be these causes. Now in science we have already found portions of matter with changeless forces, indestructible qualities, and called them, chemical, elements. If, then, we imagine the world composed of elements with inalterable qualities, the only changes that can remain possible in such a world are spatial changes, i.e. Movements, and the only outer relations which can modify the action of the forces are spatial to or, in other words, the forces are motor forces dependent for their effect only on spatial relations. More exactly still, the phenomena of nature must be reduced to, Zurukkafurt, conceived as, classed as, James' insertion, motions of material points with inalterable motor forces acting according to space relations alone. But points have no mutual space relations except their distance, and a motor force which they exert upon each other can cause nothing but a change of distance i.e. be an attractive or a repulsive force. And its intensity can only depend on distance. So that at last the task of physics resolves itself into this, to refer phenomena to inalterable attractive and repulsive forces whose intensity varies with distance. The solution of this task would at the same time be the condition of nature's complete intelligibility. 560. The subjective interest leading to the assumption could not be more candidly expressed. What makes the assumption scientific and not merely poetic, what makes a Helmholtz and his kin discoverers, is that the things of nature turn out to act as if they were of the kind assumed. They behave as such mere drawing and driving atoms would behave. And so far as they have been distinctly enough translated into molecular terms to test the point, so far a certain fantastically ideal object, namely, the mathematical sum containing their mutual distances and velocities, is found to be constant throughout all their movements. This sum is called the total energy of the molecules considered. Its con, page 669, Stancy or, conservation gives the name to the hypothesis of molecules and central forces from which it was logically deduced. Take any other mathematico-mechanical theory and it is the same. They are all translations of sensible experiences into other forms, substitutions of items between which ideal relations of kind, number, form, equality, etc. Obtain, for items between which no such relations obtain coupled with declarations that the experienced form is false and the ideal form true. Declarations which are justified by the appearance of new sensible experiences at just those times and places at which we logically infer that their ideal correlates ought to be. Wave hypotheses thus make us predict things of darkness and color, distortions, dispersions, changes of pitch in sonorous bodies moving from us, etc., 
molecule hypotheses lead to predictions of vapor density, freezing point, etc. All which predictions fall true. Thus the world grows more orderly and rational to the mind, which passes from one feature of it to another by deductive necessity. As soon as it conceives it as made up of so few and so simple phenomena as bodies with no properties but number and movement to and fro. Metaphysical Axioms But alongside of these ideal relations between terms which the world verifies, there are other ideal relations not as yet so verified. I refer to those propositions, no longer expressing mere results of comparison, which are formulated in such metaphysical and aesthetic axioms as, the principle of things is one, the quantity of existence is unchanged. Nature is simple and invariable, nature acts by the shortest ways, ex nihilo nihil fit, nothing can be evolved which was not involved, whatever is in the effect must be in the cause, a thing can only work where it is. A thing can only affect another of its own kind, cessant causa, cessat eti effectus, nature makes no leaps, things belong to discrete and permanent kinds, nothing is or happens without a reason. The world is throughout rationally intelligible, etc., page 670, etc., etc. Such principles as these, which might be multiplied to satiety, 561, are properly to be called postulates of rationality, not propositions of fact. If nature did obey them, she would be pro tanto more intelligible, and we seek meanwhile so to conceive her phenomena as to show that she does obey them. To a certain extent we succeed. For example, instead of the quantity of existence, so vaguely postulated as unchanged, nature allows us to suppose that curious sum of distances and velocities which for want of a better term we call energy. For the effect being, contained in the cause, nature lets us substitute, the effect is the cause, so soon as she lets us conceive both effect and cause as the same molecules, in two successive positions. But all around these incipient successes, as all around the molecular world, so soon as we add to it as its effects those illusory things of common sense which we had to butcher for its sake. There still spreads a vast field of irrationalized fact whose items simply are together, and from one to another of which we can pass by no ideally rational way. It is not that these more metaphysical postulates of rationality are absolutely barren, though barren enough they were when used, as the scholastics used them, as immediate propositions of fact, 562, they have a fertility as, p. 671, ideals, and keep us uneasy and striving always to recast the world of sense until its lines become more congruent with theirs. Take for example the principle that nothing can happen without a cause. We have no definite idea of what we mean by cause, or of what causality consists in. But the principle expresses a demand for some deeper sort of inward connection between phenomena than their merely habitual time sequence seems to us to be. The word cause is, in short, an altar to an unknown god, an empty pedestal still marking the place of a hoped-for statue. Any really inward belonging together of the sequent terms, if discovered, would be accepted as what the word cause was meant to stand for. So we seek, and seek. And in the molecular systems we find a sort of inward belonging in the notion of identity of matter with change of collocation. Perhaps by still seeking we may find other sorts of inward belonging, even between the molecules and those, secondary qualities, etc., which they produce upon our minds. It cannot be too often repeated that the triumphant application of any one of our ideal systems of rational relations to the real world justifies our hope that other systems may be found also applicable. Metaphysics should take heart from the example of physics, simply confessing that hers is the longer task. Nature may be remodeled, nay, certainly will be remodeled, far beyond the point at present reached. Just how far? is a question which only the whole future history of science and philosophy can answer, 563, our task being psychology, we cannot even cross the threshold of that larger problem. Besides the mental structure which results in such, p. 672, metaphysical principles as those just considered, there is a mental structure which expresses itself in aesthetic and moral principles. The aesthetic principles are at bottom such axioms as that a note sounds good with its third and fifth, or that potatoes need salt, 
we are once for all so made that when certain impressions come before our mind, one of them will seem to call for or repel the others as its companions. To a certain extent the principle of habit will explain these aesthetic connections. When a conjunction is repeatedly experienced, the cohesion of its terms grows grateful, or at least their disruption grows unpleasant. But to explain all aesthetic judgments in this way would be absurd, for it is notorious how seldom natural experiences come up to our aesthetic demands. Many of the so-called metaphysical principles are at bottom only expressions of aesthetic feeling. Nature is simple and invariable, makes no leaps, or makes nothing but leaps, is rationally intelligible, neither increases nor diminishes in quantity, flows from one principle, etc., etc. What do all such principles express save our sense of how pleasantly our intellect would feel if it had a nature of that sort to deal with? The subjectivity of which feeling is of course quite compatible with nature also turning out objectively to be of that sort, later on. The moral principles which our mental structure engenders are quite as little explicable in toto by habitual experiences having bred inner cohesions. Rightness is not mere usualness, wrongness not mere oddity, however numerous the facts which might be invoked to prove such identity. Nor are the moral judgments those most invariably and emphatically impressed on us by public opinion. The most characteristically and peculiarly moral judgments that a man is ever called on to make are in unprecedented cases and lonely emergencies, where no popular rhetorical maxims can avail, and the hidden oracle alone can speak. And it speaks often in favor of conduct quite unusual, and suicidal as far as gaining popular approbation goes. The forces which conspire to this resultant are subtle harmonies and discords between the p. 673, elementary ideas which form the data of the case. Some of these harmonies, no doubt, have to do with habit. But in respect to most of them our sensibility must assuredly be a phenomenon of supernumerary order, correlated with a brain function quite as secondary as that which takes cognizance of the diverse excellence of elaborate musical compositions. No more than the higher musical sensibility can the higher moral sensibility be accounted for by the frequency with which outer relations have cohered, 564, take judgments of justice or equity, for example. Instinctively, one judges everything differently, according as it pertains to oneself or to someone else, empirically one that everybody else does the same. But little by little there dawns in one the judgment, nothing can be right for me which would not be right for another similarly placed, or the fulfillment of my desires is intrinsically no more imperative than that of anyone else's. Or, what it is reasonable that another should do for me, it is also reasonable that I should do for him, 565, and forth with the whole mass of the habitual gets overturned. It gets seriously overturned only in a few fanatical heads. But its overturning is due to a backdoor and not to a front-door process. Some minds are preternaturally sensitive to logical consistency and inconsistency. When they have ranked a thing under a kind, they must treat it as of that kind's kind, or feel all out of tune. In many respects we do class ourselves with other men, and call them and ourselves by a common name. They agree with us in having the same Heavenly Father, in not being consulted about their birth, p. 674 in not being themselves to thank or blame for their natural gifts, in having the same desires and pains and pleasures, in short in a host of fundamental relations. Hence, if these things be our essence, we should be substitutable for other men, and they for us, in any proposition in which either of us is involved. The more fundamental and common the essence chosen, and the more simple the reasoning, 566, the more wildly radical and unconditional will the justice be which is aspired to. Life is one long struggle between conclusions based on abstract ways of conceiving cases, and opposite conclusions prompted by our instinctive perception of them as individual facts. The logical stickler for justice always seems pedantic and mechanical to the man who goes by tact and a particular instance, and who usually makes a poor show at argument. Sometimes the abstract conceiver's way is better, sometimes that of the man of instinct. But just as in our study of reasoning we found it impossible to lay down any mark whereby to distinguish right conception of a concrete case from confusion, cpp. 336, 350, 
so here we can give no general rule for deciding when it is morally useful to treat a concrete case as sui generis, and when to lump it with others in an abstract class. 567. p. 675. An adequate treatment of the way in which we come by our aesthetic and moral judgments would require a separate chapter, which I cannot conveniently include in this book. Suffice it that these judgments express inner harmonies and discords between objects of thought. And that whilst outer cohesions frequently repeated will often seem harmonious, all harmonies are not thus engendered, but our feeling of many of them is a secondary and incidental function of the mind. Where harmonies are asserted of the real world, they are obviously mere postulates of rationality, so far as they transcend experience. Such postulates are exemplified by the ethical propositions that the individual and universal good are one, and that happiness and goodness are bound to coalesce in the same subject. Summary of what precedes I will now sum up our progress so far by a short summary of the most important conclusions which we have reached. p. 676 The mind has a native structure in this sense, that certain of its objects, if considered together in certain ways, give definite results, and that no other ways of considering, and no other results, are possible if the same objects be taken. The results are relations, which are all expressed by judgments of subsumption and of comparison. The judgments of subsumption are themselves subsumed under the laws of logic. Those of comparison are expressed in classifications, and in the sciences of arithmetic and geometry. Mr. Spencer's opinion that our consciousness of classificatory, logical, and mathematical relations between ideas is due to the frequency with which the corresponding outer relations have impressed our minds, is unintelligible. Our consciousness of these relations, no doubt, has a natural genesis. But it is to be sought rather in the inner forces which have made the brain grow, than in any mere paths of frequent association which outer stimuli may have ploughed in that organ. But let our sense for these relations have arisen as it may, the relations themselves form a fixed system of lines of cleavage, so to speak, in the mind, by which we naturally pass from one object to another. And the objects connected by these lines of cleavage are often not connected by any regular time and space associations. We distinguish, therefore, between the empirical order of things, and this their rational order of comparison. And, so far as possible, we seek to translate the former into the latter, as being the more congenial of the two to our intellect. Any classification of things into kinds, especially if the kinds form series, or if they successively involve each other, is a more rational way of conceiving the things than is that mere juxtaposition or separation of them as individuals in time and space which is the order of their crude perception. Any assimilation of things to terms between which such classificatory relations, with their remote and mediate transactions, obtain, is a way of bringing the things into a more rational scheme. Solids in motion are such terms. And the mechanical, page 677, philosophy is only a way of conceiving nature so as to arrange its items along some of the more natural lines of cleavage of our mental structure. Other natural lines are the moral and aesthetic relations. Philosophy is still seeking to conceive things so that these relations also may seem to obtain between them. As long as things have not successfully been so conceived, the moral and aesthetic relations obtain only between entia rationis, terms in the mind. And the moral and aesthetic principles remain but postulates, not propositions, with regard to the real world outside. There is thus a large body of a priori or intuitively necessary truths. As a rule, these are truths of comparison only, and in the first instance they express relations between merely mental terms. Nature, however, acts as if some of her realities were identical with these mental terms. So far as she does this, we can make a priori propositions concerning natural fact. The aim of both science and philosophy is to make the identifiable terms more numerous. So far it has proved easier to identify nature's things with mental terms of the mechanical than with mental terms of the sentimental order. The widest postulate of rationality is that the world is rationally intelligible throughout, after the pattern of some ideal system. The whole war of the philosophies is over that point of faith. 
some say they can see their way already to the rationality, others that it is hopeless in any other but the mechanical way. To some the very fact that there is a world at all seems irrational. Nonentity would be a more natural thing than existence, for these minds. One philosopher at least says that the relatedness of things to each other is irrational anyhow, and that a world of relations can never be made intelligible. 568. With this I may be assumed to have completed the program which I announced at the beginning of the chapter, so far as the theoretic part of our organic mental struck, page 678, tour goes. It can be due neither to our own nor to our ancestors' experience. I now pass to those practical parts of our organic mental structure. Things are a little different here. And our conclusion, though it lies in the same direction, can be by no means as confidently expressed. To be as short and simple as possible, I will take the case of instincts, and, supposing the reader to be familiar with chapter 24, I will plunge in medias res. The origin of instincts. Instincts must have been either. 1. Each specially created in complete form, or 2. Gradually evolved. As the first alternative is nowadays obsolete, I proceed directly to the second. The two most prominent suggestions as to the way in which instincts may have been evolved are associated with the names of Lamarck and Darwin. Lamarck's statement is that animals have wants, and contract, to satisfy them habits which transform themselves gradually into so many propensities which they can neither resist nor change. These propensities, once acquired, propagate themselves by way of transmission to the young, so that they come to exist in new individuals, anteriorly to all exercise. Thus are the same emotions, the same habits, the same instincts, perpetuated without variation from one generation to another, so long as the outward conditions of existence remain the same. 569, Mr. Lewis calls this the theory of lapsed intelligence. Mr. Spencer's words are clearer than Lamarck's, so that I will quote from him frowny face 570. p. 679, setting out with the unquestionable assumption, that every new form of emotion making its appearance in the individual or the race is a modification of some pre-existing emotion, or a compounding of several pre-existing emotions. We should be greatly aided by knowing what always are the pre-existing emotions. When, for example, we find that very few, if any, of the lower animals show any love of accumulation, and that this feeling is absent in infancy. When we see that an infant in arms exhibits anger, fear, wonder, while yet it manifests no desire of permanent possession. And that a brute which has no acquisitive emotion can nevertheless feel attachment, jealousy, love of approbation, we may suspect that the feeling which property satisfies is compounded out of simpler and deeper feelings. We may conclude that as when a dog hides a bone there must exist in him a prospective gratification of hunger, so there must similarly, at first, in all cases where anything is secured or taken possession of, exist an ideal excitement of the feeling which that thing will gratify. We may further conclude that when the intelligence is such that a variety of objects come to be utilized for different purposes. When, as among savages, divers' wants are satisfied through the articles appropriated for weapons, shelter, clothing, ornament, the act of appropriating comes to be one constantly involving agreeable associations. And one which is therefore pleasurable, irrespective of the end subserved. And when, as in civilized life, the property acquired is of a kind not conducing to one order of gratifications, but is capable of ministering to all gratifications. The pleasure of acquiring property grows more distinct from each of the various pleasures subserved, is more completely differentiated into a separate emotion. 571. It is well known that on newly discovered islands not inhabited by man, birds are so devoid of fear as to allow themselves to be knocked over with sticks, but that in the course of genera. P. 680, Tyans they acquire such a dread of man as to fly on his approach, and that this dread is manifested by young as well as old. Now unless this change be ascribed to the killing off of the least fearful, and the preservation and multiplication of the more fearful, which, considering the small number killed by man, is an inadequate cause. 
It must be ascribed to accumulated experiences, and each experience must be held to have a share in producing it. We must conclude that in each bird that escapes with injuries inflicted by man, or is alarmed by the outcries of other members of the flock. There is established an association of ideas between the human aspect and the pains, direct and indirect, suffered from human agency. And we must further conclude that the state of consciousness which impels the bird to take flight is at first nothing more than an ideal reproduction of those painful impressions which before followed man's approach. That such ideal reproduction becomes more vivid and more massive as the painful experiences, direct or sympathetic, increase. And that thus the emotion, in its incipient state, is nothing else than an aggregation of the revived pains before experienced. As, in the course of generations, the young birds of this race begin to display a fear of man before they have been injured by him. It is an unavoidable inference that the nervous system of the race has been organically modified by these experiences. We have no choice but to conclude that when a young bird is thus led to fly, it is because the impression produced on its senses by the approaching man entails, through an incipiently reflex action, a partial excitement of all those nerves which, in its ancestors, have been excited under the like conditions. That this partial excitement has its accompanying painful consciousness, and that the vague painful consciousness thus arising constitutes emotion proper, emotion, undecomposable into specific experiences, and therefore seemingly homogeneous. If such be the explanation of the fact in this case, then it is in all cases. If the emotion is so generated here, then it is so generated throughout. If so, we must perforce conclude that the emotional modifications displayed by different nations, and those higher emotions by which civilized are distinguished from savage, are to be accounted for on the same principle. And, concluding this, we are led strongly to suspect that the emotions in general have severally thus originated. 572. Obviously the word emotion here means instinct as well, the actions we call instinctive are expressions or manifestations of the emotions whose genesis Mr. Spencer describes. Now if habit could thus bear fruit outside the individual life, and if the modifications so painfully acquired by the parents' nervous systems could be found ready-made at birth in those of the young, it would be hard, p. 681, to overestimate the importance, both practical and theoretical, of such an extension of its sway. In principle, instincts would then be assimilated to secondarily automatic habits, and the origin of many of them out of tentative experiments made during ancestral lives, perfected by repetition, addition and association through successive generations, would be a comparatively simple thing to understand. Contemporary students of instinct have accordingly been alert to discover all the facts which would seem to establish the possibility of such an explanation. The list is not very long, considering what a burden of conclusions it has to bear. Let acquisitiveness and fear of man, as just argued for by Spencer, lead it off. Other cases of the latter sort are the increased shyness of the woodcock notice to have occurred within sixty years observation by Mr. T. A. Knight, and the greater shyness everywhere shown by large than by small birds, to which Darwin has called attention. Then we may add. The propensities of pointing, retrieving, etc. In sporting dogs, which seem partly, at any rate, to be due to training, but which in well-bred stock are all but innate. It is in these breeds considered bad for a litter of young if its sire or dam have not been trained in the field. Docility of domestic breeds of horses and cattle. Tameness of young of tame rabbit, young wild rabbits being invincibly timid. Young foxes are most wary in those places where they are most severely hunted. Wild ducks, hatched out by tame ones, fly off. But if kept close for some generations, the young are said to become tame. 573. Young savages at a certain age will revert to the woods. English greyhounds taken to the high plateau of Mexico could not at first run well, on account of rarefied air. Their whelps entirely got over the difficulty. Mr. Lewis somewhere, 574, tells of a terrier pup whose parents had been taught to beg, and who constantly, page 682, threw himself spontaneously into the begging attitude. Darwin tells of a French orphan child, 
brought up out of France, yet shrugging like his ancestors, 575. Musical ability often increases from generation to generation in the families of musicians. The hereditarily epileptic guinea pigs of Brown Seaquard, whose parents had become epileptic through surgical operations on the spinal cord or sciatic nerve. The adults often lose some of their hind toes, and the young, in addition to being epileptic, are frequently born with the corresponding toes lacking. The offspring of guinea pigs whose cervical sympathetic nerve has been cut on one side will have the ear larger, the eyeball smaller, etc., just like their parents after the operation. Puncture of the restiform body of the medulla will, in the same animal, congest and enlarge one eye, and cause gangrene of one ear. In the young of such parents the same symptoms occur. Physical refinement, delicate hands and feet, etc. Appear in families well-bred and rich for several generations. The nervous temperament also develops in the descendants of sedentary brain-working people. Inebriates produce offspring in various ways degenerate. Nearsightedness is produced by indoor occupation for generations. It has been found in Europe much more frequent among schoolchildren in towns than among children of the same age in the country. These latter cases are of the inheritance of structural rather than of functional peculiarities. But as structure gives rise to function it may be said that the principle is the same. Amongst other inheritances of adaptive, 576, structural change may be mentioned. The Yankee type. Scrofula, rickets and other diseases of bad conditions of life. The udders and permanent milk of the domestic breeds of cow. P. 683, the fancy rabbit's ears, drooping through lack of need to erect them. Dogs, asses, etc., in some breeds ditto. The obsolete eyes of mole and various cave-dwelling animals. The diminished size of the wing bones of domesticated ducks, due to ancestral disuse of flight. 577. These are about all the facts which, by one author or another, have been invoked as evidence in favor of the lapsed intelligence theory of the origin of instincts. Mr. Darwin's theory is that of the natural selection of accidentally produced tendencies to action. It would, says he, be the most serious error to suppose that the greater number of instincts have been acquired by habit in one generation, and then transmitted by inheritance in succeeding generations. It can clearly be shown that the most wonderful instincts with which we are acquainted, namely, those of the hive bee and of many ants, could not possibly have been thus acquired. 578 it will be universally admitted that instincts are as important as corporeal structure for the welfare of each species, under its present conditions of life. Under changed conditions of life, it is at least possible that slight modifications of instinct might be profitable to a species. And if it can be shown that instincts do very ever so little, then I can see no difficulty in natural selection preserving and continually accumulating variations of instinct to any extent that may be profitable. It is thus, as I believe, that all the most complex and wonderful instincts have arisen. I believe that the effects of habit are of quite subordinate importance to the effects of the natural selection of what may be called accidental variations of instincts. That is, of variations produced by the same unknown causes which produce slight deviations of bodily structure. 579 the evidence for Mr. Darwin's view is too complex to be given in this place. To my own mind it is quite convincing. If, with the Darwinian theory in mind, one rereads, page 684, the list of examples given in favor of the Lamarckian theory, one finds that many of the cases are irrelevant, and that some make for one side as well as for the other. This is so obvious in many of the cases that it is needless to point it out in detail. The shrugging child and the begging pup, e.g., prove somewhat too much. They are examples so unique as to suggest spontaneous variation rather than inherited habit. In other cases the observations much need corroboration, e.g. The effects of not training for a generation in sporting dogs and racehorses, the difference between young wild rabbits born in captivity and young tame ones, the cumulative effect of many generations of captivity on wild ducks, etc. 
Similarly, the increased wariness of the large birds, of those on islands frequented by men, of the woodcock, of the foxes, may be due to the fact that the bolder families have been killed off, and left none but the naturally timid behind. Or simply to the individual experience of older birds being imparted by example to the young so that a new educational tradition has occurred. The cases of physical refinement, nervous temperament, Yankee type, etc., also need much more discriminating treatment than they have yet received from the Lamarckians. There is no real evidence that physical refinement and nervosity tend to accumulate from generation to generation in aristocratic or intellectual families. Nor is there any that the change in that direction which Europeans transplanted to America undergo is not all completed in the first generation of children bred on our soil. To my mind, the facts all point that way. Similarly the better breathing of the greyhounds born in Mexico was surely due to a postnatal adaptation of the pup's thorax to the rarer air. Distinct neurotic degeneration may undoubtedly accumulate from parent to child, and as the parent usually in this case grows worse by his own irregular habits of life, the temptation lies near to ascribe the child's deterioration to this cause. This, again, is a hasty conclusion. For neurotic degeneration is unquestionably a disease whose original causes are unknown, and like other accidental variations it is hereditary. But it ultimately ends in sterility. And it seems to me quite unfair to draw any conclusions from its, page 685, natural history in favor of the transmission of acquired peculiarities. Nor does the degeneration of the children of alcoholics prove anything in favor of their having inherited the shattered nervous system which the alcohol has induced in their parents, because the poison usually has a chance to directly affect their own bodies before birth. By acting on the germinal matter from which they are formed whilst it is still nourished by the alcoholized blood of the parent. In many cases, however, the parental alcoholics are themselves degenerates neurotically, and the drink habit is only a symptom of their disease, which in some form or other they also propagate to their children. There remain the inherited mutilations of the guinea pig. But these are such startling exceptions to the ordinary rule with animals that they should hardly be used as examples of a typical process. The docility of domestic cattle is certainly in part due to man's selection, etc., etc. In a word, the proofs form rather a beggarly array. Add to this that the writers who have tried to carry out the theory of transmitted habit with any detail are always obliged somewhere to admit inexplicable variation. Thus Spencer allows that. Sociality can begin only where, through some slight variation, there is less tendency than usual for the individuals to disperse. That slight variations of mental nature, sufficient to initiate this process, may be fairly assumed, all our domestic animals show us, differences in their characters and likings are conspicuous sociality having thus commenced. And survival of the fittest tending ever to maintain and increase it, it will be further strengthened by the inherited effects of habit. 580, again, in writing of the pleasure of pity, Mr. Spencer says, this feeling is not one that has arisen through the inherited effects of experiences, but belongs to a quite different group, traceable to the survival of the fittest simply, to the natural selection of incidental variations. In this group are included all the bodily appetites, together with those simpler instincts, sexual and parental, by which every race is maintained, and which must exist before the higher processes of mental evolution can commence. 581. The inheritance of tricks of manner and trifling peculiarities, such as handwriting, certain odd gestures when pleased, peculiar movements during sleep, etc., have also been quoted in favor of the theory of transmission of acquired habits. Strangely enough, for of all things in the, page 686, world these tricks seem most like idiosyncratic variations. They are usually defects or oddities which the education of the individual, the pressure of what is really acquired by him, would counteract, but which are too native to be repressed, and breaks through all artificial barriers in his children as well as in himself. I leave my text practically just as it was written in 1885. I proceeded at that time to draw a tentative conclusion to the effect that the origin of most of our instincts must certainly be deemed fruits of the backdoor method of genesis, and not of ancestral experience in the proper meaning of the term. 
Whether acquired ancestral habits played any part at all in their production was still an open question in which it would be as rash to affirm as to deny. Already before that time, however, Professor Weissman of Freiburg had begun a very serious attack upon the Lamarckian theory. 582, and his polemic has at last excited such a widespread interest among naturalists that the Wylam almost unhesitatingly accepted theory seems almost on the point of being abandoned. I will therefore add some of Weissman's criticisms of the supposed evidence to my own. In the first place, he has a captivating theory of descent of his own, 583, which makes him think it a priori impossible that any peculiarity acquired during lifetime by the parent should be transmitted to the germ. Into the nature of that theory this is not the place to go. Suffice to say that it has made him a keener critic of Lamarck's and Spencer's theory than he otherwise might have been. The only way in which the germinal products can be influenced whilst in the body of the parent is, according to Weissman, by good or bad nutrition. Through this they may degenerate in various ways or lose vitality altogether. They may also be infected through the blood by smallpox, syphilis, or other virulent diseases, and otherwise be poisoned. But peculiarities of neural structure and habit in the parents which the parents themselves were not, p. 687, born with, they can never acquire unless perhaps accidentally through some coincidental variation of their own. Accidental variations develop of course into idiosyncrasies which tend to pass to later generations in virtue of the well-known law which no one doubts. Referring to the often heard assertion that the increase of talent found in certain families from one generation to another is due to the transmitted effects of exercise of the faculty concerned, the Bachs, the Bernoullis, Mozart, etc. He sensibly remarks, that the talent being kept in exercise, it ought to have gone on growing for an indefinite number of generations. As a matter of fact, it quickly reaches a maximum, and then we hear no more of it, which is what happens always when an idiosyncrasy is exposed to the effects of miscellaneous intermarriage. The hereditary epilepsy and other degenerations of the operated guinea pigs are explained by Professor Weissman as results of infection of the young by the parent's blood. The latter he supposes to undergo a pathologic change in consequence of the original traumatic injury. The obsolescence of disused organs he explains very satisfactorily, without invoking any transmission of the direct effects of disuse, by his theory of panmixie, for which I must refer to his own writings. Finally, he criticizes searchingly the stories we occasionally hear of inherited mutilations in animals, dogs ears and tails, etc and cites a prolonged series of experiments of his own on mice, which he bred for many generations, cutting off both parental tails each time, without interfering in the least with the length of tail with which the young continued to be born. The strongest argument, after all, in favor of the Lamarckian theory remains the a priori one urged by Spencer in his little work, much the solidest thing, by the way, which he has ever written, The Factors of Organic Evolution. Since, says Mr. Spencer, the accidental variations of all parts of the body are independent of each other, if the entire organization of animals mere due to such accidental variations alone. The amount of mutual adaptation and harmony that we now find there could hardly possibly have come about in any finite time. We must rather suppose that the diver's varying parts brought the other parts into har, page 688, moaning with themselves by exercising them ad hoc, and that the effects of the exercise remained and were passed on to the young. This forms, of course, a great presumption against the all-sufficiency of the view of selection of accidental variations exclusively. But it must be admitted that in favor of the contrary view, that adaptive changes are inherited, we have as yet perhaps not one single unequivocal item of positive proof. I must therefore end this chapter on the genesis of our mental structure by reaffirming my conviction that the so-called experience philosophy has failed to prove its point. No more if we take ancestral experiences into account than if we limit ourselves to those of the individual after birth. Can we believe that the couplings of terms within the mind are simple copies of corresponding couplings impressed upon it by the environment? This indeed is true of a small part of our cognitions. But so far as logical and mathematical, ethical, aesthetical, and metaphysical propositions go, such an assertion is not only untrue but altogether unintelligible. 
For these propositions say nothing about the time and space order of things, and it is hard to understand how such shallow and vague accounts of them as Mills and Spencer's could ever have been given by thinking men. The causes of our mental structure are doubtless natural, and connected, like all our other peculiarities, with those of our nervous structure. Our interests, our tendencies of attention, our motor impulses, the aesthetic, moral, and theoretic combinations we delight in, the extent of our power of apprehending schemes of relation, just like the elementary relations themselves, time, space. Difference and similarity, and the elementary kinds of feeling, have all grown up in ways of which at present we can give no account. Even in the clearest parts of psychology our insight is insignificant enough. And the more sincerely one seeks to trace the actual course of psychogenesis, the steps by which as a race we may have come by the peculiar mental attributes which we possess. The more clearly one perceives the slowly gathering twilight close in utter night.